Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. For in a few moments, you're going to meet a ghost, the strangest phantom that you ever heard of. But first, I want you to be my guest on a little train ride. We're running at 60 miles an hour on open track in the dead of night. Now we thunder through a sleeping village. Then beyond it, we plunge into the waiting mouth of a tunnel. We race through the tunnel and into the open again. Over a trestle and on into the night. A little world of our own, rushing forward resistlessly, a symbol of power and speed and life. Yes, trains do have a life of their own, as you'll see in the unusual ghost story that I call... The Locomotive Ghost. My story starts some years ago in a hilly region of western Pennsylvania. It's almost midnight, and two men laden down with several handbags are moving cautiously over the rough ground beneath a railroad trestle. They come to a spot beneath one end of it, and there in the darkness, they stop and turn on a flashlight. All right, we can sit down and rest now. Are you sure this is the right spot? Of course I'm sure. This is a loading spur. It branches off at a mine entrance. Main line's over there, about a hundred yards away. How, uh, how long do you think we'll have to wait? Five or ten minutes. These mine trains don't run in a minute the way they do out in the main line. Suppose, uh, the money isn't on the mine train. They might have changed their plans. It'll be on it. Those miners are waiting for their pay, and the treasurer's bringing it himself. Plus bonus money and cash for operating the expenses. Big haul, my friend. Two hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars? That's a lot of dough, but... But what? You getting cold feet? No, no, of course not, but... Well, they'll be killed, won't they? The crew on the train? Forget it. I thought you were turning soft on me now after I spilled the whole plan to no, you. No, Joe, I'm not turning soft. Joe. What is it? Don't hear the noise, then. Over there. It's just your imagination. Oh, you're right. Somebody's coming. Keep the light steady. I got my gun handy. Who could it be? It's probably just a bum. He often sleep under his trestle. All right, you step where you are. It's only me, boys. Just old Boomer. Who? Old Boomer, that's all. Looking for a place to bunk. Howdy, boys. It's okay, Tom. I heard of this guy. So you're old Boomer, huh? The one they call the king of the bums? Uh, not the king, son. Just the traveling is one of them all. Fifty years I've been riding the rods, and I guess I've covered a million miles of track. Mind if I sit down here? Got a kind of ache in my bones. Sit down if you want to. Uh, thanks, son. <clears throat> Say, uh, you fellas ain't bums. You're dressed too good. Never mind about us. Curiosity ain't healthy. <laughs> Old Boomer never fights with anybody. Live and let live's his motto. Listen, here comes number 25. It's a mighty fine train, 25. Got a 16-wheel Mikado engine, can pull 20 cars at 80 on a level track. He's uh, 50 seconds late tonight. Do you know every train on the tracks? Uh, pretty near, son, pretty near. I ain't rode them all. I rode them all, I mean, from the Lackawanna to the Santa Fe. There ain't much about trains I don't know. Say, uh, you fellas wouldn't have a little nip handy to take the chill out of an old man's bones. No, we ain't got a little nip handy. Oh, sure, son. No harm in asking. <laughs> yeah. There's the 25 passing mines, Bill, now. Ain't that whistle far off in the night a sweet, mournful sound, though? Yeah, it is kind of mournful. Sounds are far off and ghostly, don't it? Well, sometimes it is a ghost you hear, not a real train at all. What are you talking about? I'm just saying that sometimes when you hear a train whistling far off and mournful in the night, it ain't a real train at all. It's a ghost train. Ghost train? 
a lot of hooey. Uh, you just think so because you're young and don't know better. But old Boomer can tell you. There's ghost trains and plenty of them. They're the ghosts of trains that died in wrecks. Anything as live as a train is bound to have a ghost live on after. All right, can the chatter. You're hurting my ears. Oh, let him talk, Joe. It helps pass the time. All right, but if you ask me, he's spotting a lot of bush water. Go on, Boomer. What were you saying about trains having ghosts? Well, I've seen them many a time. They're running the tracks with all the lights out, gone faster than the wind. Not a sound coming from them. I've seen the Heavenly Express, too, a couple times. What's the Heavenly Express? It's a special train, son. It's on the Earth to Heaven run. Travels a million miles a minute when it gets up speed. Takes the souls of railroad men from this world to the next. It always passes by when a wreck's going to happen. That's enough talk. I'm sick of listening to you. All right, son. You don't believe me, but I know what I know. I can... Glory be. I hear it coming. I hear it coming now. Hear what coming? The Heavenly Express. It's coming down this track. Listen. I don't hear anything. There's nothing to hear. It's passing right by overhead. Now it's slowing. It's going to stop. It's never stopped before. That, that means Rex's going to be here. Joe, he knows. That's it. That's what you're here for. You're going to wreck that mine train. Hear that, old man? That's a mine train turning into this spur. You're right, we're going to wreck it. No, you can't. You mustn't. But before we do, we got to take care of you. And this is how we're going to do it. <coughs> you shot him. I guess the Heavenly Express stopped for me, too. I sure hope so. But you fellas, it'll punish you. It'll follow you, sure as I'm laying here. Hello, follow us. What are you talking about? The judgment special. It punishes fellas that wreck trains on purpose. It runs any place has tracks. And it follows them until it gets them, one way or another. Because murdering a train is like murdering a man. you got to pay for it. And you'll pay for it. You think I'm crazy, but you'll see. You'll see. <laughs> Yeah, that shut him up. Crazy old coot. I wish you hadn't killed him, Joe. Don't be a sap. Couldn't let him live to tell what he knew, could I? No, no, of course not. Listen. I hear the mine train coming. We just got time to get ready now. Put the suitcase with the dynamite against the trestle here. That's it. Now, come on, help me unroll a wire. Yeah, yeah, sure, Joe. Anything you say. That's it. Keep coming. All right. Gotta get plenty far away. Hit a train now? Yeah, I hear it. I can see the headlight, too. Look how bright it is. Okay, this is far enough. Take me just a second to hitch up the detonator. There it is. Now we're all ready. It's on the trestle now. Almost halfway across. What's the matter? You sound shaky. Listen, Tom, you're in this now, and it's too late to back out, you hear? Yeah, I know. It's, it's almost across. All right, then I'll close the detonator. Now. There she goes. Three hours later, the two men, Joe Malone and Tom Henderson, were driving eastward through the night, far from the scene of the train wreck. Between them on the seat was a large handbag, and Joe Malone at the wheel patted it lovingly. Two hundred thousand bucks. Ha! You realize that, Tom? We got two hundred thousand bucks riding here between us. Yeah. Yeah, I know. What's the matter? You don't sound very happy about it. Sure I am. It's just... Just what? Well, I can't help remembering the crash when the mine train went to the ravine. The way the whistle kept screaming, just like the locomotive was something alive that was being killed. Well, for Pete's sake, the whistle valve got stuck when the engine crashed, that's all. Sure, I know that, only... Well, I just can't help remembering it. Joe, the crew were all killed, weren't they? Suppose they were. What do you care? You're as nervous as an old woman. Should never rung you in on this job. I'm all right, really. I am, Joe. Listen, uh, what are you gonna do with your hundred thousand? I'm heading for the big town. Gonna have one swell time. Gonna buy new clothes, stay at the best hotel in town, and really cut loose. Meet me in New York. I'll show you a real time. Where are you gonna stay? Mrs. Miller's boarding house. It's over on the west side. You can find it in a phone book. 
I'm just staying there till I can buy some real classy duds. And I'm moving to Park Avenue. Always had a yen to live on Park Avenue. Now I'm going to see what it's like. Yeah, sounds all right. Maybe, uh... Joe, look out that train! What'd you do that for? Why'd you grab the brake? You stall us right here in the middle of a railroad crossing. I had to, Joe. The train on the track there in front of us. We almost ran into it. What are you talking about? There wasn't any train on that track. But there was, running without lights and not making a sound. You're crazy. I tell you, there wasn't anything in sight, not even a handcar. But I saw it, Joe. Never heard of a train running without lights. That proves you're crazy. Well, maybe it was an empty. But if I hadn't stopped the car, we'd have smashed into the side of it. Yeah. Uh, good mind to suck you one. Now we're stalling the railroad track, and the car won't... Start. I'll get out and push. Joe, look. A headlight. Real train this time. Coming around the bend. It's about 200 yards off. Joe, it's going to hit us. we got to jump. Yeah, but this door won't open. It's stuck. Come on, out this side. Come on, I got the bag. Oh, my coat's caught in the car door. I'm stuck. Help me. I can't, Joe. Jump. Jump. Help me, Tom. Help. Help me. Help. Mister? Mister, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. But my uh, friend, he must have been killed. Yes, he sure was. It's a wonder you get away. Look at your car. Uh, There's pieces of it spread a quarter mile up the track. Whatever made you stop right there on the crossing? Car stall. Who are you? I- I'm the crossing watchman. Watchman? Why weren't you on duty? Why didn't you signal there was a train coming? Because I didn't know it, mister. That was the wrecking train taking doctors down to Mineville. It was unscheduled. Oh, I see. What about the other train, the one that went past going east just before the wrecking train hit us? Other train? Yeah. Well, no other train due through here till 6 a.m. this morning. I saw it, I tell you, traveling without lights. No train ever travels without lights. It's against the law. Say, are you drunk? No, no, I'm not. Where are you going? Listen, I got a, a report to make on this. You got to fill out a form. Forget it. I'm not interested. Get away from here. I'm going to New York. Late the next afternoon, Tom Henderson reached New York. Not knowing where else to go, he hunted in the phone book for Mrs. Miller's boarding house that Joe Malone had mentioned and went there. Mrs. Miller gave him a room on the top floor. And there he carefully locked in the closet the precious handbag that held $200,000. All of it his since Joe's unfortunate death. After that, Tom went out to see New York's nightclubs. But he got back after midnight, feeling considerably more cheerful. As he was about to unlock his door, Mrs. Miller appeared in the hall. Oh, Mr. Henderson. Oh, Oh, yeah, Mrs. Miller. I was waiting for you, Mr. Henderson. Huh? It's turned so cool that I lit the gas heater in your room. Well, thanks a lot. I just wanted to warn you that you... What was that? What was what, Mr. Henderson? That, that whistle just now. What was it? A boat out in the river? Oh, that was a freight train, Mr. Henderson. Freight train? Here in the heart of New York? Well, yes. They come down the west side elevated tracks to the freight yard downtown. They run past just a few yards down the street. I didn't know that. I wouldn't have come here if I had. Oh, I'm sure they won't bother you, Mr. Henderson. Really, they won't. Well, good night. Good night. Oh, bad Lex. She's sure they won't bother me. It's too late to find someplace else where I'd leave here right now. I'll close the window. There. I'll keep the sound out. Anyway, suppose I can hear a train or two. But I'm going to hear them do me. I'm going to go to sleep and forget it. Yeah, forget it. I've got 200,000 bucks in my whole life ahead of me. <laughs> Should let an old coot like that boomer worry me. Joe's getting killed by a train was just an accident. Could happen to anybody. Me? I'm alive. Tomorrow, I'm going to start enjoying it plenty. Oh, Lord! Trains. 
Perhaps till it trains. All aboard, son. We're leaving in one millionth of a second, and we've got to be on time. Boomer, uh, it's you. That's right, son. You've got to wake up and get aboard. We're pulling out. Well, I'm at a railroad station someplace, but everything's so misty, I can't see much. No time for talking, son. Got to get aboard. Yeah, but I'm the only passenger, except for you and me, there isn't another soul in sight. And you're wearing a conductor's uniform. They promoted me. Now, come on, get aboard. I don't want to. I don't like trains. I don't want to go any place. Can't help it. This is a special trip just for you. And you've got to be aboard. Had it. Come on now, up those steps. I... That's it. Now we're off right on time to the millionth of a second. Where, where are we going? What train is this? Why, it's completely empty except for me and you. That's right, son. It's a thousand-car train pulled by 30 engines. And you and me are the only ones aboard. Well, where are we going? What, what train is this, anyway? It's the Judgment Special, son. And we're bound from this world to the next. No. No! Yeah, or any place there's tracks to judge up right outside your wind and took your board. I don't want to die. I don't want to. You haven't any choice, son. You're on the Judgment Special and we're hitting a million miles a minute now. What? Look out the window. There's the earth way down below us. See it? Yeah. But I don't want to leave it. I don't want to go. Look at the stars flash by. We're gone a million miles a minute. And it'll take us all eternity to get there. Yep. Here, I'll put the wind up so you can see better. Oh. There you are, son. There's the earth we left. That tiny little dot of light way up in the sky. Oh, I won't go with it. I won't. Hey, I won't. what are you doing? Get down. I can't jump out that window. We're going a million miles a minute. I will jump. I'm not going with you. Come back. Come back. Wake up. Wake up, Mr. Henderson. Wake up. Wake up. What is it? Oh, what is it? Oh, Mr. Henderson, thank heaven you're still alive. I, I thought you were dead for sure. What, what happened? Well, you closed your window. I meant to warn you that with the gas heater on, you must leave it open. Well, you almost suffocated in your sleep. I... I almost suffocated? Yes. If I hadn't heard you trying to get your breath and hurried in and opened your window, you'd have been dead now, for sure. The rest of the night, Tom Henderson spent sitting on a bench in the nearest park, shivering at the nearness of his escape. The next day, he bought himself an expensive wardrobe... Then he checked into the biggest hotel on Park Avenue. There, just before he retired, he, he took his sleeping tablet. Yeah, that fixed it. No dreams for me tonight. Ah, some layout. So this is what you can enjoy when you have money. And I'm going to enjoy it. I've been letting my nerves get the better of me. Not anymore. Feel better already. So it goes the light. I sleep like a millionaire. Yes, just like a millionaire. And so Tom fell asleep. But unfortunately, he did dream. And he knew he was dreaming, but he couldn't wake up. It was a very curious dream indeed. He dreamed that he got up and dressed, rode down in the elevator that he walked out into Park Avenue, and there, down the street, he found a tiny door which he entered. It led down a flight of steep iron stairs to a dark tunnel far beneath the ground. There in the tunnel, a man was waiting for him. The man turned, and he saw it was his former pal, Joe Malone. Hello, Tom. Joe. Joe, it's you. Yeah. I've been waiting for you, Tom. But... But you're dead. I saw you killed. Maybe I'm dead. Maybe I'm not. You're dead. I know it. It's just a dream. I gotta wake up. Can't wake up. Don't you understand? You're never gonna wake up. I will. I oh, will. Oh, Tom. Hmm. Now come along with me. I'm here to guide you. Where? Where are you taking me? Down this tunnel. See how it stretches out? On and on. Now it keeps going down and down. No. Where do you think it goes to? 
I don't know. I don't, I don't want to know. Come on now, Tom. I can't wait all night. No, I won't go. I'm going to wake up. You can't, Tom. The night I was killed, you saw the judgment special. Now you can never get away from it. It's not true. This is... It's the dream. I'm safe in my own bed in the hotel. And you refuse to come with me? Yes, I do. I refuse. Listen, Tom. Listen to what? I don't hear anything. Listen. It's closer now. No. You hear that? That's the judgment special, Tom. Coming through this tunnel. Train. It's a train coming. And where are you going to go? You're in a tunnel, Tom. And no way out. It's, it's just a dream. It can't hurt me. It's coming closer, Tom. It's coming closer. No, it's only a dream. I gotta wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, mister. Oh. Oh. Thank heavens I'm awake. I'd say not any too soon either. But... I... Who are you? It's so dark and... Carrying a lantern. Who am I? Mister, I'm a track walker. Track walker? What do you mean? I mean that I inspect the track here under Park Avenue. What? How did I get here? Why, mister, a minute ago I found you walking in your sleep, your eyes tight closed down this tunnel right under Park Avenue. Park Avenue? If I hadn't met you, you never would open your eyes again, because number ten is due along here in three minutes. Then... And it wasn't a dream. I... I really am in a railroad tunnel. Yes, I am. I'll say you are. How you got here, I don't know, unless you came down one of the inspection doors from the street. But, brother, if this walking in your sleep is something you do often, take my advice and see a doctor. But Tom didn't go to a doctor, so he knew what a doctor would say. That it was his nerves, his guilty conscience. Now Tom felt he had to get away far away to a place where there were no trains to haunt him. At dawn, he bought a ticket on the first plane leaving for Canada. That afternoon, he found himself in a tiny town deep in the heart of Canada. There, he hired a French-Canadian guide to take him by canoe far into the woods, away from any trace of civilization. Late that night, they arrived at the cabin where the guide lived with his wife. Tom unpacked his suitcase and joined the guide and his wife on the porch. For the first time since the wrecking of the mine train, Tom felt at peace. Oh, this is something like it. It is peaceful, is it not, monsieur? Yeah. Ah, monsieur's nerves are better already. Yes, this is what I need. Uh, how far is it to the nearest railroad? Oh, it is 80 miles, monsieur. 80 miles. Old Boomer said it traveled anywhere there were tracks. 80 miles ought to be enough. Pardon? I do not understand. Oh, never mind. Uh, I've got to get some sleep now. Of course. Good night, monsieur. Good night, monsieur. What was that? Uh, what was what, monsieur? That that whistle, then. It sounded like a train whistle. Impossible. It must have been an owl. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry about it. Good night. Tom entered his room and went to bed. But he could not sleep. He tossed and turned, and at last got up and dressed. Oh, the moon is bright. I'll take a little walk. i got to calm myself down. There's nothing to worry about now, not a thing. Out here in the wilds, I'm safe. Perfectly safe. Tom left the cabin and entered the woods. They pressed thick around him. But an open passageway through the trees attracted Tom. He started down it, the moonlight illuminating his way. He paused and made a startling discovery. Why, well, I'm walking on old railroad ties. And there are tracks here, all rusted and loose. But the guide said there wasn't a railroad closer than 80 miles. He lied to me. He tricked me. A train. There's a train coming. It's coming toward me. There's a headlight. I gotta run. Run. Run! Marie! Marie! Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça, Pierre? The nervous one. He's not in the cabin. He has wandered off into the woods. Oh, that is strange. We must go after him. Hurry, before he does himself an injury. It's still behind me. Still following me. I... I can't... I can't run anymore. I can't... I can't go any further. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. 
The judgment special, son. It runs any place there's tracks, and it follows you till it gets you. Because murder in a train is like murder in a man. You got to pay for it. You think I'm crazy, but you'll see. Here it comes, son. No! No! He cannot be far now, Marie. See his footprints. Ah, he was running for half a mile. He would do himself harm running so hard in his darkness. Look, Pierre. Voila. Yes, it is the nervous one. We have found him. He's lying face down. Wait, I will turn him over. Pierre, he lies so still. Has he done himself an injury? No, Marie. There is not a mark on him. Yet his face, it is twisted with fear. Pierre, is he... Is he dead? Yes, Marie, he is dead. His heart, he killed himself by running, no doubt. But what was it he ran away from? There is nothing dangerous in these woods. This is the mysterious traveler again. Poor Tom. The tracks he found himself on led to an abandoned logging camp. They hadn't been used in 20 years, and no train could possibly have run on them. Uh, except a ghost train. But of course, none of us believes in ghosts, so we just have to accept the coroner's verdict, which was heart failure induced by overexertion. Just the same... If you ever see a train running without lights and going faster than the wind, don't be too sure it's only your imagination. And next time you hear a distant, mournful whistle in the night, you... Oh, all this talk about trains is making you nervous and you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. Shall we say next week at the same time? You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, James McCallion, Joe Julian, Bryna Rayburn, and Cameron Andrews. Original music was played by Charles Paul. Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... The Man the Insects Hated. Another strange and shivery tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable. If you can. It's the end of July, and rather warm, isn't it? There's probably an insect or two buzzing around in your living room right this moment or banging against your screen trying to get in. 
before we go any further, you better get rid of it. If you do, you'll breathe easier as you hear the unusual story I have for you today. The story I call... The Man the Insects Hated. My story begins in a homemade laboratory in a crumbling mansion on the edge of a bayou, deep in the heart of the Louisiana swamps. Outside, the air is filled with the strident hum and buzz of insects, uncounted swarms of them crawling and hopping and flying in the hot, lush atmosphere. Inside the laboratory, the air is filled with the same sound as a small man with graying hair lifts a wire insect trap to a table. Listen to them, Mary. How they hate me, every one of them. The flies, the bees, the hornets, the beetles, the locusts, the spiders, they all hate me. Oh, John, they don't hate you. They're just bugs. They can't hate you. Yes, but listen to them hum and buzz when I come near. (laughs) They know me. And the reason they're so upset is that they know that we're enemies. And that I'm going to destroy them. Destroy them utterly. All right, John. (sighs) Oh, Mary, you look tired. This life we've been leading the last few months, it's very dreary for you, isn't it? It's all right, John. It doesn't matter. But it does. These swamps, they must seem like the last outpost of creation to you. You always did love the city and the lights, the movement, the gaiety. I'm all right. You mustn't worry about me. It's only... It's such a struggle. If we had someone to help us, it would be easier. But no one will come out here and work for us. Yes, I know, my darling. Believe me, I do. But it's only for a little while. Soon we'll be rich. I promise it. All right, John. I'll be patient. You do believe me, Mary. You know that I'm on the verge of success now, don't you? That last formula, you saw how quickly it killed every insect in the cage? Yes, I know. It was wonderful, John. Yes, and you know yourself what it'll mean to the world. The perfect insect killer, something much better than DDT. Why, it will be tremendous. It will make the worst jungle livable. It'll cut down disease and increase the crops and... There's someone at the door. Yes. That's very odd. I wonder who it could be. I'll see. Perhaps it's Dr. Guernsey or, or Mr. Conway, the druggist. They promised to call. Good morning. Is Professor Hansen in? But... Why, yes, he is. Come in quickly. There's so many flies. Yeah. Seems like the air is full of bugs outside. Never saw so many in my life. What is it, Mary? It's uh, someone to see you, John. I don't know who. Andrews, the name, Professor. Martin Andrews. Say, you really are out in the wilds here, aren't you? Thought I'd never find you. Yes, we are rather isolated, but... uh... You're wondering who I am and what I want here. The truth is, I was in Conway's drugstore back in town, and he told me you might be able to use a handyman. Oh, a handyman? Yes, we can use a handyman. How much do you want? Oh, not very much. I guess 25 bucks a week would do me. We can manage that, I think. But on second thought, I don't know. I'm not crazy about these swamps with all these bugs around. Oh, please try it anyway, Mr. Andrews. My husband is engaged on some very important research, and he needs help badly. Oh. Well, when you put it like that, Mrs. Hanson... Then you will stay. Yeah, I'll stay. (laughs) What have I got to lose? Maybe I'll like it better than I thought at first. Excellent, Mr. Andrews, excellent. Oh, just call me Martin, Professor. Uh, uh, Yes, Martin, yes. Now, there are a lot of details that you can help me with. Uh, now, take this watch and... Uh, Lunch will be ready in a minute. Oh, yes, my dear, yes. Uh, uh, take this watch, Martin, uh-huh. and uh, you see this wire trap full of insects? Yeah. There must be thousands of bugs in there. There are. You see, I'm working to discover the perfect insect exterminator. Oh, yeah, I see. Yes, and in this spray gun, I have my latest solution, Formula 312. And I'm going to spray it just once at this trap full of insects, and you are to time how long it takes them all to die. You're going to kill all those bugs with just one squirt from that sprayer? (laughs) I hope so. And they know it, too. Listen to them hum. (laughs) How they hate me. They know I'm going to kill them, and they, they wish they could get free to kill me. Huh? Oh, yes. Yes, they know me. 
Insects hate me. All insects, just as I hate them. They'd kill me if they could, but instead I'm going to kill them. <laughs> Have you got your eye on the watch? What? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Then start timing. Now, watch and listen. Say, that stuff really mows them down, Professor. Yes, they're dying now. A few of them are still trying to crawl around, but uh, there they go. Now, how long did it take? Uh, 29 seconds. It's good, but not quite good enough. But I'm sure I'm on the right track. Lunch is ready, John. Oh, yes, my dear, yes, we're coming. Well, uh, Martin, do you think you're going to like working here, helping me develop my new insect killer? Yes, sir, Professor. I've got an idea it's going to be a lot more interesting here than I ever imagined. More coffee, John? Thank you, my dear. No, I want to go back to the lab to try a new formula. And um, while I'm mixing it, why don't you show Martin around the place? Why, That's I... a swell idea, Professor. I'd like to get wise to just what you're doing here. But I'm sure that John could show you around and explain everything better than I could. No, 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 not at all, Mary. And besides, you know how I feel about going outdoors. Well, all right, John. If you want me to. Fine. I'll get started on the new mixture right away, and uh, when you're through, I'll have something for you to do, Martin. Okay, Professor. Well, Mrs. Hanson, I'll be obliged to you if you'll give me the lowdown on everything. Well, all right, Martin. There are things that you really should know, so... That's how it is, huh? Mm-hmm. The professor is hipped on the subject of bugs and wants to rid the world of them. <laughs> and he thinks they all know it and hate him, huh? <laughs> oh, that's a hot one. <laughs> the bees and the mosquitoes and the flies. They all got it in for him, huh? <laughs> you mustn't laugh. I know it's a strange quirk of his mind, but it's a harmless one. And you must pretend not to notice anything odd about it. Okay, Mrs. Hanson, if you say so. You see, when he was a small boy, my husband was almost stung to death by a swarm of bees. That brought on his peculiar hatred of all insects and his belief that they hate him. Mm, sure, I can see how that would be. And that's the reason why all his life he's been experimenting to find the perfect insect exterminator. It's screwy, but if he does find this perfect bug killer, it'll pay off big. Oh, he will find it. I'm sure of it. That's why I'm willing to... I mean, I, I'm sure he will. You were going to say that's why you're willing to stay here in this swamp because you think he'll find this bug killer and make a lot of money from it, huh? Well, that's the truth, ain't it, Mrs. Hanson? I... You're being impertinent. The first time I looked at you, I could see you weren't meant for a life like this. You were meant for pretty clothes and soft music, dancing, fun. Not for rotting away in a swamp that's only fit for bugs... You mustn't talk like that. I've got to go back to the house. No, no, not yet. Listen, the minute I stepped inside that house, I knew you were eating your heart out all for fun and people and pretty things. I don't know what you're talking about. Let go of my wrist. Not yet. Listen, I'm no handyman. I know how to make money when I want to. It's just good luck that brought me here. My good luck. There's meant to be something between us. I knew that the second you opened the door this morning. You're crazy. Let me go. Sure, I'll let you go. There. Well, why don't you run away from me now that you can? You mustn't say things like that. You mustn't. But I already have, and I will again. You weren't meant to be married to a dotty old dodo like the professor... You were meant to live. And I'm going to hang around here until I prove it to you. And so Martin Andrews joined the strange household in the swamps, the household where Professor Hansen plotted death for the insect world. 
Mary suggested to him that it had been a mistake to hire Martin so hastily without investigating his background. But her husband pooh-poohed her arguments, and she was silent. Knowing she could not explain that she was both frightened and fascinated by a man whom she'd seen for the first time that day. So Martin stayed, and in the days that followed, Professor Hansen found him invaluable. With his help, the work went much more quickly. And daily, as the work progressed, the number of insects swarming about the house increased, buzzing and humming ominously as though news of the professor's success was spreading throughout the whole swamp. Then one morning in the laboratory... Time, Martin. Exactly 15 seconds, Professor. 15 seconds and every insect in the trap is dead. We've done it, Martin. Mary! Mary! Yes, John? What is it? Mary, we've done it. At last I found the formula that will kill any insect known almost instantly. Oh, John! Oh, I'm so glad. Yes, Formula 3970. Here it is. Just a few marks on this piece of paper. <laughs> but it's man's final victory over the insect world. Ha! <laughs> Listen to the bugs outside. Hum, Professor. Yes. They sound almost like they knew what you'd done. Oh, yes, they do know. But they're helpless. They're beaten and they know it. <gasps> yes. Now I've got to write a note to Dr. Guernsey and Mr. Conway. Uh, Martin, wait here for me. Yeah, sure, Professor. Martin, what are you doing with that formula? Just putting it in my pocket where it'll be safe. You know how the professor is always losing things. Give it to me, please. I'll take care of it. No, I think I'd better hold on to it. But I have something else for you. No. Let me go. Let go of me. Ever since I... that first day. And I've been waiting. Till you know as well as I do that we were meant for each other. You must say such things. You do know it, don't you? No. No, I... Maybe this will convince you. Oh, Martin. Oh, Martin. Now you know it. Don't you? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm crazy, I suppose, but I can't help it. You... You've got to go away, Martin. Now, today... You to... are crazy if you think I'm going without you. Oh, here comes the professor. We'll talk about it later. Martin, here's a note from Mr. Conway, the druggist. I've asked him to come out with Dr. Guernsey tomorrow night. Will you drive into town and deliver it to him, please? Sure, Professor. I'd be glad to. Right away. Come in, Martin, quickly. Oh, my, your clothes are covered with insects. Here, stand still a minute. I'll get rid of them. There. It takes care of that. How in the world did so many get on you? When I got out to open the garage door, they were crawling all over it. They dropped onto me. I couldn't knock them off. John! Oh, John! Yes, Mary? John! John, there are, there are ants in the kitchen. A whole swarm of giant black ants. They're monsters. Giant ants in the kitchen? How did they get in? I don't know, but they're there. And more coming all the time. Well, never mind. We'll take care of them. Come on, Martin. Bring the spray gun. Right. They mustn't get into the house. I won't let them. They want to get at me, but they're not going to. There they are, John. All over the floor. These giant ants. The floor's black with them. And look at them come this way toward me. They know who I am. Quick, Martin. Use the spray. Yes, Professor. This will fix them. Ah. Look at them turn up their toes. Yes. Yeah. That finishes them. But how in the world did they get in? I thought I'd made this house insect-proof. Here are some more, coming through this hole in the woodwork. I'll take care of them. Now I'll plug up the hole. No more will come in that way. They're such big ants. I've never seen any that big before. And they were after me. But we've taught them a lesson. Professor, you've almost convinced me you're right. About the bugs hating you, I mean. What are you saying? It's the truth. You never saw so many bugs in your life as there are outside right now. When I got back from town, I could hardly see the house for the beetles and the flies and the hornets that are buzzing around it. A couple of times, the car ran over columns of ants so thick I thought they were going to clog the wheels. Columns heading this way. Is that so? I must go over to the window and see for myself. Yes, good heavens, the screen is so covered with insects I can't see out. I'll give them a dose of your bug killer. That'll make them move on. Yeah, that cleared them off. Now, take a look outside, Professor. 
Did you ever see anything like that in your life? <gasps> oh! Good Lord, the sky is black with insects. Look at that swarm over the trees. Flying beetles, wasps, bees, loco... I can't identify them all. Yeah, and just listen to them. Listen to that song of hate. Don't say that. It, it's just a natural phenomenon. These swamps breed insects by the millions. Yeah, yeah, I know. And every one of those millions is headed right for this spot. But that's ridiculous. No, it's not. All the way to town, I didn't see a single bug. Because they're all gathered right around here, right around this house. You mustn't say that. He's right. They know what's happening here and they want to stop me. No, John, no. If you want my advice, the thing to do is make up all the Formula 397 we can. If those bugs ever get into this house, we're going to need it. As the day wore on, the clouds of insects surrounding the old mansion in the swamps grew steadily bigger. At times, the house was almost hidden by the black swarms of tiny creatures flying and crawling over it, as if they really were trying to force their way inside. But only a few did get into the house through unnoticed cracks, but as night came on... John. Yes? John, the lights won't go on. They won't? No, look. Her fuse must have blown out. I'll go take a look, Professor. I have the flashlight. Thank you, Martin. I'll only be a minute. Listen to them, Mary. Listen to them swarming about the house, beating against the screens, trying to get in at me. Oh, John, they're just insects. They don't hate you. They don't? Hey, well, then where have they come from? Why are they surrounding this house? Answer me that. Oh, I don't know. Martin agrees with me. He said so this afternoon. You mustn't pay any attention to Martin. Listen to them. If they could get in, we'd be dead in 15 minutes. There's death we hear humming and buzzing out there, Mary. Professor! Uh, Professor! Yes, what is it? Did you find the trouble? Yes, it's in the switch box, all right. All the fuses are blown out. All of them? But how? The switch box is full of little beetles. I don't know where they came from, but they caused a short circuit that blew out all the fuses. They did it on purpose. Oh, John! Well, anyway, we'll be using candles tonight. And there's another thing. What, Martin? The cellar is full of little white ants. I couldn't find out where they're coming from. White ants? Not ants, Martin. Those are termites. Well, termites, then. They're all over everything. Termites? They can eat their way through wood. They can eat holes that the other insects can enter through. Yeah. That's right, isn't it? Martin, come on. Get two insect sprays. We've got to get down there and destroy them before they destroy us. <laughs> be billions of bugs out there. Crickets, bees, flies, hornets, wasps, ants, every kind of insect there is. It's a good thing you put tight screens on this house. John! What is it, Mary? Well, I thought I felt the house shake then. Ah, oh, don't let your imagination get you. I didn't feel anything. No, no, no. You must keep control of your nerves. I suppose I imagined it then. Oh, John, it's almost midnight. Are they ever going to go away? Maybe not. If the professor's right and they're after him, they'll just hang around until we starve to death or until they get in and finish us off. Oh, Martin, stop it. Martin is right. We've used up all the Formula 397, and if they ever do get into the house, we're doomed. I was just thinking that myself. We have got to get help. Go out of the house? Yes. Oh, oh no, John. Not all of us. But maybe if I were to take the car and make a dash for town, they might follow me. John, that's madness. In the sedan, with all the windows shut, they couldn't get at me, and in town I could get help. Yeah, yeah, you could. I could make up more Formula 397 at Conway's drugstore, and he and Dr. Guernsey can come back with me. And if we used a big pumper spray, we could destroy every insect that's outside. No! You mustn't try it. It sounds like a good idea to me. I'd go, only I couldn't mix the formula. No, John, you mustn't go out. Yes, I'm going to do it. If those ants ever get at the car, they'd cut the tires to shreds, and then we would be at their mercy. I've got to go for help while I can. Then let's all go. We can all get in the car. It'd be safer to stay here. This house will hold them off for a good while yet. I think the professor's scheme is the best. All right, Martin. Now, I'll get ready, and then you come downstairs and help me with the garage doors, and you're going to have to open and shut them awfully fast when I take the car out. <laughs> Despite Mary's protests, Professor Hansen carried out his plan. 
With the car tightly closed, the motor racing, Martin flung open the garage doors. The car shot out into the night, the headlights showing great swarms of flying insects in its path. Then Martin swiftly closed and bolted the door again and hurried upstairs. Well, he's gone. Oh, why did you let him go? That ought to be obvious. What do you mean? I didn't let him go. I made him go. I put the whole idea in his mind so he'd go off and leave us alone here. Oh, no. Sure I did. I'm a bright boy. From now on, it's going to be just you and me and fun. What are you saying? John isn't going to come back from his little trip to town. I don't understand. Then I'll make it simple. In the first place, all those bugs outside don't mean a thing. When I was in town this morning, Conway the druggist told me it happens out here every seven years or so. There's something about the way the wind blows that makes millions of bugs come out of the swamp to swarm around this house in certain years. Oh, but then... Why did you pretend to believe John when he said it was because they were after him? Just so as he'd go to town for help. Those bugs are harmless. As soon as the wind shifts, they'll be gone. But then... Right this minute, John's driving to town as fast as he can go. And any second now, the steering gear is going to bust. Oh, no. Yes, baby, because I fixed it too. And when that steering wheel goes, it'll be curtains for John. The car will hit a tree and... You'll be free to marry me. We'll have Formula 397 and all the dough it'll bring in. That's murder. (laughs) No, it isn't murder. It's being smart. You've murdered John. And I'm guilty too. Because I didn't make him send you away. Uh, You never really wanted me to go. I ought to lie with you. And myself, too, but... But I... But you don't. No, Martin. I don't. That's more like it, baby. We'll always be together. Always. Forever, Martin. We... Martin! Huh? Something's happening. What? The house! It's... It's, it's shaking! Oh, we've got to get out of here. The house oh. came in. It's very oh. quick. Grab hold of me. Oh. Come on now, before... Look out! Mr. Conway, can't you drive faster? We must get back to the house. I'm driving as fast as I can, Professor. Professor, you must control yourself. That was a serious accident you were in. It's a miracle you weren't killed. Sure was. Where your car hit that tree, well, I'm just glad it wasn't me. Yes, 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 but please drive faster. No, I should never have allowed you to return to your home with us. You should be in a hospital. But, Doctor, my wife and Martin, I've got to save them. Those insects, they hate me. They're out to destroy all of us. They'll kill my wife and Martin if we don't get there in time. Professor, you must calm yourself. I'm sure it isn't as serious as all that. Oh, Doctor, you're like everyone else. You don't know how dangerous the insect world is, but I know, and that's why they hate me, and that's why they're out to destroy me and my wife and Martin. Well, we're almost there. The house is just around this bend in the road. Yes, but please hurry. You mustn't slow down. Professor, I've got to take this curve slow. After all, we don't want no more... Good Lord. (sighs) The house. It's collapsed. They've wrecked it. I told you they were out to get me. Now, come quickly. We must find my wife and Martin. Uh, Come along, Conway. This looks bad. Yes, Doctor. Mary! Mary, where are you? Mary, answer me. Conway, you'd better start looking through the wrecking. Okay, Doctor. Mary! Mary, where are you? Oh, Lord, I've never seen so many bugs in all my life. We only had more of my Formula 397. We could kill all of them. All of them! But they won't get the better of me. They won't. Professor, what are you doing? There isn't any spray in that gun. It's empty. I'll show them. I'll show them. Doctor. Doctor. I found them. They're under the wreckage of the house. Oh, you'd better take me to them, Conway. Perhaps we can... It's too late, Doc. They're both dead. Dead? They're dead? Yes, Professor. They were killed by falling timbers when the house collapsed. No. 
No, it wasn't the falling timbers that killed them. It was the insect world that killed them. They tried to destroy me, and instead they murdered Mary. And now they're trying to break me down, but I won't let them. I won't let them. My formula, formula 397. The spray will destroy them all. Yes, yes, they're dying left and right. They're dying, you see. Doc, what, they're what's wrong with them? That, that spray all. gun's empty. Uh, yes, Conway, I know. I'm afraid he's completely mad. The insect world has destroyed his mind. This is the mysterious traveler again. And how did you enjoy our visit with the man the insects hated? Too bad about poor Professor Hansen, wasn't it? Yes, they found he'd gone completely mad, and in his madness had completely forgotten his newly discovered Formula 397, which would destroy all insects. Oh, what happened to the copy of the formula which Martin had stolen? Well, strangely enough, when Martin's body was removed from the wreckage. The formula was not in his pockets. Some people say that the insects... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. <laughs> You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's story, the cast included Maurice Tarplin, Eric Dressler, Helen Shields, and Robert Dryden. Original music was played by Gene Perazzo. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled, I Dream of Dying. Another strange and terrifying tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Mysterious Traveler. This is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join him on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. I hope it's not making you nervous, being alone with me here in the dark. Darkness stirs strange terrors in some minds, particularly those of children. For children live in a world of their own, a world far removed from that of adults. Who among us knows the psychology of the child mind with its devious thoughts and actions? As in the tale of The Good Die Young. Years ago, when I was practicing medicine, I brought a child into the world, a girl who was named Sandra. In the years that followed, she grew into an extremely beautiful 
and the clever child. But my story begins the day that Martha, the housekeeper, was finishing her duties for the last time. Sandra, come in here. I want to see you. Sandra! Were you calling me Martha? Yes. I told you to come right home after school. Where have you been? Oh, I'm sorry, Martha. I didn't hear you tell me to come home right after school. I'm sorry. Truly, I am. Save your acting for your father, young lady. It hasn't fooled me for a long time. Sandra, since your mother died, you're becoming more and more of a problem every day. Well, at least after tonight, I won't have to put up with your lies and your thousand and one little tricks. What do you mean, Martha? Your father won't be needing a housekeeper anymore. I'm leaving tonight. But why? Well... I'm not supposed to tell you. But you may as well know now as later. Your father is bringing home a new mother for you tonight. A new mother? Yes. He's just married again. But I don't want a new mother. Daddy and I don't need anyone else. We're happy the way we are. Sandra, stop screaming. I won't have it. Do you hear? I won't have it. Your new mother's a very fine woman. I met her last night. I hate her. I hate her. Daddy's mine and no one else's. She hasn't any right to him. If you don't stop that screaming, I'll tell your father when he comes home tonight. Oh, no, no, no. Don't do that. I'll be good. But I hate her and I always will. I'll never stop hating her. That's a fine way to talk. Perhaps I ought to warn the poor woman about Sandra. Well, then it's none of my business. Besides, she'll find out about her soon enough. <laughs> Even it's ridiculous you're carrying me across the threshold. All right, darling. It's tradition in my family to carry the bride over the threshold. <laughs> there you are. Oh. Oh. oh, Stephen, what a lovely house. Mm -hmm. Oh, you haven't seen the best part of it yet. Sandra. Do you think she'll like me, Stephen? I do so want her to. Of course she will. Perhaps you should have told her about us instead of breaking it to her so unexpectedly like oh, this. Oh, nonsense, Helen. I know my daughter. She's a wonderful child. And she'll fall madly in love with you at the first sight, just as her father did. <laughs> Sandra, where are you? Daddy. Daddy, you're home early. Oh, I'm so glad. How are you, darling? Oh, Daddy. <laughs> um, I have a surprise for you. A surprise? Mm hmm Sandra, this is Helen. Helen, I want you to meet my daughter, Sandra. Hello, Sandra. Hello. Darling, the uh, surprise I just mentioned is Helen. We were married this afternoon. That means that Helen is now your mother. Oh, Daddy, that's wonderful. Now I'll have a mother just like all the other girls do. Oh, I'm so glad. So am I, Sandra. And I'm sure we're all going to be very happy together. Of course we are. That night, after the family had said goodbye to Martha and seen her off, Sandra was sent to bed. She lay quietly in the darkness, thinking. Occasionally, she would speak softly to her doll, Barbara. She hasn't any right being here, Barbara. Daddy and I were perfectly happy until she came along. Tonight, he didn't even notice me. Just kept looking at her. Well, she shan't have him. He's always been mine, and he always will be. <laughs> Enough of that. Now let me see. Sandra! This is the second time this afternoon I've asked you not to pound the keys that way. That's no way to play. I'm sorry, Mother. It's not only the piano, dear. There are many other little things. You pay no attention when I speak to you about them. I don't mean to do them, Mother. I just forget. Well, please try to remember, dear. Now, I want you to play the piano as you did last night for Daddy. He was very pleased. Yes, Mother. Sandra! Yes, Mother? Sandra. I thought I asked you to stop pounding the piano like that. But, Mother, I was just composing a new piece for Daddy. Well, that wasn't music, Sandra, but just noise. 
That'll be enough for today. Hello, beautiful. How are you, darling? Uh-huh. Well, I wasn't sent her at the door to meet me. She's all right, isn't she? Oh, of course, dear. Uh, Stephen? Hmm? I was a bit angry with Sandra this afternoon. Angry with Sandra? Why? What'd she do? Well, several times this afternoon, I had to speak to her about pounding the piano, being loud and discordant. Huh. Well, that isn't like Sandra. You know how well she plays. Yes, of course. That wasn't the way she played today. Well, I'll go up and see her. All right. Uh, supper will be ready soon. All right, Ellen. Sandra, what's this? Oh, Daddy, Daddy. What's wrong? Sandra? You never cry. Uh, I was only trying to compose a new piece for your birthday next month. A new piece for my birthday? Yes, I wanted to surprise you. Oh, well, there, there, dear. You mustn't cry. I'm sure Mother understands you didn't mean to be bad. Now, here, let me wipe your tears. Oh, Daddy, I love you so. I just wanted to compose something wonderful for you. I understand, darling. Oh, Daddy, you always understand. Is supper ready to do? Mm-hmm. Where's Sandra? She'll be down in a minute. Helen. Yes, Stephen? She really didn't mean to pound on the piano and get on your nerves. It's just she was trying to compose a new piece for me. But, Stephen, it wasn't music. It was just noise. Well, you mustn't be harsh with her. You know what children are like in their enthusiasm. They forget what they're told. But, Stephen... I don't know exactly what to say. It's just a question of being patient with her. Winning her love. All right, Stephen... Perhaps I was a bit impatient with her. You know I want nothing more than for the three of us to be happy together. I know that, darling. And the three of us will be happy together. In the weeks that followed, Helen tried to overlook Sandra's slamming of doors, constant droppings of objects, and other nerve-wracking incidents. In time, she felt... Sandra would come to accept her love and guidance. It was just a matter of patience. Sandra, is that you? Yes, Mother. Please sit down, dear. I want to talk to you. All right, but do hurry. Daddy will be home soon. Sandra, every day I've been giving you milk money for school. Why haven't you been buying milk with that money? But I have been, Mother. Now, please, Sandra, I won't punish you. I just want to know what you've been doing with that money. I've been buying milk with it. Please, Sandra. Mrs. Gordon, your teacher, told me you haven't bought milk for almost a month now. But I have. She just... Sandra, I won't have you lying to me. Now, that's your father. We'll see what he has to say about this. (laughs) You don't understand. You just don't understand. Stephen? Sandra, what are you crying about? I'm sorry, Stephen, but Sandra's been misbehaving. Mm -hmm. I think you'd better speak to her. You just don't understand. What's she done, Helen? Mrs. Gordon, her teacher, told me today that for the past month, Sandra hasn't been buying milk with her milk money. Is that true, Sandra? What's worse, Stephen, when I asked Sandra about it, she lied and said that she had been buying milk at school. Why, Sandra, it isn't like you to lie about things. I didn't mean to lie about it. I just wanted to keep it a surprise. <laughs> what a surprise. Your, your birthday present. Oh? I, I saved my milk money so that I could buy you a pipe. It's here in this box. But Sandra, you know I'd have given you money to buy a birthday present for Daddy. It isn't the same thing. I wanted to buy him a present with my own money. Oh, I'm sorry, Sandra. Oh, you might have told me about it when I asked you. But then it wouldn't have been a real surprise. 
I did want to surprise Daddy, so... But you have, darling. This is a beautiful pipe. No. The surprise is spoiled. Your birthday isn't until tomorrow. Well, this is much better, darling. It means I'll be able to smoke this pipe tonight. <laughs> oh, now, please stop trying. You go upstairs and wash your face and hands, huh? Uh, all right, Daddy. I'm sorry, Stephen. But I had no idea what she'd done with the money. And she did lie when I asked her about it. Well, if you'd only have a little more faith in her, Helen. I know it's difficult to understand her at times, but that's because as a child she looks at things differently. I'm sorry, Stephen. If you think I've failed with her. Oh, but you haven't, Helen. I'm sure that in time she'll come to love you as much as she loves me. I don't know, Stephen. I often wonder about that. As the weeks went by, Helen found herself coming no closer to winning Sandra's confidence. It wasn't that Sandra was unfriendly, but there was an air of reserve about her, which vanished only in her father's presence. Helen felt Stephen watching her anxiously when Sandra was about and sought to reassure him. Her one thought was to preserve their happiness. Hello, Helen. Hello, dear. Well, what happened to that vase, dear? Sandra broke it. Oh? Well, accidents will happen. Stephen, this is the fourth piece she's broken in two weeks. And each of them were pieces I've treasured and had for years. Well, Helen, you sound as though Sandra deliberately broken those vases because they were yours. Well, why is it that only my things are broken? Oh, Helen, surely you don't believe she's deliberately breaking your things. I don't know what to believe. The first few times I thought it was an accident, but now... Oh, Helen. Oh, please, Stephen, let's not quarrel. Perhaps I'm wrong. I admit I haven't any proof. It's, it's just all the little things adding up. Helen, what are you talking about? Oh, you wouldn't understand even if I told you. Where's Sandra? In her room, I suppose. Well, I'll go up and see what she's doing. Huh? All right. Sandra, it's Daddy. Are you in your room? It's huh. funny. She isn't here. Hello, what's this? A note addressed to me. Dear Daddy, I'm sorry about the broken vase. Tried my best to be a good girl, but everything I do seems wrong. I make Mother very unhappy, so I'm running away. I love you very much and always will. Your daughter, Sandra. After searching vainly for an hour in the dark and cold, Stephen returned and notified the police. All through the long hours of the night, he and Helen sat up, not saying a word, each afraid to speak. The fear of what might be said. As the first rays of dawn showed, the doorbell rang. Stephen rushed to answer. Mr. Hammond? Sandra. Oh, Daddy, Daddy. <laughs> darling, darling, everything's all right now. I'm the police patron from the 55th Street Station, Mr. Hamilton. One of the officers on the force just found her. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing her home. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Hamilton. This is our job. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> there, 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 dear. Don't cry. Oh, Daddy, it was so dark out there. And I thought I'd never see you again. Well, what a thing to say. How do you feel, Sandra? <laughs> you want me to take her, Stephen, and put her to bed? No, well, I'll do it, Helen. All right, Stephen. Just as you say. Is she all right, Stephen? Uh -huh. She just fell asleep. Yeah, I hope her being out all night won't have any after effects. Stephen, you feel I'm to blame for her running away, don't you? Of course not, Helen. It's just that... Well, you, you don't seem to understand her. But, Stephen, I've tried so hard. Oh, it's no use. She doesn't want me here, never has. Helen, how can you talk like that? Why, she was delighted the day I brought you here as my wife. Yes, I thought she was in the beginning. But now I know she was just pretending. Pretending? Yes, Stephen. From the first moment she saw me, she resented me. She feels I've come between you, taken her place in your affection. Oh, Helen, how can you say such it's a thing? It's true, I tell you. She sees me as a rival for your love. You're just imagining all that. I'm not, I tell you. 
Oh, it's no use, Steve. We can't go on this way. What do you mean? Don't you see? We aren't happy anymore. Instead of things improving, they get worse. Perhaps it would be best if we were to separate. Helen, Helen, I won't hear of it. I love you, darling. I wouldn't want to live without you. Whatever misunderstandings we may have about Sandra, I'm, I'm sure we can straighten them out. I don't know, Steve. If you love me, Helen, you won't give up so easily. Please, say you won't leave. All right, Steve. I won't leave. Perhaps we will be able to work this out. I hope so. Sandra? Sandra? You awake, darling? Yes, Daddy. Sandra, Mother and I were very upset when you ran away last night. Mother seems to think you ran away because you you couldn't get along with her. She felt so badly about it, she wanted to go away. She did? Yes. But I told her how much we both loved and needed her. So she's promised to stay. Oh. I see. Sandra, you will try to be a good girl and do as Mother wants, won't you? It would make Daddy very happy. Oh, Daddy, I'd do anything to make you happy, anything. That's a good girl, darling. Now, you get up and get dressed, huh? I'll wait for you downstairs. All right, Daddy. He just doesn't understand. He should have let her go, but she's still here. And she's going to stay. I won't have it. I won't have it. I hate her. I hate her. A week passed. A week in which Sandra's behavior pleased Helen no end. At last it seemed they were going to be the happy family she had always dreamed they would be. Helen! Yes, dear? Will you bring my coat with you when you come downstairs? Sandra and I are going for a walk. All right, Stephen. I'll get it and be right down. Daddy, can we walk down to the river? Oh, we won't have enough time for that, Sandra. Stephen? Hmm? I have your coat, but I can't find your scarf. Oh, the scarf's down here, Helen. Just bring the coat. Oh, all right. Helen, Helen, are you all right? Helen, speak to me. Daddy, is is she dead? No, Sandra, don't talk like that. Quick, phone Dr. Smith at once. I arrived at the Hamilton home to find Helen suffering from shock, but otherwise unhurt. I was somewhat disturbed, however, to find her very nervous and run down. She'll be all right, won't she, Doctor? Yes, of course. I'm going to leave you a prescription, Mrs. Hamilton. It's something that will help quiet your nerves. You ought to take it twice a day. Ah, here's the prescription, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Doctor. I'll have it filled at once. Well, Sandra, how are you? You've been so quiet, I hardly knew you were here. I'm fine, thank you. You're you're growing up to be quite a young lady. Are you still troubled by nightmares? Yes, she still has them once in a while. No, it's just her nerves. Uh, If she continues to have them, you might give her some of the medicine I've prescribed for your wife. Well, I must be leaving. Goodbye, Mrs. Hamilton, and uh, stay in bed a few days. I will, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Well, darling, you gave us quite a scare. Yes, I I slipped on something on the top step. Hmm. You must have slipped on the marble, dear. I found seven or eight of them on the top step. Uh, marble? Sandra, were they your marbles? No, Mother. They belong to Margie. She must have left them on the stairs when we were playing here. Oh, I see. It wasn't my fault. Truly it wasn't. Of course it wasn't, Sandra. Our mother knows you wouldn't leave marbles lying around where she could slip on them. Isn't that so, Ellen? Yes, hey, Stephen. I'm sure Sandra wouldn't want anything to happen to me. Sandra, will you come into Mother's room a moment, please? Yes, Mother. The medicine that Dr. Smith prescribed for me is in the bathroom. Will you get it for me, please? All right, Mother. You'll find it in the medicine chest. It's in a blue bottle. Yes, I know what it looks like. Oh, here it is. That's fine, Sandra. Just bring it to me. 
Here you are, Mother. Thank you, dear. Oh, Sandra, this isn't the medicine that Dr. Smith prescribed for me. Didn't you read the label? This bottle has poison in it. Poison? Well, yes. It's right here in red letters on the label. Oh, I'm sorry, but this bottle is blue, too. It looks just like the one with your medicine. Yes, it does at that. Now, I'll put this bottle of poison back and get me my medicine. Yes, Mother. I'll have to get rid of that poison. It's too dangerous to keep in the medicine chest. Would have been awful if you took the poison, wouldn't it, Mother? Or you might have died. <laughs> Wake up, wake up. You're having a nightmare. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Well, of course I won't, Sandra. Stephen, she's so frightened. Yes, these nightmares leave her nervous for hours. <laughs> Darling, there's nothing to cry about now. Oh, Daddy. I was so frightened. Stephen, come here a moment, will you please? All right, Ellen. Oh, Daddy, don't leave me. No, no. Sandra, I'm not going to leave you. I'm just going to see what Mother wants. <laughs> What is it, Helen? Stephen, hmm? Dr. Smith said that if she had a nightmare, some of the medicine he prescribed for me would help her. Well, Sandra doesn't like taking medicine. But this medicine's very easy to take, and it'll have her asleep in no time. Well, if you think it's best. Yes, I'm sure it is. Now, you go back to Sandra while I get the medicine and a glass. All right, Helen. <laughs> no, Sandra. You must stop your crying. Daddy's here. Don't go away, Daddy. I want you to stay with me. Of course I'll stay with you. What were you dreaming about, dear? I, I don't know. It was all so mixed up. Oh, Daddy, will you always love me more than anybody else in the world? Of course. Now, stop your crying. All right, Stephen, I have it. Now, if you just have Sandra sit up. Come on, darling. Sit up now. That's it. What's Mother doing? She's pouring you some medicine. It'll help you sleep, darling. Medicine? Yes. It's the same medicine Mother takes for her own nerves. No! No, I don't want it! Now, please, Sandra. It'll make you feel much better. No, don't come near me. I don't want but it. Sandra, Mother takes it twice a day. There's nothing to it. No, I won't take it. I won't! Perhaps you'd better let it go, Helen. Nonsense, Stephen. She'll have us up all night if she doesn't take it. All right. Now, Sandra, stop being a baby and take this medicine. No, Daddy, don't let her make me take it. Don't let her! Sandra... Are you going to let me give you this quietly, or do I have to make you take it? No, no, it'll kill me. I know it will. Yeah, let me hold your head. That's it. No. Now, Sandra, stop clenching your teeth. Open your mouth. Do you hear? Daddy, don't let her. There, you've taken it. All this fuss over nothing. Helen, she's talking. Daddy, Daddy, it burns. Sandra, what's wrong? It's burning me, Daddy. Tell him, quick. Call Dr. Smith. Tell him it's an emergency. Stephen, here's Dr. Smith. Let me see her. She's been unconscious for ten minutes now. Doctor, you must do something. I'm afraid it's too late, Mr. Hamilton. She's dead. Oh, no. No, she can't be. I'm sorry. How can she be? We only gave her the medicine you prescribed for Helen. Yes, here it is. Let me see it. But this medicine wouldn't kill her. It's only a nerve tonic. You can see... Doctor, what is it? Why, this is the bottle, all right. But the medicine in it isn't the medicine I prescribed. But it is. I took some of it last night. I assure you, this isn't the medicine I prescribed. Then what is in that bottle? It smells like carbolic acid. Carbolic acid? But that's impossible. Look at the label. You can see it's my medicine. Yes, the label's right, but someone poured out the medicine I prescribed and replaced it with carbolic acid. Oh, no. But why? Why should anyone want to do such a thing? Who could possibly want to kill Sandra? Everyone loved her. Ask Helen. She'll tell you that Sandra... Stephen, why are you looking at me like that? Surely you don't believe I poisoned her. Stephen, no... No! This is the mysterious traveler again.
Have you enjoyed our little trip? Uh, by the way, do you have a child in your home? If so, I do trust it isn't angry with you. You can't be too careful with children. Why, I recall another child who, after being punished by his parents, took a razor and... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. Perhaps you'll join me again soon. I take this same train every week at the same time. You've just heard Chapter 13 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The Good Die Young, Betty Jane Tyler played Sandra. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled Design for Death. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday at 7 over most of these stations. This is Mutual. driving along a narrow road through the woods. At a point where a second road, even narrower, crosses the first, the car stops. Here you are, young fella. This is the professor's place. Uh, is it? All I can see is woods. Uh, it's up that road, about 50 yards. Look sharp and you can see the light shining between them two trees. Huh? Oh, yes, I see it now. Then I guess I get out here. Uh... Would you hand me my bag, Sheriff Ramsey? All right. Here you are. Thanks. And that's a dollar I owe you, right? Yep. Thank you. You know the professor, do you? Yes. I was Professor Clark's laboratory assistant back in college ten years ago. Oh. Why? I was thinking maybe... Maybe you could drop a hint to him. A hint? What kind of a hint? Well, that there's been some talk in town of running him and that man of his, that Barton, fell out of the county. Running Professor Clark? Oh, you're not serious. Yep. Of course, it's just talk. So far. But, but what has anybody got against Professor Clark? There isn't a milder man in the world. Well, maybe so, but folks has got wind of what happened at the state penitentiary over in Hillvale last year. Sure, if you're talking in riddles. What did happen? The professor went over there when they hanged Richard. That hauled up killer. Uh-huh. And the warden give the professor the murderer's brain. That's what happened. Well, what of it? Professor Clark is a great authority on nerve and brain tissues. Maybe he wanted it for research purposes. Yeah, I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just telling you how folks are talking. They think he's keeping that brain in a big glass jar and making it grow. Oh, that's perfectly ridiculous. Well, they don't think so. They got the notion that brain is big as a bull calf by now. And they're afraid someday it'll escape. <laughs> sure, for a minute I was taking you seriously. A brain as big as a calf? Oh, I'm not saying I ever believed it, but it'd be a good idea if the professor'd give folks a notion of what he's really doing in that laboratory of his with that Barton fella to help him. Then maybe the talk would die down. I understand. All right, Sheriff, I'll mention it to him. Well, then I'll be getting on. Good night, young fella. Good night, Sheriff. Right up that road, about 50 yards. You can't miss it. A few moments later, Dr. Richard Dale was knocking on the door of an old stone house almost hidden among the trees. A frail, white-haired old man answered the door. An old man who could hardly speak in his joy as he gripped Richard Dale's hand. 
He led the way down a long hall to a great room where strange equipment took up almost every inch of space. Retorts and electric furnaces, generators, batteries, and great glass vats. Dr. Dale stared around him in intense curiosity as Professor Clark helped him off with his hat and coat. There. Now, sit down, Dick, my boy. Sit down and let me get a good look at you. Ah, so, you got my letter? Oh, yes, yes, of course you did, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, thanks, Professor. Yes, I got your letter. And it made me so curious I took the first train. You promised me a surprise. Well, is this it, this amazing laboratory? <laughs> no, no, my boy. I'll come to that in a moment after you've met Barton, my assistant. Barton? I, I don't seem to know the name. Should I? No, he's not famous yet. But he will be. And he's been with me only a few months. But I couldn't get along without him. He certainly sounds interesting. Yeah, you'll like him, I'm sure you will. Oh, uh, Barton! Yes, Professor? And Dr. Dale has arrived. I want you to meet him. Why, of course. How do you do, Dr. Dale? We both of us been looking forward to your visit. Uh, how do you do? Yes, the professor's letter made me so curious I couldn't stay away. I'm still wondering what the great surprise is he promised me. Uh, you'll see, Dick, in just a minute. My curiosity's at fever pitch. Well, it's time to satisfy it. Uh, Barton, is Alpha making some coffee? Yes, he started it when we heard the car. Alpha? Who is he? Our general man of all work. Truly amazing fellow. <laughs> ah, here he comes now. Shall Alpha serve coffee? Good heavens. I said you'd be surprised, Dick. He's not human. He's a machine. A robot. Yes, my boy. An artificial man made from metal and synthetic brain tissue. A machine man? Walking and talking. He's not very pretty, but then the professor was mostly interested in making sure he'd work. He must weigh a ton. No, only about 300 pounds. You see, Alpha's mostly aluminum and other light alloys. Inside his aluminum plates are some new batteries I devised, together with miles of fine silver wire and a dozen electric motors. And to give you only the highlights... It's a good thing you did keep this for a surprise. If you had mentioned it in your letter, I, I don't think I would have believed you. Shall Alpha serve coffee now? Yes, Alpha. Put it on this table here and pour a cup for Dr. Dale. Alpha, do so. Still can't make myself believe it. Alpha poured the coffee. Go on, Dick. Take it. Huh? Oh, 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 yes, of course. Uh, Al, thank you. Alpha, this is Dr. Dale, our guest. Any orders he gives are to be obeyed. Alpha understands. He looks clumsy, but, but he poured the coffee as well as a man could. Yes, my boy. Alpha has capabilities you'd never suspect to look at him. Here, here I'll show you. Alpha. Alpha hears. The fireplace needs more wood. Put on that big log there. Alpha, do it. Alpha has log. Now, break it in half. Alpha, break it. Six feet log. He's breaking it with his hands. need you anymore tonight, Alpha. You can go back to your room now. Alpha is going. Be sure to switch off your batteries. They're going to need recharging tomorrow. Alpha understands. That's the most incredible thing I ever saw. You see, Dick, I try to treat Alpha as if he were really a man. So I give him a room of his own. Like any machine, he's completely inactive when his batteries have been switched off. But his brain continues to function. 
It's an artificial protoplasm that I spent eight years creating. It's the only thing that makes him different from any other machine. But it means Alpha can think. Think like a man. A machine that can walk and talk and think. Ah, but Alpha's not the only surprise I have for you, Dick. He's not? No, I have another one. Even more astonishing. Uh, But you'll have to wait until morning to learn about that. Because now it's time we were both in bed. I suppose you're right. It's after one. I know you must be tired. I'm getting old. So I'm going up to bed now, Dick. Uh, Barton will show you to your room. Of course, Professor. I'll see you in the morning, then. Yes. We'll have a long talk tomorrow. Good night. Good night, Professor Clark. Oh, uh, Dr. Dale. Uh, Yes, Barton? Could we talk for a minute before I show you to your room? Oh, yes, of course. It occurs to me the professor forgot to tell you why he asked you here. Oh, yes, that's true. And I've been so interested I forgot to ask. It was his hope that you'd stay indefinitely and help us carry forward the work we've been doing here. Stay indefinitely? Well, I have my own work and Don't say no yet. Now, just think, Dr. Dale. Alpha is stronger and more rugged than a man. He needs no rest, no food. Yet he can do the work of three men. He can plow, reap, run machinery. Think how much drudgery a million like him could lift from mankind's shoulders. Yes, 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 that's true. And already Alpha is technically obsolete. Professor Clark has the blueprints for a new machine man. As superior to Alpha as as an airplane is to a bicycle. We want you to help us build them. Well, I'm certainly tempted. Perhaps I could arrange Ah, excellent. And uh, now there's only one more thing I want to tell you. Yes? What is it? It's about Alpha. You must help me persuade the professor to... to dismantle him. Dismantle him? Yes. Why? He has become dangerous. Uh, I I don't understand. Because he was the first successful machine man that the professor built. He is imperfect in many ways. He's not completely reliable. I'm afraid that someday he may escape from the house and so do some damage that would seriously upset our plans. Yes, yes, that could easily happen. The local inhabitants are unfriendly enough as it is. I know. Sheriff Ramsey was warning me about that tonight. All right, I'll speak to Professor Clark about it tomorrow. Ah, good. Then I'll show you to your room now, if you wish. (laughs) Yes. I am sleepy if you'll just come this way. His mind in a whirl of amazement, Dr. Dale retired and finally fell into an uneasy sleep. How long he had slept, he did not know. And abruptly he woke with a scream ringing in his ears. The cry came from downstairs. Dr. Dale leaped from his bed and raced down to the lower floor. Help! Help me! Ah! In the lower hall, he found Barton hammering on the heavy door of the laboratory. Professor Clark! Professor Clark! What's wrong? What? What's up? It's the professor. I heard him call for help. Huh. Yes, so did I. It woke me the up. The door's locked. He must be in there, but there's no sound in there now. Well, we've got to break the door down. Yes. Put your shoulder beside mine. Right. You ready? Ready. And shut. Professor Clark, where are you? Professor Clark, he's not here. Yes. Here he is, lying on the floor beside the window. He's been murdered. It was Alpha. It must have been. No one else could have done it. But where is Alpha? The window. It's open. He went out that day. We've got to go after him. I'm afraid it's hopeless. At night in these woods, we couldn't possibly find him. No, no, you're right. It'll be morning soon. Then I think he'll come back. He knows that he can only go a few more hours before his batteries must be recharged. Then we can capture him and destroy him. But, Barton, why did he kill the man who created him? The professor must have come down to the laboratory for some reason. Occasionally, when he couldn't sleep, he would do that. He may have decided to make some more tests of Alpha. Yes, but that doesn't explain why... During the test, something must have occurred. When Alpha returns, we can find out. Poor Professor Clark. Well, we'll have to notify the police. There's only the sheriff... In any case, I think we should wait till morning and then report the professor's death as, uh, as an accident. An accident? Yes. If the authorities learn the truth, our research may be stopped. And when Professor Clark has achieved so much, can we let it go for nothing? No, no, of course not. Dr. Dale, we must carry on his work for him. Yes, that's what he would want. Then you will help me continue it. 
You'll stay? Yes. Yes, I'll stay. Greatly upset by the tragedy, Dr. Dale returned to bed and at last fell into an uneasy sleep, haunted by dreams of Alpha, the metal monster Professor Clark had created. When he awoke, the sun was shining, and he could hear Barton moving about downstairs. He dressed and went down to find Barton getting breakfast ready. Oh, good morning, Dr. Dale. Good morning, Barton. Any sign of Alpha? Not yet. Well, we ought to start a search point. But first, I think you ought to eat breakfast. Everything's ready. Oh, all right. Some coffee anyway. Yes. Yeah. Sit here. Thank you. I didn't know you were a cook as well as a lab assistant, Barton. I've uh, learned to do a lot of things since I came here. Uh, aren't you going to eat, too? I, I'm not hungry. I seldom am. But I thought that while you ate, I might outline some of the problems facing us. That's a good idea. You see, though Alpha's brain is of synthetic protoplasm, it is not completely artificial. I, I was wondering about that. Sheriff Ramsey mentioned that the professor secured a human brain from... From an executed killer, yes. The professor found that to give life to his artificial brain tissue, it was necessary to add a small amount of tissue from a real brain. I see. The real tissue gave life to the rest. Of course. Yes, but in this instance, it may have tainted Alpha's brain with the murderous impulse of a killer. Yes, that sounds plausible. So our first problem will be to obtain untainted brain tissues to blend with the artificial tissues we will make according to the professor's formula. That should give us no trouble. I can get what we need through the research laboratories where I'm connected. Ah, then that solves our worst problem. The rest will be matters of detail. Fortunately, there's enough equipment here to build a dozen or so robots. Like Alpha, you mean? No. The far more advanced type Professor Clark was perfecting. And now, if you finished... I have something to show you. Yes, I'm through. I don't feel much like eating after last night. Then come with me to the laboratory, and I'll show you the second surprise that Professor Clark had in store for you. Ah, here we are. Now, what I'm going to show you is in this box. Uh, another robot? Yes. A second mechanical man the professor built a few months ago. This one, though, was a failure. You mean it wouldn't work? It worked too well. I don't follow. It was too intelligent. Professor Clark called it Beta. And Beta's brain power was greater than that of any human scientist who ever lived. But Beta was insane. Good Lord. He represented, however, a tremendous technical advance. Look. It looks exactly like a human being. Yes. Professor Clark used me for a model when he built Beta. It's an excellent likeness. Uh, touch the face, Doctor. Oh, all right. It feels smooth and rubbery with a hard surface underneath. The surface is a new plastic Professor Clark developed with which he could imitate exactly the appearance of human skin. Underneath is an aluminum body on which the plastic was baked. I see. Beta's hair, eyes, and teeth are all artificial, too. But he walked and talked and acted so much like a human being that no man alive could have guessed his secret. No, he would have fooled me completely. And you say he was insane? From, from the human viewpoint, yes. He considered himself superior to the human race. With his enormous brain power, he intended to make himself ruler of the world. You're joking. Not in the least. That is why Professor Clark destroyed him just in time. He had made plans to take over this laboratory and construct dozens of mechanical men like himself. And then, with their help, he was going to enslave all mankind. Boy, if that could happen once, it might happen again. I don't believe we should continue Professor Clark's work after all. Oh, there's no danger now, Doctor. You see... Beta also had a brain which contained tissues taken from that of the condemned murderer, but we will select the brain tissues from the highest types that are available. Yes, but even so, then, you... Doctor, we will produce mechanical men, tireless, indestructible, who will be mankind's willing servants, who will solve for man problems he can't solve for himself. I wonder. In any case, we must proceed with the utmost caution. Of course. Doctor, listen. Someone's coming to the house. It's Alpha. He's come back. Alpha. We may need a weapon, Barton. No. I can control him. Alpha. Alpha, come here. Now, 
Alpha comes. Alpha, you killed Professor Clark. Why did you do it? Professor said he would destroy Alpha. And you killed him because of that? Alpha does not want to be destroyed. But, but you're just a machine. What difference does it make to you? Alpha is machine that lives. Alpha is stronger than you. Alpha is better than you. Alpha, be quiet. We must destroy Alpha at once. You are right, Doctor. Do you hear, Alpha? You are to be punished. Alpha here. But first, we want to know where you've been. Did anyone see you? Men saw Alpha. Men saw you? What do you mean? Two men driving automobiles saw him. And what did they do? They tried to hit Alpha with automobile. And then what happened? Alpha stopped automobile. Alpha killed one man. Killed him? Other man ran off in woods. Alpha could not find him. Alpha came back. We can't keep this a secret. No matter what happens, we must notify the authorities at once. No, wait. Let me think. We can't... The bell. There's someone at the door. I'll see who it is. You stay here. But what about Alpha? I'll switch off his batteries, then he can't move. There. Now I'll see who's at the door. Dr. Dale waited while Barton went to the door. He heard the door open and recognized the excited voice of Sheriff Ramsey speaking. Then a moment later, Barton came back into the laboratory, followed by the sheriff, who held a revolver in his hand. But, Sheriff, if you'd only let me explain... Never mind that. You're coming with me, both of you. Dr. Dale, perhaps you can reason with the sheriff. He insists that we're under arrest. Yes, and I'm taking you to the lockup. The professor, too. Where is he? Professor Clark is dead, Sheriff. Dead? He was killed last night when an experiment he was engaged in went wrong. An experiment, huh? I suppose it was an experiment that crushed the life out of him. It crushed the life out of Jed Thompson an hour ago down the road and scared Fred Jennings so bad all he can do is jabber about monsters. It's true. The things that killed both the professor and Thompson is an experiment. It's standing there behind you. Behind? <gasps> a machine. A man made out of machinery. Well, don't be alarmed, Sheriff. It's perfectly harmless now. It is a machine man which Professor Clark built. Unfortunately, it got out of control. I don't believe it. I don't blame you, Sheriff, but that's the truth. I think I can convince you. What are you doing? Stand still. I'm simply going to switch Alpha on. There. Now he can move and speak as well as you and me. That thing talk? You're lying. You're up to something. Alpha, will you tell the Sheriff that it was you who killed Mr. Thompson? Alpha (sighs) killed him. He tried to hit Alpha with car. So that's what the professor was up to all this time. Building that thing. Now, Sheriff, surely you realize that we are not murderers. Maybe not, but you come to jail just the same. You're partly responsible anyhow. But, Sheriff... We... Anyway, it's for your own protection. There's a mob on its way out here from town. They're going to burn this place down. What? i got to put you in jail for your own safety. They're ready to lynch you right now. Burn the place down? That's what I said. So turn that machine thing off and come along. We ain't got much time. No. All this equipment, machinery, the professor's notes, they must not be destroyed. We must stop them. Yes, Sheriff. The lost to science. Never mind science. You've got your own skins to worry about. That mob means business. Let's get started. I'm afraid we can't do that, Sheriff. You can't. i got a six shooter here that says different. We have no choice, Barton. Oh, yes, we have. Alpha, take the gun away from this man. What are you doing? Stop him. Stop him, or I... Stop him. Too late, Dr. Dale. He's dead. Alpha crushed him. Yes, Dr. Dale. Now, you're a murderer. In a good cause. The life of one man or of a dozen men cannot stand in my way. You don't expect me to keep silent about this, do you? I think you will. Alpha. Alpha. He doesn't answer. His batteries have gone dead. That last burst of energy must have drained them dry. But it makes no difference. I think it does. A big difference. There, see this? It's Sheriff Ramsey's revolver with three bullets still in it. 
Now put your hands up. I must explain something to you, Doctor. You can talk, but if you move, I'll shoot. I only want to say that nothing is going to interfere with my plan to build more of the improved form of robots that Professor Clark perfected before his death. Robots who look and act so much like men, no one can detect them. They'll never be built. I intend to destroy all of Professor Clark's notes. They will be built by me. I shall build ten, a hundred, a thousand. Then I shall lead them with their superior intelligence to the mastery of the world. You're mad. Of course I should have guessed. No, Doctor, that's not the answer. I shall tell you the truth. And then you must die. Stand still or I'll shoot. You remember last night when the professor said he had another surprise for you? An even greater surprise than Alpha? Yes. That surprise, Doctor, was Beta, the second robot. So perfect it looked like a man but so intelligent that human beings were as children in comparison. But Beta was destroyed. No, Dr. Beta was not destroyed. But you must be destroyed. Stand back. Stand back, I say. All right, then I'll shoot. And now, Doctor, your bullets are gone. You, you aren't even hurt. Bullets cannot harm me. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Beta, the second robot... Was not destroyed. But I saw him. What you saw was only an initial attempt that failed. The real beta still exists. You see, Dr. Dale, I am beta. You? Yes. I, too, am a mechanical man. And now, you must die. No. No, stay away from me. Stay away! <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. What happened to Dr. Dale? Why, he's still alive, but of course under observation in a hospital. In fact, it was he who told me the story. You see, the mob that was coming to burn down the house arrived just in time to save him. But Barton, or Beta as he called himself, escaped. He could hardly have survived all those bullets if he had been human, could he? I wonder if the story is true. Do you suppose that somewhere a strange individual who is really a robot is making other mechanical men preparing to carry out Barton's plan to rule the world? Oh, you haven't time to talk about it now. You're getting off here. Well, I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this same time. You've just heard Chapter 19 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's story... Beware of Tomorrow, Will Hare played Dr. Dale, and Don Randolph played Barton. Also featured were Maurice Tarplin and Philip Clark. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled The Accusing Corpse. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented over WOR Mutual every Sunday at 7 over most of these stations. This is Mutual. Mysterious Traveler. This 
is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join him on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. Where are we going? We're going to journey to the grave and learn the secrets of the dead in a tale titled The Accusing Corpse. Some years ago, when I was a county coroner, I was called in on a most interesting case. A case which had begun in the country home of Philip Drake, the wealthy stockbroker. Roger, thank goodness you were able to get here in time. I left town right after I received your call. What's wrong, Philip? You sounded so upset over the phone. It's Vivian. She's upstairs in her room packing. She says she's leaving me. Leaving you? Why? She seems to feel our marriage has been a mistake. Roger, won't you speak to her? Persuade her to stay. After all, she is your sister. I'm afraid, Philip, that Vivian and I have never been as close as sister and brother should be. She's always been wild and spoiled. Perhaps, Philip, it would be better if... If you were to let her go. No, I couldn't do that. I love her, Roger. I wouldn't want to live without her. Won't you please try to persuade her to stay? All right, Philip. I'll do my best. But I must warn you, I haven't much influence well, over her. Philip, I'm all packed and ready to... Why, Roger, darling, what a surprise. What are you doing here? Vivian, Philip has told me. Now, surely you can't be serious... You know how he loves you, everything he's done to make you happy. Now, Roger, you aren't going to start on that, are you? Someday, Vivian, you'll get just what you deserve for walking over people, breaking their hearts. Every time I think of you being my sister, I feel Roger, like I... please. Would you mind waiting in the other room? I'd like to speak to Vivian alone. Oh, all right, Philip. Call me when you want me. <sighs> really, Philip, no matter what you have to say, you're just wasting your time. Oh, Vivian, how can you do this to me? You know I love you, but I'd do anything to make you happy. That's sweet of you, dear. Would you mind lending me your car to get to town? If you leave me, Vivian, you won't get a cent. Not a cent, do you hear? Really? Did you ever stop to think, Philip, that there might be another man huh? with more money than you? Another man? Oh, no, that couldn't be. And why not? But we've only been married three months. There, there couldn't be anyone in that time. Oh, but there was. Oh, Vivian, in spite of what you've done... I'm willing to forgive you and start over with you. <laughs> but, darling, I don't want you to forgive me. I want you to forget me. Vivian, you can't do this to me. I love you. I won't let you go. I really must be saying goodbye now. He's waiting for me in town, and I don't want to be late. If I can't have you, no one else will, do you hear? Oh, really, Philip, you're being ridiculous. I must go. No. You. Philip, what are you doing? A gun. Yes, Vivian, a gun. I told you if I couldn't have you, no one else would. Oh, Philip, you're insane. Put that gun down. If you don't change your mind about leaving, I'll kill you. Even with that gun, you can't keep me, do you hear? I'd sooner die than go on living with you. I'm going. And you're not going to stop. Oh, you... You shot... Vivian. Philip. Philip, Philip, what happened? I, I thought I heard... Vivian. Roger. Is she... Dead? Yes. Philip, do you, do you know what this may mean? Life imprisonment, perhaps. E even the electric chair. I know. Nothing seems to matter now. But, but you simply can't throw your life away like that, Philip. Oh, even if Vivian was my sister, I don't mind telling you that I always felt you were far too good for her. She didn't deserve to be your wife. Oh, please, Roger. Now, look, Philip. If, if we were to get rid of the body... Who could possibly know that she didn't leave here tonight as she'd planned? Oh, no, it wouldn't work, Roger. You can't get away with murder. That's nonsense, Philip. Now, now, if we were to bury her in the woods, no one would ever find the body. Bury her in the woods? I couldn't do that. Well, then I'll do it. You can wait here till I return. But, Roger, what if, Philip, you must let me handle this? You, you'd better give me the gun. All right, Roger. You are. Good. Now, now you wait here while I get rid of the body. Philip watched, spellbound, unable to say a word, as Roger picked up the body and left the room. 
As Roger, carrying his burden past the gardener's shed, he picked up a shovel. In a few moments, he reached the woods which began at the rear of the house and extended for miles. He carefully made his way through the forest underbrush until he was well out of sight of the house. Then he stopped and looked about. Uh, I... I think this is quite fine, huh? I think you can put me down now, Roger. I'm tired of being carried like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, let me congratulate you on your performance as a corpse. <laughs> Do you think he suspects anything? <laughs> of course he doesn't. He's positive that he shot and killed you. You've got the gun, haven't you? Well, certainly I've got it. You don't think I was going to let him discover that the bullets had been removed and blank cartridges substituted, do you? Oh, no. Not you, Roger. You always know what you're doing. I always try to, my dear sister. You don't think Philip will give you any trouble, do you? Outside of being in love with me, he isn't an utter fool. <laughs> don't worry, I can handle Philip. Now, uh, here's the key to the apartment I rented in town. You'll find my car a quarter of a mile down the road. All right. I'll be waiting for you at the apartment. I'll be there in a few hours. Hmm, now, now, let me see. Yes. Yes, this seems like a nice place to dig. The next morning, Roger called on Philip at his office. With a calculating glance, he noted that Philip's eyes were bloodshot, that his hand trembled as the two shook hands. How are you, Philip? I couldn't sleep at all last night. I kept thinking of Vivian... And what if her disappearance is noticed? People begin asking questions. Now, all you have to do is tell them that Vivian left you and, and you don't know where she is. Or things like that happen every day. You've been very helpful to me, Roger. If ever I get a chance to repay you for it, rest assured, I will. That's very good of you, Philip. Uh, truth of the matter is, you, uh, you could do me a favor if you would. Of course. What is it? Well, I'm in the midst of a business deal and... I find myself a little short of capital. If you could lend me some money, I'd appreciate it. Oh, certainly, Roger. How much do you need? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand? That's quite a lot. Naturally, Philip, if you feel you can't lend it to me, I'll go to a bank and try to borrow oh, it. It isn't that I can't lend it to you, Roger. It's just that the amount surprised me. Uh, shall I make the check out to you? Uh, y yes, if you please. All right. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, Philip. As Philip wrote out a check for $20,000, Roger smiled. Things were working out just as he had planned. An hour later, Roger entered an old brownstone house and went to apartment 2C. Roger, did you get it? <laughs> what does this look like? Oh, Roger, that's wonderful. Now we can clear out and... Why, there isn't a hundred thousand here. <laughs> no, my dear. I only got twenty thousand from him. But we were after a hundred thousand. Why didn't you get it all this morning when you saw him? My dear Vivian, it simply isn't done that way. Uh, blackmail is an art. An art that calls for the use of psychology. Philip will give us many times over the money I hold in my hand. All in due time, of course. You mean I'll have to go on hiding in this miserable apartment until you finish your little game with him? Never being able to leave it for fear someone will recognize it. Come, him. come now, Vivian. You've got the radio and books I and won't other... spend weeks in this apartment, I tell you. I won't... My arm! You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. Exactly. Do you understand? Roger, my arm. You're hurting it's me. It's nothing to what I'll do if you disobey me. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes. A week passed. A week in which Roger... Patiently bided his time. For time, he knew, was working on his side against Philip. Then one morning he called on Philip at his office. Good morning, Philip. How are you? How do you expect me to be? This past week I've been able to think of nothing but Vivian and what happened that night. Philip, you must stop brooding over it. Whatever happened was her fault, not yours. Yes, you're right. Perhaps what I need is a vacation. Yes, yes, of course. A trip would do you a world of good. And if I could afford it, I'd go along with you. You mean you haven't any money? I'm, I'm afraid not, Philip. That's what I've come to see you about. I must have $40,000 at once. 40000 Yes, I, I know it's a good deal of money, Philip, but 
Without it, I'll be ruined. Well, naturally, I want to help you, Roger, but 40000 If I don't get the 40000 Philip, it may mean prison for me. Now, you wouldn't want to see that happen, would you? Well, of course not, Roger, well, but... After all, Philip, I, I saved you from prison. In fact, I made myself an accomplice to Vivian's murder by not turning you over to the police. Well, yes, I know, now, but... You, you could hardly expect me to remain loyal to you if you weren't willing to help me, could you? I see. It seems I haven't any choice. Very well, Roger. I'll write you out a check. Roger's eyes gleamed in amusement as he accepted the check from Philip. There was no longer any doubt that Philip understood him perfectly. Things were working out exactly as he had planned. Later that day, Roger went back to the old brownstone house. There was a smile on his lips as he entered apartment 2C. <laughs> Look at this. $40,000 in cash. Oh, Roger. Now, wasn't this worth staying and hiding for, Vivian? And there's plenty more where this came from. Who could that be? You better get behind that screen. No. All right, Roger. Uh, yes? C.L.D. for Miss Brown. It amounts to $64. Oh, uh, you must be mistaken. There's no Miss Brown here. This is the address she gave. It's in care of Mr. Roger Martinson. Is that your name? Why, why yes, but I don't know uh, any... Those packages are for me, Roger. Uh, how much did you say the C.O.D. was? $64, Miss. Oh. Here you are. Thank you, Miss. Here's your receipt. Goodbye. Goodbye. When did you buy those clothes? This morning. You mean you went out shopping in spite of what I told you? Well, I was sick of being cooped up in this apartment day and night. I had to do something for a change. And what of my plans? You risk everything with so much at stake. Roger, stop looking at me like that. I tell you, I couldn't stand being cooped up in this apartment any longer. But I give you orders to stay here. Well, I won't. I want you to get the rest of the money at once so we can clear out. And if you don't, I'll go shopping whenever I feel like it. You can't make me stay here. <gasps> You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. I won't allow anything or anyone to interfere with my plans. I've worked out every step perfectly, and there isn't going to be any slip-up. Another week passed, a week in which Roger made no effort to see Philip. Then early one evening, he got into his car and drove out of the city to Philip's home in the country. Oh, it's you, Roger. Come in. Good evening, Philip. Oh, uh, where are the servants? This is their night off. Oh. Uh, you're, uh, you're not looking well at all, Philip. You, you shouldn't remain in this house by yourself. What difference does it make where I am? Wherever I go, the memory of that night follows. It's hard to believe that it was only two weeks ago tonight that I killed her. Two weeks ago tonight? Well, so it was. Oh, well. Oh, by the way, Philip, do you think you might possibly lend me $60,000? 60000 You can't be serious. Oh, but I am. But I lent you that much already. Yes, I know, but I must have more. No. I won't give you another cent. You blackmailed me enough. Blackmail is a harsh word, Philip. What else can you call it? Now, you're just as hard and grasping as Vivian was. Yes, but you must remember I'm alive and she isn't. I suppose you're glad she's dead. In life, she was worth nothing to you. In death, you're able to get $60,000 for her. In death? How do I know she is dead? But don't be foolish, Philip. You saw her lying on the floor in this very room. Yes, but how do I know she's dead? It was you who examined her and told me so. And you buried the body by yourself. Well, I, I just wanted to spare you, Philip. Just exactly where did you bury Vivian? As a matter of fact, how do I know the whole affair isn't staged for my special benefit? So that you can extort money from me. Oh, surely you don't believe that, Philip. Why, you shot her with your own gun. Yes. And you took the gun away from me immediately after the shooting. Suddenly that whole affair is becoming very clear to I me. I tell you, she's dead, Philip, and buried out in the woods. Then I want to see the grave and the body you say is in it. But this is ridiculous. I, I won't go searching for a grave in the middle of the night. You shouldn't have to search for it, Roger. Not if you really dug one. Come along, we can pick up a shovel at the tool shed. I won't do it, I won't do it. I, I said come along, Roger. Oh, very well. 
But I'm not certain I'll be able to find the grave. After all, the woods is fairly large, and it's been two weeks since I buried her. That's all right, Roger. We'll stay out there until you do find her. A few minutes later, Philip and Roger picked up the shovel at the tool shed and then continued on their way to the woods that began at the rear of the house. Neither of the men spoke as they entered the woods, Roger leading the way with a flashlight. Several times he stopped, trying to get his bearings, then plunged on again, hoping to find a a familiar landmark. It became apparent that Roger was growing less and less sure of himself. Oh, the grave is someplace around here. I'm certain of it. Perhaps we ought to come back in the daytime. It it might be easier to find it then. I know, Roger. You shouldn't have any trouble finding it now, if it exists. It does exist, I tell you. It's it's just that the woods are so confusing at night. Everything looks so so different. Just keep on searching, Roger. Well, perhaps this is the spot. It it looks something like it. Well, is it or isn't it? I, I, I don't know. It looks like the place where I buried her, and yet... Yet I'm, I, I'm not certain. There's only one way to make certain, and that's to start digging. Here, here's the shovel. But suppose this isn't the spot. Then we'll dig somewhere else. In fact, we'll dig up the entire woods if necessary. After all, you're certain she is buried in the woods, aren't you? Go ahead, Roger. Start digging. Oh, oh very well. Roger, you've been digging for 20 minutes now, and you haven't uncovered a body. Philip, I told you I wasn't sure this was the spot where I buried her. You're a great actor, Roger. But I'm afraid this time you've overplayed your role. Uh, What do you mean? Vivian isn't dead. And there's no use your pretending she is. Everything that's happened was part of a scheme the two of you planned to extort money from me. I tell you she is dead. Then where's the body? I thought this was the spot, but I must be mistaken. I'm sure I didn't bury her any deeper than this, but if I... Philip, turn the flashlight this way. What is it? Look. Do you see what I've uncovered? (gasps) A hand? Yes. This is the spot where I buried her, Philip. Just a few more shovelfuls and I'll have her uncovered. Oh. Oh, it can't be. There. Ah, There you are, Philip. Of course, she's been in the ground for two weeks, but... I think you can easily recognize that it's Vivian. Yes, it's Vivian. And look, Philip, here's the bullet hole under her heart. The bullet hole that you made. I don't want to see any more. I've had enough. You should trust me a little more, Philip. Everything I did was for your own good. After all, you you don't want to go to the electric chair, do you? I don't care what happens anymore. I can't stand having her death on my conscience any longer. I'm going to call the police. Don't be a fool, Philip. You know it might well mean the electric chair. I'll take my chances. Anything's better than going on living the way I have these past two weeks. I'm going back to the house and call the police. Philip, Philip, come back. Come back. Philip! Operator. Operator. Philip, Philip, wait. Wait, don't do anything foolish. No, you cut me off. Take your hands off that phone, Roger. What I want you to do, Philip, is to listen to me for a few minutes. At the end of that time, you may, you may do as you please. Now, that's fair enough, isn't it? Nothing you can say will make me change my mind about calling the now, police. listen to me first. Then if you still want to call the police, you can. Now, please put the receiver down, Philip. Yeah, that's it. Well, what do you want to tell me? Well, uh, do you mind if I mix myself a drink first? It's... It's been a rather difficult evening. Very well. Oh, well, what about one for you, Philip? You look as though you could stand a drink. No, thank you. Oh, nonsense. Do you good. What is it you want to say to me, Roger? Huh? Oh, oh yes, say to you. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, here's your drink, Philip. Thank you. Well, now, uh, what shall we drink to? Uh, we'll drink to your good luck, come what may. Ah, there. I feel a good deal better. All right. Now that we've had our drinks, what have you got to say? Oh, yes, yes, I, uh... What I wanted to say was I... 
I never let anything interfere with my plans, Philip. What do you mean by that? Simply that I can't allow you to go to the police, and therefore you shan't. It would spoil my plans. Oh, it would, would it? Well, I'd like to see you stop me. I have, Philip. In a very little while, in fact, in just a few seconds, you'll be dead. Dead? What are you saying? Yes, Philip. The drink I mixed for you was poisoned. Poison? Aren't you finding that it's becoming uh, difficult to breathe? Oh, no, you couldn't have. I... My throat it burns. Yes, I know, Philip, but it'll all be over in a matter of seconds. No, I, I see it all. You, you might... Yes, Philip, just a week ago tonight, she uh, died according to plan. I'm... Call the police. Joe. I'm afraid, Philip, that you haven't the strength left to reach the telephone. I will. Uh-huh. I'm afraid you and Vivian never had a chance, Philip. I had things worked out perfectly, down to the smallest detail. Hello, operator. Uh, operator... Please connect me with the police. It was at this point that I was called into the case. Inspector Carlton called me an hour after Roger Martinson had phoned the police. When I arrived at the Drake mansion, I examined the body of Vivian Drake and that of her husband, Philip. When I had finished my examination, I entered the library where Inspector Carlton was questioning Roger Martinson. Hello, Doc. Oh, Doc, this is Roger Martinson. Mr. Martinson, this is Dr. Smith, the county coroner. How do you do? Hello. I'll be with you in a few minutes, Doc. Just stick around. Now, Mr. Martinson, you were telling me how you came to this house two weeks ago tonight to see your sister and found that she was gone. Uh, Yes. Yes, my brother-in-law, Philip, told me that she'd gone on a vacation... No, I, I thought it strange at the time that she should have gone away without saying goodbye to me, as we were always very close. But days passed, and, and I didn't hear from her. Tell me, was it like your sister to go away and not write? No, no, it wasn't, and, and, and that's what worried me so. These past two weeks, Philip kept putting me off when I inquired about Vivian's whereabouts. Well, tonight I, tonight I, I couldn't stand it any longer, and I came to this house to have it out with him. What did your brother-in-law say when he saw you? Well, he was quite agitated at my unexpected arrival. When I couldn't get any satisfaction out of him regarding Vivian, I I threatened to go to the police. Then he broke down and confessed that he murdered Vivian. When did he murder her? He told me that he'd done it two weeks ago tonight. Why, that was the very night I'd come here to see Vivian, and he told me that she'd left for a vacation. Mm, I see. Go on. Naturally, when he told me he'd murdered her, I, I was aghast. He led me to the woods and showed me the grave. We returned to the house, and before I knew what had happened... Philip had taken poison. Then I called the police. Well, it seems like a plain case of murder and suicide. Outside of a few questions at the inquest, I don't think we'll trouble you anymore, Mr. Martinson. Oh, that's quite all right, Inspector. I shall be at your service any time. Just a moment, Mr. Martinson. Uh, Yes? I was very much interested in hearing what you had to say to the inspector regarding the murder of your sister. You say that your brother-in-law confessed to murdering her two weeks ago tonight? Uh, That's right. That would be um, April 2nd, wouldn't it? Um, Yes, that's correct. Then you never saw her alive after the night of April 2nd? Why, oh, I know, of course not. What are you getting at, Doc? Please, Inspector. Mr. Martinson, would you mind telling me where you live? I, at uh, 425 West 107th Street. Tell me, were some clothes delivered to that address in your care a week ago today, April 9th? Clothes? Yes. To be exact, a woman's sports suit, which cost $64 and arrived COD. Why, why no? You're lying, Mr. Martinson. I have in my hand a slip of paper that not only proves that you're lying, but that will send you to the electric chair. Doc, what are you saying? Yes, Inspector. Mr. Martinson's plan was perfect, but he... he slipped up badly. He forgot to search Vivian Drake's clothing before he buried her. When I examined her body just now... I found in one of her pockets this receipted bill bearing the date April 9th. That proves beyond a doubt that she wasn't murdered by her husband on April 2nd. 
as Mr. Martinson here no. claims. No, no. Yes, Mr. Martinson, the corpse has accused you from the grave of murder and has given us proof of your guilt. No, no, it can't be. I had everything planned perfectly, perfectly, do you hear? Down to the last detail. I couldn't have failed. I couldn't have failed. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip to the grave? Poor Roger. What a pity. After all that planning and hard work, to be tripped up by a sail slip found on a corpse just goes to prove that you have to be more careful when you're burying people you've murdered. Now, I recall another case where a woman drugged her husband and... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. I hope you'll join me again soon. But if you do, please remember this. Next Sunday, I shall take a train that leaves at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. Don't forget, Sunday afternoon at half past three... You've just heard Chapter 20 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The Accusing Corpse, Don Randolph played Roger. Also featured were Maurice Tarplin and Philip Clark. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled Escape by Death. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday over most of these stations. But beginning next week, the mysterious traveler will be presented at a new time, Sunday afternoons at 3.30. Please note the change in time. 3.30 every Sunday afternoon, beginning next Sunday. This is Mutual. A Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you'll enjoy this little trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. But where are we going? We're going to delve into the life of a frightened man. In a tale titled, The Queen of the Cats. Some years ago, when I was practicing medicine, I was called upon by a young girl of 22 or so. As she was shown into my office, I could see that she was having a, a difficult time suppressing her agitation. Her lips trembled as she spoke. Dr. Smith. My name is Jane Elliott. I have an appointment with you. Yes, Miss Elliott. Uh, won't you be seated, please? Thank you. Now, what seems to be the trouble, Miss Elliott? You're trembling. You don't look well at all. I'm not ill, Doctor. It's Chris. Chris Arnold, my fiancé. Oh, Doctor, you've got to help him. If you don't, something terrible will happen. Well, I'll do everything I can, Miss Elliott. Now, tell me what's wrong. I... Well, I don't know what's wrong. All I know is that... Chris is frightened. He's in deadly fear of something. Has he told you uh, what it is that frightens him? No. No, I've questioned him countless times, but he refuses to tell me. I see. Where is your fiancé now? At his home, Brookfield Manor. Oh, 
Doctor, I, I, I know it's late, but won't you come with me and see Chris? He needs help desperately. There, there, Miss Elliot. You mustn't cry. Of course I'll come with you. And I'll do what I can. Who is it? Chris, it's Jane. Just a minute. Jane, I, I've asked you before not to... Who? Who's he? Darling, this is Dr. Smith. Doctor, this is my fiancé, Chris Arnold. How do you do, Mr. Arnold? Why the devil did you bring him? I don't need a doctor. Please, darling, I, I just couldn't Forgive stand me, to Mr. see Forgive me, Mr. Arnold, but it's obvious to the most untrained eye you do need a doctor. Please, Chris, tell the doctor what you're afraid of. I'm not afraid of anything. Oh, darling, please tell him, please. You can't go on this way. Yes, yes, you're right. I can't go on this way. If I don't tell someone, I'll go mad. Believe me, Mr. Arnold, you'll feel much better once you've talked your fears out. Now, um, suppose you start from the beginning and tell me everything. All right, Doctor. Come on in. I, I suppose it all began two years ago at a party Jane and I were invited to. That's a wonderful party. The only thing wonderful about it is you. <laughs> oh, Chris, don't. People are watching. Oh, a fine thing when a man can't kiss his best girl in public. What's this generation coming to, anyway? At Miss Tyndall's school, we were taught a young lady never kisses a man in public. <laughs> Miss Tyndall is setting romance back 50 years. Who are you looking for, anyway? Rana Farouk. My roommate is at Miss Tyndall's. Oh, oh, yeah, she's... She's the Egyptian girl you were telling me about. Yes, I want you to meet her. Only you better not fall in love with her as every other man does. Mm. Sounds as though she's a second Cleopatra. Men just can't seem to be able to resist her. Mm. Well, I'm curious to see this siren of the Nile. Oh, there she is, Chris. Come on. So that's Rana. No wonder men can't resist her. Hello, Jane. I've missed you. Rana, this is Chris Arnold. Chris, this is Rana Farouk. Hello, Chris. Hello, Rana. Oh, look, there's Miss Tyndall waving to me. Excuse me, won't you? Of course, Jane. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> you know, Chris, at Miss Tyndall's, the first thing I'd see in the morning when I got up, and the last thing before I went to bed was your picture. And I always knew that someday we should meet. And now we have. Why are you staring at me like that? Aren't you going to say anything? I prefer just to look. Even now, Doctor, two years after our first meeting, I find it difficult to describe how beautiful Rana was. She had lustrous black hair that came down to her shoulders and sparkling green eyes that bewitched you. No words can do her beauty justice. I was captivated the moment I saw her. I see. What happened after that first meeting? Rana seemed also attracted to me. And after that night, we saw each other constantly. You did? Nothing seemed to matter to me when I was with her. And it made me indescribably happy to learn she felt the same way. A month after we'd met, we were married. Mm. Please go on, Mr. Arnold. After we were married, we took an apartment in town. In the months that followed, I began to see Rana not as the image I'd been infatuated with, but as she really was, vain, selfish, and possessive. It was a possessiveness verging on madness. She couldn't bear to have me out of her sight. And when I was upon my return, there would be questions, countless questions. I began to dread seeing her. And then... Then there were the cats. The cats? Yes. She had an insane passion for them. Yes, when Rana and I were at school together, Doctor, she always had a few cats around. She said that she couldn't live without them. The apartment them. was always full of cats. She'd sit for hours stroking them, whispering to them until I felt I'd go mad. Life became a nightmare for me, a nightmare full of cats. And Rana asking questions, endless questions. One day, I realized I couldn't go on living with her any longer. That our marriage had been a mistake. 
I decided to tell her about it that very evening. May I come in, Rana? Of course, dear. Rana, there's, there's something important I want to talk to you about. Oh, please, Chris. There's so little time just now. We can talk later after the party. But, Rana, this is important. I think that... Darling, whatever you have to say can wait. Now, please hurry. But, but... Well, well, all right. We'll discuss what I have to say later. Chris, when I called you at the office this afternoon, why didn't you tell me that you had had lunch with Mary Walker? What? How did you know I had lunch with her? Oh, a friend told me. A friend? Who was it? What is it, my beauty? What are you trying to say? Rana, put that cat down and answer me. Who was the friend that told you I had lunch with Mary Walker? You have never met her, darling. How is it that you always know what I've been doing, whom I've been seeing? It's as though you have people spying on me. Chris, what a thing to say. Now, please hurry or we'll be late. There's something strange about the way you always know what I've been doing. Sometimes I suspect... Chris, look out. You've stepped on Sabina's tail. I'm sorry, but I didn't see it. I'd ask you before to be more careful. Poor Sabina. Are you all right now, my beauty? If there weren't so many cats underfoot, I wouldn't have stepped on her. Why must you have five cats around? Because I love cats. They're beautiful, sacred. Thousands of years ago, my ancestors worshipped cats. And the great cat god is Sekonit. On the river Nile, close by the ancient city of Hamadi, where I was born, are the graves of a hundred thousand sacred cats. They have been mummified and buried with reverence. Uh, Rana, I can't go on like this anymore. My darling, what do you mean? I feel our marriage was a mistake. I want a divorce. Chris, you can't be serious. But I am. I love you, Chris, and I won't give you up. You're mine, darling. You always will be. Nothing shall ever separate us. Would you care for a cocktail, sir? Uh, no, no, thank you. Well, even if you won't have one, Mr. Arnold, I will. Jane, Jane, <laughs> it's good to see you again. Just let me look at you. Chris, you're... you're not looking well at all. Are you all right? I am now. But Jane, Jane, can't we go someplace and talk? What about the terrace? All right, Chris. Here, this door opens onto it. There, yeah, this is much better. It's been quite some time since we've seen each other, hasn't it? Yes, the last time we saw each other was the night that... The night that I met Rana. Yes. How is Rana, Chris? Oh, she's... she's fine. We... Jane, I've made such a mess out of everything. I was a fool to have married her. Please, Chris, you mustn't talk like that. But I was a fool, Jane. Mistaking infatuation for love. Can you ever forgive me for the way I behaved toward you? There's, there's nothing to forgive, Chris. Well, Jane, this is a surprise. Rana. Hello, Rana. Really, Jane, the way you've avoided calling on us, I half suspect you are still in love with Chris. Rana, you had no right to talk to her like that. Uh, please, Chris, I, I'm i afraid I'll have to be leaving. It's getting quite late. Good night. Good night, Jane. I hope I didn't interrupt anything by coming out here so unexpectedly, Chris. Yes, Rana, you did. I was about to tell Jane that I love her and that I always will. I suppose that's why you ask me for a divorce. You've been secretly seeing her. Secretly seeing her? Is it possible for me to see anyone or do anything secretly without your knowing about it? No, you are quite right. It is not possible. I know everything you do. So I would forget Jane if I were you. Uh, Rana, how can you possibly want me? Knowing how I feel about Jane. You've got to give me a divorce. I'll never give you a divorce. Never. Do you hear? You're mine. You always will be. Yes, well, what's to prevent me from leaving you? Wherever you go, Chris, I'll follow. If I can't have you, no one else ever will. Remember, Chris, you're mine. You always will be. I can still see her, Doctor. As she stood there screaming at me. Remember, Chris, you're mine and you always will be. It was a, a shock to suddenly realize that she looked like a cat, an angry cat. Her green eyes, cold and murderous, 
Her long nails digging into my arms. Her body tense. For a moment, I... I thought she was going to scratch my eyes out. Yes, Rana did look like that when she was in a rage. Hmm. What happened after that night, Mr. Arnold? I stopped speaking to Rana. We lived in the same apartment, but that was all. Weeks passed, and Rana waited for me to come around as she felt certain I would. Yes. She had all the patience of a cat playing with a mouse. But when a month had passed and I still refused to talk to her, she made an attempt to win me back. It happened one night as we were driving to this house. Why are you slowing down, Rana? I want to talk to you, Chris, and I can't talk to you while I'm driving. There's no point in your stopping. We have nothing to say to each other. Oh, but we do, darling. Chris. We could be so happy together, if you wanted to. You know how much I love you. It's a possessive love that smothers me to death. Chris, you know that isn't true. I could make you happy if you'd only let me. Oh, please don't turn away from me, Chris. I'll do anything to make you happy. Anything. Anything? And you can give me a divorce. So you're still thinking of her, hoping I'll give you a divorce so you can marry her. Well, I won't. Do you hear? I won't. I think we'd better be moving along. Chris, you haven't any right to treat me like this. I'm your wife. Only in the eyes of the law, not in my eyes. I hate you. I hate you! You can't! You almost took out my eyes with those claws of yours. I will scratch your eyes out before I let any other woman have you. You're mine. You always will be. Perhaps this will bring you to your senses. (laughs) Slide over. I'll drive. Very well, Chris. You think you've beaten me, Chris. But you haven't. In the end, you'll come crawling to me. It may take a year, two years, five years. But I can wait. I'll never come crawling to you. Never. But you will, Chris. Jane knows I'll never give you your freedom. In time, she'll marry. And when she does, all the heart will be gone out of you. Then you'll be mine. That'll never happen. But it will, Chris. And deep down in your heart, you know I'm right. Jane will never be yours. I'll see to that. You have everything planned perfectly, Rana, don't you? But I have one way of escape from you that you've never thought of. Really? And what way is that? I can escape through death. Death? Yes, Rana. If I should fail to take the curve a hundred yards ahead, we'd plunge off the side of this mountain. Chris, you would. Why not, Rana? You've shown me there's nothing to live for. This at least is a clean way out. No! Chris, don't! No! When I drove the car over the side of the mountain, Doctor, I thought Rana and I were going to our deaths. But fate decreed otherwise. When I recovered consciousness 48 hours later in a hospital, I learned it was only Rana who died. Yes, I recall reading about it in the papers. It was a miracle that you survived. Yes. For weeks, they despaired of saving me. But at the end of eight months, I walked out of that hospital. The police believed my story that it was an accident. And I was free to begin a new life. It was just a week after I was discharged from the hospital that I ran into Jane... Chris! Oh, Chris, it's you. Danny, you always seem to pop up just when I need you most. Chris, you... you look so much older. Are you all right? My heart isn't any too good, but otherwise I'm fine. And seeing you again is just what I need to put me on my feet. These past months must have been so difficult for you. Uh, I don't want to look back to the past, Jane. But only to the future. The future I once hoped we'd share. And still do. Two months ago, Doctor, Jane and I became engaged. It was just about that time that I first began to notice that everywhere I went, there always seemed to be a cat following me. Are you sure you weren't imagining it, Mr. Arnold? At first, I thought it was my imagination. But a week after Jane and I became engaged, I was certain I was being followed. 
Uh, tell me, Mr. Arnold, was it always the same cat that followed you? No, no, no. One day it'd be one cat, and another, another day a different one. Oh, I, I know you must think I'm mad, Doctor. And at the time I felt I was going mad. That is, until that night. What night, Mr. Arnold? The night I saw her. It happened in this very room six weeks ago. I, I, I had great difficulty in falling asleep that night. Suddenly, the silence was broken by the faint crying of a cat. The crying grew louder and louder. I lay in the darkness listening, realizing that the cat crying was real, living, and in my room. I could feel my heart pounding as I sat up in bed and looked about my darkened room. And then suddenly I saw her, two burning green eyes in the darkness. There was no mistaking those eyes. They were runners. I stared into those eyes for what seemed like hours. Then, as though listening to a stranger's voice, I heard myself speak. Rana! It is you, Rana, isn't it? Yes. I'd recognize those green eyes anywhere. So you've come back, and in a form I've always thought of you, as a cat. I know why you've come back. It's because of Jane. You always said that if you couldn't have me, no one else could. But I was yours, and always would be. Meow. Well, you're wrong, do you hear? Jane and I are going to be married. Meow. Meow. You came between us once, but you aren't going to this time. I will marry you, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Meow. Ah, you fiend, Meow. trying to scratch my eyes out. Meow. Well, we'll see about that. Uh, there. Perhaps that'll show you that nothing you can do will stop me from marrying her. I know that all those cats that were following me, spying on me, were doing so under your orders. You, you're the queen of the cats! Ah, yes, I should have known. No wonder you always knew where I'd been, who I'd seen. You had your cats spying on me even then. Well, even if you are the queen of the cats, you can't prevent me from marrying Jane. That's a bullet between those green eyes of yours is what's needed. <laughs> Emptied the gun at her, Doctor. And then turned on the lights. There was no sign of her. She'd vanished. All that I found were those six bullet holes in the wall. Tell me, Mr. Arnold, isn't it possible that you only dreamed all that? That actually you fired the gun in your sleep and the shots themselves wakened you? I tried to tell myself that, Doctor. But during the nights that followed, I, I knew it was not a dream. For night after night, she appeared in my room... I'd lie awake, waiting to hear her footsteps, her voice. And when she would appear, I'd plead with her to leave me alone. But she'd only stare at me with those burning green eyes, waiting, waiting. I knew she'd never leave me alone as long as I intended to marry Jane. Finally, I could stand it no longer, and I went to see Jane. Chris, this is a surprise. Come in, darling. Thank you, Jane. Oh, well, where have you been keeping yourself this past week? I was beginning to believe I was being jilted. Jane, there's something I want to ask you. Yes, Chris, of course. What is it? I know we set our wedding for next week. But couldn't we put it off for a while? J just a little while. Darling, what is it? There's something wrong. I, I know there is. Please tell me. I wish I could, but I can't. Oh, please, Jane, just have faith in me. You know, I, I wouldn't postpone our marriage if I could possibly help it. All right, Chris, I... I do have faith in you. We'll consider our marriage postponed for the time being. The night I put off my marriage to Jane, Doctor, was the first night that Rana didn't appear. And the first night in a week that I'd been able to sleep. You think, Mr. Arnold, that she didn't appear again because you would postpone your marriage to Jane? I know it. Weeks went by, weeks in which I was able to sleep soundly without being awakened by her. And I came to think that perhaps it had all been part of a horrible nightmare and that I was over it at last. A week ago, I asked Jane to set the date for our wedding. She did so. And that same day, we took out a marriage license. But that night, she appeared again. Her eyes shining in the dark, cold and murderous. 
She knew about the license. That's why she returned. And you've seen her again? Yes, yes, every night. She just keeps staring at me with those green eyes, waiting, waiting. She's determined not to give me any rest. I tell myself that I, I mustn't be afraid, but I, I, I keep hearing her voice over and over. If I can't have you, no one else will. You're mine and you always will be. Oh, Chris, darling, I wish I had known all this before. Do you feel, Mr. Arnold, that somehow she'll prevent you from marrying Jane? Huh? I, I know I sound mad, but I do. I have a feeling something horrible will happen if I attempt to marry her. Do you still have the marriage license? Yes. Why do you ask? Mr. Arnold, you've reached a crisis in your life. You're faced with fears that are threatening to overwhelm your sanity. The only way for you to challenge your fears is to go through with your marriage to Jane now. Tonight. Tonight? Yes. It's quite late, but I'm sure a friend of mine who's a judge will marry you. Uh, get married t tonight? If you hesitate, you're lost. Your only chance is to face your fears. All right, Doctor. All right. Jane, will you marry me tonight? Oh, yes, Chris. Yes. Sorry to get you up in the middle of the night, Judge, but for reasons I can't explain, it's important that these two be married tonight. That's quite all right, Doc. Always glad to oblige a friend. Have you got the license and the ring, young man? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Here's the license and the ring. Now, young man, if you'll take her right hand. That's it. Now, shall I give you the long ceremony or the short one? The short one, please. Just as you say, young lady. This is the shortest one I've got. Do you, Jane Elliott, take this man to be your lawful wedded husband, to love, honor, and obey as long as ye both shall live? I do. Do you, Christopher Arnold, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife, to love, honor, and cherish as long as ye both shall live? <laughs> it's she. It's Rana. Chris, please, it's only a black cat. You mustn't pay any attention to it. Of course not. Now, it's, it's Rana, I tell you. Look at her eyes. I told you she was trying to prevent my marrying Jane. Well, I'll get rid of her once and for all. Chris, what are you doing with that gun? Put it down. <laughs> ah, she got away. Well, whatever she's gone, I'll find her and kill her. Chris! Chris, come back! Oh, Doctor, where can he be? Now, Jane, he can't be far off. We'll find him. Listen. Doctor, that must be Chris firing that gun. Get on. Those shots came from close by. Hurry! Hurry! We, we better take it easy now, Doc. It's pretty dark out here. Wait a moment now. Light my cigarette lighter. Doc! Look, a dead cat! Yes. We shot through the head. Say, so look. Here's another one that's been shot to death. Neither one of them is the, the black cat. Say, Doc, isn't that a body over there? Chris! No, Jane, you stay with the judge while I look. All right, Doctor. There, there, miss. You, you mustn't cry. This never would have happened if, if I hadn't agreed to bury him. He was afraid, so afraid. Doc, is it Arnold? Yes. Yes, it's he. He's... Dead, isn't he? I can see it in your face. Yes, Jen. He's dead. But, Doc, what happened to him? He's been clawed to bits, as if by hundreds of cats. <gasps> and most horrible of all, his eyes have been scratched out. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip into the life, or should I say, death of a frightened man? Strangely enough, two days later, at Chris Arnold's funeral, 
Just as the coffin was being lowered into the grave, the mourners suddenly noticed a black cat with green eyes sitting on the edge of the grave, quietly licking its paws. Uh, by the way, I, I trust you haven't a cat in your home, uh, particularly a black one. I, uh, I once knew a woman, uh, she's dead now, who had a... Uh, you're getting off at the next stop, huh? And I'm sorry. <laughs> Perhaps you'll join me again soon. I take this same train every week at the same time. You have just heard Chapter 31 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's story, Queen of the Cats, Stotts Cotsworth played Chris, Sarah Burton played Rana, and Sandra Gould played Jane. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. And original music was played by Doc Whipple. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Listen next week to a tale titled Broadway, Here I Come. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. It is presented over most of these stations every Sunday afternoon at half past three. This is Mutual. Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Why, we're going to follow the adventures of a man who thought he could commit murder and escape punishment. I call the story, Death Laughs Last. It was while I was practicing medicine in an eastern city that Edward Harrison brought his wife Mary to me for an examination. I could see at a glance that she was dangerously ill. When I had finished my examination, however, I tried to conceal her true condition from her till I had a chance to speak privately to her husband. It, it isn't anything serious, is it, Dr. Smith? Oh, please tell me that it isn't. Well, I'm afraid it's too soon to say, Mrs. Harrison. Until the X-ray plates are ready, I can't say yes or no. Oh, but... Now uh... your husband is waiting outside. He's probably beginning to worry, so... Uh... Oh, yes, of course. Here's your wife, Mr. Harrison. You must have thought I'd kidnapped her. No, but I was getting a little worried, Doctor. I, uh, I hope you didn't find anything very wrong. Well, I took several X-rays, but uh, I won't be able to tell much until they're developed. Uh... I'd like your wife to come back uh, day after tomorrow, if she can. Of course, Doctor. What time would be the best? Well, any time that's convenient to you. Now, I'll write out a prescription your husband can have filled. Will you uh, step in for a moment, Mr. Harrison? Sure thing. With you in a moment, Mary. Of course, darling. Sit down, won't you, Mr. Harrison? All right. Now, what is it, Doctor? Mr. Harrison, your wife is... Dangerously ill. That's, uh, does that mean she's going to, to die? Her only hope is a brain operation. 
A very difficult and delicate operation. Without it, well, I could only give her six months a year at most. No, no, it mustn't be. She's got to have the operation, you hear? I must tell you, Mr. Harrison, that only one man in this country has the necessary skill for the operation your wife needs. He's Dr. Howard Richards, and naturally he's in great demand. His average fee for an operation is about fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen hundred? Well, of course, if you can't afford that, you might consider the circumstances and No, no, I can afford it. I can afford anything Mary needs. Well then I'll get in touch with him at once. Yeah, sure. You make the arrangements right away and I'll get a hold of the money. I'll get it to you by tomorrow, sure. Help me off with my coat, will you, please? Oh, sure, sure, Mary. Yeah. How are you feeling? Oh, much better since Dr. Smith gave me that medicine in his office. Uh, he's a swell doctor. Mm-hmm. He'll fix you up in no time. Did he... Did he tell you anything more, Edward? Uh, not a thing, except that the treatment might take a little time, that's all. A little time? Oh, dear, I hope it won't be too expensive. Your business hasn't been good, and we've used up all the money in our savings account, and... Oh, don't you fret about money. Don't you worry about anything. All right, darling, I won't. Oh, well, aren't you going to take your coat off? No, I... uh, I've got to get the prescription the doctor gave me filled. You just take it easy till I get back. I might stop in at the shop, too. There's something... uh, something I've got to attend to there. Danvers, I'm Ed Harrison. Oh, yes, Mr. Harrison. Please sit down. <clears throat> I uh, see that you want to borrow $1,500 from us. That's right. Hmm. Unfortunately, the security you offer, your home... Well, what's wrong with it? It's a swell little house, good section, all in good repair. Yes, yes, that's true. But you already have a first and second mortgage on it, totaling $4,000. And, well, I'm, I'm afraid we can't make any further loans. But I've got to have the money. I just got to. I'm sorry to hear that because there's nothing we can do to help you. Nothing we can do. You say you're not employed, Mr. Harrison. No, I own a shop. I'm a locksmith. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that means you're never certain of your income. If you had a job now, a regular income you could depend on... What are you getting at? You mean you're not going to let me have the money? I certainly wish I could, but under the circumstances... Well, I'm sorry, very sorry, but there's nothing I can do. I'm afraid the collateral you suggest isn't satisfactory, Mr. Harrison. We'd lend you the money if we could, but we just can't. Sorry. But I've got to have it. I've just got to. Sorry. It's to save Mary's life. She'll die if I Sorry. don't. And I won't let her die. I won't. Sorry. I, I... Sorry. Look, Sorry. You must... Sorry. Listen. Sorry. You must... Edward, you aren't eating. Oh, and you're so quiet. Dear, is there anything wrong? What? Oh, no, of course not. You're worrying about me, aren't you? Why? No, Mary, I... I was just thinking about making some changes at the shop, but... Darling, you don't have to lie to me. I know I'm not well, but I'm going to get better. Really, I am, I promise. Of course you are. Dr. Smith said so. You're going to be well in no time. Now I've got to go out. I I have an appointment over the other side of the city with Horace Latimer. He wants to see me about something. uh, Something important. Edward had no appointment with Horace Latimer, but went to see Horace anyway. For he and Horace had been boyhood friends, and their paths had separated, and Horace had grown wealthy. But in his desperation, Edward Harrison hoped that Horace would remember the past and would lend him the money he'd been trying to raise all day. Horace could spare it easily, but would he? Fifteen hundred? That's rather a lot of money, Ed. I know it is, Horace, but it's for Mary, for an operation. I've got to have it. Uh, yes. 
Uh, why don't you try the bank? You have a house, a business. I have tried the bank and all the personal loan companies in town. They all turned me down, said the security wasn't good enough. I see. Well, that's too bad. But I don't quite understand why you came to me, Ed. Because we're friends, that's why. Because when we were boys, we agreed that we'd each of us always lend the other a helping hand if we could. Uh, boys don't understand business very well, I'm afraid, Ed. No, I suppose not. They don't understand business. They just understand friendship. You know if I had the money and you needed it, I'd lend it to you in a minute. I don't doubt that at all, Ed. And you can bet I'd lend it to you if I had it. But that's the trouble. I haven't any ready cash. Uh, the income tax, you know, and a couple of shaky investments that I had to bolster up lately. All right, Horace, never mind explaining. I get the idea. You're not going to lend me the money. Oh, really, Ed, I would if I could, but I can't. I, I'm sorry, Save your but sorrow I... for somebody else. I don't need your money, you hear? I'll get it someplace else. Yes, I'll get it. Somehow. <laughs> After he had slammed out of Horace Latimer's expensive home, Edward stood for a moment on the dark street corner, staring back with bitterness in his face. I'm sorry. Yes, you're sorry, and a pig's eye, you're sorry. What a sap I was to think you were a pal of mine. Uh, what's I... that, buddy? Oh, was you talking to me? What? Oh, no, sorry. I, I guess I was thinking out loud. Oh, that's okay. Hey, you got a match? A match? Oh, sure. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Okay, just hold it like that. But, make a move and I'll plug you. Gun? Yeah, Why, this you... is a stick-up hold. Your whole hand over your dough and make it fast, see? My dough? <laughs> That's a hot one. I'm out trying to raise money myself. We're both out of luck. I've only got a dollar on me. Take it if you want it anyway. It's more than I could raise. Don't try to kid me. Stand still while I see what you got in your pockets. A wallet... A leather case of some kind. You'll find just one dollar in that wallet. Yeah. A buck. One measly buck. And I bet you got a roll hidden in this leather case. It's heavy enough. There's nothing in there but my emergency kit. Yeah, well, I'll just see for myself. Say. Oh, this kit is full of skeleton keys and pick locks and stuff. What are you, anyway? Second story worker? I'm a locksmith and a safe repairman, if it's anything to you. Now, how about taking the dollar and letting me go on my way? I'm in a hurry. Ah, not so fast, pal. Not so fast. Now, were you leveling just now when you said you was trying to raise dough? Yeah, I've got to have $1,500 by tomorrow. What's it to you? Ah, you'd be surprised, pal. <laughs> okay, I'm putting the gun away, but you ain't leaving yet. Me and you... We're going to talk business, because I got a plan that'll get us both all the dough we need. Two more beers, waiter. Coming up. Well, is it a deal on my proposition? I... I, I don't know, my... I sure you do. There's nothing to it. You can open locks and safes. I know where there's a house with plenty of dough in it. You and me together, we'll go get it. We'll make a team. But burglary? I ain't never stolen anything in my life. Listen, you said you needed the dough bad, didn't you? So do I, plenty bad. You said you'd do anything to get it, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. And then what are you hanging back for? All you got to do is get the back door opened and the safe. In half an hour, you'll have your 1500 and more. How else are you ever going to get it? Answer me that. I don't know. You, you're sure the money's there, Mike? Positive. I was casing the joint, looked in the window in time to see the old geezer put a whole roll of bills in a safe that's like a bread box. Ah, you could open it with your teeth. All right, I'll do it. I've got to have the money. I'll go on the job with you. easy. But I shouldn't be doing this. There must be some other way to get the money straight. Uh, don't be a sucker all your life. you got to take what you want in this world. If you don't, you'll never get it. Everybody's a crook of some kind. Take it from me. Well... Get on. Get that door open. we got to get inside. 
time before we spotted. All right. Let me take a second, I think. Yes. There. Gun locked. Okay. Get inside. The safe's in the library. Down this way. Don't make any noise. You're sure there's only two of them in the house? Yeah, the old guy and his butler. Probably both of them deaf as posts. Here's the library. Come on. The safe's behind the picture on the wall. This picture? Yeah, that's it. I'll lift it down. There you are. That safe is just a kid's toy. Go ahead and get it open. It won't be that easy. But I'll have it open inside half an hour. Forty minutes on that thing. It's coming now. There. It's open. About time, too. Now, let's see what's in it. Uh, here's the cash box. Will I open it? There. Look. Dough, cash, Mazuma. What'd I tell you? There must be thousands there. Easy. Come on, we'll count it and divvy it up. No, never mind. Just give me 1500 That's all I want. You can keep the rest. Are you kidding? No, that's all I want. Just the 1500 I need. Okay, it's your funeral. Yeah, here you are. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 1500 dollar bills. $1,500? Yeah, for just an hour's work. Easy money, huh? What do you say? We crack a couple more cribs tonight? No, no, I just want to get out of here now and... Get behind this door. I'll take care of it. Jenkins, Jenkins, please help. Uh, what'd you expect me to do, shake his hand? Would you kill him? Yes. I'm an accessory to murder. Then tough and let's get out of here. Or do you want to get caught? No, no, of course not. Right, let's get going. Come on, we can stand still, both of you. I have a gun and I have you covered. The butler. If you move, I'll shoot. I can see you perfectly. He's standing on the stairs. He's got a gun. We caught, we caught. No, not yet, we ain't. Not by an old scarecrow with a rusty horse pistol. Put up your hands. I'm going to call the police. You've done something to the boss. Okay, okay, we'll put up our hands. I can we will. Oh! Shut him. we got to get out of here in a hurry. No shots. <laughs> But why did you make me come here? Well, I can't let go home. You hide me. Come on in. That's better. Now, take off your hat and stay a while. But I can't stay, Mike. My wife, she'll be worrying. Hold to her. You've got other things than your wife to worry about, chum. What do you mean, Mike? I mean the cops. Or have you forgotten you wanted for murder? No, no, I haven't forgotten. I'll never be able to forget. Why did you kill them? Why? Well, it was either kill them or go to jail. Or would you rather have gone to jail, huh? No, no, but I'm all mixed up. How did I get into this anyway? You needed dough. That's how you got into this. And you got it, so now cut out the sob stuff. Well, why won't you let me go home? Why did you make me come here to your room? You're here so you and me can have a little talk. What kind of a talk? Well, chum, that door and that safe open, you and me got a future again. Oh, I won't do it, I won't. Sure you won't. And always send a little note to the cops. They'd get you too. I'd be a long ways off here. You got a sick wife. You can they say. You You don't think you can pull a job and then go on as if nothing had happened. Somebody's always got to be another. I did it only for a minute now and you can't get out. Wait. I... Oh, I have a... Get it off my chest. Oh, no, you do. You see this? Come to fire top. Hey, get away, go. You got me into this. You got me I'll take that gun away from me. I'll plug you out. Oh. Mike. He's dead. I'm going to get away. In the days of horror, he made his way to the street. Thoughts which he could not control round in his head. I mean, they'll hang me. But I had the money. The money to make Mary... Now they'll catch me. They'll hang me. I've got to. Paid for somehow. But if you can't escape, if you're lucky... I need a drink. I've got to have a drink before I go crazy. So when Harrison started the street... and struggling to control his shaking his normal... He ordered a double whiskey and got his senses cleared a little. Uh, he heard the radio at the end of the barn uh, broadcasting a warning to the city. Attention. The police department for the following man that committed in the Buxton Park. Please make a note of the following man 
Say, buddy, what's the radio off for? Because I was D. And I got a knife, I want to hear it. So I'm going to turn it back on again. No, no, you mustn't. I'm going to. Now, if you try a gun right here under the bar, see what that dirty killer looked like. I repeat, be on tight, lean and wiry, with reddish brown hair, Buxton Park earlier this evening. Man reported once to him. Now turn you back to our regular night owl program of popular dance tunes. Uh, oh, lean and wiry with reddish brown hair, huh? Well, that ain't you. You're heavy set and black haired. But for a minute there, you had me going. I was positive you was the killer the way you didn't want me to hear the description. I guess you just jumped me, huh? Well, here. Have another drink. On the house. Thanks, thanks. I need some sleep. Yeah, that's what I need. Some sleep. How close he had come to giving himself away. Edward Harrison hurried. Mike, the police were looking for. Not Edward Harrison. And they had. Edward Harrison was safe. His own good luck. Edward was asleep. Quiet. And troubled by nightmare. Mary was already preparing breakfast. Good morning, darling. Who? I I was pretty rude. I stopped at the shop. I I was pretty did a little work. I forgot to watch the time. Oh, and this morning you look terrible. I know. You're worrying about me. Really, I am. Of course you are. I'm going to see to that. What do you think? Dr. Smith called up last night. He wanted to talk to you. Said he had some good news for you. Good news? Yes, but he wouldn't tell me what it was. I don't know why. He asked for you to stop in at his office this morning. I think I know what it is. Yes, sure, I'll go right over and see him. Oh, but darling, you're going to eat breakfast first, aren't you? I'll eat when I get back. I want to see the doctor first. Anyway, I'm not very hungry. Well, all right, Edward. But please hurry back. I want to know what the doctor says, too. Yes, yeah, sure, Mary. I'll be right back. But everything's okay now, darling. Everything's okay. After he left the house, Edward bought a morning paper. Big headlines told of the murders the night before, but he scarcely saw them. His eyes hurried through the story until he found what he was looking for. The news that Mike's body had been found. The butler Mike had shot had given the police Mike's description and then died before he could tell them there was anyone with Mike. So the police had listed Mike's death as a suicide or an accident and closed the case. Edward Harrison was safe. Perfectly safe. Safe. I'm safe. Mike was wrong. Sometimes you can get away with murder and not have to pay anything if you're lucky. And I've been lucky. I've been lucky. When Edward Harrison entered my office, he sat down beside my desk and tossed a folded newspaper into the wastebasket. His expression was that of a man who had just faced disaster and been rescued at the last moment. Good morning, Doctor. Mary said you'd phoned you had good news. Yes, Mr. Harrison, I called you last night after I got in touch with Dr. Richards. I wanted to tell you that he had agreed to operate on your wife. Oh, that's swell, Doctor. And I've got the money right here in my pocket. The money, yes. Yes, I was also going to tell you that uh, Dr. Richards had said not to worry about it. You could take as long as you wanted to pay it. As long as I wanted? Yeah. Then, then it wasn't necessary. I didn't have to do it. I didn't have to do I, it. I'm I, afraid I don't understand. I, never mind, Doctor. I, I mean, I've got the money. I want to pay it. He's got to take it right away. Well, what's the matter? What are you looking at me like that for? The operation is going to save Mary's life, isn't it? You said it would. You can go back on your word. You can, do you hear? It's not that, Mr. Harrison. Yes, the operation would save your wife's life, but... Unfortunately, Dr. Richards was the only man in this country... Able to perform it. Well, so what? He said he'd do it, didn't he? And I've raised the dough to pay him, so what's the hitch? Mr. Harrison, Dr. Richards can't perform the operation now. But you said... He was tragically murdered last night by a burglar who broke into his home in Buxton Park. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did 
you enjoy our little trip into the life of a man who thought he could make good come out of evil? Poor Edward Harrison. He didn't believe that crime must always be paid for by someone, did he? Uh, what became of him? Well, after his wife died a few months later, he confessed everything to the police. He didn't have anything to live for, poor fellow. But I hope his experience will teach you that crime really doesn't pay. I always say that it... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week. You have just heard Chapter 42 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's story, Death Laughs Last, Philip Clark played Edward Harrison, Carl Emery played Mike, and Elizabeth Morgan played Mary Harrison. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Henry Silvern. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. And now, an important message for all of you. This is Jock McGregor speaking. The National War Fund drive begins tomorrow. As you probably know, this fund includes over 22 of the major war relief and service organizations. As the war progresses on all fronts, more and more people will need help. Our armed forces, American prisoners of war, our allies, and people right here at home. And by giving to the National War Fund, you will be helping. Consider just one of the many organizations that the War Fund supports, the USO. More than 3,000 service units are in operation. Clubs where our service men and women find recreation, dances, educational activities, reading, writing, and game rooms, and religious council. The USO is responsible for the traveler's aid desks, which help servicemen make connections and find sleeping accommodations. It operates the lounges in railroad and bus terminals. USO camp shows bring American entertainment to our troops at camps and stations throughout this country and in all the combat zones. Groups will play the jungle circuit in the South Pacific, the desert circuit in North Africa, the grass skirt circuit in the Hawaiian Islands, and the foxhole circuit in combat zones just behind the front lines. We can't measure in money the good accomplished by the USO, but we can help to continue that good work by giving our money the National War Fund. So when your community war fund or war chest representative calls on you, give and give generously. Listen next time to a tale titled The Man the Insects Hated. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. Beginning Saturday, October 7th, The Mysterious Traveler will be heard at a new time. It will be presented every Saturday evening at half past ten, Eastern Wartime, over most of these same stations. So remember the new time, 10.30 p.m., Saturdays. This is Mutual. Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Why, we're we going to visit a man who could change the soul of a human being from one body into another. In a story I call, They Who Sleep. My story begins late one foggy night in a dingy little room 
in the slum section of a great city. The occupant of the room, a small man, white-haired, his cheeks hollow from hunger, has just admitted a visitor whom he does not know and whom he is trying to send away. An expensively dressed young woman with a heavy veil hiding her face. But, my child, it cannot be me to whom you wish to speak. You have made some mistake. I haven't made any mistake. I've been hunting for you for days. I spent a good deal of money tracing you here. But I do not understand. Why should you wish to find me, Alexander Thomas, a penniless old man You did who... not always use the name Alexander Thomas. Once you called yourself Chadwin the Great, hypnotist beyond compare. Chadwin the Great? Yes. I, I once used that name. But Chadwin the Great no longer exists. I am only Alexander Thomas now. Listen to me, Chadwin. We've met before. Ten years ago, you gave a performance at the Bijou Theater. Oh, there are so many Bijou Theaters. You asked for volunteers to be hypnotized. I came up on the stage. I and my sister Rose. You hypnotized her easily, but you could not hypnotize me. There were so many, I cannot remember. No, but you can remember this newspaper clipping. <laughs> that old story from the newspapers? Where did you get it? It says that you, Chadwin the Great, once performed the experiment of exchanging two men's souls... By the use of secret drugs and your great powers of hypnotism, you transferred one man's soul into another man's body. You cannot believe all the newspapers say. But you did this before witnesses. And one of the two men died. You went to prison for five years for manslaughter. Why do you come here to remind an old man of his tragedies? Go, please, leave me alone. No, Chadwin. For years I've kept this clipping, for years. Never knowing what impulse made me tear it out and save it. Until last week I found it again. And then I knew. You speak not like a woman, but like a soul possessed by devils. Perhaps I am. So you can transfer souls from one body to another? No, no, I cannot. How much would you charge to do it again? Do not ask that of me. I am old. I have been in prison. How much, Chadwin? Could you put my soul into another's body for $10,000? $10,000? Ten yes, then you could live like a man again, not like a starving animal in this hovel. Once before I tampered with the eternal laws, I paid the penalty. And so did one of those I experimented upon. But which one, Chadwin? The which weaker one? one. He died. The other, the strong soul in its new body, lived. Ah, then I am ready. When can you do it? Tomorrow night? But my child, why should you risk your life for that which cannot be, which was not meant to be? Look, Chadwin. I shall raise my veil. Would you call me beautiful? Even pretty? No. I'm ugly. You are not ugly. Your face is strong. But if it were not twisted by bitterness... Enough it... of talking. How can you know what it means to a woman to be ugly? To lose the man you love to a woman you hate. Because you are plain. And she is so beautiful. Chadwin, will you do as I ask? To help you change with one who is beautiful. To help you to be loved for just a little. My child, perhaps it is not such a great wickedness to do that. Then you'll do it? But it is only for a little while. You must understand that. For ten days, no more. Then the laws which cannot be violated with impunity require that your soul must return to your body. It's enough. It's all I want, Chadwin. Very well. I have here a small bottle. Here. Take it. Guard it carefully. When the moment comes, she, the other, must drink it in water. Yes. It will be easy. She will drift off to sleep. Then you, you must come to me. But not here. It would not be safe. Never mind. I know the place. The safest in the world. Very well. The exchange will be made, and I will see that she, in your body, slumbers dreamlessly. After ten days, she will wake and be herself again, with no memory whatever of what has happened. And uh, now, Miss... Vaughan... Helen Vaughan. Now, Miss Vaughan, who is this beautiful one with whom you would change places? The girl who just married the man I love. My sister, Rose Vaughan. Good 
morning, Bessie. Good morning, Miss Helen. Where's Miss Rose? She's gone downstairs yet? Mrs. Tabor, you must learn to say now, Miss Helen. Mrs. Tabor, then? Uh, she's in her room, Miss Helen. Is uh, Mr. Tabor with her? Yes, he is. All right, Bessie, thank you. Helen, is that you? We thought we heard your voice. Come on in. Leonard's just leaving for the office. Good morning, Helen. How's the best sister-in-law I ever had? Hello, Rose. Leonard? Darling, what's the matter? Ah, I know. Did you hear what time this young lady got in last night? It must have been quite a party. Oh, Leonard, I hope you aren't keeping tabs on Helen. No, but I did hear the clock strike three just as her door closed. <laughs> <laughs> well, me for the office. First, a goodbye kiss. Oh, gosh. I sure picked myself a beautiful wife. Oh, run along, you silly. <laughs> Bye, Helen. Got a sisterly kiss for me? Leonard, don't put your arms around me, please. Well, there's sisterly affection for you. You'd think she hated me. Oh, run along, Leonard. They probably need you downtown to polish off a big deal. Yeah, they probably do at that. Okay, I'm on my way. Bye, you two. Bye, darling. Well, Helen, you are in a mood this morning. I just think you two carry this lovey-dovey business to a ridiculous extreme. Helen, it's as if... Well, as if you dislike seeing Leonard kiss me. You don't have to be constantly kissing him in front of... of other people, do you? Helen, oh, my dear, I didn't realize. Didn't realize what? Didn't realize it. Oh, Helen, darling, believe me. Someday the man will come along who'll mean just as much to you as, as Leonard does to me. You'll find him. I'll help you find him. Listen, I'll give some parties and invite a lot of new... Stop it, Rose. Let go of me. Huh? Don't go gushing over me, you idiot. Helen, how can you be so cruel? Oh, stop sniveling like that. I'm sorry, Helen, but you're always so sharp when anybody tries to be nice to you. I... And you... You're always so nice to everybody, so soft, so sweet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Rose. I always forget how the least quarrel upsets you. Well, here. Drink this, Rose. There's a sedative in it. Something quite harmless. It'll soothe your nerves. Oh, all right. Oh, oh nasty stuff. Now lie down in your bed. That's it. Just a few moments now, and you'll be drifting off to slumberland, my beautiful sister. Oh, it is quick, isn't it? You're drowsy already. You do? Huh. And you must give in to the feeling, you hear? Don't fight it. It feels so queer. It's as though I were on a boat. Little Rose. Rose? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Helen, I hear you. You seem such a long ways away. Such a long way. Rose? You're to come to me when I call you. Do you hear? Yes. You're to sleep for a while. Then when I call, no matter where I yes. am, you're to come to me. Yes, I'll come to you. I'll... She's asleep. Chadwin's drug is working. The rain! Come! Well, let it rain. Yes, let the skies open and drench the earth. Let the rain fall like a curtain. Like a cloak to hide the rebirth of Helen Vaughn. Leaving your sister Rose in a slumber so deep it was almost death-like, Helen Vaughn hurried to her room. There she wrote a note addressed to Rose and Leonard, explaining that she had decided suddenly to go off by herself on a trip to Mexico and that they would probably not hear from her for some time. And she put on her hat and coat and slipped out. All day, she waited in a hotel. Then when night came, she picked up Chadwin the Great in a rented car and drove him through the storm into a spot well outside the city. 
and she turned into an ancient cemetery. There she brought the car to a stop before a low building of white marble over which ivy and moss had grown for many years. With a heavy key, she opened the massive padlock and they entered, shutting the door behind them. The air in this old mausoleum is dank odor of a charnel house. But where else could the living lie asleep, peaceful and undisturbed, as safely as here among the sleeping dead? No, I will not go through with you it. You already have your money. You can knock back out now. Then in heaven's name, let us be finished quickly. Quickly, yes. The storm should hide the car from the cemetery guards. But we must take no chances. Now, here's a flashlight I brought. I'll turn it on. Look there, Chadwin. At the tiers of compartments this tiny stone building holds. Each compartment with its iron door. Each holding within it a coffin. In which lies the dust of a vault. I see them, yes. Twelve of them. This one, here on the bottom, is empty. Meant someday to hold the body of Helen Vaughan. Tonight it shall receive her. No, no, this is madness. I'll open it. There. See that narrow, dark compartment? So small, so quiet, so restful, so safe from disturbance. In it for the next ten days shall rest my body. Holding the soul of my sister Rose. No, no, there must be some other way. None that is safe. While my body sleeps and I am absent from it, it must be where no one can find it. And here, no one ever will. I do not like it. Hold the light. I'll slide into it. It's quite roomy enough. The stone is chilly, but what matters that to one who is asleep? Go in. Rose one, hear me. Enter the body that awaits you here. Enter quickly and wait. I must have been dreaming. Rose, Rose, what's happened to you? Why, your voice sounds just like Helen's. Really, Leonard? That's odd. Perhaps I'm catching a cold. No, no. Now you you sound like yourself again. But for a moment, I'd, I'd have sworn it was Helen speaking. Uh, I guess I've been so worried, I'm, I'm just imagining things. Oh, Leonard, hold you close. Close, darling, close. Always, Rose. Always. Always. Yes, always. She'll never have you back. Never. What What are you saying, Rose? I was just thinking of how much I love you. So much that I'll never let anything take you away from me. Never. In the days that followed, Leonard found his beautiful wife, Rose, is strangely changed. You... You've been different somehow these last ten days. In fact, ever since Helen went away so unexpectedly. Have I, Leonard? How? Well, you've been gayer. More headstrong, too. It's almost as if you'd acquired a whole new character. 
Well, perhaps I have. And how do you like this new wife of yours? Well, I do, and I... Don't? Oh, please, I I don't mean it. It's just that... Well, I was so in love with the old roads, it's a little hard to get used to the new. And all these bills that you're running up. Why, that's not like the roads you used to be. Oh, Leonard, I do hope you're not too mad at me, because... Well, what is it this time? Another fur coat? <laughs> Worse than that. We're going to give a party. Another? Why, there's three in ten days. Rose, I forbid it. You can't, man. Because I've invited everybody already. Rose, it's so unlike you. You used... Why, you act more like Helen than like yourself these days. Never mind, darling. You'll get used to the change in me. In time. Ignoring her husband's displeasure, Rose, or should I say, Helen, went ahead with her plans for a party that night. And when early in the evening, a small gray-haired man presented himself at the door and asked for her, he sent word by Bessie that she would not see him. I'm sorry, Mr. Chadwin. Mrs. Tabor says she cannot see you. Um, she says she does not know anyone named Chadwin. But she does. Ten days ago I was here. I gave you an envelope for her. It had a key in it. Oh, surely you remember? Yes, but just the same, she says she doesn't know you. Now, please go, or I'll have to call an officer. Did you tell her what I said? This was the tenth day? Yes, and she said she had no idea what you were talking about. All right, I'm going. I must do what I can by myself. And while the gay party went on, miles away in the old cemetery, Chadwin the Great worked frantically with a hammer and chisel to force the padlock on the door of the mausoleum in which, unknown to the world, a sleeping girl lay hidden. <laughs> Look! Don't get it open. Won't let me into our house. Don't even talk to me. Won't let me warn her. She wa What is that? Dog's coming this way. Hey, somebody trying to break into the barn mausoleum. The guards. I must run for it. The guard, he's getting away. Hey, you great brother. You better somebody. They missed me. Got to get back to town. I must warn her. She's got to know. Miss Vaughan, thank heaven this time you heeded my message. I won't have you coming around to my house this way, do you hear? You must never come here again. But you do not understand. The ten days is up tonight. Now, your time is over. Are you trying to scare me, Chadwin? To get more money from me? Money? No, I'm just trying to tell you. It was understood ten days only. More is not allowed. You fool! Do you think I ever intended to give up Rose's body once I had it? In that narrow crypt in the tightly locked mausoleum, my body has long since died from lack of air. That Rose has died with it. But I remain alive. Oh, that is what you planned. I should have guessed. But it is not so. Your body is not dead. It is in a sleep so deep that it scarcely breathes. It needs no food, no water. But sometime tonight, the dog will wear off, and your sister Rose will claim her body again, while you, you, Helen Vaughan, will wake to find yourself locked within a burial crypt. No. No, it's not true. It is true. And you will not be asleep. You will be awake, needing air, and there will be no air. You're just trying to frighten me. Tonight, I try to open the tomb to save you. I was driven away by guards with dogs. But what can I do? Only if we can reach the tomb in time to open it, can you be saved. We must go now. I'll get the key. And we must hurry. Hurry! There's the most limb, Miss Vaughan. Pray heaven the guards are not waiting. They won't be. We fool them by leaving the car outside and walking up this back path. Now hurry, Chip. What is it, Miss Vaughan? I don't know. For a moment, I... I felt so dizzy. So weak. It's Rose. 
trying to return to her body. We cannot waste an instant. Hold me up. Something is pulling at me, tugging at me. Helen, where are you? She's speaking through her own lips. No. No, not yet. Go back, you hear me, Rose? Go back. Here's the mausoleum. The key. Give me the key. Here it is. Quickly. She's pushing at me so hard. No. Oh, Helen, help me. Yes. Everything is so dark. Oh, where are you? Go back. Go back, I say. Chad, have you got the lock on? Okay? It won't unlock. It must. They put a new padlock on. Oh, dear heaven, they've changed the lock. Helen, help no. Me. No. It's getting dark. Dark. It's hopeless. We cannot enter. Helen, where are you? No. We can't both be in the same body. Go back. Helen, I'm trying. Don't push me out. Help me. Go back where you were. Help me. Wait, Rose, wait. Help me. Helen. No. No, don't. Rose, you mustn't. You mustn't. The guards, they're coming back. Where am I? What happened to me? Sleep, child. Sleep a little longer and wake without memories. Please. Yes. Please. For her, I can do nothing now. And the guards, they must not catch me. They must not catch me. We've got him this time. Holy cat. It's a girl. It's Mrs. Taylor. Asleep on the steps of her own family mausoleum. Say, we got to get her out of here. Help me lift her yeah. out. Hey, wait. Did you hear something then? Like somebody calling a long ways off? Listen. Help me. I can't breathe. Dad, help me. Come on, Do you hear anything? No, I can't hear anything. Just the wind. Come on, we got to phone Miss Tabor's husband. She may be sick. Come on now, no time to lose. Help me, Remember anything about a man named Chadwin? Chadwin? No, I don't, Leonard. Well, Bessie says he called several times last week to see you. The last time was the night of the party. You're sure you don't remember? Uh, no, Leonard. I, I'm sorry, oh, but... it's all right, darling. I just thought maybe you might have begun to remember some of the things that, that happened during those ten days when you, well, weren't yourself. It's so strange. As if my mind had been asleep the whole time. Is there something about Chadwin in the paper? He committed suicide last night. Oh. His body was found near the old family mausoleum. He left a mysterious note saying he was paying for some transgression. How strange. I wondered if he could have given us any clue as to... as to how you came to leave the party so suddenly that night and drive to the cemetery. Oh, but... It's all over now and not worth worrying about. I'd remember if I could, but when I try, I, I become suddenly frightened and feel as if I were locked in in some dark, tiny space where I can't breathe. All right now, darling, all right. Let's forget the whole thing. Now, let's see what came in the morning mail. Maybe there's a letter from Helen. You know, it's high time we were hearing from her. She's really not acting much like a sister being lost for long without even finding a letter to know where she is. the mysterious traveler again. I'm afraid Leonard and Rose are going to have to wait a long time for a letter from Helen. In fact, I'll be very much surprised if they ever get one. I suppose it'll never occur to them to look in the old mausoleum. In fact, uh, since they both feel a distinct aversion to going near it, it may never be opened again. But I don't suppose that'll make much difference to Helen. <laughs> uh, now. Now, if you were wishing, uh, you could step into somebody else's shoes. Maybe what happened to Helen will make you change your mind. You know, I knew a man once who... He, he stole somebody else's body. Only to discover when it was too late that he... 
Oh, you're getting off here? Well, perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard Chapter 55 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's story, They Who Sleep, Philip Clark played Chadwin, Gertrude Warner played Helen, and Helen Clare played Rose. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Original music is played by Henry Silvern, and the entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Listen next week to a tale titled... Escape Through Time. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. This is Mutual. Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Are we going to join Charles Foster as he takes an excursion into crime? I call the story The Case of Charles Foster. Late one evening several years ago, when I was practicing medicine in a large eastern city, I visited Charles Foster, a friend and patient of mine. I took with me Flush, a cocker spaniel he had entrusted to me. Hello, Doctor. Glad you were able to come. I see you brought Flush. Hello, Flush, old boy. He's missed you, Charles. I've missed him too, Doctor. Been quite lonesome without him these past few months. Ah, down, boy. It's a good dog. How do you feel, Charles? Oh, I'm all right, Doctor. You needn't worry about me. I'm glad to hear that. I suppose you've been quite puzzled about everything that's happened these past months. But frankly, Charles, I have. Even now, I find it difficult to believe that you... Could... Doctor, I'm going to tell you something that I've never told anyone. I thought I'd go to the grave with my secret, but... You know, you've always been friends, and I'd like you to know the truth. As you wish, Charles. Strange how little people know of one another. For ten years, Agatha and I were married, and to the outside world, we were a happily married couple. But in the privacy of our home, I found life with Agatha a nightmare. I never would have guessed that. For ten years, I stood her sharp tongue and constant nagging. I might have gone on taking it the rest of my life. Fate hadn't decreed otherwise. It was three years ago on a beautiful spring evening that fate stepped in change the entire course of my life. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Did you remember to buy me some more of my cough medicine? Yes, here it is. 
Supper ready? Some men would be more interested in their wives' health than their own suppers. I'm sorry, Agatha, but you really don't look sick to me. That's because you don't care. I'm not well, and you know it. I work myself to death day in and day out keeping this house clean. And little thanks do I get for I've it. I've told you before, Agatha. If the house is too much for you, hire a maid. And how exactly can we afford a maid on your miserable bookkeeper's salary? Well, if you can't manage it out of my salary, there's always the $50,000 your father left you. That money is mine. And I'm not spending a single cent of it. It's up to you to provide a maid. All right, Agatha. Please. Let's not quarrel. Oh, hello, Flush. How are you, old boy? Oh, you care more about that dog than you do me. You know that isn't true. It is. Sometimes I think the only reason you come home is because of that dirty old dog. Quiet, Get away from me. All he does is eat and put his filthy paws on my furniture. I want you to get rid of that dog, Charles. Get rid of him? Yes. Buy some poison at the drugstore and dispose of him. You can't stand to see me have anything that makes me happy, can you? Well, I'm not getting rid of him. Charles, this is my house, not yours. And I don't want him here. Come on, Flush. <laughs> oh, don't think that by walking away that ends the matter, Charles Foster. You'd better get rid of that dog, do you hear? <sighs> Glad to get out of the house, eh, old boy? Ah, <laughs> uh, so am I. Oh, it's a beautiful evening, isn't it? <laughs> Come on, boy, we're going to take a long walk. You want to turn around and go home now, Flush? <coughs> oh, neither do I. Pardon me, but aren't you Charles? Julia! Julia Sanders! Uh, Charles, I thought it was you. Oh, let me look at you. Oh, Julia, you haven't changed a bit. You're as lovely as... How long has it been since we last saw each other? Ten years. Almost eleven. Has it really been that long? Julia... Have you ever forgiven me for what happened? Of course, Charles. I was so insanely in love with you, Julia, that I couldn't bear to have other men look at you. You, you know that I didn't I mean... I know, to... Charles. I've thought of that night constantly. It's been like a nightmare ever since. Please, Charles, it's all past and forgotten now. You were perfectly justified in breaking our engagement. After what I'd done, there was nothing else you could do. I understand you married Agatha Winthrop a year after I'd gone abroad. Yes, Julia. After you left for Europe, people kept telling me well, what a wonderful wife Agatha would make me. I allowed myself to be convinced and married her. Well, I'm sure everything turned out for the best. Oh, but it didn't, Julia. Almost from the beginning, our marriage was a failure. For these past five years, Agatha and I have merely been living together under the same roof. Well, I'm sorry, Charles, that it didn't turn out well. Nothing turned out well, Julia, after I lost you... I hope things have been better with you these past 11 years. Oh, I can't complain. I spent a number of years in Paris studying art and working at dress designing. Oh. I only came back a few months ago. You've uh, never married? No. I'm working now for Morgan's Department Store as their art director. Oh, really? Well, my, my office is only a few blocks from there. Look, Julia, why don't we have lunch together tomorrow? There are so many things I'd like to know... Well, I'd like to, Charles, but I think it would be much better that we don't. Oh, now, surely, Julia, there's no harm in two old friends having lunch together, is there? No, I suppose not. I won't take no for an answer. Do you know where Drake's restaurant is? Yes. Will one o'clock tomorrow be all right? Yes, that's my usual lunch hour. Good, then it's a date. Strange, isn't it, Doctor? The way after 11 years, Julia and I bumped into each other. If we hadn't, what followed would never have happened. It's such small things as an accidental meeting that often change the course of one's life. Yes, I know that now, but I didn't then. I met Julia for lunch the next day, and soon we were having lunch together every day. Mm. And for the first time in years, life began to mean something. Merely seeing Julia for one hour a day made life worth living. I understand, sir. We'd have lunch together, and then we'd go for a walk in the park. I sensed at the time that Julia, too, was lonely and in the need of friendship. The summer passed swiftly and happily. I should have realized that things couldn't go on that way, but I didn't. You mean you fell in love with Julia? Fell in love with her? I don't think I'd ever really stopped loving her. I became aware of how much I really cared for her one warm autumn day as we were walking through the park together. (laughs) 
Julia. Yes, Charles? What about going to the theater with me tonight? Oh, I wish you hadn't asked me, Charles. Why? Because it means we can't go on seeing each other anymore. But why shouldn't we go on seeing each other? Because you aren't satisfied any longer just to see me at lunch. and It isn't right for us to go out together at night. But surely there's no harm in our going to the theater together. You're married, Charles. That's reason enough. All right, Julia. Forget I ever asked you. But at least we can go on having lunch together, can't we? No, Charles. Oh, but... Can't you see? Things can never be the way they were. We've become dependent upon each other, and we have no right to be. We can't go on seeing each other any longer. It isn't fair to Agatha. But you know that Agatha and I mean nothing to each other. We haven't for years. Nevertheless, she's your wife. Julia, you, you know I love you. I've always loved you, and I can't do without you. Charles, you're just making it difficult for both of us. Julia, you do love me, don't you? Yes. But can't you see? It's no use. I remember Agatha only too well. She'd never give you a divorce. I know she won't. I've asked her a dozen times in the past five years, but she said she'll never give me one. I want to part now, Charles. Right here. Must we? Yes. Goodbye, Charles. My life seemed to end that day, Doctor, with our parting. I went through the motions of living, but nothing seemed to matter any longer. I can well understand that. Well, months went by. Every day after work, I stayed in town, unable to face an evening at home with Agatha. When I did arrive home late at night, she'd be waiting for me. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Sorry if I woke you. Now, lot you care. Coming in night after night at all hours. Leaving me alone in this big house. Oh, don't think I don't know what you're up to. I know you're kind, Charles Foster. You better go to sleep, Agatha. A fine chance I have to sleep with you putting on the bathroom light. You know I can't sleep when that now, light's on. It take me a minute to brush my teeth, then I'll turn off the light. Agatha. Well, what is it now? What's this bottle of prussic acid doing in the medicine chest? It's a deadly poison. I know that. I got it from Mrs. Smedley, the druggist's wife. She used it to get rid of an old cat they had. When I told her about flush, she said it What's was a thing... What's that about flush? I said Mrs. Smedley gave me that bottle of prussic acid so I could get rid of flush. I'm going to put him out of his misery tomorrow. You'll do no such thing, you hear? If you so much as lay a hand on flush, I'll kill you. I'll kill you, do you understand? Yes, yes, Charles. You get rid of that poison tomorrow. Let's have no more talk of putting flush out of his misery. <laughs> for hours, Doctor, unable to fall asleep. Julia's breaking off with me and my wife's refusal to give me a divorce and the prussic acid she meant to poison flush with had left me all worked up. Then Agatha began coughing. That cough she'd cultivated for years to give people the impression that she was an invalid. Well, after she'd coughed her usual five minutes or so, she got out of bed and started for the bathroom where she kept her cough medicine. Oh! That chair. Why don't you turn on the light so you can see where you're going? I can see perfectly well where I'm going. Besides, on your salary, we can't afford to waste electricity. I knew there wasn't any use in saying anything more. For years, Agatha had gotten up every night and groped her way to the medicine chest where her cough medicine was. Nothing could make her change her habits. I lay in bed listening as she opened the medicine chest and fumbled in the corner where she always kept the bottle. As I heard her groping for her medicine, I suddenly thought of the bottle that was standing next to it. The bottle of prussic acid. Without thinking, it came to mind. If only she'd take the prussic acid instead of the cough medicine. If she did, I would be free. Free of her constant nagging and whining. Free to see Julia. Then I knew it was useless to hope for such a mistake to happen. Agatha's cough medicine always stood in the same corner of the medicine chest. Even in the dark, she'd never take the bottle of prussic acid. And then... And it came to me. What if the bottles were to be switched? What if the following night the prussic acid were placed in the customary spot of the cough medicine? Suddenly it was all very clear to me what I was going to do. Agatha? <laughs> well? Agatha, I've been thinking over what you said about flush. What? I suppose you're right. Flush should be disposed of. He certainly should. He's old and he's smelly. 
It'll be a blessing for him to be put out of his misery. Yes, of course. I, I'm sorry I shouted at you before, Agatha, but, well, I see now that you're right. Hmm. When are you going to do it? Oh, we'll wait until Saturday. And none too soon, either. Uh, you're sure the prussic acid won't make him suffer? Nonsense, of course it won't. Mrs. Smedley said nothing worked faster than prussic acid. Oh, you told her what it was for. Uh, that's fine. Very well, I guess I just leave everything to me. The next night, Doctor... After Agatha was in bed, I quietly stole into the bathroom and opened the medicine chest. I compared the bottle of cough medicine with that of the prussic acid. They were both small bottles, almost identical in size. I removed the cough medicine from where it stood in the corner of the chest and replaced it with the poison. Then I went to bed and waited impatiently for Agatha to start coughing. <laughs> Can I get you a glass of water or something, Agatha? Oh, water won't do any good. What I need is my cough medicine. Oh, back that chair. Why don't you turn on the light? Because I can see perfectly in the dark. Besides, someone's got to economize on the electricity in this house. I'm in here in the darkness, listening to her grumble as she opened the door of the medicine chest. The blood pounded in my ears as I heard her fumbling into the bottle. Would she feel the slight difference in the bottle when she picked it up? Scarcely able to breathe, I waited. Listen. And she fell to the floor. I quickly got out of bed, turned on the lights, and went into the bathroom. She was lying on the floor, quite dead. There was an agonized look on her face. I returned the bottle of cough medicine to its proper place, and then I phoned the police. <laughs> Now, you say, Mr. Foster, that your wife was in the habit of going every night to the medicine chest for a few drops of her cough medicine. Yes, that's right. And she never turned on the lights when she went to the medicine chest. Oh, no, sir. Wasn't that a bit unusual? Well, I always used to tell her to turn on the lights, but she said it was a waste of electricity. I see. And you say your wife... It was her who placed the bottle of prussic acid in the medicine chest next to her cough medicine, eh? Yes, sir. I'd never touched the bottle of prussic acid. You see, it was my wife who procured it, and she... Yes, yes, Mr. Smedley, the druggist has testified that his wife gave it to your wife. Mr. Foster, are you familiar with the contents of your wife's will dated ten years ago? Why, uh, yes, I am. Then you know, of course, that your wife left her entire estate to the home for the aged. Home for the aged? Oh, yes, yes. I fought to keep my face expressionless to prevent him from learning that I hadn't known all the years we'd been married, Agatha had given me to understand that all her money would go to me. Now I knew that she'd been lying. Her will had been made out in favor of the home for the aged for years. I began to feel angry at the way she'd cheated me. But a moment later, I was grateful that she had. Frankly, Mr. Foster, your wife's death occurred under very suspicious circumstances, to say the least. For years, she'd gone to the medicine chest every night without mishap. And yet, on the second night that there was a bottle of prussic acid in the chest... She met her death. Were it not for the fact that your wife had left her entire estate to the home for the aged, I might be inclined to go further with this investigation. As it is, I'll instruct the coroner's jury to bring in a verdict of death through accident. That's all, Mr. Foster. I walked out of the district attorney's office a free man. A few days later, I moved out of the house which had been Agatha's and took up quarters elsewhere. Six long and uneventful months passed. I made no effort to contact Julia for fear that the police might still have their suspicions. And then I could stand it no longer. I, I called on her. Jo Charles, when I was told you were waiting to see me, I could hardly believe it. I'm so glad to see you again. Thank you, Julia. It's good to see you again, too. Charles, you don't look well at all. Now, these past few months have been something of a strain, Junior, but I'm all right now. I was tempted so many times to get in touch with you. Then I thought perhaps you didn't want to see anyone. Well, I did want to see you, Julia, but I was afraid it wouldn't look right. I understand, Charles. Now, let's not say anything more of the past. Only the present and the future. Junior, do you think we might try to pick up where we left off last autumn? 
We can try, Charles. Julia and I, Doctor, began to see each other night after night. Life for me became exciting and wonderful the way it had been 11 years ago before Julia and I had broken our engagement. Didn't you ever stop to think of what you'd done? You mean Agatha? Yes. No, Doctor. They say that a murderer is ever haunted by his crime. But that isn't true. Hmm. At least it wasn't in my case. To me, Agatha was part of another life in the dim past. I rarely thought of the past, only the present and the future. Now, if I had any fears at all, it was the fear that something would spoil the happiness that Julia and I had found together. But nothing did. And a few months later, we were married with you as my best man. Yes, I remember. And my second marriage was everything that my first hadn't been. The first time in my life I knew what true happiness meant. Julia and I were poor, but that didn't matter. For we had each other. The months swiftly passed. And as our first anniversary approached, it was hard to believe that we'd been married almost a year. Charles, before you leave for work, will you sign a check for me? Oh, who's it for, dear? Never you mind, Mr. Foster. You just leave a signed check. I'll fill in the amount and the party it's meant for. Mrs. Foster, you're acting very mysterious. Well, a wife has a right to act mysterious once a year. <laughs> Darling, I suspect you're going to use this check to buy me an anniversary present. Well, whatever you get me, please don't make a neckties. <laughs> well, I'll have you know I have very good taste in neckties. I know you do, dear, but I have to wear them. You're an ungrateful <laughs> wretch. Very well, I won't get you ties. <laughs> good, then I'll sign the check for you. And please bear in mind that you can't make this check out for more than $312.50. That's all we have in the bank. Oh, I'll leave you at least the 50 cents. You'd better leave a good deal more. Oh, we won't be going up to Lake Ellis. Charles, are we going up to Lake Ellis? Oh, they had slipped out. And I meant it as an anniversary surprise. Oh, Charles, that's wonderful. When are we going? This Friday afternoon. I've rented a cabin and a small motorboat on Lake Ellis for the weekend. Oh, darling, what an exciting surprise. Charles, you're sure it won't be too expensive? Why, nothing can be too expensive for our first anniversary. Oh, darling, <laughs> I've never been so happy. <laughs> Now, this looks like a nice place to fish. Oh, let's see, where'd I put that bait? Here it is, dear. Thanks, darling. Uh-huh. Ah, here's a nice, fat, dimpled worm. <laughs> well, if you can't stand to see me bait him, just turn the other way. Okay. It'll only take me a minute. Charles, look. That's where I get this. There's smoke to... coming out of the engine hatch. What's that? Yes, you're right. It's on fire. There are flames shooting out. Fire extinguishers at the other end of the boat. Charles, you'd never make it. You'd be burned. Yes, you're right. Besides, even the extinguisher wouldn't do much good now. The fire's too big. What are we going to do? Oh, the heat is becoming unbearable. There's only one thing we can do, Julia. Let's go over the side. We're almost in the center of the lake. I can't swim. But I can, dear. I'll manage to keep us above water somehow. Well, all right, darling. I'll do whatever you say. You'll come through this, Julia. Now, don't be afraid. Now, I'll slip over the side of the boat first, and you follow. All right. Now, hurry, Julia. Let yourself down into the water. I'll keep you afloat. Yes, Charles. Uh, that's it. <coughs> now, now, let go of the side of the boat. I have you. Yes, Charles. Now, don't be afraid, darling. You see? It's no trouble keeping you above water. Now, now just relax, dear. While I swim with you a bit, we've got to get a good distance from the boat. It may explode. Yes, Charles. Do you see any boats, Rob? No, but someone's bound to see the fire and come to our rescue. Until they do, we must have courage. Aren't you, Charles? No. Now, don't worry, dear. I can keep us afloat for a long time yet. Oh, why doesn't someone come to our rescue? They will. Someone must surely have seen that boat burning. Charles, we've been in the water so long. Oh, it just seems long, darling. It can't be more than ten minutes. Ten minutes? It feels more like... Charles! I've got you, Jenny. Just for a moment, you you slipped away from me. 
Charlie. It's no use. I'm just a millstone around your neck. What are you, what are you saying? Why should we both drown? Charles, save yourself. Save myself? Yes. I want you to let go of me. Let go of you? No. No, never. Yes, you must. You're too tired to keep going. No, no darling. Either we're both saved or we're both drowned. No, I won't have you throw your life away. Let go of me. Oh, Julia. Julia, stop trying to break loose. Julia, darling, don't. I can't live without you. Julia, stop struggling. Save Julia. Julia. Help! Help my wife! My wife! She... Yeah, yeah, we saw it all. Hey, Mike, he's passed out. Get him before he goes under. Yeah. I got him. Hey, help me get him aboard, Skipper. All right, all right. Any sign of his wife? Uh, she's gone, Skipper. Yeah, too bad. Well, if it's the last thing I do, I aim to see just a stand of this fella. She never had a chance. You see him shovel under? It was murder, that's what it was. Now, Mr. Foster, both of the men who rescued you claim that as they approached you and your late wife in their boat, they saw you struggling with her. You admit this? Yes. Yes, but I tell you, I was trying to save her, not drown her. No, you were trying to save her. But both the witnesses testified they saw you push her head under. Oh, they're wrong. I wasn't pushing her under. I was trying to bring her to the surface. You must believe me. Oh, Mr. Foster. You maintain that you were rescuing your wife, not drowning her. Yes. Is it true, Mr. Foster, that you were engaged to your wife 11 years ago and that she broke the engagement? Yes. That's true. Would you mind telling the jury why she broke the engagement? We we had a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding. Do you call shooting the woman you're engaged to just a misunderstanding? No, no. You must let me explain. It's true that 11 years ago I did shoot Julia, but I've been drinking. I didn't know what Mr. I was... Mr. Foster, you do admit shooting and wounding her. Yes, yes. Have you ever seen this before? Why, yes... That's the insurance policy I took out for Julia and myself. Exactly. And when was this policy taken out? Well, about a month ago. June 15th, to be exact. And what's the value of this policy, uh, Mr. Foster? Well, if either my wife or myself died, it provided $10,000 for the survivor. Yes, Mr. Foster. If either you or your wife died a natural death, it provided $10,000 to the survivor. But there's also a double indemnity clause in this policy, isn't there? Yes, but I... One that provides you with $20,000 if your wife died an accidental death, such as drowning. Yes, that's true, but I swear I didn't drown my wife. I tell you, I was trying to save her. Save her, not drown her. You must believe me. You must... That, Doctor, is exactly the way everything happened. Strange, isn't it? The way justice works itself out. I committed murder and escaped punishment. Now I'm paying with my life for the death of the one person I really loved. It's time to go, Foster. All right, Warden. Goodbye, Doctor. And take good care of Flush, will you? Of course, Charles. Goodbye. All right, Warden. I'm ready. Let's go. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? Too bad about Charles Foster, wasn't it? As he was strapped into the electric chair, there was an ironic smile on his lips. For he was being executed for something he had not done. But as Charles himself said, justice has a strange way of working itself out. I knew another man once who thought it would be a simple thing to dispose of his wife... Uh, unfortunately, he, uh, 
Oh, you're getting off here? I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard Chapter 64 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and the terrifying. In tonight's story, the case of Charles Foster, Humphrey Davis played Charles Foster, Nancy Sheridan played Julia, and Joan Shea played Agatha. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Henry Silverne. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Listen next week to a tale titled Blood Money. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. This is Mutual. <laughs> Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves. If you can. Where are we going? Why, we're going to pay a visit to the home of Albert and Louise Jordan. As nice a couple as you'd hope to meet. In a story I call... Death is the Visitor. My story begins in the Jordan home late on a hot summer night. Albert Jordan is asleep and is having a nightmare about his mother-in-law. You can't pull the wool over my eyes, Albert Jordan. I'm on to your ways. Think that my only child was foolish enough to elope with you. But you made her do it, Albert. You made her. No, no. She wanted As long as I'm alive, she'll be protected from you. Albert, are you listening? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Please. Darling, wake up. What? What? What is it? You were having a nightmare, dear. You don't want to wake Mother up. She needs a good night's sleep for a trip tomorrow. Oh, oh yes, the trip. I wish it was tomorrow already. She was gone. Are you sure you have everything, Mother? Yes, Louise. Everything I need for my trip home is in this handbag. Oh, oh now, don't forget to ship my trunk. I've already notified the expressman, Mother. He'll be here to pick it up this morning. Thank you, dear. Well, it's... Almost nine o'clock, Mother. You'll miss your train. I've never missed a train in my life. You needn't be so anxious to get rid of me, Albert. Oh, really, Mother, I didn't mean... Oh, Louise, darling, I do hate leaving you alone like this. But, Mother, I'm not alone. I have Albert. Well, I don't mind saying it right to his face. I don't trust him, Louise, and I never will. I'm really wrong about people, you know that. Now, see here, Mother, I've had about enough. Louise and I get along perfectly well when you're not here. See, Louise, what a temper he has. Do you want me to stay, darling? Really, Mother, I'm very happy with Albert. Oh, well, very well, then I'll go. But you'd better be good to her, Albert. Yes, Mother, I will. Well, goodbye. And don't forget, Louise, Mother will be back if you need her. Yes, Mother. Bye. Louise, if your mother pays us just one more visit, I'll leave this house for good. Albert, what are you saying? In the past year, she spent eight months with us. She has her clothes here, a key to the house. Why, she's even listed in the phone book under, under our number. I tell you, I won't be responsible for what happens if she doesn't stay away. I'll write to her, Albert, and try to explain. Really, I will. Make her understand that we have our own lives to lead. You know, now that she's gone, I I feel like a new man. 
I can breathe in my own house. Oh, Albert, you won't forget to put the tags on Mother's trunk, will you? The expressman will be here for it soon. No, dear. Shipping your mother's trunk to her will be one thing I certainly won't forget. Ah, uh, let me see. This is Hortense Murdoch. 125 River Road, Ferndale, Pennsylvania. That won't be necessary, Albert. My trunk can remain here. Mother, but you went to catch your train. I know I did, but I changed my mind about going. I won't leave my little girl alone. Why are you looking so startled, Albert? Are you hiding something from me? Uh, no. No, of course not. Where's Louise? She went downtown a, an hour ago. Uh, she should be home soon. I'm sure at least she'll be glad to see me. I... Oh, you haven't locked my trunk yet. That's good. So you've come back again. <laughs> you've always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. Keep me away from my only child. But I refuse to give her up. Yes, I've come back, Albert, and I'm staying for good. Frankly, I don't trust you. You don't trust me? No. I don't even know your background. For all I know, you may have criminal tendencies. There's a certain amount of the criminal in all of us. Most people can control their worst instincts. And some can't. Exactly. And I'm here to see to it that no one harms Louise. But, Mother, who's going to look out for you? Uh, Albert, why are you looking so queerly at me? Are you sick? Yes, Mother, I'm sick. Sick of the sight of you. Albert, stop looking at me that way, why... You seem like a different person. I am, Mother. You've made me different. And now you must take the consequences. Albert, stay away from me. Don't you dare come near me. So you would keep coming back, Mother. Well, you came back just once too often. No, no, Albert. Don't touch me. Albert, <laughs> You should have taken that train, Mother. But at least now, I know you won't be coming back ever again. I... I didn't want to kill you. But you made me. Oh, but now I, I've got to get rid of you or they'll catch me. The trunk. Yes, it, it's large enough. Even in death, you're a problem, Mother. But you won't be for long. There. Now I'll have to get rid of the trunk. Somehow. I'll think of a way... Louise, the trunk. I've got to close it. Is that you, Albert? I, yes, dear, yes. Oh, I see you're locking the trunk. Yes, I was just getting it ready for the expressman. Oh, he should be here by now. Albert, is anything wrong? Uh, anything wrong? Uh, what do you mean, Louise? I don't know. Your face is so flushed. Oh, it's just a little warm in here, that's all. Oh, we forgot to pack Mother's robe. Look, oh, you'll have to open the trunk again, Albert. No, I, I mean, uh, the trunk's full already, you... Wouldn't be able to get anything else into it. Why, nonsense. When Mother and I packed it, it was only half full. Oh, please open it. But it's locked and we haven't got the keys. Oh, yes, that's right. Mother has them. Well, we'll just have to mail the robe to her. Oh, I'll answer the door. It must be the expressman. Make sure the tags are on it, dear. Uh, the tags. Oh, it can't go to her home. Oh, if I only had time to think, think. Wait, yes, that, that's the only thing to do. Come this way, please. You'll find the trunk in this room. <clears throat> Here it is. Are you finished, Albert? Yes, it's all ready to go. Okay. Well, let me make a record of it. Now, let me see. It's being shipped uh, to... Perhaps you'd better load it on the truck first. It's easier this way, mister. Uh, you're shipping it to uh, Mr. William Smith, 345 Wood Street, Las Vegas. Well, well that isn't the right address. Then uh, what? what is it on this uh, shipping tag, lady? Oh, uh, well, that uh, must be one of my customers. I must have been thinking of someone else when I wrote it out. Yeah, but what's the right address? Oh, it's Mrs. Hortense Murdoch, 125 River Road, Ferrydale, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's right, isn't it, dear? Yes. Okay, I know your name and address. Uh, I'll put the right tags on later. Uh, uh, that's mighty heavy. Oh, please be careful with it. Don't worry, lady. Um, get there. Please get some. Albert. 
Albert, did you get the mail just now? Yes, dear. Is there a letter from Mother yet? No, no, just a few bills. Oh, I'm really worried. It's a week now and no word from her. But you mustn't worry, Louise. I'm sure she's all right. Why, Albert, you're even worried yourself about her. You look so upset. Oh, I'll answer. I'll come with you. Maybe it's a special delivery for Mother. Yes? Hey, good morning. I got a trunk here for you folks. What? It's Mother's trunk. Yes. You always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. But I come back, Albert, and I'm staying for good. Bring it in, won't you, please? Okay, lady. There you are. But I don't understand. Why should Mother send her trunk back to us? Now, would you mind signing for it, uh, Mr. Jordan? What? Oh, yes. Here you are. Thanks. Bye. Albert, I, I can't understand why Mother shipped her trunk back to us and without even writing a word about it. Can you figure it out? Well, what? Oh, no, I can't. Well, I'm going to put an end to this guessing. Louise, what are you going to do? I'm calling Mother. Hello, operator. I want to put through a call to Ferrydale, Pennsylvania. The number is 223. Uh, why bother, Louise? I'm sure there's a letter on the way. Oh, I've waited long enough for one. I'm sure there's something wrong. Oh, hello? Oh, hello, Sarah. This is Louise calling. Is my mother there? What? Are you sure? Oh, and that's why you shipped the trunk back. No, no. Thank you, Sarah. Albert, Sarah says that mother never arrived home. She sent a postcard saying not to expect her just yet. Was Sarah the one who shipped the trunk back? Yes. She thought that mother had decided to stay with us longer and would need her clothes. What... Albert, where can she be? Oh, now, Louise, I'm sure she's all right. All right, she's been missing a week. How could she be? Well, perhaps she's staying with friends. Oh, you know Mother hasn't any friends. We've got to do something. Albert, I'm going to call the police. The police investigated, but they had no clues, so they didn't learn anything. And George got rid of the embarrassing trunk just as fast as he could. Telling Louise he was going to put it into storage, he took it to a trucking company to ship it as far away as it could go. It was the only thing he could think of to do. All right, I got it straight, I guess, now. Mr. Richard Jones, 65 Ocean Avenue, Los Angeles. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. He's my brother. Yeah, and your name is... Uh... Uh, Martin Jones. Huh? 1635 Sherwood Road, Riverdale, New York. Jones... Sherwood Road, Riverdale. All right, Mr. Jones, now let's see. That'll be $18. Oh, well, here's, uh, here's 20 Keep the change. Oh, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. Jones. Uh, here's your receipt. It'll go out right away. Uh, there's a truck leaving tonight. Don't you worry. This trunk will get to Los Angeles all right. That's fine, fine. It'll be quite a load off my mind when it's gone. <laughs> A week passed, two weeks, three, and poor Albert was breathing more easily again. Until one morning when something most unexpected happened. Louise! Louise, darling! Yes, Albert. Oh, darling, I have a present for you. Some flowers. <laughs> Just saw them and thought you'd like them. Thank you, Albert. You're very thoughtful. Louise, your mother's been missing more than a month now. You can't go on like this. You'll have a breakdown. Oh, well, but where can she be? Why can't the police find her? Well, darling, if she hasn't been found in five weeks... Oh, excuse me, dear, I'll answer it. Maybe it's news of Mother, Arthur. Uh, good evening. Uh, I got a trunk here I, I think belongs to you. A trunk? Yeah, uh, that's you right. You always wanted to get rid of me, Albert. But I've come back, Albert. I've come back. Do you recognize it? It, it's yours, isn't it? Oh, no, no. Huh? Well, uh, ain't you the fellow that shipped this trunk about a month ago? Did, didn't you give me a $2 tip? I'm afraid you have me confused with someone else. Don't you know where the trunk goes? Well, no. You see, it's come all the way back from California. It's, it seems there wasn't uh, no such address where this was shipped to. Surely, surely it had a return address. Uh, yeah, but the trunk got wet. Uh, uh, the return address kind of washed off, so it came back to the office where it was shipped from. Oh. But what makes you think it belongs here? Well, you hey, see, I kind of did a little detective work. The uh, initials stamped on the trunk are H.G.M. 
Well, I looked it up in the phone book, and the only person in town with those initials lives here. Well, I'm sorry, but it, it certainly isn't my trunk. Oh, well, I'm sorry to trouble you. I, I'd have sworn you was the guy who gave me that two-buck tip. Uh, where will you take the trunk now? Oh, it'll be put to the unclaimed baggage, uh, and then in a few months it'll be auctioned off. Auctioned off? Yeah. You'd be surprised what you sometimes find in them, just like a grab bag game. Well, sorry to trouble you. Oh, wait a minute. Huh? Uh, what did you say those initials were? Uh, H.G.M. H.G.M. What? Uh, they're, they're, they're my mother-in-law's initials. Her name is, is Hortense G. Murdoch. Well, sure, that, that was the only name in the book with those initials. That's why I came here. Well, that was a very clever piece of detective work. Uh, yes, of course it's her trunk. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't recognize it. Well, you know, trunks, they kind of look alike. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Well, bring it in. Trunks are funny things, aren't they? You have something valuable in one, and just as likely as not, it'll get lost. But put something you don't want in it, like a mother-in-law, and it'll come back every time. You can hardly blame Albert for being upset, especially since Louise wanted to open the trunk to look for possible clues. But Albert managed to get Louise out of the house, then uh, put the trunk onto the trunk rack of his car and started out. Several hours later, he was at the receiving platform of an all-night storage warehouse in New York. Yes, mister? Can I help you? Pardon me, but you store uh, trunks here, don't you? Yeah, sure. We store anything in here. You want to store that trunk you got there? Oh, yes, please. Okay, I'll make out a ticket. Now, what's your name? Williams. John Williams. Your address? Uh, 313 Maple Street. Yeah, but what city, mister? What oh, city? Oh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore. Okay. Charge is $3 a month. How long you want to pay for? Oh, quite a while. Uh, I'll be leaving the country and... Uh... Well, what is it? Anything wrong, mister? Oh, dear. I only seem to have six dollars with me. Well, that'll pay for two months. Then we'll send you a bill. No, that won't be necessary. I'll send you a money order in a few days. I may be out of the country for several years. Okay. Leave the trunk there. I'll take care of it. And uh, here's your receipt. Just put the number of it in your letter when you send the money. I will. I, I won't forget. Good night. Good night. Hey, Mr. Williams, Mr. Ah, he's gone. There's a receipt on the platform where he dropped it. Huh. The nervous type. Oh, well, I suppose they can forward it to him from Baltimore. When Albert found he'd lost his receipt for the trunk, he was badly upset at first. That meant he couldn't send any money for future storage charges. But after all... There was no identification inside it, and he'd rubbed Mother's initials off the outside this time. So how could anyone trace it back to him? Especially since they'd be looking for him in Baltimore. So in a few weeks, Albert was himself again. Except for a nightmare once in a while. Oh. After all, oh. what do I know about you, Albert? Mm. You may have criminal tendencies. Oh. I'm going to protect my daughter from you. Yes, I've come back and you're not going to get rid of me. Do you hear me, Albert? I've come back to stay. Oh, no. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I tell you. Albert, no. Albert, wake up. Oh, what is it, Louise? You were moaning in your sleep, dear. You must have been having a nightmare. Oh, oh yes, I was. But it's not important... It, just that midnight snack I had. Go back to sleep, darling. But as the months passed, so did the nightmares. And finally, Albert was his old cheerful self again. Good evening, dear. How are you? I'm all right, Albert. Fine, fine. Say, I bumped into George Horton and his wife while on the way home, and they asked us to come to the charity bazaar tonight. That was very nice of him, Albert. Well, why don't we go? There'll be an auction, a raffle, supper, a fancy. It'll do you good. I know, but somehow I don't feel like meeting people. But you can't go on this way, Louise, cutting yourself off from the world. I've been unfair to you, haven't I, Albert? Keeping you home night after night all these months. Oh, why, darling, you know I've been perfectly happy. It's been so nice. Just the two of us. 
You've been perfectly wonderful, Albert. I'm afraid I've been acting very selfishly. All right, I'll go to that charity affair tonight. Now, what have I bid for this beautiful antique lamp? Do I hear, Dollar? Do I hear a dollar? I'll get a dollar. Ah, there we have a lady with a real sense of beauty. Now, do I hear two dollars? Do I hear two dollars? Well, good evening, George. Well, hello, Albert. Hello, Louise. Hello, George. Gee, I'm sure glad you two came. Missed you both a lot these past months. Well, I hope you'll be seeing more of us. Hey, we've got quite a crowd here tonight. Oh, yeah. We hope to raise quite a bit of money. Hey, that auctioneer's a genius. Come on, let's get a little closer. All right. Uh, now, uh, that gentleman over there, the one with the superb eye for beauty, bids five dollars for this lamp. Do I hear five fifty? Your last chance, ladies and gentlemen, going at five dollars once, going twice, sold. To the gentleman in the tweed suit, and very fortunate he is. <laughs> that lamp couldn't have cost more than three dollars when it was new. <laughs> well, now we come to the raffle. The raffle? Yeah. The raffle for a mystery prize donated by yours truly, George Horton. Oh. <laughs> Better let me sell you a few tickets, Albert. They're I'll... only 50 cents each. No, no, thanks, George. We just came to be sociable. Better take a chance. No telling what you might win. Now, uh, next, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the feature of the evening. A raffle for a mystery prize, which I have hidden here beneath this canvas cover. Now, I'm going to lift this cover and show you a locked trunk. Now, take a good look at it. A trunk? Oh, no. It can't be. Because she's come back again. Yes, Albert, I've come back. And I'm going to stay for good this time. Oh, no, no. Now, this is no ordinary trunk, ladies and gentlemen. It was donated by a gentleman who bought it for storage charges. Now, who knows what it contains? Perhaps the crown jewels of old Russia. Or better still, uh, a case of scotch. <laughs> now, take a good look at it and try to guess. Albert, you're so pale. Is there anything wrong? Uh, no, of course not. George, where did you get this trunk? Oh, that big storage place in New York. You know, on the east side. Somebody did keep up the storage charges on it, and all the notifications they mailed came back, yes. so... Yes, yes, I see. And now that you've seen all the prizes, and particularly seen this prize, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're going to want to buy not one, not two, but half a dozen chances each. What can be in it? Guessing is half the fun. Well, now we're all going to adjourn for supper, and immediately after supper, the big drawing will be held. So buy your chances now and win yourself a trunk full of surprise and pleasure. Well, Albert, changed your mind about buying a chance or two? Yes, George. Yes, I have. I'll take all you've got. Albert, I don't understand you. You've bought every chance that was left on that trunk. Louise, I know what I'm doing. What on earth do you want with an old trunk that... Looks a lot like Mother's trunk, doesn't it? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. But of course it does, Albert. It's the same make and color. It has the same dent there. But it couldn't be. Of course not. (laughs) The idea is absurd. Darling, you're acting so strangely. You didn't eat any supper, and now you... For heaven's sakes, Louise, will you stop nagging me? I'm sorry, Albert. Hello, hello. (laughs) Feeling pretty sure you're going to win it with all those tickets, huh, Albert? I hope so. I knew the mystery of it would get you. Say, I've even got a ticket on it myself. So you'll have some competition. Oh, I'll win it. I've got to. Well, I did my best. I picked out the heaviest trunk the place had for sale. So I don't want the winner to blame me if he doesn't like what he finds. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready for the feature of the evening, the drawing for the locked mystery trunk. Now, my assistant has put all the ticket stubs in the wire wheel, and so I spin it, Thus, round and round it goes, and where it stops, nobody knows. (laughs) Now the stubs are thoroughly mixed, and I stop the wheel so that this lovely young lady may reach in and withdraw the number of the lucky, lucky winner. Now, will you open your eyes, please, and read the number that you have drawn? Number, number 38. Number 38. Number 38. Number 38 is the winner. Is the holder of number 38 here, please? Yes. Yes, I have it. I've won. 
I've won. Well, good for you, Albert. Congratulations, sir. May I have your ticket, please, so that I may compare it with the stub that the young lady drew? Yes, yes, of course. Here it is. Thank you. Yes. Now, I place the ticket and the stub together, and we... What is it? I'm very sorry. I'm afraid an error has occurred. An error? What do you mean? Uh, the young lady misrep... Uh, she misread the winning number. It is number 33, not 38. No. Oh, you're lying. I won. The trunk's mine. Uh, now I'm sorry, but mistakes will happen. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I must make a correction. The winning number is 33. Here's the holder of number 33 present. Oh, yes, yes. Well, that's my number. Well, hard luck, Albert. But I guess you don't win after all. Uh, now, may I, uh, may I have your ticket, please? Yeah, sure, here, here. Thank you very much. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, the lucky winner, purely by chance, is the gentleman who donated the prize... Mr. George Barton, and congratulations to you, sir. <laughs> and I hope you'll open the trunk now and let the rest of us know what we missed out on. I certainly will. No, he, he can't open it. You haven't got the key. No, no, but I have a bunch here that I borrowed from a locksmith, and one of them's bound to work. But you mustn't open it. George, George, I'll buy that trunk from you. But I don't want to sell. I, uh, I want to know what's in the trunk. That's where the fun comes in. I'll give you $100. You can't refuse. $100? Well, if you want it that bad, all right. I'll give you my check tomorrow. Yeah, but there's one condition. Condition? Yeah, that you open the trunk here so we can all see what's in it. Oh, no, I won't do it. Well, then the deal's off. Sorry, Albert, but curiosity has the better of me. Oh, come on. George, <laughs> George, please listen to sorry, me. Sorry, Albert, sorry. Uh, just a minute, everybody. As soon as I find one of these keys at bed, I'll... Oh, do I come back, Albert? And I have. Oh. You should have known I would. Oh, no, no. Darling, you're not well. Let's go home. No, it's no use at... It's just no use. What on earth do you mean? You will never be rid of me, Albert. Never. I've come back to stay this time. I think I've got it. Yeah, this piece ain't be fair. No, wait. Wait. Uh, what is it? You mustn't open it. Oh, Albert, fun's fun, but uh, after all... I had something to tell you. She's beaten me. I... I can't keep it hidden any longer. That's right, Albert. Tell them it's the only way you can ever be rid of me. Go on. Tell them. Well, Albert... I... I did it. I killed her. Did what? Killed who? Albert, what are you talking about? I killed Louise's mother. Her body is in that trunk. Oh, oh no. no. Albert, that's a very poor joke. Oh, it's no joke. I thought I could get rid of her, but I can't. She keeps coming back. And coming back. And coming back. And I can't stand it any longer. Go on, open the trunk now. You'll see I'm telling the truth. Go on, open it. All right, we will. Uh, please stand back, everybody. Come on, stand back, all of you. Yeah, back. Auctioneer, help me, will you? Yes, sure, Mr. Horton. I'll undo this catch now. There. All right, now lift up. Albert, this trunk. Why, there's nothing in it but old books. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. Poor Albert. He let himself be fooled by the wrong trunk. Maybe it was his guilty conscience. What happened to him? Why, he's getting the best of attention these days in a small but comfortable room with bars over the windows. The only trouble is the bars won't keep his mother-in-law out. She comes in every night to talk to him. So if you're ever tempted to... Oh, you're getting off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled Murder is No Accident. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. Stay tuned to this station for another exciting crime drama. True Detective Mysteries, which immediately follows station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
The Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves, if you can. Where are we going? Why, today we're going to accompany Mr. Harvey Benson through a fateful 24 hours of his life. In a story I call... No One on the Line. Our visit with Harvey Benson begins on a Wednesday evening in summer. Harvey, a self-made businessman, is smoking a cigar and reading the paper while his wife, Linda, reads a book. It's really quite a picture of peaceful domesticity. <coughs> well, that's that. Nothing much in the paper tonight, dear. Too bad your poker game tonight fell through, darling. I know how you look forward to Wednesday evening. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Good book you're reading? Oh, yes. Yes, it's very exciting. It's a new murder mystery everybody's talking about. I would have guessed it was rather dull from the way you've been looking at the same page for ten minutes now. Oh, was I? I must have been wool gathering. Well, I guess I'll go... Oh, phone. I'll get it, Linda. No, sit still, Harvey. You're tired. I'll answer. No, I insist, my dear. <laughs> Hello. 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 That's funny. No one on the line. Well, how strange. Maybe the phone's out of order. No, I heard the click as someone hung up when I answered. Oh, but it's not worth wondering about. It's getting late. What do you say we turn in? And now we join Harvey again at breakfast the following morning. It's getting late, but Harvey lingers over his coffee as if he had the whole day ahead of him. Mmm. Good coffee, this. Pour me some more, will you, darling? Of course, Harvey. But, uh, shouldn't you be leaving for your office, dear? Oh, there's plenty of time. But it's almost 9.30. You seem very anxious to get me to the office, Linda. You're not trying to get rid of me by any chance. Oh, well, of course not. But you said you had an important appointment this morning, oh, and yes, I just thought... Oh, yes, but the fellow will wait. Mmm, my good coffee, this. Harvey. Hmm? Is there anything wrong? Anything wrong? Yes. You seemed a little odd the last day or two, and this morning... And what's the matter with me this morning? Oh, I don't know that anything is, but you do seem a little strange. Strange? In what way, Linda, my dear? Oh, I'm sorry if I've said anything to annoy you, but... Oh, I'll answer it. Still, Linda, I'll answer it. But, Harvey, it's probably... I said I'll answer it. Maybe a call I've been expecting. All right, Harvey. Hello? 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 Strange, there's no one on the line. Same thing that happened last night. Well, how peculiar. Oh, but that phone must be out of order. Yes, I suppose so. And yet I could swear I heard someone hang up when I answered. Oh, you must have been mistaken, darling. I suppose so. You better give the company a ring, Linda. Yes, I will, Harvey, right away. Good, and now I do have to be going. Uh, see you tonight, darling. So now we accompany Harvey Benson to his office. Uh, because we're spending one complete day with him, remember? His office is large and luxurious, reflecting the success Harvey Benson has achieved in the world by hard work and constant vigilance. Once arrived there, Harvey plunges into his work. Until shortly before noon, the sound of the inter-office phone arouses him. Excuse me, Mr. Benson. Oh, uh, yes, Miss Johnson? Uh, Mr. Mungo is here to see you. Shall I send him in? No, ask him to wait. I'd like to see you for a moment first, Miss Johnson. Certainly, Mr. Benson. I'll be right in. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Benson? Uh, sit down, please, Miss Johnson. Yes, sir. I brought my book. You won't need it. I just want to chat with you for a moment. 
I don't understand, Mr. Benson. I just want to talk to you, that's all. I don't believe you and I have ever talked before as person to person, have we? No, sir, we haven't. And you've been with me uh, seven years, isn't it? Seven years next month. Seven years, and we've never talked as equals. But then, I've never needed advice before. You've noticed that I never ask advice, I suppose. Well, yes, I have, Mr. Benson. Make your own decision and act upon it, is my motto. And yet, now I'm going to ask your advice as a woman, not as a secretary. Well, I, I'll i try to be helpful if I can. Good. Now then, picture for yourself a woman who has always been very practical and, uh, well, let's say rather cold. Suddenly this woman becomes dreamy and absent-minded. She stands for minutes at the window, looking at nothing. You speak to her. She doesn't hear you. What would you deduce from that? Why, I'd say she was in love. Excellent. Now, suppose this woman is married. Suppose on several occasions when her husband is in the room... You're following me, aren't you? Oh, yes, sir. Suppose on these occasions the phone rings and this married woman answers. And each time she tells the party calling... He has a wrong number. What then? Why, I suppose that could happen. But now, Miss Johnson, suppose on several occasions the husband answers and the party at the other end hangs up without speaking. Why, it sounds like someone trying to call the wife without her husband knowing about it. Exactly. I felt sure I couldn't be wrong. But it's helpful to have your opinion and back me up. Thank you very much, Miss Johnson. Why, why not at all, Mr. Benson? And now, please send in Mr. Mungo. Yes, sir, right away. Mr. Benson will see you now. Okay, sister. Good morning, Mr. Benson. Come in, Mungo, and close the door. Sure, Mr. Benson. Uh, Sit down. Yeah, sure. You have the information for me? Everything's right here in my report. Good, let's have it. I checked thoroughly on the four names you suggested. And which one was she meeting? I only witnessed one meeting, Mr. Benson. The other time, she gave me the slip. Then you don't know your business. Well, what she did was go to Duke and Baker's department store, take a dress into one of the fitting rooms, and then leave by another door. I couldn't very well follow her there. You should have managed it somehow. I... Oh, never mind that. What did you learn? I'll give you the general report first before I mention a name. All right, do so, but don't dawdle about it. Yes, Mr. Benson. As you'll see, I've called the four individuals you suggested... Parties A, B, C, and D. Yes. Now, party B, Mrs. Benson knew before her marriage, but I found no evidence they have ever communicated since. Yes, go on. Parties C and D, she also knew before she became Mrs. Benson, and from time to time she's seen both of them since. Uh, But those meetings appear to have been accidental. Maybe so. Get on with it. But party A, the architect one, I traced him back to Atlanta. That's his hometown. Uh Yes. He comes from Atlanta, too. Yes, sir. They went to high school together. Were sweet on each other for a year or two. He used to keep her picture in his room. Oh, he did, did he? Yeah. And since he reached New York three months ago, he's phoned her four or five times, according to the switchboard operator at his apartment house. Yes, of course. I remember how excited she was when they met at the Jennings dance two months ago. And three days ago, get this. When Mrs. Benson was downtown shopping, she dropped into Rass for lunch and she ran into him there. No doubt it was a planned meeting. It was very cleverly done. Then they sat for two hours talking and... Well, that meeting was no accident. No, of course it wasn't. Donald Arkwright. Yes, I was sure of it. Yes, sir. But if you want me to keep on following... No, no, no. no. It's time for more decisive steps. I don't understand. You're not supposed to. But if you knew me better, you'd know that the moment... My mind is made up. I act. I see, Mr. Benson. And I propose to act now. So send me your bill and forget the whole affair. Very good, Mr. Benson. I'll forget the whole affair. I'm very good at that. Good day, Mr. Benson. Goodbye. Hello, Donald Arkwright speaking. Oh, hello, Arkwright. This is Harvey Benson. You remember me, Linda's husband? Yes, yes, of course, Mr. Benson. How are you? Fine, thanks. I'm calling because I need an architect. Oh, and uh, you wanted me to... Yes, I'm going to put up a summer place out on Long Island, and I wanted you to draw the plan. Well, that's great, Mr. Benson. Uh, Now, what kind of site have you? I'll do better than tell you. 
I'll show it to you. That is, if you're free to drive out with me this morning. Well, uh, I do have an appointment. Cancel it. This will be well worth your while, I assure you. Well, all right, I will, Mr. Benton. Good. Then I'll pick you up in my car. Say about uh, 45 minutes. All right, that'll be fine. I'll be looking for you. Good. I'll see you shortly, then. We'll have lunch on the way. Miss Johnson. Yes, Mr. Benson? I'm leaving for the day. Cancel any appointments I may have. Now Harvey Benson leaves his office, and we follow him to the garage where he keeps his cars. Well, Joe, you have my car ready? I uh, got it right here, Mr. Benson. But look, uh, don't you want to take the new coupe? No, I said I wanted the sedan. Yeah, sure, but since that little accident Mrs. Benson had, the sedan ain't in too good a shape. It'll do for today. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is it, it ain't safe. I'm not worried. You put in plenty of gas? Yep. By gallons, Mr. Benson. But look now, don't take no chances with them brakes. They don't hold worth a cent. I'm aware of that. And that right-hand door, it sticks something terrible. What of it? What do you care? Oh, I just thought well, I'd Well, don't. <laughs> Golly, he's certainly in a hurry. With them brakes the way they are, he'll kill somebody if he ain't careful. <laughs> Seventh Street, Harvey Benson picks up his passenger, Donald Arkwright. And several hours later, they are far out in a lonely section of Long Island. Just a quarter of a mile more, Arkwright. Up ahead on top of those cliffs. That's where my locks are. I uh, surely appreciate your asking me to prepare the plans, Mr. Benson. Linda suggested you for the job. Said you were a first-rate architect. Well, that's swell of her. I wasn't even sure she'd remember me. Oh, she remembers you very well. I could see how happy she was to meet you at the Jennings party. Yeah, I was tickled that she recognized me. After all, it's six years since we last met. Well, why shouldn't she recognize you? After all, you were sweethearts, weren't you? (laughs) Well, I suppose you could have called us that. We did have some good times together. Riding, hiking, and dancing. Well, it's plain she still thinks a lot of you. Now, there's the sight. Right up ahead. Oh, yeah. Smack on the edge of the cliff, huh? Well, you'll have a nice view all the way across the sound. Eighty feet sheer to the water. Not another house in miles. Look, you can see all the way down to the rocks from the bend in the road here. Well, those waves sure are kicking up a fuss. man wouldn't last long down there. No. No, not long. But you don't have to worry. I'll build you a house that'll never slide over the edge. I'm sure you'll never give me any cause to worry. Well, here we are. Have to pull the car a bit off the road, though, to park. Oh, pretty steep here. Yes. I'll have to put in a retaining wall. Terrace the ground, I guess. There. Ah, I got her off the road. Uh, We'll leave her here. Well, we'll have room to turn around when we're ready to start back. Sure hope you have good brakes. I'd hate to slide over onto those rocks down there. I'd hate to myself. <laughs> oh, want to get out and block the wheels for me? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Door won't open. Seems to be stuck. That's right. That door does open hard. Never mind. I'll get out on this side and block them. Well, say, aren't you forgetting to set the brakes? Not necessary. But this slope is steep here. I know what I'm doing. But look, the car's moving already. It's starting to roll forward. Yes, it is, isn't it? And it'll keep on rolling. Mr. Benson? I, I can't stop your car. The brakes won't hold. Mr. Benson, it's gone over the cliff. It's gone over the cliff! Harvey stands there, watching the car roll toward the edge while his passenger struggles frantically to get out. It only has ten feet to go, five feet, and then on the very edge, the wheels twist against a rock, and the car stops. Harvey runs down the slope and reaches the spot, just as Donald Arkwright manages at last to scramble out. Mr. Benson, you did that on purpose. Yes, Arkwright, I did. You tried to kill me. Exactly, I tried to kill you. But... Why? You... You must be crazy. No, I cried. Only myself. 
If you knew me better, you'd know that no one tries to take anything away from me without suffering for it. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. What's mine is mine. And everything that's mine I keep. You are crazy. I can see it. Get away from me. Take your hands off of me. No, no I'm right. You uh, haven't a chance. Yes. Let me go, I say. I'll, I'll, you'll do nothing. In this world, a man has to be strong and ruthless to stay on top. And I'm... Oh, no. No, you're pushing me toward the edge. Let me go. You're going over, do you hear? You're going over. No, no. For a moment, Harvey stands, glaring down at the white-capped waters that have received his victim. Then he turns to the car. A quick twist of the steering wheel, a push, and the car is gone. Then Harvey turns away back to the road. He walks a mile, two miles, three, until he gets a lift from a driver who takes him to the nearest state police barracks, where State Police Sergeant Thomas hears his story. Mr. Manson, you say you got out of the car to block the wheels, and the car started rolling forward? Yes, Sergeant. Arkwright tried to open the door, but it stuck. The car was at the edge by the time he got it open. He he jumped, but he was too late. I see. All right, I have the details straight. Oh, it was horrible, Sergeant. He was my friend. There was nothing I could do to help. Nothing. Yes, I understand, Mr. Benson. You were quite alone at the time? No witnesses? No, we were miles from the nearest house. Why do you ask? Well, because there's a Boy Scout camp about a mile from there, Mr. Benson. I thought some of the boys might have been within sight. Oh, no, no. There wasn't anyone in sight. I see. Well, I guess that's all, Mr. Benson. It's just about dark now, so we probably won't recover the body before tomorrow. I'll notify you the minute we do, so you can identify your friend. And so, late in the evening, Harvey returns home to find Linda waiting for him anxiously. Is that you, Harvey? Yes, my dear, it is. Well, I waited dinner as long as I could, and then I went ahead and ate. Shall I fix you something now? No, thank you. I've eaten. Let's sit down, Linda. I'd like to talk to you. Why, why, of course, Harvey. Do you have the phone fixed? The phone? Oh, no. I I called the company, but they said there was nothing wrong with it. I see. Well, they were quite right. I discovered that the trouble was from another source. I don't think I understand you, Harvey. Linda, my dear, do you consider me a fool? What? Well, of course not. Don't you suppose that I've known what was going on for some days now? Just what do you mean, Harvey? When a woman suddenly takes to mooning around the house, staring out the window, not answering when she's spoken to, the signs are unmistakable. Are you speaking about me, Harvey? And when that same woman gets several phone calls while her husband is in the room and each time tells the caller, I'm afraid you have the wrong number. There's no one here by that name. It would be a very stupid husband indeed who failed to notice. Yes. Yes, I suppose it was. But the crowning touch was those calls when there was no one on the line. One several days ago, one last night, and now one this morning. But Harvey... I I... answer and there's no one on the line. But who's there when you answer? That's what I want to know, Linda. Well, what have you to say? There isn't much I can say, Harvey. Oh, then you admit it. Those calls were from someone I wasn't supposed to know about. Someone you're in love with. Yes. Someone I'm in love with. Someone I've been trying to bring myself to tell you about. Someone you've been meeting at Tawdry Rendezvous. Nothing of the kind. We've met, yes. But they've been perfectly innocent meetings, lunch, and a walk in the park. Nothing worse than that. (laughs) You're a fool to expect me to believe that. Yes, I, I suppose I am. And yet it's the truth. Well, it doesn't matter. But may I inquire what your plans are? I want a divorce, Harvey. So that you can marry this unknown who telephones you and then hangs up when I answer. Yes. And I'm sorry that ever happened. It was my fault. I suggested it. You see, I was afraid of you, Harvey. Afraid? Of me? Of your loving husband? I was. But I'm not anymore. I only want to be free of you. Free to marry the man I really love. Very interesting, my dear. But slightly impractical. 
Do you really think I'd let anyone take you away from me? I'm afraid you have no choice. Well, you're wrong. It's you who have no choice. You're penniless, Linda. You have no family, no money, no training. You have only me. What are you trying to say? I'm just leading up to a story I have to tell you, Linda. A very tragic story which occurred only this afternoon. And so Harvey tells Linda the story of the afternoon's uh, events. Well, not the true story, of course. But she guesses the truth as he speaks and recoils in horror when he is finished. Oh, you've killed him. You deliberately murdered him. Nonsense. It was a tragic accident. The police have already exonerated him. You me. killed him? Oh, no. No, I don't believe you. You're just trying to torture me. You know me better than that. You know that what I have, I keep at any cost. Then you did kill him. You're a murderer. Don't be hysterical, my dear. I shall be forced to discipline you. I'm going to the police. I'm going to tell them the truth. Linda, come back here. No, no, you can't stop Linda, me. Linda, come back. Come back, I say. Linda is gone before Harvey can get to the door. Harvey pauses, irresolute. Then he shrugs, turns back, sits down, lights a cigar. Hmm. Good cigar. I must remember to order another box. And so, Linda, you've rushed off to the police. In your heart of hearts, you hope that I'm lying. Your first move will be to rush to a telephone. You put a nickel and dial with trembling fingers. You'll hear the phone at the other end ring. And with beating heart, you'll wait. Hoping against hope that Donald Arkwright will answer. <laughs> but he won't. And then you'll know I've told the truth. Then... Hmm. Will you come back first? Or will you go on to the police? I rather think you'll go to the police. For you are excited just now. And you'll return with a detective or two. I shall have to explain to them... Tell them of your hysterical spells. Then you and I will be left alone. And in a day or two, I think we'll leave on a little trip. Yes, up to my hunting lodge, where we can be alone there. And we'll get to know each other well again. Very well. And in the future... Ah, oh, the bell. So you're back already, Linda. <laughs> I guessed wrong. Just a moment, my dear. I'm coming. Harvey crosses to the door, opens it, and recoils in surprise. Good evening, Mr. Benson. Well, if it isn't Sergeant Thomas. And I see my wife is with you. Yes, we met in the lobby. She came back up with me. I'd like to come in. Why, of course. After you, Mrs. Benson. These other men will wait out here. Thank you, Sergeant. And now do sit down, Linda. And you too, Sergeant. Oh, uh, cigar. No, thanks. We might as well waste no time, Mr. Fenton. We've recovered your friend's body. Already? But surely you didn't come here to tell me that. They know you killed him, Harvey. They know. Please, Linda. You must forgive my wife, Sergeant. She's overwrought. I, I suppose she's been babbling some nonsense rather to you. She told me a story. I don't think it's nonsense. Of course it is. She's hysterical. But there were witnesses, Harvey. There were witnesses. What? That's absurd. There was no one within miles. Except a camp of boy scouts. Four of them with a scoutmaster were lying in the grass half a mile away when you drove up. They were watching for birds with field glasses. You're lying. And with natural curiosity, they turned their glasses on you. They saw your struggle on the cliff. No, no. You're lying. They went to another police barrack to report or I'd have been here sooner. Here are copies of the affidavits they signed. Affidavit? Yeah. Look him over. Affidavit. Five of them. Yes, they seem to be in order. So, there were witnesses. I dare say their evidence is unshakable. You haven't a chance, Benson. Well, those men outside of city detectives, are you going to come quietly? Yes. Why not? What else? Is there to do? You're caught, Harvey, and I'm glad, glad. Yes, I'm caught. 
But precious little good that'll do you, Linda, because he's dead. Do you hear? Donald Arkwright is dead. Donald Arkwright? Yes. You wonder how I knew it was he, don't you? Well, I hired a private detective. Oh. And he discovered that Arkwright had been phoning you. That you'd been slipping away to meet him. He managed to follow you to one of those innocent luncheons. That luncheon? But that meeting was an accident. A very clever accident. But not clever enough to save Arkwright because he's dead, do you hear? And no matter what happens to me, I've beaten you. You're insane. You always have been with your lust for power. And I never guessed it till now. Fine words. But they won't change the fact that your beloved is dead and that I've taken him from you. You killed Donald Arkwright because you thought I was in love with him. <laughs> You've killed the wrong man. No, I didn't. It was Arkwright. I know it. Oh, no. Don Arkwright was just an old friend. The man I love is someone you've never met, whose name I see now you don't even know. I don't believe you. You've committed murder and you've been caught, and all for nothing. No. And that knowledge is worse to you than any punishment the law can inflict. You're lying. It was Arkwright who phoned and hung up when I answered. I tell you it was. It couldn't have been anybody else. It... No. No. Better answer it, Mrs. Benson. No, I'll answer it. Hello? 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 Serious traveler again. Well, that was rather a hectic 24 hours for Harvey Benson, wasn't it? He shouldn't have been quite so sure of himself. It never pays. Those phone calls now. If you get any calls and find there's no one on the line, uh, don't be quite as hasty as he was. You might get into a bad jam. I know someone else who didn't wait to make sure of his facts, and he... Oh, you're getting off here. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Ted Osborne, Mary Jane Higby, Jack Manning, and James Van Dyke. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled Death Whispers Softly. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. What could have been in the little black box that led intelligence men, Nazi agents, and Mike Waring, the Falcon on a chase of mystery and intrigue over two continents. You'll learn the answer when you hear Death Comes in Boxes, this Tuesday night's mystery on the adventures of the Falcon. Tune in Tuesday for The Falcon. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Mysterious Traveler.
This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves, if you can. Where are we going? We're going to call on Edward Farrington and his three sisters. A little family of four who love each other devotedly. And whose story I call... The Symphony of Death. Edward Farrington and his sisters live by themselves in a large gloomy old house on the outskirts of Boston. It is evening, and Edward is on his way home when his attention is attracted by a small establishment which is advertising a close-out sale. An economical and foresighted man, Edward stops his car and enters the dimly lighted shop. Good evening, sir. May I serve you? I'm not sure. I saw your sign, and it occurred to me that by purchasing now, something I'm sure to need sooner or later, I might save a substantial sum. You are very foresighted, sir. Now, here is a design I can recommend unreservedly. A simple white column, yet cut from the finest Carrara marble. I see. The angel on top is of a single piece with a shaft. It can never be dislodged or separated. In every inch, in every line, it expresses dignified grief. Yes, I agree with you, but I'm afraid it's too expensive. What are these stones here in the corner? These? Uh, they are our simplest design. Polished granite cubes with just enough room for the name and the date. They are excellent memorials, but I am sure in the long run you will get greater satisfaction from something more appealing to the eye. No, no, I think these will do excellently. Yes, they're just what I had in mind. I'm particularly pleased by the fact that they're all alike. I see. You wish all four of them, then? No, not four, just three. Three will quite prepare me for all eventualities. Will you be able to store them for me until they're needed? Yes, we can store them at our main warehouse, if you wish. Excellent. I suppose I might as well give you the inscriptions to be carved on them while I'm here. You can leave room for the dates to be added. Of course, sir. Then if you'll just take this down. In loving memory of Florence... Sister of Edward Farrington. Yes, sir. In loving memory of Martha, sister of Edward Farrington. In loving memory of Emily, sister of Edward Farrington. Edward, is that you? Yes, Emily. Oh. You're all wet. Yes, it's beginning to rain. Let me help you with your coat, Edward. I'll hang it up for you. Now, Emily, please don't fuss over me this way. It makes me nervous to be poured at. But I just want to help you with your coat. I can hang it up by myself. Emily, is that Edward? Oh, Edward, you're late. We were worried about you. I'm here, and I'm perfectly all right, Florence, as you can see. Now, is dinner ready? Oh, yes, Edward. Martha has everything ready. Martha, Edward's home. What? Oh, oh, it's you, Edward. We were worried about you. Martha, I've told you not to worry if I'm a few minutes late. Well, I suppose we just can't help it, Edward. Now we'll eat. And perhaps after dinner you will play the piano for us. Oh, will you, Edward? Please, say yes. Please, Edward. Well, we'll see. I really should work on my symphony tonight, but perhaps I can play for a few minutes after dinner. And so, after dinner, Edward played for his sisters on the great piano in the library. Emily and Florence crowded close to him as he played, and Martha, busy with her knitting, sat and watched them with fond gaze. That was lovely, Edward. Please play some more. Yes. Something we can sing. Well, all right. Just one more and that's all.
Emily, it's just thunder. You mustn't jump like that. It can't hurt you. Uh, I know, but I, I can't help it. I like thunderstorms. I like to watch the lightning. I think that's enough for tonight. Now off to bed, both of you. All right. Good night, Edward. Good night, Edward. Good night, Emily, Florence. Well, I suppose I might as well go to bed myself. No, Martha, don't go yet. I uh, want to talk to you. To me? Yes. What about Edward? How old are you? How old? I'm 35. Oh, no. Why be silly about it? I'm 37. <laughs> you ought to get married. You still could. And you owe it to yourself. I shall never marry, Edward. I promised Father that I'd look after things and keep the four of us together as long as we live. And I will. As long as we live. But perhaps we'd be better off if we weren't together. You can't mean that. But I do. I need solitude in which to finish my book and my symphony. It's very distracting, you know, to have the three of you constantly hovering about me. You're just feeling blue tonight. You wouldn't be happy without us any more than we would be without you. No, we'll all be together, the four of us, as long as we all live. Well, now I'm going to bed. Good night, Edward, dear. Good night, Martha. We'll all be together, the four of us, as long as we live. As long as we all live. In the morning, it was still raining. After breakfast, Edward shut himself in the library to continue work on his symphony. Doesn't Edward play well, Emily? Edward's a wonderful player. Let's listen a minute before we go upstairs. Do you think he'd really mind if we went in? If we just sat very quiet? I don't think so. We'll be very quiet. Uh, who's there? Oh, it's you two. We're sorry, Edward. We didn't mean to disturb you. We'll go right away. No, you don't have to go. You mean we can stay, Edward? For a minute. I'm going to stop for a smoke. I'll bring you the cigarette. Oh, the cigar box is empty. Empty? Why, I was positive I had plenty of cigarettes. That's why I didn't buy any yesterday. You did have a lot yesterday. I saw them. Well, they're gone now. And I suppose I'll have to drive down the hill to the drugstore and get some more. And that will mean I'll get nothing done this morning. Nothing whatever. I wish I had someone I could send for them. Edward, let me go for you. In this rain? Why, you'd get soaking wet, Florence. Well, I could take the car. Take the car in weather like this? But I'm a good driver, Edward. You once said so yourself. And I have a driver's license. You know I have. You helped me get it. Yes, that's true. Well, but... I'd be very careful, Edward. Well, you must promise to drive very slowly down the hill to town. Oh, I will, Edward. All right, then, Florence. Here's the key to the car. The old car, of course. Now be very careful. Oh, I will. I promise I will. May I stay and listen until Florence comes back? Well, I suppose so, seeing you're here already. You don't like us to be around, do you? Sometimes I think you don't like us at all anymore. Oh, that's nonsense. It's just that I'm trying to get a great piece of music written. And you keep disturbing me. Oh, <laughs> There goes Florence in the car now. She's going fast. Florence likes to go fast. And then step on the brakes. She promised to be careful. I know, but she forgets. Well, I'm sure she'll be all right. Now I must get to work. Well, I'm perfectly comfortable, Martha. I don't need a jacket. You mustn't take chances. Here, put it on. Oh, all right. Emily, where's Florence? Is she up there? Oh, no. 
She's gone to get Edward some cigarettes. Gone out? In this rain? Edward let her take the car. Edward, you didn't. Martha, please don't get excited. She can drive and she promised to be careful. But you promised never to let her drive alone. You know how she drives unless someone's with her. Really, she's a better driver than you think. There's nothing to be alarmed about. She'll be back any minute and then... I'll answer it. No, it's probably for me. I'll answer it. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Farrington. Uh, the police. Edward, what is it? Hush, Martha. Uh, uh, what, what about my sister? She did what? All right. Yes, yes, of course. I'll be right down. Edward, what is it? What's happened to Florence? Martha, we must all be very calm. Florence has had a terrible accident. Oh, no. The brakes of the car apparently gave way at the bottom of the hill. Florence ran off the curb and crashed into the rocks there. She was killed instantly. The official investigation into poor Florence's death established only the fact that the brakes had failed. But the brakes had only been checked the day before, as Edward proved to the police. Accordingly, they ascribed death to an unfortunate mechanical failure and closed the case. Edward, however, could not dismiss it from his mind so easily. Edward, you can't go on like this day after day, brooding about poor Florence's death. Oh, my dear, I blame myself for it if I hadn't better take the car. I know, Edward. Why don't you try to work on your symphony? It'll help take your mind off, Florence. No, no, I can't possibly do any work on that yet for a while. No, but I have another notion. I think I'd like to write our family history. Our family history? Yes, and it seems to me that once in Mother's old trunk in the attic, I saw a lot of letters that were written to her by relatives. Are they still there? Why, yes, they are. Now, I'd like to look them over. They might help me get started on my history. Will you show me where they are, Martha? Why, yes, of course. We'll go up to the attic and I'll get them out for you right after lunch. Here are the letters, Edward. Mother wrote a lot of letters those last few years. After the doctor said she must never leave the house. Yes, I remember. How quiet and dark it is up here in the attic. We used to play hide-and-go-seek here, the four of us. Yes. Until Mother died. I've often wondered about that. She uh, fell from one of these attic windows, I remember. She was leaning out, looking at the river, and uh, she slipped. Yes. It was that window there. The one looking down into the courtyard. I'd like to look at it. Oh, the catch is stuck. Will you help me open it, Martha? Well, all right. Uh, there. It's almost 50 feet down to the courtyard. She was killed instantly, wasn't she? Yes. But let's close it now. In a moment. Martha, did Mother really slip and fall, or did she throw herself out? What makes you ask that? I was only eight at the time, but it seems to me Mother was wandering badly in her mind there at the end. And then I recollect hearing Father say something about an asylum to Uncle George. Edward, you mustn't say that ever again. It would terrify Emily. But it's true, isn't it? Yes, it's true. Poor Mother. It's strange you calling her mother because she wasn't really your mother. No, but I always think of her as mother. I was only two when father married her. Poor creature. Let's believe that she slipped. It would be easy to slip from this window, wouldn't it? Well, the sill isn't very low. Yes, but lean out a little farther and see how easy it would be. No, a little farther. You see how overbalanced one becomes? Yes, yes, you're right. Now, help me back, Edward. Of course. Martha, catch yourself. Martha! <laughs> Poor Martha's tragic death, coming so soon after Florence's, was a great shock to Emily and Edward. But Edward uh, recovered from the tragedy somehow after a few weeks, and as though determined not to let it upset him, spent many hours a day at his beloved piano, working on his projected masterpiece. Oh, Edward, that was 
was wonderful. You played just like you used to. Before Florence and Martha died. Yes, I'm getting my old touch back. You don't mind my coming in to listen, do you? Not today. But, Emily, you have been disturbing me these last few weeks. Must you follow me around all the time? But, Edward, you know how much I like to be near you. And now that that Florence and Martha are gone, I haven't anyone else to talk to. Yes, I know that, but I can't get any work done unless I'm left in peace. I won't bother you anymore, I promise. You know, I do miss Florence and Martha. Of course you do. But just the same, it's been awfully nice having you all to myself since they went. I'm afraid it's very lonely for you. Oh, no, it isn't. I like it. Yes, but I think we'll have to get a housekeeper. She'd be company for you and she'd look after things. In fact, I'm going into town to interview a housekeeper today, a Mrs. McDonald. You'd like to go with me, wouldn't you? Oh, yes, Edward. We'll take the car and have a nice drive at the same time. Oh, that'll be fun. Now, how would you like to go out and get the car started for me? Get the car started? Yes, I have to tend to a few things before we go, and the motor needs to warm up. It's not working very well. Oh, Edward, do you think I could start it? Of course you could. Just turn on the switch and step on the starter, and then let it run until it's good and warm. All right, Edward. May I have the key? Yes. Here you are. Now, this is the ignition key. Mm-hmm. And use the little side door to get in. I'll unlock the big doors when I come out. Uh, I can pretend I'm driving it. Will you be long? No, just sit in the car and wait until I come. All right, Edward. <laughs> Here I am, Emily. I took longer than I expected. I hope you haven't been sitting here with a motor running all this time. Emily! Emily! With Emily's unfortunate death from carbon monoxide poisoning, Edward Farrington was left quite alone in the great old house. His neighbors saw little of him though they could hear him at his piano for many hours each day. They knew, however, that a week after Emily's funeral, he hired a housekeeper, Mrs. McDonald, to take charge of the house for him. Now, Mrs. McDonald, this is your first day, and before you start, I'd like to explain a few things to you. Of course, Mr. Farrington. As you know, I've suffered the tragic loss of all my sisters in the past few months. Oh, yes, sir, a great sorrow it must have been. But they do say tragedies come in threes. Indeed, they seem to. But I'm sure I'll be quite comfortable now with you to look after me. I surely hope so, sir. I'm certain of it. Now, uh, I'm a rather moody man, and I'm working upon some music for which I have great hopes. Yes, sir. Above all else, I wish to be left alone. I do not want to be disturbed. Is that understood? Quite, Mr. Farrington. You may call me at mealtimes. At all other times, I prefer that you do not even enter this part of the house. I understand. Good. That's all, I think. Just put up with my little oddities and we'll get along very well. Yes, sir. Then uh, I'll see about the ordering for dinner now, sir, if you'll excuse me. Now, let me see. The second movement needs touching up, so perhaps I'd better... What is it, Mrs. McDonald? I thought I said I was never to be disturbed. I'm very sorry, sir, but there's a gentleman come to see you. It's Detective Barnes, sir, from the police. From the police? Am I to be bothered with more stupid questions? Well, show him in. I suppose I must see him. Yes, sir. Will you go in, sir? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Farrington. You remember me, I think. Yes, yes, Mr. Barnes, I remember you. In view of the number of ridiculous and unnecessary questions you asked me after the deaths of my poor sisters, I have good reason to remember you. I've come to ask you more questions, Mr. Farrington. Tell me, did your sister Emily have a driver's license? I I really don't know, and I don't care. You should care. Listen to me. First, your sister Florence died in an auto accident when brakes that had just been inspected failed to work. Even modern automobiles aren't proof against mechanical failure. Then Martha died in a fall from an attic window. 
Her body landed in the courtyard a full six feet from the wall of well, the house. Well, what of that? It was much too far away for her to strike. Unless she leaped or was pushed. And you have said she didn't leap. I repeated she did not leap. She fell. Perhaps. Now we come to Emily. She died of carbon monoxide poisoning in a closed garage. Well? You have said it happened because she went to get the car out to drive you downtown. That was your statement under oath. And a perfectly accurate statement. But I have just learned from the neighbors that Emily didn't know how to drive a car. Why, well, of course she could. Furthermore, they say her mental condition was such she could never learn to drive. Well, perfectly absurd. Did she have a driver's license? I repeat, I do not know. Because if she didn't, your statement is false. And if any part of your statement proves false, Mr. Farrington, I trust I make my meaning clear. Mr. Barnes, you can't show one jot of evidence to back up your ridiculous suspicions. Any court in the land would laugh at you for them. I can show no direct evidence. But there is such a thing as circumstantial evidence. You haven't even any circumstantial evidence. I have a world of it. The brakes on your car fail, and you are an amateur mechanic. Well? Martha's body falling so far from the building that she must have been pushed. Mere conjecture. Finally, Emily dying in a car she couldn't drive. Though you have said she was going to drive you downtown. And she was. You've done nothing but build a tissue of fantastic suspicions. A jury will take them more seriously. Especially when they learn that just before the first death, you bought three tombstones. One for each of your sisters. That shows what you were planning. It shows nothing. It was a sale. I was merely being foresighted. Then, Mr. Farrington, why didn't you buy four stones? One for each of you. I refuse to discuss the point. There was no reason for me to kill my sisters. No normal reason, perhaps. Though now that you are alone, you are living very comfortably on the income from your father's estate. Indeed. Furthermore, Mr. Farrington, I have checked on your family history. I know the truth about your unfortunate mother. Well... The fact concerning her might cause the jury to look differently upon you. It might influence the jury to bring in a verdict of murder while of unsound mind. Get out. Get out of this house, do you hear? You can prove nothing. Nothing whatsoever. All right, Mr. Farrington. I'm going. But I'll be back. Uh, no, wait. Uh, I'm ill. Help me, I... Here, here, sit here. That's it. it it's my heart. There's medicine in my desk drawer. There. A, a small bottle. In the desk here? Yes. Here's a blue bottle. Is this it? Yes. Hurry. There's water in the thermos jug. Yes, I have it. Here's the water and the pill. Swallow it. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, that's better. The pain is going away. Then, Mr. Farrington, I'll be on my way. I warn you, I'm going to check as to whether Emily had a driver's license. Today is Sunday, so it may take me a few hours. But if I find she had no license, I'm going to return with a warrant for your arrest. No. There's no need for that. Of course, the poor simpleton had no driver's license. I should have thought of that. I should have thought of that. Then you admit you killed her. Certainly I did. Why shouldn't I? She annoyed me. Me, a genius. I'm afraid a jury won't care whether you're a genius or not, Mr. Farrington. Do you suppose I care what a jury thinks? A genius is not answerable to the laws that bind other people. The law does not agree with you. The law? What do I care for the law? You think you've trapped me, don't you? But you haven't. You hear you haven't. I think I have, Mr. Farrington. You fool. No one is going to put Edward Farrington in an asylum. No one. In a minute, I'll be beyond your reach. What do you mean? I mean that tablet you so obligingly got for me is a deadly poison. Poison that I bought months ago. You and your circumstantial evidence. You're never going to get a chance to use... Never get a chance to blacken my name. But, but Detective Barnes... Yes, what is it? Uh, promise me one thing. Promise me, you won't let them bury me with my sisters. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little visit with Edward Farrington and his three loving sisters? 
Uh, you know, perhaps Edward made a mistake after all when he didn't buy a, a fourth tombstone. Uh, by the way, do you live in a gloomy old house with three sisters who love you so much you can't bear to have them near you? Well, if you do, I'd advise you not to be too drastic with them. You might find yourself buried right beside them, as Edward was. I know another man who... Oh, you're getting off here. Well, I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. But before we tell you of next week's exciting story, here is Maurice Tarplin, the mysterious traveler himself, with a brief but vital message from your government. You all know that the stories we tell on this program are just stories, designed to entertain you, but not to be taken too seriously. Well, what I have to say now, however, is not a story, and is deadly serious. All over the world, people are starving. The United States and other food-producing nations are fighting a battle against famine. To win, food stocks must be conserved. You can help conserve them by canning and preserving food for your own use. If you have a victory garden, put up as much as possible from it. When your local markets feature an abundance of fruits or vegetables suitable for home preservation, can or preserve a winter's supply and release that much commercially canned food for the starving. Conserve your sugar for canning purposes. Follow the wartime rule of one pound of sugar to four quarts of finished fruit. And be sure to use only safe, tested methods. If you want information on any phase of home food preservation, write to the United States Department of Agriculture, Washington 25, D.C. Thank you, Maurice Tarplin. In addition to Maurice Toplin, today's cast included Eric Dressler, Hester Sondergaard, Ann Tiemann, Inga Adams, and Martin Wolfson. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these mutual stations to a tale titled, As I Lie Dying. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by the Mutual Network from our New York studios. Russ Dunbar speaking. Stay tuned to this station for another exciting crime drama, True Detective Mysteries, which immediately follows station identification. This is the Mutual... Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves. If you can. Where are we going? Why, tonight we're going on a little excursion into the realm of pure imagination. You've all heard the old saying, believe in a thing enough and it'll come true. Well, suppose, just suppose many people came to believe in something, something that couldn't possibly be real. Such as an artificial monster growing in a scientist's laboratory. What would happen? Well, if you want to know what might happen, uh, listen to the story I call... If You Believe. My story begins in a rambling old house deep in the woods. In a homemade laboratory, gray-haired Professor Jonathan Davis is peering eagerly into a large glass container that holds an odd, transparent, jelly-like substance. Ellen! Oh, Ellen! 
Yes, Dad? Ellen, come quick. I'm coming, dear. What is it? Ellen, look. I think... I think I've succeeded, have I? Oh, Dad. You look. Your eyes are better than mine. Yes, yes. Isn't there movement in the protoplasm this time? Isn't it stirring J- just a little? No, Dad. There isn't any movement. No? You're positive, Ellen? I, I was sure I saw some sign of light. I'm quite positive, Dad. Now, please, won't you admit that what you're trying to do is impossible? No, Ellen. No, I will succeed. I know it. Now, come. We've got to try another feeding mixture. If you hand me the saline solution and the dextrose, now I'll begin again. But while Professor Davis labored in his lonely seclusion to make a lifelong dream come true, something that was to affect him vitally was happening in the editorial room of the largest newspaper in the nearby city. Steady desk, Benson speaking. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. McGuire. Yes? Well, yes, sure, I've been reading Dan Duncan's special features. I edit them. I see. You don't think they've been colorful enough lately, huh? Well, to tell the truth, I agree with you. I've been meaning to speak to him about it. Yes. Sure, I'll do it now. He just came in. Right. Right. Good night, Mr. McGuire. Hey, Dan. Yeah, Joe. What cooks? The big boss just phoned down. What's he want? Well, frankly, he thinks you're slipping. McGuire thinks I'm slipping. Well, I like that. That's what he said. And I've done everything to get hot material except to go out and commit a murder myself. Well, maybe he's tired of murders. You want to know why you don't turn up something like that haunted house story you did last spring? Why I don't. <laughs> that was a good story, wasn't it? It was on it. Yeah. Especially the description of the way the ghost of the drowned girl walked around the house leaving wet spots where it stepped. You know, I caught a heck of a cold walking around in wet socks to make those footmarks. No more than you deserve for faking a story. You're faking a story. Listen, Benson, any time a million readers believe a story, it's true. And they believed in that ghost. Every one of them. I'm not saying they didn't, but McGuire wants another story just as good. i got a good mind to tell the old buzzer to fly a kite. Another story like... Hey. Huh? What is it? I think I got it. Hey, Ted. Ted Jones. Oh, yeah, Dan? Front and center. Oh. Yeah, what is it, Dan? All right, dump your camera on the desk and sit. Okay. Now, tell me, what was that story you told me last week about some professor living up in the woods back at town, never coming out of his private lab? Oh, you mean uh, Professor Davis? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Well, what about him? There was a fuss over something he said in a lecture one day, wasn't there? A fuss? Oh, it was more like an explosion. Hey, wait a minute. I remember that case. Professor claimed he could create an artificial man, wasn't that it? No, 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 no. He said that an artificial man might be produced someday. Uh, might be. Well, the paper said he claimed he could create one. Yeah, I know. Well, it made a good story, didn't it? And drove Professor Davis out of the university into retirement. Oh, the school didn't like the publicity. Water under the bridge, kid. Anyway, here's the old professor working away secretly for the last five years. All alone. No, no, he, he wasn't all alone. His daughter Ellen's with him. How old is she? Oh, she was 15 then, so... She's 20 now. Good looker? Well, I was in Professor Davis's class. I remember as a, well, as a skinny brat with uh, yellow hair. Yeah, good, a blonde. So here's the prof secretly working with his beautiful blonde daughter at what? I'll bite. What? Why, he's trying to prove he was right. He's trying to create a, an artificial man. Say, you've got something there. Oh, no, wait a minute. You don't know Professor Davis is trying to create artificial life. Well, we soon will. You know where his hideout is, don't you? Yeah. All right, then grab your camera. Let's get going. Oh, no, wait a minute, Dan. Suppose you find Professor Davis is... Ah, forget it. Benson, save me two columns. Come on, Ted. We're on our way. There, Ellen. It's done. Now we must warm it ever so gently. It'll stay at blood heat until morning. And then, Ellen... Oh, I hope so, Dad. But, darling, if you fail again, won't you please promise me to stop trying to create this artificial protoplasm? Well, we'll talk about that in the morning. Now, uh... Oh, 
who could that be? I'll go see that. Yes? I'm Ted Jones, Miss Davis. I don't suppose you remember me. Ted Jones? Oh, you were one of Father's students, weren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm a newspaper photographer now. Uh, Could we come in? I have a friend with me, a reporter. Helen, who is it? Uh, Newspaper men, Dad, they want to see you. Newspaper men, don't let them in. Send them away. All right, come now, Professor. We just want to ask you a couple of questions, and uh, but we can talk better inside, so... Uh, There. Now we can talk like friends. Hey, but, Dan, we weren't invited in. How dare you force your way in here? Get out, both of you. Please go. Dan, come on. Professor Davis doesn't want to talk to us. Keep your shirt on, Ted. Just a couple of questions, Professor. Now, isn't it true that hidden away here, you're creating artificial life? I won't answer your questions. You just print more lies and ruin everything I'm trying to do. Then you are creating artificial life, huh? Young man, Tell I... me how far you've got. You figuring on springing an artificial man on us one of these days? You fools. While I still struggle to create synthetic protoplasm, you talk of artificial men. Go, go before I throw you out. Please go, please. Come on, Dan, we're leaving. Okay, we're going. Thanks for the interview, Professor. Read all about it in tomorrow's curse. The imbeciles. What do they know of science? All they want is to cheapen my work. Make it a sensation for the headlines. Oh, please, Father, you must get control of yourself. They've gone now. Yes, yes, they are. Well, they shan't interfere with my work. Well, come, we must adjust the heat. Ellen. Ellen. Yes, Dad, what is it? Ellen, the mixture's moving. This time I'm sure of it. The protoplasm. It, it's alive. <laughs> Say, Dan, this is something. Behind bolted doors deep in the woods, Professor Jonathan Davis toils night and day to create the world's first synthetic man. In a great vat lies a strange caricature of humanity. It has a head, arms, legs, a body, all of them fashioned of a pale green substance like gelatin. Nice touch, huh? Day by day, life stirs more strongly in this grotesque creation of science. Someday it may breathe, walk, eat. Now look, Dan, aren't you going pretty strong? Ah, forget it. The old man wants a story, doesn't he? Besides, the professor really is working on synthetic protoplasm. Maybe he has got a pale green monster in his bathtub. How do I know? Okay, Dan, but if you're faking this story, I know nothing about it. Faking it? You know I never fake stories. Okay, We'll set this up and put it in the press wires. By noon tomorrow, 40 million people will be believing in Professor Davis' artificial monster. By noon tomorrow, I'll be believing in it myself. People read the story and marveled and believed. While in the laboratory, hidden in the woods. Oh, look. This time, this time it is alive. It is. There can be no doubt of it. The liquid is certainly moving, Dad. Yes, see? And the protoplasm is breathing. Listen. You can hear it. I've created artificial life, Ellen. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid so, Dad. Afraid so? What do you mean? I'd like to see their faces down at the university when they hear of this. It's grown since last night. Yes, it has. The cells are multiplying. Like true protoplasm. That's why I transferred it to this gas tank. Now I'm at that salt, acid, phosphorus. Oh, that, that must be grocery boy. Excuse me, Dad. Yes? Oh, you... Uh, Miss Davis, I hope that you'll let me apologize. We have nothing to say to you. Please don't shut the door before I explain. Explain? There's nothing to explain. You force your way in here. I came to apologize for that, is it? Well, have you seen the morning papers? We're not interested in the papers. I'm afraid you'll be interested in this one. Look. Oh, how outrageous. That story of your father creating an artificial man is in every paper in the country, and I... Well, I feel I'm to blame, and... I want to make up for it. Can I come in so we can talk? I guess you'd better, Mr. Jones. But Dad mustn't see this paper. Oh, no, no, of course not. 
But won't he recognize me? No, I don't think so. He's very nearsighted. I'll just tell him that you used to be one of his students. And if you'll tell me the real truth, I'll try to get the paper to understand that Dan Duncan just made up his story. Who is it, Ellen? Uh, it, it's Ted Jones, Dad, one of your former students. He, he called to say hello. Jones, eh? Jones? Yes. Ted Jones? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Organic chemistry, wasn't it, Joe? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> You're the one who kept breaking things. <laughs> oh, Jones, I-, I have something here you'd be very interested in. Come and see. Yes, sir. Look. That's stuff in the tank. It could be alive. Yeah. It is alive. Synthetic protoplasm, my boy, the first ever created... Breathing, yes, and it's also growing. Life becomes stronger in it by the moment. It, it's changing color, Dad. It's becoming a pale green. Yes, it's growing fast. Very fast. I never dreamed of success would come Hello, so completely. Hi, it's Dan. I thought I'd find you here. Why, Dan. Dan Duncan himself. Hiya, Professor. What do you want here? Oh, just a few pictures. Shot of you in your lab, so far. You have the nerve to come here after what you've done. What I've done? You haven't seen anything yet. You and your father are big news now. You're going to be bigger. Dan, you'd better go. Better go? I don't follow you, kid. I said you'd better go. There isn't any story here for you. No story? Hey, what's eating you? Aren't you here to get a follow-up? No, I came here to get the truth. Something you wouldn't be interested in. Hey, what kind of talk is that? Are you going to go or will I have to throw you out? Throw me out? Now listen, kid. You want me to try it? All right, I will. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going. Take your hands off but don't think you can get away with this. You're fired. And that's all right with me. As for you, Professor, you and your artificial man are going to be so well-known in a day or two, you'll be getting offers from Hollywood. And so, with each edition of the papers, the headlines grew bigger. Telegraph wires carried editorials condemning Professor Davis. Is it a man or is it a monster Professor Davis has created? By his refusal to answer questions, the professor led us to suspect that this created... Radio commentators spread the story to still more listening millions. A strange substance like pale green gelatin. Now it moves and stirs in its confinement, seeking to escape. This strange and speakers denounced Professor Davis. And I ask you, can science be permitted to venture into these forbidden realms unchecked? Who knows what horror may emerge from the laboratory if we are not careful? This mad thing must be stopped. Stop! Who is this? Oh, it's me, Ted. Oh. But, Ted, did you have any trouble? No, no, I got the medicine for your father, all right, and I I brought the evening papers, too. What do they say? They're pretty bad. They're all using Duncan's story, and he shot the works. Ted, how can he do such a thing? Well, he's a very plausible writer. He has a knack for making people believe him. If anybody accuses him of lying, he'll just say that he was misled by your father. I see. I'm sorry you lost your job trying to help us. That doesn't matter. I was about ready to quit anyway. How... How is your father now? He seems to be sleeping quietly. Well, I'm sticking around until he's all right again. Well, you don't have to do that, Ted. I'll make up. If I hadn't gotten into that fight with Duncan, your father might not have had his stroke. No, it was just the excitement. It's his heart, but I know how to take care of him. But, Ted, I... I'm frightened. About your father? No. No, about it... The protoplasm. Oh. It's changed just since this morning. It's changed? But how? It's grown and... Well, come on, see for yourself. All right. Oh, this seems to be taking on shape. Yes, and it looks... Oh, Ted, it looks like green gelatin. Just the way Justin describes it. And look... It's a vague shape like a head and, and the rough outline of arms and legs. Oh. oh, it isn't possible. It shouldn't be, but it's happening. 
Something terrible is taking place inside that glass tank. I don't understand. Your father certainly never intended to create this. You know, all afternoon I've been wondering if father really has created it. I don't follow you, Alan. You mean... You mean some outside force might be responsible? Ted, you know the old saying... Believe in a thing enough and it'll come true. Yes, of course. Well, I think that's true. The power of belief is a tremendous thing. People begin to believe that... Well, that there's going to be a depression, and there is a depression. But, Ellen... They begin to believe that strangers and foreigners are enemies. And pretty soon they are enemies. They believe there's going to be a war. And war comes. Well, that's true, but what are you getting at? How many people are reading Dan Duncan's story this very minute, right now, while we're talking? Oh, hundreds of thousands, probably, all over the nation. Maybe a million. And they all believe it's true. Well, a good many of them. Yes, Dan has a genius for being plausible. Then don't you see, Ted? Here in this laboratory is the necessary material for a monster. And out there are all those people believing in such a fantastic monster. You mean... You mean a million people are thinking life into the protoplasm. Yes, Ted. I know it sounds fantastic, but that monster was never created by my father. Dan Duncan created it when he wrote about it. Well, if that's true... There's no other answer. Over there in that glass tank is something that's alive only because millions of people believe it's alive. No, it is alive. There's no telling what it may become. Ellen, we have to destroy it. It'll break Dad's heart, but we can't let it live. It's growing bigger by the minute. We've got to get rid of it now before it grows any larger. There's acid in those bottles. There, that'll destroy it. All right. Yeah, yeah, I see. Here. I took the tuna and I get it open. So take care of the creature. Be careful, Ted. It, it can burn you dreadfully. Ellen, Ellen, what's happening? What are you doing? Jan, darling, you're supposed to be in bed. Yeah, I'm feeling better. I wanted to see how the protoplasm was. Please go back to bed, Dot. Your heart. Oh, my heart's all right, but I must be sure... Oh, it's changed. It's taken on a form. Yes, Professor, a monstrous, unnatural form. It has a head, arms, legs. But it can't have it. It's only protoplasm. It's all impossible. Unfortunately, it's true. I can't explain now, but, well, we've got to destroy it. No, no, the culmination of my life's work. You can't destroy we it. We must, Dad. No, no, I won't let you. It's the only thing to do. Professor, look at it. It's, it's crawling around inside the tank now. It's trying to climb out. But it can't be dangerous. It's just harmless protoplasm. Dad, Ted is right. You've got to let us kill it. It's just protoplasm, I tell you. It was just protoplasm. Stand back, Professor. I'm going to empty this half and No, no, you mustn't. I will. Dad! 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 I have his arms. Quick, you take his feet. I have right. Oh, hurry up, Ted. He's trying to crawl out of the tank. Try to get him upstairs. Can you manage it? Yes, yes. Keep on. All right, easy now. Easy. All right, just a little farther. All right, one more step, Ellen. There. Now, here's the landing. We can, we can put him down here. Now, easy. Easy. There. Oh. Oh. Ted. Ted, I can't find his pulse. Let me try. Dad? Ted, it's no use. He's gone. I'm afraid so. His heart failed him. I've always known it would someday. <laughs> Ted, down in the laboratory. Yes, it's moving. Look, it's gotten out of the tank and it's crawling all around the lab. And the only way out is down those stairs and through the lab. We're trapped up here. Look, I'm not saying it isn't a good story, Dan. It's a whale of a story. But McGuire wants some pictures. Pictures? How can I get pictures? I can't even get into the place. I don't care. Just get them. You want me to bust in the window, I suppose? Let your conscience be your guide. And I know you haven't got a conscience. But make it fast. I want those shots for the late morning edition. All right. I'm going. With a camera in one hand and a bunch of skeleton keys in the other. (laughs) 
Looking for food, Ted. Yes, and it's getting frantic. Look how it crawls back and forth through the lab. It's been doing that for an hour now. Look how enormous it's grown. Yeah. So, suppose it tries to come up these stairs to this balcony. Well, it may not. It, it has no eyes, no intelligence. It, it's just protoplasm, blindly seeking food. But suppose it does try to come up the stairs. Well, then we'll stop it. I have the gun here that I found in your father's desk. I'll, I'll use that on it. I don't think it would even feel a bullet. Well, we'll see. There. There, it's on the other side of the lab now in plain sight. Stand back, dear, and I'll, I'll try a couple of shots. I hit it. It didn't even notice. Oh. Well, we could only reach those bottles of acid. That would fix it. But every time we've started down the stairs, it, it's rushed over to wait for us. Must feel the vibration, but... I'm going to take one more try. Ted, please be careful. Yes, I will. I'll tiptoe down one step at a time. Perhaps I can avoid attracting its attention this time. What's it doing now? Lying quiet, as if it was listening. It'll only lie quiet a few seconds more. I'm almost at the bottom. Ted, quick! It's coming this way! It almost got yes, you. Yes, it did touch my foot, but well, I wasn't interested in getting any better acquainted. What are we going to do now? I don't know. I don't know, Ellen. I don't know if we could only reach that acid. Say, I wonder if it would make any difference if we turned out the lights. They can be controlled from up here, can't they? Oh, yes, but what good would that do? Well, in the dark, it might become inactive. Some elementary organisms are like that. Well, we can try it. Okay, I'll, I'll turn out the lights. There. It's black now. But it's still moving around. Well, well, just wait a moment. Listen. What is it, Tim? thought I heard footsteps outside the house. Footsteps? Just listen. Someone coming in the front door. Ted, there's someone in the lab. But who would... Good heavens, I'll... Duncan, is that you, Dan? Dan, answer me. Is that you? Get out. Get out. Quick. Okay, kid. Keep your shirt on. I'm going as soon as I get a picture of this joint. But, Dan, you don't understand. It's loose. Get away. Quick. Ellen, turn on that light. Yes, Ted. <laughs> you can't scare me, kid. I came to get a picture, and I'm going to get it. <gasps> Run, Dan. Run. 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 gone back to a liquid now. There's nothing left of it. It's gone as if it had never existed. Except for Dan Duncan. Oh, dear. There's nothing we can do for him, Ellen. He's dead. He created the monster. And it's killed him. again. Well, maybe it's true about believing in things and making them happen. Wars and depressions and uh, artificial monsters and things like that. I think I'll make a New Year's resolution to be careful what I believe in 1947. 
Uh, no more believing in bogeymen or spooks. I might meet one. Instead, I'll try believing in some of the, uh, some of the nicer things for a change, such as peace and goodwill among nations. Well, if I can get enough people to join me, maybe they'll come true and... Oh, you'll have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Toplin, Chuck Webster, Louise Fitch, Wendell Holmes, Edgar Staley, and Bill Smith. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Kogan. You've been listening to Theater of the... presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back and get a good grip on your nerves. If you can. Where are we going? Well, let us say for the moment, we're taking a little trip into time. And a story I call... New Year's Nightmare. As the old year entered its last minute, the crowds at the Club Tropicana were waiting expectantly for the clock to strike midnight. At a ringside table, a lovely young woman angrily whispers to the man with her. Chris, if you take another drink, I'll leave. Oh, Judy, this is New Year's Eve. It'll be 1947 in another minute. Gotta celebrate, don't I? Just one more. Just one more, just one more. That's what you always say. I wouldn't mind if it were just tonight, but you're always getting drunk. Waiter, another bottle of champagne. Nothing I say means anything to you, does it? You think because I've forgiven you a dozen times in the past, I'll do it again. But you're wrong, Chris. Happy New Year, darling. 1947 is going to be our year. No, Chris, it isn't. I won't marry a man who gets drunk in New York and wakes up the next day in another city. Oh, Judy, what are you saying? You don't mean that. You know I love you. Yes, Chris, you love me. But not enough to give up drinking. I'll miss you, Chris. Miss you terribly. But I know I'm doing the right thing. Judy, don't talk like that. I couldn't live without you. You know that. Won't you? I'm sorry, Chris. Here's your ring. Will you please take me home? You don't have to leave. If the sight of my drinking is too much for you, I'll go someplace else and do it. Martin will take you home. Happy New Year and goodbye. Uh, do you mind finishing that drink, mister? Five o'clock in the morning and I'm dead on my feet. Sure. Sure, I'll drink up. No matter what she says. That's right. Now, you better go home and sleep it off. Good night and a happy 1947 to you. Thanks. And the same to you. Don't. Gotta find another bar. New Year's. Gotta celebrate. Hmm. Another bar across the street. Oh, gotta celebrate. Hey, mister, look out for that car. You gotta get run down if you don't. Look out! Oh, 
Oh, my... My head. Oh, it feels so funny. What's that noise? Those horns. My well, darling, it's midnight. New Year's. Oh, my head. It's throbbing so. Where am I? How did I get here? Why, darling, you live here. Live here? What are you talking about? Charles, I'd better call Dr. Smith. You look so strange. Hello? Connect me with Dr. Smith's apartment, please. I've never seen this place before. Hello, Doctor? This is Blanche Arnold. Yes, it's Charles. He isn't well. Could you come to our apartment at once? Oh, thank you. Goodbye. What do you mean, I live here? Who are you? Where am I? I'm your wife, Charles. This is our home, don't you remember? You're my wife. Well, you can't be. I'm not married. What am I doing here? What's your game? Charles, can't you remember anything about us? What are you talking about? I never saw you before. And why do you keep calling me Charles? My name is Chris. Chris Andrews. Chris Andrews. So that's what the initial C.A. stood for. Oh, that noise out there. What are they making such a racket for? Because it's midnight, New Year's Eve. Midnight? New Year's Eve? But it was midnight hours ago, when I left the Club Tropicana. What are you talking about? Oh, that must be Dr. Smith. I'll answer it. Dr. Smith? I don't know any Dr. Smith. Oh, come in, doctor. I'm so glad you're here. I think it's the amnesia. It seems to have left him all of a sudden. Charles? It's Dr. Smith. I don't know him, and I don't know you. And please stop calling me Charles. I told you my name is Chris Andrews. Mm Mm-hmm. I want you to sit down, Mr. Andrews. I'd like to talk with you for a few minutes. What about? Uh, Tell me, Mr. Andrews. What's the last thing you remember before finding yourself in this apartment? Why, Judy. She and I were at the Club Tropicana, celebrating New Year's Eve. I see. I remember we quarreled about my drinking. I walked out on her and had a few drinks someplace else. Uh That's all I can recall. Oh, my head. I've had hangovers, but I've never felt like this before. What time is it? Uh, It's just four minutes after 12. But it can't be four minutes after 12 New Year's Eve. That was hours ago when I left the Tropicana. Mr. Andrews, that was New Year's Eve... 1947. What do you mean, that was New Year's Eve, 1947? Uh, This is New Year's Eve, 1948. 1948? What are you talking about? It's 1947. Well, here's the morning paper. You can see the date for yourself. Thursday, January 1st, 1948. No, it can't be. It can't be. A year gone? Just like that? But where did it go? I haven't lived it yet. Perhaps you'd better let me clear up a few things for you. 1948. Uh, My name is Smith. I was a resident physician until recently at the Park Hospital. Uh, While I was on duty uh, last New Year's Day, 1947, you were brought into the hospital seriously injured, having been run over by a car. When you recovered consciousness five days later, you didn't know who you were. You were a victim of amnesia. Amnesia? Yes, and we didn't know who you were as you had no identification papers. But my wallet, uh, letters... They were gone. The only clue to your identity was a belt buckle with the initials uh, C.A. on it. We didn't know your real name, so I called you Charles for the C. Uh, Blanche was your nurse. I've always liked the name Charles. And as for your last name, we thought Arnold was as good as any. So you became Charles Arnold. But what have I been doing since the day I recovered consciousness? Well, you weren't discharged from the hospital until May. Uh, Then you went to work as an insurance clerk. As an insurance clerk? But I don't know anything about being a clerk. I'm a reporter. Well, there was no way of learning what your occupation had been. Uh, So when Blanche learned of this opening in an insurance office, you applied for the position. And that's where I've been working? Up to now? Yes. And then after you got your job, we were married. Married? Charles. I mean, Chris. 
Don't you remember? I'm afraid, Blanche, you really can't. Married. But Judy... Oh, it's like a dream. My head keeps throbbing. I keep expecting to wake up. There's a date in the paper. January 1st, 1948. Doctor, you said he might never get over his amnesia. Well, that was a strong possibility, but apparently the sounds of New Year's brought back his memory. You're going just like that. Judy, my friends, job, all gone. Doctor, where am I? I mean, what's the address of this apartment house? You're at 5718 North 13th Street, Philadelphia. Philadelphia? But how did I get to Philadelphia? Uh, That we don't know. All that I can tell you is that your accident occurred just a few blocks from here. Darling, I know what a shock it must be. Strange. You must have called me darling many times in the past. And yet this is the first time I've I've ever heard you call me that. Yes. I know. What did you say your name was? Hello, Doctor. Come in, won't you? Thank you. How are you, Blanche? Mm, All right, I suppose. How's Chris getting along? He's fine. It's just... Why, Blanche, what's this? I've never seen you cry. Here, here. No, it's just that everything's so changed. Those six months Chris and I were married before he regained his memory were the happiest of my life. And now? This past month since he got his memory back, it's been as though I were married to a stranger. It isn't as though he doesn't try to be nice to me, but it's all so obvious. He doesn't love me. Now, Blanche, you mustn't say that. It's true, I tell you. How can a man love a woman those first six months as he loved me and then fall out of love with her when he's regained his memory? Well, you must have patience, Blanche. It will take time for Chris to adjust himself to what's happened. He fell in love with you as Charles Arnold, and I'm sure he will as Chris Andrews. You just must give him time. Chris! Chris Andrews! Chris, it is you! Judy! Oh, Oh, Judy! Oh, just let me look at you. This can't be true. You're being here. Oh, well, it is. Ah, uh, it's been a long time. Yes. A year and a month since New Year's Eve, 1947. Chris, what are you doing here in Philadelphia? I live here. Well, so do I. I, I got a job with Ryan and Company as a copywriter here a few months ago. Look, Judy, we can't talk here on the sidewalk. <laughs> oh, that's right. Uh, well, look, I, I live only a few blocks from here. We can go to my apartment. Oh, that's fine. There's so much I want to ask and... There's so much to tell. Here, let me have your hat and coat. Thank you. Would you like something to drink? No, I uh, don't drink anymore. Oh? Chris, you have changed. You look so much older. Well, you don't. You're as lovely as that night I saw you last. (laughs) Thank you, Chris. Judy... You'll have to let me explain what happened after I left you that night at the Tropicana. If you find it difficult to believe, I won't blame you. It still seems like a nightmare to me. That night, after I left you... And so now you know everything. From the moment I last saw you to this one. No wonder you look different after having gone through an experience like that. Well, you're all right now. You you know who you are. You're happily married. You have a job. I'm not happily married, Judy. Chris, you mustn't talk like that. Surely you must have loved your wife if you married her. And she hasn't changed. Judy, there's never been anyone for me but you. You know that. And you still feel that way about me. No, I don't. When we met tonight, that old look was still in your eyes... You do care. You know you do. Please, Chris, no matter how I feel about you, it's over now. You're married, and that's all there is to it. I I, I wish you'd go, and I don't want to see you again. Chris? Where have 
you been? I expected you home from work hours ago. I met a friend. Oh. Oh, you look so tired. Do you feel well? Blanche, this past month I tried my best to be a good husband, haven't I? Oh, you have been, darling. No, there's something missing, and you know it. Oh, it isn't your fault, it's mine. And as a result, we're both unhappy. You mustn't say that, Chris. I feel that in time, things will be as they were when we were first married. When you were Charles Arnold. No, but they won't be, Blanche. It's no use, I tell you. Chris, who is the friend you met tonight? The girl I was once engaged to. I see. Blanche, you've got to give me a divorce. No, Chris. I'll never do that. But why? You know I don't love you. What's the sense in going on like this? Chris, when you were Charles Arnold, you did love me and we were happy together. I had your love once and I mean to win it back. I won't give you a divorce. <laughs> Hello, Judy. Chris. Chris, I, I asked you not to call on me again. Judy, I've got to talk to you. May I come in? Well, all right. But just for a few minutes. Thank you. Judy, even if we hadn't met again a week ago, things wouldn't have been any different between my wife and myself. I'll never love her. And I'm not going on with her. What do you mean, Chris? I'm going to leave her, Judy, and start all over someplace far away. I just came around to say goodbye. Are you set on leaving her? Yes. Nothing can change my mind about that. Now, you, you've got to understand my position, Chris. I could never be happy with you if I thought I'd been the one who came between you and your wife. But if you are going to leave her, I would like to see you again when you're free. Would you, Judy? Yes. But I don't want to see you until she's given you a divorce. A divorce? Judy, I am going to be free. Nothing's going to prevent it. Nothing. Blanche, uh, how would you like to go out tonight? Go out? Yeah, we might take in a show or... Go dancing? <laughs> Didn't I ever take you out when I was Charles Arnold? Oh, why, yes. We used to have wonderful evenings together then. Well, why not now? Unless you don't want to. Oh, Chris, there's nothing in the world I'd rather do. Hey, why the tears? Oh, it's just that I'm so happy. Oh, come here. Uh, did this Mr. Arnold ever put his <laughs> arms around you? Like this? Oh, yes, often. <laughs> oh, Chris, stop squeezing me so tight. Chris! Sorry, darling. Oh. Oh. You almost, you almost squeezed me to death. That's so you remember that I'm your husband and uh, not Mr. Arnold. And uh, Blanche. Oh, yes, Chris. I'm taking a week's vacation soon. Um... Uh... What do you say if we go up to the Adirondack Mountains for a week of winter sports? Oh, Chris, I'd love to. Well, it'll be like a second honeymoon. Blanche, you all right? There's only a few more feet to the top. I'm coming, darling. Where are you? Oh, there you are. <sighs> oh, Chris. Oh, the view is wonderful from here, isn't it? You're right. Being up here is like being alone in the world. Yes, just the two of us. Oh, this past week's been a wonderful one, Chris. I've never been so happy. Nor have I. Oh, be careful, Chris. Don't go so near the edge. That canyon's 4,000 feet deep. Oh, this ledge is perfectly safe. Come over here and take a look at the valley below. All right. Oh, please keep your arms around me, Chris. Looking down like this frightens me. There. You're safe in my uh, arms. Chris, why are you looking at me that way? What way, dear? I don't know. Is your head throbbing again? 
No, dear. Uh, I don't suppose you've changed your mind about giving me a divorce, have you? Giving you a divorce? But I thought we were so happy together. Yes, that's the impression I meant people to get. Chris, you can't be serious. Why, everything's been wonderful these past few weeks. Oh, I see it won't be any use trying to talk you into it. What do you mean? I'm sorry, Blanche. I don't want to do this, but you've given me no alternative. It's really your own fault uh, that you must die. Let, 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 let go of me. Let, let, it, oh, let, no, you're no. struggling, darling. No one can see or hear you. And you can't possibly escape. You can't throw me off that ledge. Then I'll hang you. I don't think so, dear. Oh, We've been so happy these past few weeks. No. I'm sure the police will see it as an unfortunate no. accident. Stop but... pushing me toward the edge. Chris, don't. I'm afraid it's too late for that. Chris. Uh, good evening, Judy. Uh, may I come in? Why, yes, of course. How are you, Chris? Oh, I'm all right. I uh, want to thank you for the note you sent me uh, when Blanche died. I can't tell you how sorry I was to hear about it, Chris. Yes, it, it all happened so quickly. Mm. What have you been doing since then? Oh, just working. Trying to straighten myself out. Yes. Uh, Judy, perhaps I shouldn't talk about it now, seeing that Blanche has only been gone a month, but I've been thinking of leaving town. Will you come with me? Uh, please sit down, Chris. You make me nervous walking back and forth like this. All right. But you haven't answered my question. Well, it isn't easy to answer. Well, it would be if you said yes. Uh, I see in your eyes you mean no. Why? Chris, I've met someone else recently. Someone else? But you said if I were free, you'd marry me. I didn't say I'd marry you. I said if you were free, I'd like to see you again. But now I'm not even sure of that. You're so different from what you used to be. Stop being clever. If you didn't say you'd marry me, you, you implied as much. Please, Chris, you're, you're making it so difficult for me. I'm making it difficult for you. And I suppose what I've been through doesn't count. I risked my life to get you. you risked your life? Chris, what are you saying? Are you such a fool as to believe that Blanche fell off that mountain? Chris, you didn't. Yes. And I did because you said you'd marry me if I were free. Oh, no. I meant a divorce. But she wouldn't give me a divorce. It was the only way I could gain my freedom. And now you tell me there's someone else. Oh, Chris. I did it for you. And you're going to marry me. No, I won't. If I can't have you, no one else will. Chris, what's the matter with you? Chris! We were meant for each other, darling. In life and in death. Chris, if you come any closer, I'll scream for help. No, don't. Chris, no! You won't marry me. You'll never marry no. anyone else. There. He'll never have you. Open up the door. Miss Leonard, are you all right? Call the police. Oh, I didn't want to do it, darling. But you forced me to. Oh, my head. It throbs so. Everything's like a nightmare. Open up in there. This is the police. The police! I've got to get away! Oh, they're closing in on me. There's no escape from this roof. Let's work our ways out from this end of the roof to the other. They'll never take me alive. Never. I've got five bullets. Four for them and... The last for myself. Maybe you should not, Joe. Maybe you me behind one of those chimneys. Oh, my head. It keeps throbbing so. If I could only think. All this can't be real. It's like a horrible dream. And you're just coming for me. Wait. There's someone behind that chimney over there. Get under cover. They'll never take me alive, never. I'll show them. Keep down, Mike. Why don't you come and get me? If I shoot it out with me, huh? I'll show you. Come on, Mike. His gun is empty. Oh, empty. You'll never take me alive. Never! He's climbing up on the ledge. It's 15 stories down. I'm coming, Judy. I'm coming. He's going to jump. I'm falling. 
falling! You'll never take me. Never. I'm falling. Falling. Doctor, the patient's recovering consciousness. Yes, you're right. He's opening his eyes. Oh, my head. It drops so. Where am I? Oh, it was a dream. Not for you. Oh, thank heaven. Now, you must be quiet. You've been in a serious accident. Accident? Yes. You were hit by an automobile New Year's morning. Uh, would you mind telling me your name? There weren't any identification papers in your clothing, and we'd like to inform your relatives of what's happened. My name? It's... It's... I can't remember my name. I see. Well, what about your address? Can you remember that? No. No, I can't remember anything. Now, you mustn't get excited. It'll all come back to you. You received a fractured skull from the accident. There was a mountain. Mountain? Y you mean you live near one? I... I don't know. There was a mountain. And the police were chasing me. And I... Jumped off a high building. It... It's all mixed up. You probably dreamed that uh, while you were unconscious. But you're all right now. Just need rest and quiet. Where am I? You're in the Park Hospital, Philadelphia. Philadelphia? What day is it? It's January 5th, 1947. It's 7.26 in the evening. And you don't know my name? No. All we have is your belt buckle with the initials uh, C.A., C.A. Nurse, will you look after the patient now? I'll be in to see him later tonight. Yes, doctor. Are you comfortable? The initial C.A. What do you suppose they stand for? Perhaps the C is for Charles. Charles? Charles. Oh, I don't know. Well, suppose I call you Charles, just for the time being. I always like the name Charles. All right. What's your name? I'm Miss Thompson, but you can call me Blanche. And Charles, let me be the first to wish you a happy 1947. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip? Oh, by the way, I want to wish you all a very happy new year. And I do hope you'll be careful about making new acquaintances. And perhaps you'd better keep an eye on the old ones, too. For after all, who can foretell the future? Not even Chris Andrews. Or should I say, Charles Arnold knows what's in store for him. But we do, don't we? And uh, speaking of the future, I... Oh, you're getting off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Stuart Brody, Louise Fitch, Hester Sondergaard, and Mort Lawrence. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. The Mysterious Traveler is written and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week over most of these stations to a tale titled... No Grave Can Hold Me. Another tale of The Mysterious Traveler. Mysterious Traveler has been presented from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. 
Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Coker. And featuring tonight two of radio's most distinguished personalities, Santos Ortega and Richard Cooker, in No Grave Can Hold Me. This is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little as we travel tonight into the world of shadows from which no man may return. And we learn the story of one who does return. It's a story I call No Grave Can Hold Me. My story starts in a court of law where a man is on trial for his life. The courtroom is tense. For the jury is out deciding the prisoner's fate. But the prisoner himself, a tall man with glossy black hair and piercing eyes, sits calmly with his lawyer, his daughter Nora, and his son in law, Harry Wilson, waiting for the fateful verdict. Oh, dear, I wish we knew. Father, I think the jury is coming in now. They say it's a bad sign when the jury is out for such a short while. You need not worry, either of you. I shall be free. I certainly hope so, Randolph, but... Well, you know, you did admit you killed Clemens. Because he insulted me. He called me a mountebank, a charlatan, a trickster. He called the great Randolph a faker. So he died. There they come. Oh, Father, I'm frightened. They're taking your place in the jury box now. They look awfully grim. I repeat, have no fear for me. Foreman of the jury, has the jury reached a verdict? It has, Your Honor. What is the verdict? We find the defendant guilty as charged of murder in the first degree. Oh, no, no! Who finds you guilty? The fools. They, too, think that I'm an imposter, a trickster. They shall learn different. If I die... So shall they. The prisoner will rise. Father, you stand up. The prisoner will rise. Very well. I'll stand up. So that they will recognize my face again when they see it suddenly in the night. And know that death has come to claim them. Maximilian Randolph. You have been found guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. It is the sentence of this court that you shall suffer the punishment of death on the night of June 6th at midnight. And may God have mercy on your soul. Mr. Randolph. Thank you, Guard Miller. You can see him for only five minutes, Mr. Wilson. Yes, all right, Guard. Hello, Randolph. Good evening, Harry. I see that my guard, Miller, managed to get you in to see me. Yes, he did. Time is so short that... Well, I know. It is almost midnight. And at midnight, I die. But Guard Miller has become a good friend. I knew he'd arrange it. Nora and I saw the governor this afternoon. He he refused to do a thing. It does not matter. What is death but a new garment for the soul to wear? Nora's waiting outside. You said you didn't want to see her tonight. That is as I wished. You were my assistant. We were very close, you and I. And now there is a last promise. You must make to me. Anything, Randolph. When you receive my body, the empty husk of the great Randolph, bury it in a vault with a bronze door which faces east. A vault facing east? Yes, of course. The door must be locked with a padlock of bronze, but it must be possible to open it from the inside without using a key. 
Randolph, you... The coffin must be locked shut as well. But I must be able to open it from the inside. Randolph, sure you're not serious. I never joke. All this and one thing more. Promise. All right, I... I promise. When I am buried, beneath my head must rest a notebook bearing the names and addresses of the 12 jurymen who found me guilty, of the prosecuting attorney, and of the judge. But, but why, Randolph? So that I may know where to seek my vengeance upon them. The vengeance I have sworn, which must be executed before my soul can sleep. Oh, Randolph, that's madness. You disbelieve. So do they. But in my studies, I have learned many things. And one of them is how to reach back from behind the dark curtain of death. All right, time is up, sir. Thank you, Miller. Goodbye, Harry. Just tell me one more thing. Is the full moon shining tonight? Yes. It's a full moon tonight. Good. And each time hereafter that it shines, one of my enemies will join me in death. And so the great Randolph went to his execution and was buried according to his instructions. After a few days, his case was forgotten. Uh, forgotten by all but Harry Wilson, his son-in-law. Well, as the first month passed and the full moon again shone in the windows of his apartment, a strange restlessness possessed Harry. Harry, what's wrong with you? No, I, I'm sorry, Nora, but tonight, the night of the full moon, I'm, I'm nervous. I, I can't help it. Oh, darling, you're not worrying about father, are you? About his threat? Yes, I am. Oh, but that's absurd. Poor father. Toward the end, I'm afraid he was suffering from delusions and he was more than just an ordinary man. He wasn't entirely sane. Harry. No, maybe not, but he was so sure of himself, so certain. And those instructions for the way he was to be buried. Oh, of course, I, I'm just being foolish. Why don't you go out and walk for a while, Harry? It'll help calm you. All right, all right, I will. You want to come along? It's a nice night. No, I think I'll stay here and read. All right, I'll be back in an hour or so, dear. And if nothing happens tonight, I'll... I'll know that Randolph is just putting on an act. A little later, another man was also walking in the moonlight of a beautiful July evening. This one was short and stout. He was strolling homeward from a small poker party with his friends, when in the dark shadows cast by the trees along the edge of the park, a tall figure stepped directly into his path. Just a moment, Adam. Uh, who are you? What do you want? Just to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. Get out of my Not way. so fast, my friend. Look. A gun. Say, what is this, a hold-up? No, Adam. It is not a hold-up. Then why are you threatening me with that gun? Why have you got that scarf covering your face? Because my face has changed in the months since I was executed and buried. It's rather frightening now. What are you saying? Who are you, anyway? You're beginning to recognize my voice, aren't you? You know who I am. You just don't want to admit it to yourself. But great Randolph. Whom you, as foreman of the jury, caused to be executed. Oh, no, no, it's not possible. No one could come back from the dead. No ordinary man. But the great Randolph has oh, come back. No, I don't believe it. There's a trick of some kind. And is this a trick, Adam? Is it? Is it? Oh, but... Hello. Hello, Nora. Is Harry there? No, he's out for a walk. Who is this? Don't you recognize my voice, Nora? Surely you heard it often enough. Oh, 
father. Oh, no, it can't be. Strange how skeptical everyone is of me. Even my own daughter. Father, it is you. What do you want? I just want to tell Harry that I have claimed the first victim of my vengeance. Exactly on the stroke of midnight. The same minute when I die. Oh, no, no. And I wanted to warn him that he must do nothing to interfere with my plans. Or if he does, I shall have to add him to my list of victims. No, no, are you... Is the telephone here? Do you want to speak to me? Yes, Harry, just a little after 12. He said that he... Yes, I know. I heard the news. I was in the restaurant having coffee and he came over the radio. Adam's the foreman of the jury. He was found strangled in front of his home. Oh, but it's impossible. And yet it was his voice, Harry. Father's voice. Oh, we've got to do something. Nora, I've got to warn the others on that list. The other jurors, Baldwin, the district attorney, and Judge Dexter. Yes, but he said if you tried to interfere... I know, but that doesn't matter. In the morning, I'm going to District Attorney Baldwin. He'll believe me. He'll have to. Oh, but Mr. Baldwin, you've got to listen to me. You've got to warn the others. You've got to give them protection. Or they'll die, just as Adams did. Winston, I'm a busy man. I have enough on my mind without having to listen to wild-eyed stories like the one you just told oh, me. But, but it's true. Randolph's instructions about the way he wanted to be buried, the notebook that I put in the coffin with him. Mere theatrical mummery. Adams was the victim of an ordinary street mugging. That's all there is to it. I have to ask you to leave. I have more important things to tend to. <laughs> Mr. Lord, you're a sensible man. You edit the biggest newspaper in this city. If you'll only print what I've told you, the authorities will have to take some action. Well, sir, my job is to print news for our readers, not ghost stories. If I ran your story, I'd be fired tomorrow. Then you don't believe me. Uh... Tell you what I will do. I'll make a story for the Sunday supplement out. Oh, that won't do any good. If it's in a Sunday supplement, people will just smile at it. When they see it, they don't know it's just a story. And I'm afraid there's no use in talking any further, Wilson. All right, I'll go to other papers. One of them will have to believe me. I don't advise it. You run a shop, don't you, selling tricks and magic apparatus? Yes, yes, that's right. Why? Just this. Newspapers don't believe in giving free publicity, and that's obviously what you're after. Goodbye, Mr. Wilson. I'm very sorry, Mr. Wilson, but Judge Dexter is unable to see you. Oh, but, Mr., do you explain to him what it's about, how important it is? The judge said if you cared to write him a letter, he'd give the matter his consideration. Oh, that's no good. I've got to talk to him. I'm sorry. He's leaving today for his vacation, and he won't be back for a month. Perhaps he'll be able to see you then, but he simply can't see you now. None of them would listen to me, Nora. They either thought I was crazy or that I wanted publicity. They all told me to forget it. They're right, Harry. That's the only thing to do to forget it. But, Nora... Maybe we're wrong. Maybe Adam's death last night was just a coincidence. I'm sure Father had nothing to do with it. Oh, no, no, no. He telephoned you. You heard his voice? Well, I'm not sure now that I did. Maybe it was a dream, Harry. Maybe I just imagined it. So forget the whole thing. Please, Harry, for my sake, forget it. Oh, Harry, darling, it's no good just pacing up and down. Please, sit down and try to relax. I can't, Nora, I can't. Tonight, the second full moon since Randolph was executed. He'll be leaving his grave tonight, and someone else will die. But Harry, the... There ought to be a guard over the vault he's buried in. Oh, no, that wouldn't do any good if he came back to him. The dead, he wouldn't be bothered by a guard. Please, Harry, you've done the best you can. And if it is true, and you go on like this, will you be in danger, too? I don't care. That list, Nora. The names on it were alphabetical. And Adams, the foreman, was the first to die. What are you driving at? The second name on the list is Baldwin, the district attorney. Baldwin. Wouldn't listen to me last time, but tonight he's got to. I'm going to his home now while it's still time. <laughs> Mr. Baldwin, you are in danger tonight. I'm sure of it. Deadly danger. No, you, you mean it, I'm sure, Wilson. Yes. I, I thought it was some kind of a gag before. 
Now I can see you fully believe everything you've said. Oh, then you, you will take precautions. At least for tonight. I've been an officer of the law for 30 years. I've been threatened by a lot of convicted murderers, but not one of them has come back to get me yet. But you don't understand. The great Randolph is different. He had powers that, that we know nothing about. Uh, perhaps, perhaps, but I doubt it. Now, Wilson, I appreciate your warning, but I can't take it seriously. Oh, really? Then you, you won't guard yourself? Uh, no more than usual. I'll lock the door presently. But I'm sure that'll keep out any ghosts who may come this way. Mr. Baldwin, please, it's almost midnight. At least let me stay with you for another hour. I'm sorry, but I'm about ready to turn in. I expect to sleep well, too. Now, you go on home, do the same. Because nobody's going to be harmed tonight by the great Randolph spook. I guarantee it. Oh, no, no, I, I... Please, I wish you'd let I me stay. I couldn't think of it. Now, you can find your way out yourself, can't you? I'm sure. Yes, of course. All right, Mr. Baldwin, I won't bother you any longer. Good night. Good night, Wilson. Well, he's gone. I'm afraid the poor fellow needs to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Randolph's ghost. I only hope I never have anything worse to be afraid of than I... Who's there? Who came in just now? Wilson, is that you again? Oh, no, my friend. It is not Wilson. Who are you? What the devil's the meaning of this? You don't recognize me, then? How can I? That cloak with the collar pulled up over your face. That is to spare the world a sight that should remain forever hidden within the darkness of a coffin. But my voice... Surely you recognize that. What are you talking about? Now, get out at once or I'll call for the police. It would tax their powers to arrest me. They have no authority in the world to which I belong. No. No, it can't be. I see you have recognized me. You should have taken Wilson's warning, Baldwin. Because I'm here. The great Randolph at your service. Oh, it's impossible. That's been said of so many things, hasn't it? But I think I can convince you. No. Now stay away. Help! Help! That won't do you any good. By the time anyone comes, you will have joined me in the world of death. Oh! Ah! I could hear you calling all the way down the hall. Nora, where have you been? I just went out to get the morning papers. Why? Why? It's happened again. District Attorney Baldwin has been killed. But how? Exactly the same way Mr. Adams was killed, strangled, just at midnight. Oh, no. And Nora, I think I know the truth now. What do you mean? I don't believe it was your father at all. I think it was I that killed him. I killed them both. Nora, you've got to do it. There's a full moon tonight. You've got to lock me in this apartment. Oh, but, Harry, you couldn't possibly have killed those two men. I could. I was near the scene at both times, and my, my mind, it, it wasn't clear. I don't remember doing it, but don't you see? If, if I'd been hypnotized, I wouldn't remember. But, darling, Father couldn't have hypnotized you into committing murder. It's a law of hypnosis. The, the, the subject won't do anything he knows is wrong. I know, I know that, but I can't be sure. I believe that in those few minutes I was with him, somehow Randolph impressed on my mind orders to carry out his vengeance for him. Oh, darling, I'm sure he didn't. But if you insist, I'll lock you in. All right. Well, I want you to go now. It might not be safe for you to stay with me. All right, Harry. I'll go to a movie. Got to stay locked in until after midnight. Then even if I am hypnotized, I won't be able to do any harm. You do understand, Nora, don't you? Oh, of course, darling. I'm sure you're wrong, but I'll do anything you say. All right, now. Lock me in. And don't you come back until after midnight. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Another hour and then I'll know. Or will I? 
Maybe I'll try to get out and I won't remember it. Or... Telephone. Yes. Hello. Hello, Harry. Randolph. Yes, my boy. I'm glad at least you don't say... No, it's impossible. No. Where are you, Randolph? That doesn't matter. I just wanted to warn you. And don't try to interfere with my plans. But, Randolph, I thought... Hello. Hello. He hung up. That proves that I'm not the one. Then in that case... Yes. That's the only possible answer. I know now what the truth is. Oh, I've got to get out of here. The door. Oh, so I can not break it down with an axe. There's no fire escape, and it's eight floors down to the street. I have it, the superintendent. I can telephone the superintendent, tell him I'm lock, locked in, and then you'll come and let me out. Judge Dexter, first... Adams died. Then Baldwin. Their names were the first two on the great Adam uh, Randolph's list. Your name is third. And so you think that tonight I'm scheduled to die, huh? Yes, yes, I'm sure of it. And you say you warned Baldwin last month just before he was murdered? I did. And he laughed at me. But he died just the same. And you're seriously asking me to believe that a dead man, legally executed by the state, is walking the streets tonight seeking my life? I tell you, he telephoned me only half an hour ago. I recognized his voice. <laughs> You know, of course, that your story sounds like the ravings of an insane mind. I know it. That's why I've kept quiet this last month. I did try to convince the police, the district attorney, and all I got was laughed at. And then... Yes, and yet, uh, obviously, you're you're in earnest. I, I don't think you're crazy. I'm not. For a little while, I thought that I was the killer. You? How? I thought that I was under post-hypnotic control, that Randolph had planted in my mind the impulse to kill his enemies... But that phone call proved that I was wrong. And what do you propose that we do? If we went to his tomb, perhaps, then we'd learn the truth. Well, Wilson, what do you want to open Randolph's tomb for? Don't you see? If we go there and we find Randolph is still in his coffin, then I'll know that the real murderer is my wife, Nora. I, I have the key right here. I'll have the padlock off in a minute. Well, then hurry. The moon is bright. I'd hate to have anyone see us. Yes, sir. A very strange story. A man in my position prowling around the cemetery at midnight. Oh, but we had to come, Judge. We had to make sure. Well. There. Unlocked it. We can open the vault door now. I'm rather sorry I paid any attention to you, Wilson. But we're here now, so let's get this thing over with. Now, I'm going in first. But don't forget, I'm on. Oh, don't worry about me. There, I've shut the door. Be safe to turn on the flashlight now. There. See? There's the coffin. That's odd. Huh? What is it, Judge? Well, the air in here is fresh. This vault has been opened and very recently. Then it must have been opened by Randolph. Oh, oh, nonsense. Open this coffin and I'll prove it. Here. How does it work? This catch on the side. It can be operated either from the inside or out. There we are. It's unlocked. Well, then lift the lid, man. Lift it. What? All right, I'll do it. No. There, there. There you are. Now, see? There's your precious Randolph, safe and sound, just as I expected. Quite dead. As he's supposed to be. He's still in his coffin. Yes, and that proves that he... Wilson. Shine your flashlight down on the floor. I, I just touched a body. Lying here near the wall. Body? Oh, it's Nora. She's dead. I don't think so. Here, give me that light. See what happened? What happened? Why did you turn out the flashlight? Something knocked it out of my hands. I, I can't find it. Because I have it, Harry. That's why you can't find it. Randolph! Wilson, what are you saying? It's Randolph. He's not dead. Oh, but I am, Harry. But don't let that disturb you. I want to thank you for bringing the judge here to me. Wilson, where are you? You're trying to play a trick on me? No, no, I swear. He's quite innocent, Judge Dexter. And as for Nora, she merely came to make sure I was where I'm supposed to be. Just as you did. 
When I spoke to her, she fainted. Wilson, get the door open. We've got to have some light in here. It's no use, Dexter. I can see in the dark like a cat, and you can't. No. I have you now. No. Judge, get out of here. You're going to die, Dexter. Executed. As you ordered me. Executed. Randolph, let me go. I warn you, Randolph. I, I've got a gun. I'm going to shoot. You're too late. You're... You're... Uh... Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I am. Now, see if you can find the flashlight. Right. I think I've taken care of Mr. Randolph. If it was Randolph... I think I have it. Yes, here it is. Judge... Randolph's body, it's, it's still in the coffin. I rather thought it would be. Harry? Harry, is that you? Oh, no. You're not hurt? No, just my head. I I came here to see your father. We understand, Mrs. Wilson. And then someone hit you. Yes, from yes. behind. There was someone here in the vault. I just got a glimpse of him, and then and then he hit me. But who was it? That's what we're just about to find out. Now, let me have the flashlight, Wilson. Yes, of course. I think he fell over here. Now, yes, here he is. But who is he? He was impersonating father, but... But who is he? I hear he's lying on his face. I'd better turn him over. Carefully now. He's still breathing. That's it. Oh. Hey, it's Miller, the guard from the penitentiary. The one Randolph said he'd made a friend of. Yes, the one who was guarding him just before he was executed. Oh, so that's it. It was Miller. Miller, can you hear me? I'm afraid he's dying. Before Father was executed, he must have hypnotized this man and ordered him to carry out his fantastic scheme of vengeance. Oh, it was a trick, but it was a very cunning trick. By means of hypnosis, Randolph used this man as a tool, even though Randolph himself is dead. He must have recognized that Miller was unusually susceptible. I think we'll find that Miller was a psychotic to begin with. Otherwise, Randolph's hypnosis would never have worked. For no normal person can be influenced the way Miller was under any circumstances. Isn't there anything we can do for him? No. No, he's gone. And with him, the great Randolph has died, too. For good. Mysterious Traveler again. So the great Randolph is dead for good, is he? I wonder. After all, Miller wasn't the only guard Randolph had a chance to talk to. Oh, but he, he couldn't have hypnotized any of the others. I wouldn't give it another thought if I were you. Unless, of course, you were on the jury that convicted Randolph. In that case... It... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. The role of the mysterious travelers played by Maurice Tarplin. In tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Richard Coogan, Shirley Blank, and Bill Smith. Original music composed and played by Al Finelli. All characters in this story were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons was purely coincidental. This is Bob Emmerich speaking. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope that you enjoy the trip, that it thrills you a little and chills you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. 
Tonight we're going to join Bill Storm, a newspaper reporter, on the strangest manhunt ever conducted, or should I say woman hunt, as he searches frantically through a great city for the most dangerous and deadly woman you've ever imagined. In the story I call... The Woman in Black. And now here is the story as Bill Storm himself wrote it down. Uh, when he began to be afraid that maybe he was going to succeed in his hunt for the woman in black. My name is Bill Storm. I'm a newspaper reporter. And I'm writing this because I have a date tonight... A date with a gorgeous brunette with big, dark eyes and the smoothest, softest voice in the world. <laughs> Sounds nice, doesn't it? Well, I'd like to believe she's nice, but I can't. In my heart, I know she's the most dangerous woman in the world. Up to a week ago, I'd never even heard of her. A week ago, the day of Rusty Dean's funeral. You know, the, the big shot, gambling, slot machines. Killed by a solitary gunman while stepping out of his nightclub. They didn't catch the killer, but they gave Rusty the biggest funeral since Prohibition. I was on the rewrite desk that afternoon. My best friend, Tom Jervis, was covering the funeral. And along about four, he phoned in. First, he gave me all the dope on the funeral, and then he started telling me about some brunette he just met. <laughs> he was always a sucker for brunettes. Bill, she's a knockout. Big black eyes and the smoothest, softest voice in the world. I want you to meet her. Oh, blonde's more my style, Tom. Anyway, you're supposed to be working. Or have you forgotten? I am working. Listen, Bill, I've got a front-page story here. Theta led me to it. Who did? Theta, that's her. T-H-E-D-A, Theta. Just like Theta Bear, the old silent picture star. Oh. Well, uh, this is how it happened, Bill. I was watching the crowd at Rusty's funeral. I spotted a trim little number all in black, uh, whispering to Joe Nelson. Well, who's Nelson? Joe Nelson, a small-time thug. Well, anyway, she moved off. I thought she might be a relative of the deceased, so I asked Joe about her. He claimed he'd never seen her before. That all that she'd said to him was four o'clock at the Banner Bar and Grill. Four o'clock at the Banner Bar and Grill? Sounds like a message. That's what Joe figured. Only he decided that she'd delivered it to the wrong guy. Well, I uh, sort of wanted to see her again, so I persuaded Nelson he needed a drink. We slipped around the corner here to the Banner Bar and Grill. Sure enough, she was here waiting for us. Now, Tom, watch yourself. Bill, you've got the wrong idea. She's a perfect lady. <laughs> yeah? What about that big story you claim you had? I'm coming to it. But honest, Bill, I want you to meet Theta. You'll go for her. Hey, look, look, I'm going to put her on the phone to say hello. Here she is. Uh, uh, Theta? Hello, Bill Storm. Hello, Theta. Is that your real name? Yes. Don't you like it, Bill? Well, sure I like it. What's the rest of it? Any girl my sidekick goes overboard for, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know her name. There isn't any rest of it, Bill. Just Theta. Oh, nobody is just one name. Not these days. Sorry, Bill. It's all I've ever had. Here's Tom again. Uh, listen, listen, Bill. I'm going to fix up a date with her for you. But here's the story that I promised you. Joe uh, Nelson has been getting quietly plastered. And from what he's let slip, I'm positive he's the gunman who killed Rusty Dean. He is? Well, then hang on to him. I am. You get a car. Come down here. We'll smuggle him up to the office and work on him. Maybe we can get the whole story out of him. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Keep buying them drinks till I get there. Uh, what's the address? Uh, it's uh, it's on the corner of 5th and Spruce. Bill, two men just came in the door. They got Tommy guns. They're after Joe Nelson. Tom, what happened? They just mowed him down. Theta's gone. She slipped away when they came in. I think she fingered him for them. Yeah, yeah, that explains everything. Uh, Bill, they're coming over toward this phone booth. They're going to shoot. Bill! Tom! Tom! She knows who they are. She's working with them. So, so long, Bill. I was there in five minutes, even before the police got there. The place was deserted, except for the two dead men. Joe Nelson, the gunman, and Tom. Tom, my best friend, led to his death by a Delilah in a black dress. Well, the police didn't find the gunman who did the shooting, so... I set out to find the girl, to track them down through her. Once I found her, she was going to talk plenty. I began the hunt by calling on the man who had been Rusty Dean's chief lieutenant and was running his enterprises now, Nick Murray. 
Sit down, Storm. You said you wanted to talk to me. What about? Murray, did your boys kill Joe Nelson this afternoon? My boys? No, Bill. Why should they? Maybe because it was Nelson who bumped off Rusty Dean. He did? How do you know that? You mean you didn't know it? Listen, if I'd known that Nelson would have been dead long before this. I figured that. That's what made me think that you were in the clear. You haven't told me how you know Nelson killed Rusty. Well, he had a few drinks this afternoon. He let it slip out to Tom Jervis, my sidekick. Just before those two hoodlums riddled them both. A brunette named Theda put Nelson and Tom on the spot for them. A brunette named Theda? I never heard of her. Oh, I hoped you might have. A good figure. Deep, dark eyes, low, soft voice. Looks like a lady. <laughs> Some lady if she works with a bump-off gang. No, I never heard of her. But if she's working with any local mob, I'll hear about her all right. If any of my boys run across her, I'll let you know. Thanks, Murray. But warn them. If they meet her, watch out. She's pure dynamite. Well, that was one lead that got me no place. So next I dropped in on Captain Hughes, the head of homicide, to ask if the police had gotten any fingerprints off the glass the girl had been drinking from before the shooting started. Sorry, Bill. No dice. You mean you, you didn't get anything from the girl's glass? Not a thing. You see, she hadn't touched it. None of the liquor was gone. Well, now, that proves that she wasn't on the level. Not necessarily, but uh, well, I've issued orders to have her picked up if she's found. Not much to go on, though. We try to get a description from Gomez, the waiter who served them, but... Uh, but what? Well, he says he didn't get a good look at her. When she slipped away, he didn't even see her go. Some eyes he must have had. I suppose he didn't even see the shooting. Not much of it. He dived down the cellar steps when it started. He's in uh, Civic Hospital now. Well, I'm going out there to talk to him. He must have noticed something. Oh, and uh, so long, Captain, and thanks. It wasn't much of a lead, but it was all I had. It was pretty late by now, and when I got there, the hospital had settled down for the night. They put Gomez in a ward, and outside the ward, I found a nurse on duty. The blonde kid who, who turned as I came up. Oh, good evening. You looking for someone? Yes, my name is Storm. I'm looking for a patient named Gomez. Gomez? Oh, yes, broken arm and internal injuries. Uh, how is he? Is he awake? Yes. He's feeling badly, complains of pains in his chest. Well, if he's awake, I want to talk to him. Uh, this is police business. What bed's he in? The last one, down by the far door. But I'll have to ask the doctor if you can see him. Will you wait here? She disappeared down the hall, but I didn't wait. The ward was dark, except for a couple of dim lights. I started for the far end, and... Then I saw her. She was just a figure in a black dress, bending over the last bed. But it was Theta, all right. It had to be. I tiptoed down the room. She was talking to Gomez, and he was moaning a little. It hurts, doesn't it, Gomez? Yes, of course it does. But it'll go away soon. He mumbled something, and then he reached for the glass on the table beside his bed. A drink of water? Of course. Let me help you. She helped him lift the glass to his lips, and then I knew what she was up to when I yelled, Gomez, grab that glass. Don't drink out of it. He dropped it all right, but it was too late. He'd already drunk from it. He turned to stare at me, his mouth open, and she moved toward the door right beside her. I ran after her, but it was too late. When I reached it, she was gone, swallowed up in a dark hall. I knew it wasn't any use hunting for her, and I turned back to Gomez. In my impatience, I grabbed his shoulder. Gomez! Who was she? What did she want? Mr. Storm, you're not supposed to be in here. What are you doing to my patient? I'm going to make him answer Take me. Take your hands off him. He's not going to answer any questions for you tonight. And I say yes. I'm afraid not, Mr. Storm. He's dead. Yes. He was dead, all right. The only possible witness who could have led me to her and she eliminated him. And then I knew that whoever she was and whatever her game was, trying to find her was going to be about as safe as moving into a den of rattlesnakes. I put in a bad night trying to figure it all out. Next morning when I got down to the paper, my eyes looking like two holes burning a bladder, I handed up my editor, Harry Holloway, in the city room. 
Well, well, look at Frankenstein. What happened to you, Bill? Oh, I'm all right, Harry. Listen, anything new come in about those thugs who killed Tom? Not a thing. Papers needling the police, but, well, so far, no results. And there won't be either, till we find that girl in black. She's the key to the whole thing, I know it. Aren't you getting a little hipped about that girl in black? After all, she may be perfectly innocent. Oh, yeah? Then how do you explain her killing Gomez last night, just before I could question him? Bill, are you sure you didn't imagine you saw her at the hospital? After all, nobody else did. Not even the nurse. Imagine it. I heard her talking to him. In a soft, honey voice, as if she was bringing him flowers instead of poison. Yeah, that's another thing. The hospital autopsy in Gomez found no trace of poison. They claim it was internal hemorrhage and shock that killed him. Sure, the shock of a nice, healthy slug of poison in his glass of water. Suppose they didn't find anything. They weren't looking for it, that's all. Harry, look, I saw her kill her. Okay, okay, you saw her. Now what? I want to be relieved of all assignments until I find her, that's what. She's in this city and I'll run her down inside a week. Or I'll quit calling myself a reporter. A week, I said. Didn't take any week to find her. Not that girl. She got around too much. I saw her again just one hour later. It happened like this. I went back to my apartment and I dropped into a chair beside my window. And I started trying to figure my next move. Now, I have an inside room and the window looks right out on another building across an air shaft, not ten feet away. I've been sitting there about half an hour when, out of the corner of my eye... I saw someone in the room directly across from me come to the window and stand there, looking over at me. It was a girl in a black dress, wearing a cute little hat with a black veil down over her eyes. And as soon as I saw her, I knew it was Theta. Don't ask me how I knew, I just did. Standing there with a ten-foot air shaft separating us. Well, I did what I could. I turned so that she couldn't see what I was doing, and I got Captain Hughes on the phone. He said that he'd have the building surrounded if I could keep her talking for five minutes. Well, I hung up the phone and I turned back toward the window, trying to act casual. Hello, Theta. Looking for me? Hello, Bill. No, it's just accidental that I'm here. But you're looking for me, aren't you? Her voice did something to me. I I can't explain it. It sounds crazy for a hard-boiled crime reporter to say, but it seemed to get down inside me. And twist things all around. Why, a minute ago, I had hated her. And and now... Well, now I knew why Tom had gone overboard about her. I said something, anything to keep her talking. Why, yeah, Theta, I've been looking for you. <laughs> You're a hard girl to find. I have to be, Bill. But why, Theta? Look, you're just a kid. What kind of a racket are you mixed up in, anyway? I'm sorry, Bill. I can't answer that. But listen, you you could be anything you wanted. You don't have to be mixed up with murder. Then you think I'm a murderer? Oh, what else can I think? Last night you killed that poor devil at the hospital. I saw you. Yes, I know. You wouldn't believe me if I told you you're wrong, would you? Oh, I'd like to, Theta, but I can't. I can't. I'm sorry, Bill. Someday you'll know the truth. Now I have to go. Oh, no, wait. Let me look at you. I think we met someplace before. Yeah, it was Chicago. I I can't remember where. Please don't try to, Bill. And don't try to find me anymore. Now, goodbye. Oh, no, wait. But she was gone. And then somebody else appeared at the window. A window washer. He started to climb out on the sill to fasten his belt to the safety hooks. And I yelled at him, Hey, you! Uh, uh, That girl who was there, stop her! You made a little number in the black dress? Yeah. Where did she go? Uh, she went out just as I come in. But... Well, go after her. Grab her. She's wanted by the police. Hey, listen, mister. I'm here to watch windows, not to chase dames. If the police want to let them catch her. Now, quit bothering me. I got a job to do. Hey, look on. Huh? What? Your safety hook. No! Ah! Right in front of my eyes, he fell 15 floors. I saw the safety hooks break as he leaned his weight against them. And then I knew why she'd been there. She'd been there to weaken those hooks to make sure that poor devil fell and killed himself. Well, Storm, we didn't get her. She slipped through our fingers somehow. But she was there, Captain. I saw her. I talked to her. Oh, she was there, all right. We found a handkerchief in the room, a woman's handkerchief. Initial J on it, heavy perfume. Here it is. 
Lilac. It's drenched in lilac. Uh, but look, the initial's J. She said her name was Theta. She was kidding you. But she did the job all right. Those safety hooks had been filed away to nothing. One of the local mobs is trying to get control of the window washers union. That's why she was killed. Intimidation. Sweet little lady, that one. Hey, but Storm, the elevator boy who took her up says she was a blonde, no, not a brunette. He was crazy. Her hair's as black and soft as midnight. Getting poetic, aren't you? I wonder if you're still as anxious to find that girl as you were. What? Of course I am. Yeah? And when I find her, she'll get what's coming to her. That's what I said. I didn't know for sure whether I meant it or not. I just knew that I had to find her again. For four days, I combed the town for that girl. And then, uh, two nights ago, as I was walking home, just about midnight, I ran into Dutton, a cop I knew, looking down the dark street and scratching his head. Hello, Dutton. What's the matter? You see a ghost? Oh, hello, Mr. Storm. No, but I got a funny feeling I just saw that girl Captain Hughes once picked up. You did? Where? When? Uh, just a minute ago. I was walking my beat when this dame comes past me, all dressed in black, and she smiles at me. Yeah, go on. What happened then? Where'd she go? Uh, down the street. She turned into that door down there. Well, come on, then. If she's still there, we gotta get her. In 30 seconds, we were standing before the dark door that Dutton said the girl had turned into. It was partly open. That's the door, Mr. Storm. But that's the entrance to a first storage loft. Why would she go in there? I don't know, but we'll find out. Well, better let me go first. I got a gun here. I'll see what's going on inside. He pushed the door open, stepped into the dark hall. And then I heard him call out. Hey, lady, I want to talk to you. I... Hey, you up there. Put down that fire. Put it down. Oh, oh. Dutton. Dutton. Who shot you? Was it the girl? No. no. She was just standing there. It was two guys upstairs. I... I, Jack, and the furs. They... They... Dutton! Dutton! But listen, Storm. You say you didn't see her. Then how do you know it was the same girl? I know, Captain Hughes. She was acting as a lookout for those fur thieves. She deliberately lured him in there to his death. Maybe, or maybe not. I'm seriously beginning to doubt if it's the same girl mixed up in all these cases. I think it's just a theory. Your theory. I'll prove it to you. She's definitely mixed up in these rackets. And by now, Nick Murray and his boys must have learned something about her. I'm going over there now and find out. When I got to Murray's club, one of the boys showed me up to the office. Hello, Storm. Come in and sit down. Thanks. I will. Can I fix you a drink? No, no thanks. No? I just wondered if you'd picked up any trace of that girl I was asking you about. Theta? No, the boys haven't turned up a thing. Look, are you sure you're not just imagining her? <laughs> That's what the police are beginning to think, too. But I'm not, Nick. She's real, all right. Listen, if there was any such girl working in this man's town, I'd know about her by now. Unless she's awful smart. And it looks like this one is. Oh, well, I guess I'd better go and get some sleep. Might need it. Oh, uh, before you go... Yeah? I don't know anything about the girl, but tomorrow I may be able to tell you who killed your sidekick, Tom Jervis. You may? Yeah. When? Well, I won't have the dope until tomorrow night. If you'll meet me around 10, I can give it to you. I'll meet you. Just say where. You know the tambourine bar on 3rd Avenue? No, but I'll find it. Okay, there's a back room. Meet me there about 10. And come alone. About 10. Right. I'll be there. I went home, but I didn't get much sleep. I was too keyed up. About three, I get up and I put on a dressing gown. I sat down by the window to smoke. And then, behind me... Hello, Bill Storm. I turned, and she was there, standing in the doorway. I started to get up, No, but... stay where you are, Bill. Unless you do, I'll leave. Theda, why have you come here? You've been looking for me so hard, Bill, I thought I ought to. Look, I won't touch you or, or try to make you stay, but... Let me get up and fix you a drink. I'm sorry, Bill. I can't stay. But I did want to tell you, the time has come when you can know the truth about me. You mean you're going to tell me who you are and why you've done what you did? Everything, Bill. But not tonight. I'll see you again tomorrow, though. When? Where? You have an appointment, don't you, with Nick Murray at 10 o'clock? 
Oh, yeah. At the tambourine bar. How do you know? Are you working for him? No, Bill, I'm not. I don't work with anyone. Yeah, but Cedar... Please don't ask me any questions now. I can't tell you anything until tomorrow night. Good night, Bill. Oh, no, wait. You can't go yet. But she was gone. By the time I reached the door, she was out of sight. So I went back to bed, but I didn't get any sleep. I was groggy, punch drunk. I knew she was guilty, but I wanted to believe she was innocent. Well, now I'm going to learn the truth. I'm waiting in the back room of the tambourine bar. It's almost ten. And I'm just finishing this report that I started this morning. She should be here soon. So should Nick Murray. If what she tells me satisfies me that she's innocent, I'll tear this up. But if she isn't... Well, I'm going to find out because she's coming through the door now. Hello, Bill. Hello, Theda. You did come, didn't you? Of course I came, Bill. You believe bad things about me, don't you? Oh, yes. How can I help it? Believe me, Bill, I'm not wicked. Look at me and see if you really think I'm bad. She lifted her veil then. And for the first time, I saw her face clearly. It was just as I thought it would be. A beautiful face. With dark eyes that I could see into deeper and deeper. Like looking into the heart of the night itself. Now, Bill, do you really think I'm wicked? Oh, no. No, I don't. I've been wrong. But who are you, then? What's your connection with these murders? You'll know in a moment, Bill. I have to leave you. Just for a minute or two. Just while you talk to Murray. He's coming now. She slipped out one door while Murray came in the other. Nick closed the door behind him and sat down. Well, I see you're on time, Storm. Yes. If you can tell me who killed Tom Jervis, I want to know. That's what I'm here for. Two of my boys killed him. Two of your boys? That's right. You see, Joe Nelson killed Rusty Dean on my orders, so I could take over. Then I saw your friend trying to pump Joe. I couldn't very well afford to take chances. I had to get rid of both of them. I see. That explains a lot. What about the girl? I don't know a thing about her. I think you just made her up as an excuse to come asking me questions. Oh, no. No, I didn't. She's real. I know better. Because you did see a girl in that apartment where the window washer fell, but not a girl in black. You saw Janice, my girl. She filed those safety hooks. Dropped that handkerchief the police found. She did? You mean you had that fellow killed? Yes, Storm. Just a little business deal I'm interested in. And last night I decided you were getting to be a nuisance. That's why I'm telling you all this now. Because you're not going to pass it on. Oh, no. No, put that gun away. You can't get away with it. You... Goodbye, Storm. We won't be meeting again. Theda. Theda. Here I am, Bill. Theda, help me. Call a doctor. I'm sorry, Bill, I can't. But it won't hurt long. Theda. Yes, Bill. I, I recognize you now. I know where I saw you that time in Chicago. Yes, Bill, I knew you'd remember. Oh, no. No, stay away from me. Bill, don't be afraid of me. Oh, no. Stay away from me. Stay away. Bill, come back. You mustn't run away from me. Come back. Come back. No. No, I won't. I won't. You're not going to get me like you did the others. Mr. Storm. Mr. Storm, can you hear me? What? Where am I? You're a nurse. Yes. You're in Civic Hospital. You were brought here an hour ago, shot in the chest. You were found crawling down 3rd Avenue by a policeman. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. Nurse, take this down. Nick Murray shot me. What? Get word to the morning ledger. Certainly, Mr. Storm. Now, please lie quietly while I get the doctor. I'll only be a minute. Hello, Bill. Hello, Theda. You followed me here. Yes. You shouldn't have run away, Bill. I did it because... I remembered where I saw you last. 
in Chicago. The time I was in a taxi accident. I saw you in the other car just before we hit. Three people were killed. That's right, Bill. You did see me then. And now you know who I am. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Now I understand why you have to be around when people die. You don't kill them. It's just your job to be there. But I... I I never expected you to be... a, a beautiful girl. Why not, Bill? Just because people think of me as an ugly old man with a scythe, does that make it true? I'm not really ugly, you know. I'm not someone you have to be afraid of. Oh, no. And I'm glad you're beautiful. Makes it easier this way. Now take my hand, Bill. It's time for us to go. Yeah, sure. I'm ready. He recovered consciousness a minute ago, Dr. Clark. I came for you at once. He seemed to be quite strong, and I... Doctor! Dr. Clark! He's dead. This is the mysterious traveler again. So that was the secret of the girl in black. Theda, a strange name. T-H-E-D-A. I wonder if Bill ever did realize that those are the same letters that spell death. But he did what he set out to do. He learned the truth, and he avenged his friend, and he... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Chet Stratton, James Van Dyke, Wendell Holmes, Mort Lawrence, and Joan Tompkins. Original music was played by Jack Ward. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Rob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... Death Wears My Face. Another strange and shivery tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler came to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and uh, chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable. If you can... What is our story tonight? Why, tonight we're going to see what happens when an honest man yields to temptation and descends into the murky depths of murder and despair. It's the story I call... Dark, Dark Destiny. In the office of Dr. William Norris, Joseph Harrison, a man in his 30s, is waiting anxiously, as in the next room, Dr. Norris is finishing his examination of pretty young Mary Harrison. It isn't anything serious, is it, Dr. Norris? Please tell me it isn't. I'm afraid it's too soon to say, Mrs. Harrison. Until the X-ray plates are developed, I can't say yes or no. And now, uh, your husband is waiting outside, and he's probably beginning to worry, yes, so... Yes, uh... of course, Doctor. Poor Joe, he does worry about me. 
Well, here's your wife, Mr. Harrison. You must have thought I'd kidnapped her. Well, no, but I was getting a little worried, Doctor. I hope you didn't find anything very wrong. Well, I took a complete x-ray series. I won't be able to tell much until they're developed. I'd like Mrs. Harrison to come back the day after tomorrow, if she can. Of course, Doctor. Any time in the day that's convenient to you will be quite all right. And meanwhile, I'll write out a prescription your husband can have filled. Uh, will you step in a minute, Mr. Harrison? Uh, sure thing. I'll be with you in a minute, Mary. All right, Doctor. Won't you sit down, Mr. Harrison? All right. What is it, Doctor? Bad news? I'm afraid so. Does that mean Mary's going to die? No, Mr. Harrison. Not that serious. But within a few months, she will be confined to her bed. I'm afraid she faces a life of invalidism. Oh, no. No, it can't be. I'm sorry, Mr. Harrison. Doctor, there must be something you can do for her. Well, well, I don't want to raise your hopes, but... Yeah? There's one doctor in this country who, through a very remarkable type of operation, has been able to help people like your wife. Why didn't you say so? Let's get him. Well, I must warn you, Mr. Harrison, this operation doesn't always meet with success. In many cases, the patient shows no improvement at all. After all, it's still in the experimental state. Look, if there's one chance in a hundred, I want Mary to have that chance. Now, please get this doctor to operate on my wife. All right, I'll try it. But his services are in great demand. And, uh... Well, his average fee for an operation is about fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen hundred. Of course, if you can't afford that, he might consider the circumstances. No, I can afford it. I can afford anything that Mary needs. Very well, then I'll get in touch with him at yeah, once. Sure. You make the arrangements right away. I'll get hold of the money. I'll have it by tomorrow, sure. <laughs> Me off with my coat, will you? Oh, sure, sure. <sighs> How you feeling? Oh, my backache is much better since I took the medicine Dr. Norris gave me. I'm sure I'm going to be all right, Joe. Of course you are. He's one of the best doctors in the city. He'll have you well in no time. Did he tell you anything more, Joe? <clears throat> I know, uh, not a thing. Except that the treatment may take a little time. That's all. A little time? Yeah. Oh, dear, I hope it won't be too expensive. Your business has fallen off, and we've used up our savings account. Now, now don't account. you worry about the money. Don't you worry about anything. All right, darling. I won't. But aren't you going to take your coat off? Uh, no, I... I, I, uh... got to get that prescription the doctor gave me filled. Now, you just take it easy till I get back. I might stop in at the shop, too. There's something, uh... Something I have to tend to. <laughs> Danvers, I'm Joe Harrison. Oh, yes, Mr. Harrison. And please sit down. Thank you. Uh, I see that you want to borrow $1,500 from us. That's right. I've got to have it right away. Hmm. Unfortunately, the uh, security you wish to offer your home is... What's uh, wrong with it? The swell little house in a good section. It's all in good repair. Houses are worth money these days. Uh, quite true. But you already have a first and second mortgage on it, and I, uh, well, prices are falling, so I'm afraid we can't make any further loans on it. I've got to have the money. I've just got to... I'm sorry to hear that, because there's nothing we can do to help you. Then forget about the loan. I'll sell the house. Plenty of people want houses. That's true, too. But, uh, I don't think you can possibly clear much over the mortgages on a sale. A few hundred dollars, perhaps. You see, uh, those mortgages were issued when prices were at their peak. And now, uh, well, things have changed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I see they have. You say you're not employed, Mr. Harrison. No, I own a shop. You see, I'm a locksmith. Hmm. That means you're never certain of your income. Now, if you had a job, a regular income that could be depended upon... What are you getting at? You mean you're not going to let me have the money? I'm afraid I can't, Mr. Harrison. But your ads say that you lend up to $2,000 on a personal note. I only want $1,500. Look, you've got to let me have it. I certainly wish I could, but under the circumstances, I... I'm sorry. Very sorry. But there's nothing I can do. I'm afraid the collateral you suggest isn't satisfactory, Mr. Harrison. 
We'd lend you the money if we could, but we just can't. Sorry. But I've just got to have it. I've got to. Sorry. Do you hear me? I've got to have it. Sorry. 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 Joe, you're not eating. And you're so quiet. Is anything wrong? What? Oh. No, no, of course not. You're worrying about me, aren't you? No, Mary, of course not. I, I, uh... I was just thinking about some changes at the shop. Darling, you don't have to lie to me. I know you're worrying. But I'm going to get better. Really, I am. I promise you. Sure you are. Sure. Dr. Norris said so. You're going to be well in no time. Well, I have to go out now. I have an appointment with Horace Latimer. You remember I told you about him? We grew up together. I may be pretty late, so don't wait up for me. Joe had no appointment with Horace Latimer. But he went to see Horace anyway, for they had been boyhood friends until their paths had separated. Horace had grown rich, and Joe hoped desperately that Horace would lend him the money he had been trying to raise all day. A sum that would mean nothing at all to Horace. Fifteen hundred dollars, that's uh, rather a lot of money, Joe. I know it is, Horace, but it's for Mary. It's for an operation. I've got to have it. Mm, I see. Well, now, why don't you try the bank? You have a house, uh, I have tried the bank, and a half a dozen loan companies. They all turned me down. They said my security wasn't good enough. Oh, I see. Well, that's too bad. But, you know, I don't quite understand why you came to me, Joe. Because we're friends, that's why. Because when we were boys, we agreed that each of us would always lend the other a helping hand if we could. Boys don't understand business very well, I'm afraid, Joe. Oh, I guess not. They don't understand business. They just understand friendship. You know, if I had the money, I'd lend it to you if you needed it. I don't doubt that at all, Joe. And you can bet I'd lend it to you if I had it. But that's the trouble. I haven't any ready cash. The income tax, you know, and... Well, a couple of shaky investments that I'm trying to yeah, bolster up. All right, up all right, and... Horace. Never mind explaining. I get the idea. You're not going to lend me any money. Now, really, Joe, I would if I could, but I can't. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll save your you... sorrow for somebody who wants it. I don't need your money, you hear? I'll get it someplace else. I'll get it someplace. Somehow. <laughs> After he had slammed out of Horace Latimer's expensive home, Joe stood for a moment on the dark street corner, staring back with bitterness in his face. Yeah, you're sorry. I'll bet you are. <laughs> what a sap I was to think you were a pal of mine. I should have known better. I should have known... Huh? You speaking to me? Oh, no. Uh, sorry, I guess I was just thinking out loud. That's Okay. Hey, you uh, got a match? Match? Sure, yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Okay, hold it just like that. Make a move uh, and I'll plug you. Gun? Wait. Well, well, you're... Yeah, this is a stick-up. Hand over your dough and make it fast, see? My dough? <laughs> That's a hot one. I'm out trying to raise money and so are you. Well, I only got a dollar on me. Take that if you want it. Anyhow, it's more than I could raise. Don't try to kid me. Stand still while I see what you got in your pockets. Go ahead. Ah, wallet. And a leather case of some kind. You'll find exactly one buck in that wallet. You made a mistake, I tell you. I don't live in this ritzy neighborhood. I just came here to try to borrow a little money. One measly buck. But I'll bet you got a roll hidden in this leather case. It's heavy enough. There's nothing in there but my emergency kit. Yeah, well, I'll see for myself. All right. This kid is full of skeleton keys and... Pick locks and stuff. What are you, anyway, a second-story worker? I'm a locksmith and a safe repairman, if it's anything to you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now, how about taking that dollar and letting me go on my way? I'm in a hurry. Not so fast, pal. Were you leveling just now when you said you were trying to raise dough? Sure I was. I gotta have $1,500 by tomorrow. And what's it to you? You'd be surprised, pal. Okay, I'm putting the gun away, but you ain't leaving yet. Why not? Because me and you are going to talk business. I got a plan that'll get us both all the dough we need. Oh, 
Two more beers, waiter. Well, Joe, is it a deal on my proposition? I... Oh, Mike, sure you do. There's nothing to it. You can open locks and safes. Yeah, but... I know a house where there's a safe with plenty of dough in it. You and me together, we'll go get it. We'll make a team. But burglary. I've never stolen anything in my life. Listen, you need dough bad, don't you? And so do I. Plenty bad. Yeah, but I... You said you'd do anything to get it, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did. Then what are you hanging back for? All you gotta do is get the back door open and the safe. You can do that, can't you? Yeah, I suppose so. But... Then forget the butts. In a half an hour, you'll have your 1500 and more. How else are you ever gonna get it? Answer me that. I don't know. Hey, look. You saw all those big houses lived in by guys with dough. How'd they get it? They took it from somebody else, every one of them. Yeah, I suppose so. You sure the money's there? I'm positive. Look, I was casing the joint, and I looked in a window just in time to see the old geezer put a roll of bills in a safe you can open with your teeth. All right, I'll do it. I gotta have that money. And so... Half an hour later, Joe and his newfound acquaintance stood in the shadows of the rear entrance of an imposing brick house, listening intently. Not a sound any place. Good thing there's no dogs around. One o'clock. Everybody's hit the hay long ago. This will be a cinch. That lock looks easy enough. I shouldn't be doing this. Must be some other way to get the money. Don't be a sucker all your life. You gotta take what you want in this world. Go on, get the door open. Gotta get inside before we're spotted. Well, all right. It'll only take a second, I think. Yeah, it's coming. There, it's unlocked. Let's get inside. Come on. There. Good. We're in. Nobody spotted us. The safe's in the library this way. Don't make any noise. You sure there's only the two of them in the house? Yeah. The old guy and his butler. Probably both deaf as posts. Here we are. Here's the library door. Come on in. The safe's behind a picture on this wall. That picture there? Yeah, that's the one. I lift it down. There you are. There's the safe. Just a kid's toy. Kid's toy, nothing. That baby's tough. Well, you can open it, can't you? Yeah, but it'll take at least a half an hour. Right, get going. We can't stay here all night. Hurry it up. You've been 40 minutes on that thing. I told you it was tough. It's coming now. There. There you are. About time, too. Now, let's see what's in it. Here's the cash box. When I open it, then we'll know what we got. There, look. Dough, cash, Mazuma. What did I tell you? There must be thousands there. Easy, come on. Let's count it and divvy it up. No, no. Never mind. Just give me the 1500 That's all I want. You can keep the rest. You kidding? No, that's all I want. Just the 1500 that I need. Okay, if that's the way you want it. Here you are. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 1500 dollar bill. 1500 dollars. <laughs> Just for an hour's work? Easy money, huh? Hey, look. What do you say we crack a couple of more cribs tonight? No, no, no. I just want to get out of here now. That's... Someone's coming. Someone's coming? Yeah. Here, get behind this door. I'll take care of this. What are you going to do? Never mind. Now, shut up. Who? Who's there? Jenkins? Jenkins, is that you? Ah. Well, the safe's open. The burglars. The Jenkins. Jenkins, call the police. Quick. Nobody's calling any cops tonight, mister. Why, you... You're a thief. Jenkins! Jenkins! Maybe that'll convince you. Why did you hit him? What'd you expect me to do? Hold his hand? Wait a minute. He looks like he's dead. I wouldn't be surprised. He don't seem to be breathing any to speak of. That's murder. So it's murder. You're in it just as much as me. Don't forget that. Yeah. I'm an accessory to murder. Cut that guff and let's get out of here. 
Or do you want to get caught? No, no, of course not. Then come on, let's get going. Okay, here we are. Come on in. Why did you make me come here? Why can't I go home? You heard me. Come on in. That's better. Now, take off your hat and stay a while. Well, I can't stay, Mike. My wife, she'll be worrying. I gotta go home to her. You've got worse things than your wife to worry about, pal. What do you mean? I mean the cops. Or have you forgotten you're wanted for murder? No, I haven't forgotten. I'll never be able to forget. Why did you kill him? Why? So we wouldn't have to go to jail. Would you rather have gone to jail, Joe? No, of course not. Yes, I would. I, I w- well, I'm all mixed up. How did I get into this anyway? You need a dough. That's how you got into this. And you got it. So cut out the sob stuff. We're in the clear. Nobody got a peep at it. Why, why won't you let me go home? Why do you make me come to your room here? Uh, two reasons. The first is I, uh, I want to make sure you know what it'll mean if you let anything slip. I know. You don't have to tell me. I won't let anything slip. If I thought you might, I'd slit your throat right now. I won't, I tell you. I... I have to live, for my wife's sake. Okay. And the second reason you're here is so you and me can have a little talk. Talk? What kind of a talk? Joe, I, uh, I like the way you got that door and that safe open tonight. You and me got a future together. I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. As soon as the heat's off, we're going to do another little job together. Oh, no. No, I won't. I won't. Yes, you will. I tell you, I won't. You can't make me. Oh, yes, I can. Because if you don't, I can always send a little note to the cops telling them it's you they want for that killing tonight. You wouldn't do that. That gets you, too. (laughs) I'd be a long ways away by then. But you can't get away. You got a business here and a sick wife. You couldn't leave them. Well... Now you see why you're going to do what I say? You dirty... You... No, 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 don't say it. You don't think you can pull a job and then go on as if nothing had happened to you. You're mixed up in murder. And somebody's always got to pay for murder. One way or another. I only did it for Mary's sake. Don't matter why you did it, you're in it now and you can't get out. Not without paying in some I... way. I got a good mind to go to the police to confess. Get this off my chest. Oh, no, you don't. You see this gun? I'd plug you in a second if I... Hey, get away. Let go of my hand. Let go. You... You've got me into this. You're not going to make me go any further into it. Get away from you. Mike. Mike. He's dead. He's dead. He tried to shoot me and shot himself. I gotta get away from here. I gotta get back to Mary. In a daze of horror, Joe Harrison found his hat and made his way to the street. His mind was a dizzy whirl of thoughts which he could not control. They went around and around in his head. I'm a murderer. Oh, catch me, Bella. Hang me. I didn't mean to do it. I just wanted the money. The money was all I wanted. The money to make Mary well, that's all. Now they'll catch me. They'll hang me. They must... I gotta escape. I got to. Mike said the murder has to be paid for somehow. That isn't true. Sometimes you can escape if you're lucky. I just gotta be lucky. I need a drink. I gotta have a drink before I go crazy. So Joe Harrison stumbled into a tiny bar on a dark street, struggling to control his shaking hands and to keep his voice normal. He ordered a double rye and gulped it down. Then, as his senses cleared a little, he heard the radio at the end of the bar broadcasting a warning to the city. The police department is asking you to be on the lookout for the following man, wanted for the brutal murder committed in Gramercy Park section two hours ago. Please make a note of the following description given by the victim before he died. The description follows. Hey, look, buddy, what's the idea? Why don't you shut the radio off? 
Answer me. What'd you do it for? Because. Because I was sick of listening to it, that's why. Oh, is that so? Well, I'm not, see. And I got an idea maybe there was some other reason you didn't want to hear it. So I'm going to turn it on again. No, 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 you mustn't. Well, I'm going to. And if you want to make a try for a break, I got a gun right here under the bar, you see? Now let's hear what the killer looked like. I repeat, be on the lookout for a man of medium height, lean and wiry, with reddish-brown hair. If you see such a man, report at once to headquarters. We now turn you back to our regular night program of popular dance tunes. Lean and wiry with reddish-brown hair, huh? Well, that ain't you. You're kind of heavy-set and blackhead. For a minute there, you had me going. I was positive you were the killer, the way you didn't want me to hear the description. Just jumpy, huh? <laughs> well, here, have another drink on the house, huh? Oh, thanks. I gotta go home. I need some sleep. Yeah, that's what I need. Some sleep. Aghast at how close he had come to giving himself away, Joe Harrison hurried home. It was Mike the police were looking for, not Joe Harrison. It was Mike whose description they had. Joe Harrison was safe. Safe. Hardly able to believe in his own good luck, Joe reached his home and let himself in. Mary was already asleep. Quietly, he got into bed and at last fell asleep himself. Asleep troubled by nightmares that gave him no peace. When he woke, it was morning and Mary was preparing breakfast. Good morning, darling. What time did you get home anyway? I waited up for you almost till two. I, uh, I was pretty late. I... I stopped at the shop and did a little work. Forgot to watch the time. <laughs> and this morning you looked terrible. I know. You're worrying. About me. But you mustn't, darling. I'm going to be all right. Really, I am. Of course you are. I'm going to see to that. What do you think? Dr. Norris called up last night. He wanted to talk to you. He said he had good news for you. Good news? Mm-hmm. But he wouldn't tell me what it was. I don't know why. He asked for you to stop in at his office this morning. Yeah, I think I know what it is. Yeah, sure. I'll go right over and see him. Oh, but darling, you're going to eat breakfast first, aren't no, you? No, I'll eat when I get back. I, uh, I want to see the doctor first. Anyway, I'm not very hungry. All right, Joe. But please hurry back. I want to know what the doctor says. Yeah, sure, Mary. I'll be right back. But everything's okay now. Everything's okay. After he left the house, Joe bought a morning paper. Big headlines told of the murder the night before, but he scarcely saw them. His eyes hurried through the story until he found what he was looking for. The news that Mike's body had been found. The man Mike had struck had given his butler Mike's description before he died. But he hadn't seen Joe at all. So the police had listed Mike's death as a suicide or an accident and closed the case. Joe Harrison was safe. Perfectly safe. Safe. I'm safe. Sometimes you can't get away with murder and not have to pay anything. If you're lucky, and I've been lucky. When he entered the doctor's office, Joe's expression was that of a man who had just faced disaster and been rescued at the last moment. He seated himself and tossed the folded newspaper into the wastebasket. Good morning, doctor. Mary said you phoned that you had good news. Oh, yes, Mr. Harrison. Yes, I called you last night after I got in touch with the surgeon I spoke of yesterday, Dr. Nelson Richards. I wanted to tell you that he had agreed to operate on your wife. That's well, Doctor, that's well. I got the money right here in my pocket. The money, yes. Yes, I was going to tell you that Dr. Richards had said not to worry about that. You could take as long as you wanted to pay it. As long as I wanted? Then it wasn't necessary. I didn't have to do it. I... I didn't have to do it. I'm, I'm afraid I don't I, understand, Mr. Harrison. Oh, never mind, Doctor. I mean, here's the money. I got it. I got it right here. I, I want to pay for it. He's got to take it right away. What's the matter? Why are you looking at me like that for? The operation is going to cure Mary, isn't it? You said it would. You can't go back on your word now. You can't, do you hear? It's not that, Mr. Harrison. Yes, the chances are the operation would have cured your wife. But... Well, unfortunately, Dr. Richards was the only man in this country able to perform it. Well, so what? He said he'd do it, didn't he? So what's the hitch? Mr. Harrison, Dr. Richards won't perform the operation now. 
Why not? Dr. Richards was tragically killed last night by a burglar who broke into his home on Gramercy Park. This is the mysterious traveler again. Fate plays strange jokes sometimes, doesn't she? Poor Joe Harrison. He forgot that good can never come out of evil and that crime must always be paid for by someone. If only he hadn't let himself be tempted. But he did. Now, what became of him? Why, he devoted himself to taking care of his invalid wife, Mary. But his deed continued to weigh on his mind. And when she died several years later, he confessed everything to the police. I do hope his experience is proof that crime really doesn't pay. I always say... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying... In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Joseph Julian, Elaine Kent, Palmer Ward, Kenny Lynch, and Bill Smith. Original music was played by Charles Paul. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Rob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... Flight from Fear. Another strange and shivery tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual presents the Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Why, today we're going to venture into a fantastic and little-known field. The human mind. It's a story I call... Mind Over Murder. On a stretch of green lawn, at the top of high cliffs looking over the Atlantic Ocean, the great Ricardo who claims to be the world's greatest mind reader, is practicing his art. He's preparing for the vaudeville tour he's soon to begin. Assisting him are his lovely young wife, Ellen, and uh, Carl Lagarde. That's it, Carl. Tie the handkerchief tightly over my eyes. Now, are you sure I can see nothing? Nothing whatever? I know positive you can't, Mr. Ricardo. I'll bet my month's wages on it. You are quite right. My eyes are in darkness. But my mind is not. Ellen? Yes, Ricardo? Did you bring out the basket of books I asked you to? Yes. I have them here. All right, Carl. Go pick a book out of the basket. Any book at all. <laughs> sure thing, Mr. Ricardo. Now what? Now open it to a page. Any page. Have you done this? Yeah. Good. Now concentrate on the book. Think about the title and the number of the page. Think about it now. Ah. Oh, yes, it is coming to me. The title is Murder by Expert. And the page, you have opened it to page 27. That's right, Mr. McCarter. But gosh, I, I don't know how you do it. Well, it's very simple, Carl. With the eyes of my mind, I read your thoughts. Now, I want to try something else. Ellen? Yes, Ricardo. 
Sit in the wicker chair over here on my right. Turn your back to both me and Carl. You, you aren't going to... Please do not argue. Do as I say. Oh, I just can't. Yesterday, my head ached for hours. Please, please don't make me. It would come easier. In time, sit down. All right. All right. Make your mind free of all thoughts. Yes, sir. I want you to look with your mind into Carl. And to read there what his eyes see on the page before him. Must I, Rick? I have said that you must. All right. I'll try. Now, Carl. Yes, Mr. Curdle? Take another book. Open it to the first page of a story and concentrate on it. Right. I get you. Now, Ellen. Read the page at which Carl is looking. I command you... By the powers of the mind, breathe. My head hurts so it's so as if it going to split. Breathe. I, I see something. Words, title, vision, judgment, fire, age, Jesus. Oh. Continue, breathe. No, I can't make it out so good. I can't see anything clearly. Oh, my head. Uh, Carl, was she correct? Uh, well, uh, yes. Well, that's all I want to know. You can leave now. Uh, okay, Mr. Ricardo. Uh, the rules are being watering. I better tend to them right away. Yes, right away. That's the interesting. He's afraid of me. How do you feel, Ellen? My head hurts. Oh, there, there, my dear. It will quickly pass. And in no time you'll find the whole thing as easy as powder in your nose. Ricardo, I can't. I... I, I just can't help you when you're right when you tell me to try to read something in Carl's mind. I feel as if my brain were going to split. You will help me, my beautiful one. You will see. Now, I'm going into the house. You may sit here and look at the ocean until your head feels better. Oh, you will have company. I see my handsome young press agent coming forward. You must be nice to him, Ellen. He's really a very good press agent. Oh, there you are, Ricardo. I was looking for oh. you. It's too bad your mind is one of the few I cannot penetrate, Tom, or I would have known that. Uh, was it about something special? Oh, just about these advanced stories to go out to the Boston editors. I have them all written. Oh, excellent. I'm going up to the house now, and I'll read them right away. Uh, stay and keep Ellen company, Tom. I'll see you both presently. All right, Ricardo. What's the matter, darling? What have you been doing? It's nothing, Tom. I just have a little headache. You're making you work with him in his act again, hasn't you? Please, Tom, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Alan, really. Alan, listen to me. You know things can't go on the way they are. You've got to leave Ricardo, do you hear? Leave him in divorce. No, Tom, I can't. I just can't. You the death of him, but there's no reason to be. He's just a phony mind no, reader. No, Tom. He's not phony. He can read mine. Sometimes he tells me just what I've been thinking. Oh, Tom, if I can think. I wish I could read it, but he won't let me. If I tried, he might do something. Something terrible. No matter what you do, I'm going to get you away from Ricardo. I'll kidnap you if necessary. I'll... Here he comes back. Oh. Well, I'm glad to see you're feeling better, Helen. Is it Tom who has put that sparkle in your eye and that brush in your teeth? I... Of course not. I would not like it if I thought so. I should be very angry if my beloved had eyes for anyone but me. But of course, you haven't. Have you, Ellen? No. No, of course not. For you love me devotedly, do you not? I love you devotedly. You always will in this world and in the next. I always will in this world and the next. There you see, Tom. You see why I dare leave my lovely Ellen alone with you? I have perfect faith in her. When we start our tour week after next, I will be quite busy much of the time, and I hope you won't mind keeping Ellen from being lonely. I'm sure the trip won't bore you. I expect it to be most entertaining. <laughs> Ellen, 
The train's just coming into Bridgeville. The car is still in the diner. Are you ready? Yes, I, I just don't for putting on my hat and coat. I didn't pass anything because you said not to, but... Oh, Tom, I'm Helen, you've got to get hold of yourself. Ricardo's not superhuman. No, sometimes I think he is, Tom. I'm positive that he knows everything we think. He's just playing with it. He seems so, so amused ever since the tour started. He seems to have been deliberately throwing us together just to see what happens. Stop worrying. In a minute, you'll be through with him forever. The bus for Chicago leaving Bridgeville five minutes after we get off. In Chicago, you can stay with my mother until you can get a divorce. Then you're going to marry me. Tom, the way. That's the whistle for Bridgeville. We're going to the station. Quick, get your coat. All right, Tom, tell me what it is. I'll give you a hand here. You got it on? What? Ricardo! Yes, my dear. I was worrying about your headache, so I left my lunch to come and see how you were. Well, I'm feeling a little better. I was going to take a walk on the platform and get some coffee. Yes, I see you have your coat out. Oh, but alas, we only stopped for a minute. Hardly long enough for a walk. No, no, I, I suppose not. Uh, so, uh, this is Bridgeville. The pretty town. On the main bus route to Chicago, I understand. Uh, is it? Uh, Someday I shall show you Chicago, Ellis. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Yes. I would like that. Ricardo, stop torturing. Torturing? Ellen? Why, Tom, what a curious idea I would give my life for Ellen. And she for me, wouldn't you, darling? Yes. I'd give my life for you. To most people that is an empty phrase, but Ellen means it. I will prove it to you, Tom. I'm not interested. Oh, but you are. Ellen, my love. Yes, Ricardo. Ellen, I'm taking a revolver from my pocket. Here, now you take it from me. Yes, Ricardo. What are you up to? Point the revolver at your heart, my dear, and pull the trigger. Yes, Ricardo. Ellen, stop! Stop! No, Tom. Go, my you shall not interfere. Oh. Ellen, pull oh. the trigger. Yes. Yeah. I'll pull it. Ellen! You... Uh, nothing happened. No, of course not. The gun was empty. But Ellen didn't know that, did you, my darling? No. I didn't know and that. So she would have died just because I asked her to. Such devotion is very rare. It is the kind that lasts through all eternity as ours do. For we shall always be together, Ellen and I... While we live, and after we die, nothing will ever separate us. Nothing, whatever. And so the great Ricardo's triumphal tour continued. Newspaper stories told of his amazing feats, and of the feats almost as marvelous performed at his direction by his pale and lovely wife. Twice Tom urged Ellen to flee with him, but both times Ricardo appeared upon the scene, smiling as though knowing every word that had been said. So at last Tom changed his tactics. Waiting until one evening when Ricardo was in the midst of his performance, concentrating on holding a great audience spellbound. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Someone among you is thinking of the initials E N. Somebody quite close to me. Tom Some listened for a moment, but he was quite sure that Ricardo's attention was fully absorbed. Then he left his place in the wings and slipped swiftly backstage to knock on a door marked with a gold star. Ellen. Oh, yes, Tom. I want to talk to you. You shouldn't be here, Tom. Ricardo Never mind, Ricardo. Put on your coat. My coat? But the performance won't be over for half an hour. Ellen. Ellen, I've got a plan to fool Ricardo. Will you trust me? Oh, but if he catches us, he might kill you. If there's one time, he's not going to be clever enough. Just put on your coat and come along without asking any questions. <laughs> But 
Uh, where are we, Tom? We've been driving for an hour, turning this way and that, and I haven't any idea which way we've come. Well, you're not supposed to have, Ellen. Don't you see, if you don't know where you are, Ricardo can never know either, even if he can make contact with your mind from this distance. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> but I did. So this time I made my plans without telling you. They filled you in. Oh, what a quaint little place, Tom. Oh, what a lovely view over the hill. Yes, it's, it's a funny little place. I found the ad in the paper. But there. I've engaged a room for you and one for me. We'll stay here tonight. Tomorrow, Ricardo will be in Buffalo, and we'll be heading in the opposite direction. Tom. There's someone standing in the shadow beside the porch. That's probably the manager waiting for us. Is that you, Mr. Adam? Uh, no, Tom. This is I, the cop. Oh, Ricardo. Yes, my beloved. I've been waiting for you. What took you so long, Tom? How did you get here? How did you know we were coming here? Why, Tom, it was I who told you to bring Ellen here. That's a lie. No one knew we were coming here but myself. Did you think this was your idea? On the contrary, I put the thought into your head every bit of it. That's impossible. I even suggested to you to look in the paper where you could find the advertisement for this delightful little thing. I, I don't believe it. Yes, Tom, at last, after painful effort, I have succeeded in forcing my thoughts into your mind. And now, now I have another little matter to settle with you. Your undesired attention to my wife. Ellen isn't your wife anymore, Ricardo. She's left you for good. Ellen, is that true? No, Ricardo. I love you. Ellen, he's making you say that. Ellen, my dear, tell Tom just how you feel towards him. I've been playing with you, Tom, to amuse myself. You've been very stupid not to realize me. I'm not impressed by your tricks, Ricardo. Ellen is leaving here with me now. Ellen is not leaving. But you are. You see that railing behind you? Beyond it is a 50-foot drop to a rocky ledge. What of it? In a moment, you are going to fall accidentally over that railing and be killed. You see, there are only the two of us. And I am far stronger than you. So, uh, now, I will show you a trick of oriental wrestling. Come on, look out. He's walking me down the uh, railing. Maybe I know some tricks. Uh, Who, Ricardo? Now, how do you like this one? Ah! Uh, 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 look. He's lying down there on the ledge. His body's all twisted. Yeah. I'm... I'm afraid he's dead. No. No, he isn't. He's alive. He's in pain. He's making me feel pain, too. No, Ricardo. No. Stop it. Stop it. No, the great Ricardo, mind reader extraordinary, was not dead. A week afterwards, he hovered on the borderline between life and death. And then as if pulling himself back to life by the sheer strength of his will, he slowly won his fight. But though he lived, his fall had paralyzed his body, leaving only his mind truly alive. He lay in a hospital bed, still breathing, but unable to move, to speak, or even to open his eyes. So... So he's definitely going to live. There's no longer any doubt of it. It's almost a miracle. I didn't think any man could survive such an injury. He wouldn't let himself die. Well, most of us want to live, I discovered. I mean, he deliberately refused to die. He kept saying to himself, I will not die. I will not die. You could hear him? But he's paralyzed. He can't speak. I could hear his voice. In my mind. Oh, I see. Yes, he's going to live. But he'll never move, nor speak, nor see again. Yes, he knows that. I beg your pardon? Ricardo knows that he'll never recover. He wants to go home. I have to take him there. I will look after him. But Ellen, you can't. I have to. I'm his prisoner again. Prisoner of his mind. 
And this time I'll never escape. And so the great Ricardo returned home. A living dead man. There in the house on the cliff, aided only by a nurse who relieved her at night, Ellen cared for him. Tom stayed close by to help her in any way he could, and did his best to persuade her to turn Ricardo's care over to professional nurses. Ellen, listen to me. You can't ruin your life like this just to care for a man you hate. I have to. I can't go away. He won't let me leave the house. If I do, I find myself turning back without knowing what I'm doing. But, Ellen, you can't... My mind isn't my own. Be controlled. Lying in his bed in that room there. Never moving. Ricardo controls my mind. Oh, Ellen, I'm sure that's just the delusion of psychiatrists could prove it to you. Ricardo was injured, helpless. But his he... mind isn't. More powerful than ever. All his strength is concentrated in it. If it went for the power of his will, he died. But he doesn't want to die. He's planning something. Planning what? I don't know. But he still hates you and wants revenge. How oh, you are letting your imagination run away with you. What can a man in Ricardo's condition do? I don't know, but he has something in his mind. Tell him you're overwrought. You need sleep. You... Look, darling. Why not take a sedative and go to bed? And in the morning, we can talk again. I have to wait until the night, nurse. All right, I'll stay with him until then. Now, go on, go on. Get to bed. All right, Tom. I do need rest. But uh, you better wait in the room with him. I'll, I'll go in now. Good night, Ellen. Good night, Tom. Oh, there you are. The great Ricard. A man who was better than anyone else in the world. And now you're a living dead man. I wish you were a dead one. Then why don't you kill me now? Huh? What? Why don't you kill me? Just put your hand over my mouth for a moment and you'll be rid of me. Carter. You can't be talking. You're paralyzed. I can speak to you, Tom. I speak with my mind, not with my voice. No, I, I don't believe it. Now you are trying to get Ellen to leave me, but she never will. Ellen and I are joined together for all eternity. I'm going to free her from you somehow. Do you hear, Ricardo? Oh, now you're threatening me. That means you do believe my mind can speak to yours. Good. We'll have many interesting conversations in the days to come. Now I'm going to rest. Good night, Tom. I shall see you tomorrow. You won't want to come, but you will. Ah, oh, Tom. It is good of you to pay me another visit. I was hoping you would come. In fact, I might say I was willing it, and you came. Oh, it's true. I was trying to convince myself I'd, I'd imagine this. Stubborn, stupid Tom, always fighting against the inevitable. You tried to stay away today, didn't you? But you couldn't. No, I couldn't. And you're convinced now you're not suffering from a delusion. All right, all right. Not a delusion. So what, Ricardo? I have some interesting information for you. But first, sit down. I think I'll stand. Sit down. I won't. I... <laughs> you see, you are seated. Are you? Yes. My mind and the stamps control over your mind. <laughs> so sit quietly and hear what I have to say. All right. What is this information of yours? I am dying. You're 
don't think that makes me sorry, do you? You could hurt Ellen. I'd kill you myself. No, no, Tom. You will kill me. You are going to kill Ellen. No, that's impossible. There is a drawer in that table beside you. Open it. No. Open it. No. You. You. In the drawer is my revolver. Pick it up. No. You pick it up. Well, with that gun, you are going to shoot Ellen. You will be executed for it as a murderer, and thus I will have my revenge. Because we shall die almost at the same instant, my soul and Ellen's will be forever joined. No, you can't force me to hurt Ellen. That's one thing you can't do. Stand up. No, you... Oh. You see, my mind does control yours. Though I lie here helpless, but I command you must do... Our... Shoot you instead! Of... You see, you cannot even lift the gun. Now listen to me. Behind that screen, across the room, is a couch. There, Ellen lies asleep at my orders. You will walk over there. You will point the gun at her forehead, and you will pull the trigger. You can't make me do that. Walk, Tom. No, I. Keep on. Oh. Another step. Make sure that you die too, Ricardo. That is not necessary. I am going now of my own accord. I am relaxing. I am letting my senses get into the dark silence of death where Ellen is waiting for me. She's there. She's just across the threshold, waiting for me. I shot you. I, I thought I killed you. Huh? Killed you? Yes, but I, I, I didn't. I, I only wounded you. Careful. Oh, I, I don't understand, Tony. Where is it? It's a car, do I? Stranger seeing that he's gone. He is gone. He is gone. Oh, I see it all now. I thought I'd killed you. Because I thought so. Ricardo thought so, too. But I was wrong. And because I was wrong, he was wrong, too. No. He's 
dead? Yes, Adam. Free of them. Free of them forever. <laughs> Ricardo made a mistake and let himself die believing that you were already dead. Oh, yes, my darling. This time he's gone for good. Ricardo was clever. But in the end, he outwitted himself. Mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? What became of Tom and Ellen? Why, Ellen's wound was serious, but far from fatal. Not nearly as fatal as Ricardo's mistake. Tom and Ellen are very happy now. But I wonder if they're as safe as they think they are. When you're dealing with a mind like Ricardo's, can you ever be quite sure... Even though he is dead. I knew a man once everybody thought was dead, and he... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. You see, I take the same train every week at this time. Just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Toplin, James Van Dyke, Jan Minor, Ian Martin, and Rod Hendrickson. Original music was played by Charles Paul. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled Death and the Devil. Another strange and terrifying tale of the mysterious traveler. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Today we're going to delve into the strange story of a Chinese bell. A bell whose ringing is a summons for the dead to live and the living to die. As you shall see in the story I call... Death is the Judge. Our story begins in a small curio shop in New York's Chinatown. Dr. John Williams, one of the finest brain surgeons in the Middle West, and his wife are celebrating their 20th wedding anniversary by a trip to New York. They have stopped in at this curio shop for sentimental reasons, just as they did on their honeymoon 20 years before. Oh, John, it's the same. It's exactly the same as it was. <laughs> Doesn't look as if a thing had been sold since we were in here last. It certainly doesn't. If it wasn't that old Key Wong is dead now, I'd be tempted to believe we'd gone back 20 years when we came through the door. Even the smell of incense and ginger is the same. Mm. We must buy something, John, even if it's only a trinket. Just for sentiment's sake. If you want a trinket, how about this statue of Buddha here, huh? It only weighs about three tons. Oh, silly. <laughs> but what about one of these bells, John? We need a dinner bell. How would this one do, hmm? That would be better for a temple gong, darling. Better try again. All right, John. Oh, I have it. This lovely little bell of rose crystal. Why, why it's the exact color of that rose 
crystal pendant old Ki Wong sold us on our honeymoon. The lady has found something that pleases her. Uh, yes, this crystal bell. How much is it? And please don't make the price too high. The price is not high, but the lady would not want it. But I do want it. Why should you think I wouldn't? Once it was a most unlucky bell. Now it is broken. My honored father, Ki Wong, broke it to break the evil fortune that followed it. Broken? Where? Looks all right to me. It is broken because it will not ring. The clapper is gone. That's right, Mary. The clapper is missing. But I could easily have a new clapper made. It is not possible. Only the clapper carved when this bell was carved out of the same block of rose crystal will make this bell ring. But that's ridiculous. I never heard of such a thing. Oh, we can test it easily enough. Suppose I tap it with this silver pencil. That ought to make it ring. I am happy to have you try. Huh. That's odd. It won't make anything but that dead sound. I'll bet I could make it ring. <laughs> You're welcome to try, my no, dear. No, I, I don't mean now. I mean once I got it home. When my honored father took out the clapper, he meant that this bell should never ring again. And it never will. But why, Sam Key? Because bell was stolen. And so carried evil fortune with it. And because it is a bell of life. It came from a temple in Tibet. Only lamas were permitted to lay hands on it. But obviously someone else did. That is why it is unlucky. When my father received it 20 years ago, he took out the clapper and disposed of it. I do not know where or to whom. But why? Just... Just what was he afraid of? He dare not risk having this bell ring, for it belonged to the High Lama of a tribe that believed the ringing of this bell will bring the dead back to life. What? You mean this bell? Yes, yes. You, you look skeptical, but it is true. When someone died whose life was too precious to spare, this sacred bell was rung beside his body... And death uh, uh, let go his hold. The dead return to life. You mean you you really believe that? It is true. But I, I have not told the whole story. This carving here upon the bell, it is Tibetan. It says, who rings this bell cheats death. But death will not be cheated. A little cryptic, I'd say. It means that when the bell is used to rescue someone from death, another whose span of life is not yet over is taken by death instead. You mean that the Grim Reaper keeps his quota filled even if he has to take somebody who's not on his list? It is so, Doctor. John, you're talking as if you believe the whole thing. It's, it's just nonsense, of course. <laughs> but what a lovely topic for conversation it'll make. Oh, I just simply won't leave without this bell now. But if it won't ring, what good is it? I'll make it ring. Leave that to me. If the lady wishes the bell, the price is five dollars. Well, the lady wants it, so she'd better have it, I guess. Oh, <clears throat> I don't want to risk breaking it while we're traveling, though. Uh, can you mail it to our home address? Of course. The name is Dr. John Williams, 1767. <laughs> And so, a week later, shortly after Dr. Williams and his wife had returned home, a small package reached them. As he unwrapped it, Dr. Williams' curiosity was stirred again, and in his study he tried once more to make the strange bell of rose crystal ring. Hmm, curious. It really won't ring, no matter what I tap it with. Hmm. John. Oh, hello, Mary. You're home from the hospital early, dear. Yes, I felt a little tired today. But look what just came in the mail. Oh, why is my crystal bell? Mm -hmm. Oh, John, it's lovely. I it's even more beautiful than I remembered it. Yes, but I'm afraid Sam Key was telling the truth when he said only the original clapper will make it ring. I've tried everything I can think of. <laughs> the trouble with men, darling is that they're not logical. What do you mean? Well, if the ball is of rose crystal, a rose crystal clapper should make it ring, shouldn't it? The logic is perfect, but how can we test it? By using my rose crystal pendant, of course. I'm wearing it this afternoon so we can try it out right away. Here, see? Uh, now what? You hold the bell, 
And I'll tap it with a pendant. All right, tap away, but I bet it doesn't ring. You'll see. Now listen. There. What'd I tell you? It did ring. Of course it did. <laughs> I was sure it would, even if Sam Key's story was true. John, don't you see? Don't I see what? Well, my crystal pendant is the bell's missing clapper. The missing clapper? Mm-hmm. Good heavens, I almost believe you're right. Well, I am right. As soon as Sam Key told us how his father took the clapper out of the bell and sold it 20 years ago, mm-hmm. <clears throat> well... I was positive he'd made it into the pendant that he sold us 20 years ago. It should be impossible, but it certainly looks as if it must be true. After all these years, the bell and the clapper have come back together again. Hmm. You know, I knew there was something queer about that bell the minute I saw it. Queerest feeling came over me that I... I just must have it. I'm not sure that I like that thought, oh, Mary. silly. I know you half believe that story Sam Key told us. But I didn't. Now, I have my bell complete. Now, all I have to do is unfasten the pendant and attach it to the bell again. But, Mary... Now, help me do it, John. Look, the pendant's loose. It'll come off the chain if I twist it. Uh, uh, yes. Here it is. Mary, are you sure this is wise? Now, if I tie it inside the bell with this thread... Darling, please hold it so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, there. Now, it's as good as new again. Listen. Mary, uh... uh John. John, what is uh, it? I don't know. I I don't feel well. Oh, you're tired, darling. Now, please sit down. Sit down here. I, I will. Well, I feel better now. It was just a moment's dizziness. You're working too hard at the hospital. That's what's the trouble. Well, maybe. I admit I had a strenuous day. I spent two hours on a brain operation. A splendid boy. He looked a lot like our David. But he'll be good for another 50 years now. With luck. Just the same. You must take it easier, John. Now, you sit still here while I fix you some spirits of ammonia, and then... Well, that's probably for me. Now, I'll you sit it. still. I'll answer. Hello? Yes, Dr. Williams is here. Who's calling, please? The hospital? Oh. Uh, yes, I'll tell him. Uh, goodbye. Mary, what's happened at the hospital? It's an emergency case, John. Another brain operation. And, oh, darling, you are so tired. Can't be helped. I'm the only brain surgeon in town these days. Uh, help me get into my coat, will you? Uh, where's my hat? Oh, here you are, oh, dear. Thanks. Now let me straighten your tie. All right. There, you're ready. Uh, I'm going to drive you over, and you can relax until we get there. All right, then, but let's get going. The almost five miles to the hospital. Nurse, another sponge, please. Here, Doctor. Dr. Williams, the pulse is very faint. The breathing has become dangerously weak. I'll have to try adrenaline. The hypodermic nurse. Uh, Yes, Doctor. I'll get it ready. The patient has stopped breathing, Doctor. And there's no pulse. Quick with that adrenaline. We've got to get the pulse started again. Here, Doctor. Good. That ought to start the heart action again. There's still no pulse, Doctor. We'll try artificial respiration. Yes, Doctor. Oxygen, nurse, quickly. Keep the pressure steady, nurse. Johnson, any pulse yet? Not yet, Doctor. The adrenaline doesn't seem to have taken effect. Well, it must. Nurse, give me more oxygen. I'm going to continue the artificial respiration as long as there's a single chance. I'm afraid it's no use, Doctor. No sign of a pulse at all. Dr. Williams, please rest now. You've done everything that anyone could. But he hasn't shown a sign of life, not for half an hour. Yes, I'm afraid we're beaten. If anyone could have saved him, you'd have done it. But death had, well, too strong a grip on him for anyone to bring him back. Too strong a grip. Yes, I do rather feel as if I'd been wrestling with someone for this poor fellow's life. And lost. Well, Doctor, don't feel too badly. In room eight, there's a boy who has a full life ahead of him, thanks to you. I suppose I have to look at it that way. Now, help me off with these things, will you, nurse? Of course, Doctor. There's the gloves and the jacket. Now, what did I do with my coat? I just threw it down somewhere when I arrived here. I was in such a hurry. I've got it, Doctor. 
Let me help you. Oh, thanks, Johnson. <laughs> what the deuce have I got in this pocket? It's that bell. I must have jammed it into my coat without thinking in the rush to get here. Oh, look out. Catch it. <laughs> oh, I have it. Ooh, that was close. <laughs> Might have smashed on the floor. Here you are, Dr. Thanks. I almost wish it had broken, though. For some reason, I hate the sound of it. But my wife... Dr. Williams. Uh, yes, nurse? The patient. The color's coming back in his face, and... And I can feel a pulse now. What? Now, let me see. Yes, you're right. His heart's beating again. Look. He's beginning to breathe. Quick, start the oxygen again. I'm going to give him an injection of plasma. Make the preparation, please, Johnson. Yes, Dr. Williams. How is the pulse now, nurse? It's getting stronger, Doctor. His respiration is gaining, too. Yes, Doctor. I've never seen anything like it. It's almost a miracle. Now, where's that plasma? Here, Doctor. I have everything ready. Good. Nurse, disinfect the arm, please. Right away, Dr. Williams. Oh, here comes Dr. Bronson. How's it going, Williams? Been having trouble? Oh, hello, Bronson. Yes, a little trouble, but I think we're in the clear now. For a while, I thought the patient was gone, but now he's going to pull through, I'm sure of it. Good. Doctor, I'm afraid I have bad news for you about your other patient, though. What do you mean? The boy in room eight. The one you operated on this afternoon. Yeah. He died suddenly just a couple of minutes ago. Just went like that for no reason at all. Dr. William's second patient, who had come back seemingly from death itself, did live. But when the operation was over and Dr. Williams was driving back to his home with his wife... He was strangely silent and preoccupied, so that when his wife spoke to him, he did not seem to hear her. Don't you want me to drive, John? John, I'm speaking to you. Oh, uh, oh what, Mary? I said, don't you want me to drive? Oh, uh, no, thanks, Mary. I'm perfectly all right. It's just that I was thinking. About that operation? Yes, the nurse told me about it. It was wonderful that you saved him. That's just it. I didn't save him. He was dead. Dead, do you hear? Then for no reason whatever, he came back to life. But you injected adrenaline and... I injected adrenaline half an hour before he showed signs of life. Then he revived. For no apparent reason whatever. Well, perhaps the adrenaline took a delayed effect. Perhaps. But there was no more reason for it than there was for the boy in room eight to die suddenly as he did. But you've said yourself, John, that in medicine, nothing is ever absolutely certain. That's true. But just the same, that boy's sudden death bothers me. I want to know why he died. Well, an autopsy would tell you, wouldn't it? An autopsy? Yes. Mary, I'm going to turn around and go back to the hospital right now. I'm going to perform that autopsy myself. But, John, you mustn't turn here. There's too much traffic oh, here. Oh, there's nothing coming now. I'll just swing around. And... John! John, look out! That car coming around the car! Look out! <laughs> Stand back, all of you. Come on, get back. Now, lady, drink this. It'll make you feel better. Thank you, officer. You were in an accident and knocked out for a couple of minutes. But you're coming around all right. Just drink this and lie quiet. An accident? Yes. My husband, where is he? I'm sorry, ma'am. Oh, he's hurt. Where is he? I I must go to him. Uh, He's right here, ma'am. When I come along on my motorcycle after it happened, I pulled you both out. But he wasn't breathing. John. John, speak to me. It's no use, ma'am. I'm afraid he's gone. John. John. Come on, get back, all of you. Get back, I say. (laughs) Well, ma'am, the ambulance will be here in a minute. If there's anything to be done, they'll do it. There's nothing. I've been a doctor's wife long enough not to know death when I see it. Just let me sit here. Where I can see him. I know how you feel, ma'am, and I hate to bother you. But if you could just tell me how it happened for my report. You see, the other driver says... It wasn't my fault. I couldn't help it. He pulled right out in front of me. He didn't even signal. I... Now, take he it easy, to... mister. Or you'll make that bump on your head worse. Officer, where's my bag? There's some smelling salts in it. I, I feel faint. Well, here's your bag. I took care of it. Thank you. I'll feel better in a minute. And here's something that was in the bag, ma'am. 
fell out and I put it in my pocket. Uh, it's a bell. I'll put it in your bag if you like. Mary. Thank you so much. Oh, Mary. All right. John. John. Was that a bell ringing? It seemed so, so loud and clear, like an alarm waking me up. What's happened, Mary? It was an accident, John. But you're all right. You're all right. An accident? Are you hurt? No, John, no. no. Please, please lie still. He's trying to sit up. And only a moment ago, he was dead. Gee, I'm glad he's okay, even though the accident wasn't my fault. Hey, mister, I'll, I'll give you a hand. I, uh, officer... Officer, I... What's wrong? I told you to be careful. You got quite a bump on the head. Officer, I feel... I feel so weak, so dizzy. Oh, he's keeled over. Where are those smelling salts? Here, let me look at him. I'm a doctor. John, you shouldn't exert yourself. Oh, please, Mary. How is he, Doc? This man is dead. Though Dr. Wilson protested that his injuries were not serious, he returned to the hospital where Dr. Bronson treated him, finding nothing wrong save a slight concussion. His wife took him home in a taxi cab, promising to see that he stayed in bed for a day or two. That night, however, neither Dr. Williams nor his wife could sleep, though they remained awake for uh, different reasons. Ten, eleven, twelve. Mary, is that you? I, I was counting the strokes. It's midnight. You should be asleep. <laughs> Can't go to sleep. Not until David gets home. David? Where is he? The movie? No. He came to me this afternoon and said there was a party at his fraternity tonight. He asked me if he could borrow the old car for the evening, and I let him have it. But he's not back yet, John. I can't help worrying. Especially after what happened to us. Well, I'll give him a talking to in the morning. A boy of 17 isn't old enough to be out until all hours. You ought to be asleep yourself, John. How's your head? It's all right. Just throbs a little. All I had was a slight concussion. John... Are you sure? Of course I am. Didn't you hear Bronson say so? What are you getting at? The bell. The crystal bell. Well, what about the bell? Your first words were about hearing it ring like an alarm wakening you. And it, it had just rung. Well, what of it? It rang and I heard it as I was regaining consciousness. But at the hospital, the bell rang in the operating room. And your patient came back to life. He, he heard the bell ring too. Oh, don't be silly, Mary. My patient revived for natural reasons. As for me, I was just knocked out. And But both times, somebody else died, John. At the hospital, the boy in room eight. And after you returned, the driver in the other car died. Pure coincidence. The boy probably had a blood clot on his heart. The driver had a fractured skull. It's a common occurrence for men with fractured skulls to keel over without even realizing they're hurt. But Sam Key told us that when the bell rang, the dead would return to life. And someone living would die. Oh, stuff and nonsense, Mary. You've been a doctor's wife long enough to know that such thing isn't possible. But, John, I... No, no buts about it. It's impossible, do you hear? Yes, John. Of course it's impossible. Oh, I do wish David would get home. I feel so uneasy about him. He'll be home any minute now. He knows that he's supposed to... Oh, it's the telephone. Well, I'll answer. No. No, let me... No, stay in bed. I'll answer. Oh, all right, John. It'll only be a moment. Hello, Dr. Williams speaking. Uh, The police? What is it? What's happened? An accident. My son? Where is he? Is he badly hurt? The car turned over and burned. And my son? I see. The Rockford Village Morgue. Yes, I'll... Come at once. John, what was it? Mary, I I told you to stay in bed. It was just an emergency call. It's David, isn't it? Yes, it is David. I can tell by your face. Where is he? What's happened to him? He's been in an accident, Mary. He... David is dead. Is that it, John? Yes, Mary. Take me to him. Oh, John, you've got to take me to him. (laughs) 
Well, this is the place, mister. The Rockford Village Morgue. Cross the pavement, go down those steps, then along the walk to where you see that little light over the door. Well, thank you. Mary, you must wait in the cab for me. I want to come with you. No, you mustn't. Promise me you'll wait here. I want to come with you. I want to see my son. Not yet. Promise you'll wait for me. Oh, all right, John. I'll wait. Be careful of those steps, mister. They're pretty steep and it's awful dark. So I'll be careful. I'll only be five minutes or so, Mary. Comes your husband back now, ma'am. John. Oh, John. Was it David? Please get back in the cab. Mary. No, John, I must know. Was it David? Yes, Mary, it, it was David. Oh, I have to go to him. Mary, stop. No, let go of me. I'm going to David. Mary, stop struggling. You can't go to I him. must. I, I must. Mary, don't you understand? You mustn't see him. I'm going, John. What have you got in your hand? It's the bell, the crystal bell. What are you doing with it? Here, give it to me. No, I'm going to ring it. Oh, give me that bell. No, I won't. I'm going to ring it, I tell you. There. There, I've rung it. I've rung it. David. David, did you hear? Mary, you're out of your mind. I'm not. I know what I'm doing. David. Can you hear me? Now give me that bell. There. In heaven's name, what are you trying to do? It brought back your patient. It brought you back. And it'll bring back my son. Mary, come to your senses. It's just a bell. It's not. I know it's not. You were dead. And I saw it bring you back to life. You mustn't believe that. And even if the bell were more than a bell. Don't you understand? The car turned over and burned. I had to identify David by his fraternity ring. And the driver's license in his wallet. I don't care. He's my son. David! David! Mary, get into the cab. I won't. Not until I have my son back. David! Mary, won't you please? Mother! Mother! John. It's David. Mother! David. Mary, don't you understand? He was burned, burned horribly. Mother, Dad, where are you? Mary. Let go of me. He's my son and I'm going to him. David. David. Mary, come back. Mary, don't go down those steps to the morgue. David. David. Mary, come back. Come back. Hey, mister, watch yourself. Look out for them steps. Mary. Mary. (laughs) Mister, look out. Mister, are you hurt? Gosh, she fell all the way down the steps. Mister, are you all right? Here, let me help you. Dad! Dad, here I am. I'm all right. I wasn't in the car at all. It was one of my fraternity brothers. I lent him my driver's license and... Dad. Dad, what is it? What's wrong? He started this way and fell down these steps. But... Why is he so still? Dad. Dad, speak to him. John. John, speak to us. David's all right, do you hear? David's come back to us. He's come back from the dead. He doesn't answer. He isn't breathing. David. He's dead. Yeah, lady. I guess he is. You see this glass bell he was holding? When he fell down, it broke. Looks like one of the pieces of it went straight into his heart. The bell killed him. Dr. Williams was dead, but his son is alive and well, even today. Although it wasn't because the bell rang. Of course not. Anyhow, the bell is broken, so there's no way of proving whether or not it had strange powers of life and death. Or whether it was just a coincidence that each time it rang, one of the dead lived and the living died. 
But if I were you, I'd certainly play safe. If you hear a bell ringing tonight, don't answer it. It might be ringing. Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train each week at this time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Cameron Prudholm, Eleanor Phelps, Donald Buca, Juan Hernandez, and Mort Lawrence. Original music was played by Charles Paul. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled, Meet Me at the Morgue. Another strange and shivery tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Ralph Paul speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable. If you can. Oh, by the way, did you have a good vacation this summer? A nice quiet time. No unusual excitement. No uh, unpleasant events that shook your nerves so that you jump when a strange hand knocks on your window at midnight or uh, slow, heavy footsteps come up to your door. That's good. Then you're in shape to go on another vacation with me tonight. It's the story I call... Vacation from Life. The spot I have in mind for your vacation is a tiny harbor along the northern main coast. An isolated beach reached only by boat from the nearest town two miles away. And so lonely, there's only a single cottage. But it's going to be vacant soon. The present owner won't be needing it after tonight. My name is Matthew Clark. I am 40 years old and I teach Greek in New York City. I suppose you could say I'm a typical professor since I wear glasses, stoop a little... I'm absent-minded at times, and as my wife has said so many times in the ten years we've been married, I hardly know a screwdriver from a monkey wrench or how to replace a burnt-out electric light bulb. A fumbler. That's her favorite word to describe me. Well, she's going to find out it's not true. She's... But I mustn't get excited. I won't be able to finish this if I... if I don't keep calm. I'm writing this in our cottage on Desolation Beach in Maine. It's almost dark, and the waves are pounding on the sand. The wind is rising. There's a real northeaster coming. But four days ago, when I came up here to open the cottage, the sun shone, the water sparkled, and except for the driftwood and seaweed along the beach, there wasn't a hint of the fierce storms that can lash this shore. I made sure that the cottage was in good shape, aired the rooms and put away the stock of provisions that Seth Thompson had brought from me from the village in his boat. 
And then while I waited for Seth to call for me, I walked along the beach, poking into the piles of driftwood like a boy searching for treasure. And I found it. I found something that set my heart to pounding and brought a flush of excitement to my face. Something that roused my imagination to a feverish pitch. It was a mine. A naval mine torn loose from its moorings someplace in the Atlantic during the war and tossed ashore at last here at my feet. It was hidden under seaweed, a three-foot steel ball with 500 pounds of TNT inside it, waiting for an incautious touch to set it off. When I saw it, I started back in alarm. And then in a flash, I knew. Knew what a treasure I'd found and what it was going to mean to me. I was gloating over it so that I didn't even hear Seth's boat arrive at my dock until he called to me. Professor, you about ready to be heading for town? I turned to see Seth stepping down off my dock. I hurried toward him. Yes, Seth, I'm ready. I um, was just uh, stretching my legs while I waited. Seen you poking around that driftwood. I figured maybe you'd found something worthwhile. Seth, what I found was a very dead codfish, an extremely odorous one. <laughs> well, here's the boat. I'll get in. Professor, for Pete's sake, don't never step right on the gunwale of a boat when it's rocking. You'll either fall into the boat and break a leg or... Over the side, maybe drown. Oh, yes, of course, you've told me that before, haven't you? Not more than 11 times. Yeah, I'll hop in first. Now, give me a hand. That's it. Now, jump down here beside me. Huh? Professor, look out. Ouch! Oh, Professor, when you lose your balance in a boat, don't ever grab the engine. It's usually hot. Let me see how bad you burned your hand. Well, it, it, it's not too bad. It, it was clumsy of me, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. The burn ain't bad. Just a little engine grease and fix it up. There. Now you sit down back there. Very well, Seth. You stay set down. Truth is, Professor, I don't trust you on machinery no more than I would a baby. My hand burned painfully, but I was too elated to notice. All the way back to the village, and then by train to New York, thoughts and plans raced through my mind. I formulated and discarded half a dozen schemes until the right one came to me. So simple, it would be impossible to go wrong. And then I fell asleep as peacefully as a child. In New York next morning, I hurried down to 10th Street to a tiny apartment six flights up and eagerly rapped on the brass knocker. Why, Matthew. Matthew, it's you. Yes, Ruth. I, I know you didn't expect me so early, but uh, here I am. Oh, I didn't expect you so early, but I am glad to see you. Won't you come in? Thank you. I'll make you some coffee. Sit down and be comfortable. I'll only be a moment. As Ruth bustled around making coffee, I sat down and relaxed. The tiny apartment was soothing. There was an atmosphere of peace and quiet about it that delighted me... And Ruth herself delighted me even more. She was small, charmingly feminine. She was a teacher, too, of ancient history. We'd met during one of my summer lectures at the university and quickly found much in common. One of our favorite pastimes was to discuss the life of the ancient world. Uh, perhaps the Punic War or the history of Greece. She from the standpoint of the historian, I from that of a student of the language and literature. Here, Matthew. Drink this. It's hot and strong the way you like it. Thank you. Oh! Oh, look out! You almost dropped it. Why, Matthew, you've hurt your hand. What have you done to it? It's just a little burn. Nothing to worry about. Matthew, you must take care of yourself. I'm going to fix that burn. Have some lotion right here and bandages. Just sit and drink your coffee while I take care of it. And tell me all about the cottage and the trip and everything. The touch of her fingers was amazingly soothing, and as she bandaged my hand, I told her of my trip, though I said nothing of the mine that I'd found on the beach. She listened to me as a woman should, with interest and appreciation. She made me forget my clumsiness, my awkwardness at conversation, my... I cannot deny it, my insignificance in the world... No wonder I loved her with a devotion that my friends would have thought impossible in poor, dull, dry Matthew Clark, professor of Greek. It was with reluctance that I said goodbye when I'd finished my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know you have to go, Matthew, but sweet of you to drop in. You know that I'd come oftener if I could, Ruth. Of course, Matthew. I understand. Will I... Will I see you again before you take your vacation? Of course, my dear. I'll stop in day after tomorrow. And, uh, Ruth... Yes, Matthew? I hope to have some news for you then. Some good news. Oh, Matthew, you mean... Yes, my dear, I hope so. But for now, au revoir. How different it was when I reached my own apartment in Washington Square. Louise, my wife, greeted me with a brisk contempt, which has been her attitude toward me almost from the first week that we were married. Is that you, Matthew? Yes. Oh, so you're home. Yes, I'm home. Safe and sound, my dear. Safe, but not completely sound, I see. That bandage on your hand, what did you do to yourself this time? Oh, I, uh, uh, I burned myself slightly on the engine of Seth Thompson's boat. Well, you wouldn't be you if you didn't hurt yourself somehow. Who put the bandage on? I see it's fresh. The bandage... Uh, a very nice young lady in the drugstore at the station fixed it. You see, I, uh, I uh, stopped by to buy some ointment. Never she mind that... the details. Now, I suppose you want me to drop everything and fix some breakfast for you. Oh, no, my dear, no. I, uh, I had a cup of coffee at the drugstore. Well, thank goodness for that. Well, how's the cottage? I suppose it had been broken into and half our things stolen. Oh, no, it was in fine shape. One of the shutters was blown off, that was all. What about the electricity? I suppose you forgot to have it turned on. No, my dear, I attended to that first thing. The place is ready and waiting for us. Well, I can hardly believe you haven't forgotten something. But I can't stand here talking. I have things to do. I suppose uh, you'll want to rest. Yes, I would rather like a nap. I didn't sleep so very well on the train. Very well. I'll see you at dinner. There's uh, something else I want to talk to you about. But it can wait. Something else she wanted to talk about. Well, there was something else that I wanted to talk about, too. I was sure it would do no good, but I had to mention it. I didn't see Louise again until dinner, and then she wasted no time in coming to the point. Matthew, I wanted to speak to you about your insurance. My insurance, darling? I said insurance, didn't I? Wish you wouldn't repeat my words after me like a parrot. Well, I'm sorry, Louise. It's just that I, uh... I rather think I'm carrying all the insurance I can afford on the teacher's salary. On a teacher's salary. That's exactly the point. Now, suppose something happens to you. What's to become of me? You certainly haven't been able to save anything. There is my life insurance. Five thousand dollars. A pittance in these times. No, Matthew. You must take out more insurance. With your ridiculous faculty for getting hurt, you might easily kill yourself at any time. Well, that's a rather callous thing to say, Louise. It's practical, that's all. Now, look at your burned hand. You might just as easily have fallen overboard and drowned as fallen against the engine. Louise, I'm not a child. Which brings me to something that I want to say. Well, say it then. Louise, for some time I felt that you were dissatisfied with me as a, as a husband. Indeed. Go on, Matthew. You seem to look upon me as a rather feeble-witted creature whom you must constantly admonish. I'm sure it can be no pleasure to you to be tied to such a man as you think me, Louise. What are you driving at, Matthew? Well, you have a very fine intelligence and, and great energy, and you deserve to be a free woman, able to carve a better place for yourself in the world. Yes. You're a handsome woman. You could easily find a husband more worthy of you. Someone like that insurance agent, Court von Walter, for instance. And just why do you mention Court von Walter? Well, it's uh, just as an example. He's obviously attracted to you, that's all. And so you think I should divorce you? Well, I can't help feeling that you'd be much happier if you did, Louise. Possibly I would be. But I know my duty. Without me, Matthew, you would be quite lost. I'm sure you'd manage to kill yourself somehow within a year. I'm your wife, Matthew. And your wife I shall remain until death, as they say, do us part. Until death do us part. Well, I had tried. I'd done my best to save her. Now I had to go ahead with my own plans. 
After all, I had a right to some happiness, too. I may be a professor of Greek, but I'm also a man with a man's ability to love and hate. Yes, to love Ruth and to hate Louise. I hadn't even known how fiercely I hated her until after I'd met Ruth. And then hatred had welled up in me with a violence that had astonished me. Some men might put up with such a woman for a lifetime, but I'm not one of them. They are the weaklings of the world. Men, real men, take what they want from life, and I was determined to be such a man. The next day, I did as Louise insisted. I called upon Kurt von Walter, the blonde, handsome refugee who has become so Americanized that he speaks better English than most Americans and who sells life insurance to men by flirting with their wives. I don't like him. His easy self-assurance and blatant masculinity revolt me. But my business didn't take long. There you are, Mr. Clark. An accident insurance policy for $20,000. Able to use so charming wife without a fuss of red tape. Yes, I think it's a waste of money, but Louise wanted it. (laughs) Who can say what will happen in this uncertain existence, my friend? Up there in Maine, the fierce tides, the slippery rocks, the great storms. At any moment, an accident may snatch a man's life from him. I suppose so, but I don't know why Louise looks upon me as such a child. She's just as apt to get hurt as I am. Very true. So why not a policy to ensure her life as well? Court, I'm just an underpaid professor. I can hardly throw money around for insurance as easily as all that. All the more reason you need it. If something happened to the lovely Mrs. Clark, if I say, well, the expenses would bankrupt you. I guess they would. So um, let me write a joint policy to cover both of you. The premium will only be a little more. Well, all right. I suppose it is the practical thing to do, and uh, Louise always likes to be practical. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, When do you leave? Uh, Tomorrow evening from Grand Central Station. I'll give myself the pleasure of seeing you off. I may be able to help with the baggage. And for now, um, au revoir, my friend. So that was that. A fumbler, was I. Incompetent, unable to plan, born to fail in anything. Louise would see her life was insured in my favor for $20,000, and Kurt von Walter would have to testify that he talked me into it. Twenty thousand. What freedom that would give Ruth and me. We could travel, see Europe, Greece, visit the very spots where Socrates walked and Plato composed his immortal dialogues. But I concealed my jubilance, lest Louise notice it and and suspect something. I paid a brief visit to Ruth to say goodbye and to tell her something of the wonderful future ahead for us. Oh, Matthew. Matthew, I can hardly believe it. Greece, Rome, Venice, all the famous spots of the old world. It would be wonderful. Yes, we'll live life for a change, Ruth, instead of just reading about it in books. Then then your wife, she has agreed to? Yes, she's going to divorce me. I'm not the man for her, and we both know it. I think you're a fine man, Matthew. Thank you, my dear. But Louise looks at things differently. We'll be back soon and attend to everything then. Very soon. I promise you. Yes, very soon. Much sooner than anyone but myself could guess. That night, Louise and I left on the main express. True to his word, Kurt von Walder, smirking and odious, was on hand to see us off, and Louise made a foolish fuss over him. Oh, oh, you really shouldn't have come to the train with us, Kurt. It wasn't necessary. But of course not. It was a pleasure, dear lady. And the way you carried all our bags. Poor Matthew could never have carried half of them, even if he hadn't burned his hand. Well, on the other <laughs> hand, I could never have learned Greek. Greek? Oh. <laughs> well, I hope you have a fine trip. Thank you. I shall be up that way myself next week. I'll drop in on you. We'll be looking for you, Kurt. We'll never forgive you if you fail us, will we, Matthew? Uh, what? Oh, never mind. <laughs> oh, dear, it's train time. Goodbye, Kurt. Goodbye, dear lady. Oh, Court, you shouldn't have done that. I'm not used to having my hand kissed. In that case, dear lady. Oh, 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 Court, you're a wicked man to kiss me like that in front of my own husband. (laughs) I I could not help it. In that case, I forgive you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I shall be seeing you soon. Very soon. Yes, Court. Very soon.
I pretended not to notice Louise's ridiculous flirting with Kurt von Walter, and we went to our drawing room. The trip passed quickly, and exactly on schedule, late in the afternoon of the next day, we were in Seth Thompson's boat, approaching our cottage on Desolation Bay. There she be, Miss Clark. Cottage come through the winter at well. Yes, better than I expected, considering that Matthew closed it up last fall. Oh, the beach is filthy, though. Well, storms last winter piled up plenty of weeds and stuff. Oh, really? I expect you can burn it, though. Mm. Oh, speaking of burning, how's your hand, Professor? It's getting well, Seth. I'm still clumsy with it, but it's healing. Yeah, them burns can be bad business. I know a fellow three years ago burned his hand and died of it. Yes, sir. Lockjaw. Here we are. At last. I'll tie her up and help you unload. Then you folks are all set for your vacation. Only you're going to have kind of nasty weather the next three days. Why? Why, is a storm coming up? Oh, goodness, the sky has gotten gray since we left the village. Oh, and the dear. wind's kicking up. Look at them whitecaps out there. Yeah, we're in for real nor'easter. I hope you folks ain't forgot nothing, because I won't be able to make it here till, uh, till the storm goes down. A nor'easter. Well, that, that's most provoking. I'll be sure and lay in plenty of firewood. Yes. she would be cold and damp till it's over. Hmm. Well, I better be getting this stuff ashore. That there storm's blowing up faster than I figured. Just listen to that wind. We might at least have had a few nice days to begin our vacation. It is too bad, my dear. Well, you don't seem very concerned about it. If anything, you seem to be quite happy that we're going to have a storm. Uh, do, oh, oh, no, but I'm not. Oh. Now, uh, let's see, everything's put away. Matthew, why didn't you have the phone installed as I asked? The price of running a wire out this far was prohibitive, Louise. Oh, money, money. I'm so tired of not being able to do what I want because it costs too much. Oh, well. Matthew, we need firewood. It's getting very cold, and all we have is that big log beside the fireplace. Yes, of course. I'll go pick up some on the beach. I'll be back in ten minutes. I hurried out of the cottage. The wind howled and the waves were pounding on the beach, sending white foam flying. I strode along the hard, packed sand, exultant. Everything was working to help me. The storm, my burned hand, everything was combining to aid me, as if I'd planned it so. A hundred feet from the house, I found the mine, just as I'd left it, hidden beneath the seaweed. A three-foot globe of concentrated death. Nestling among the driftwood of seaweed and dead fish, covered with barnacles. So innocent looking, so deadly. Carefully, I lifted the seaweed I'd placed on top of it and exposed the detonating horns. Those deadly knobs of metal sticking up from the mine and spelling death to any ship that touched them. Next, I found several pieces of wood nearby, just the right size for our fireplace, and pulled from the sand a length of rope which once had anchored a fisherman's lobster pot. And now came the dangerous part. I had to fasten several pieces of the firewood to the detonating horns of the mine, using the rope to tie them fast. With the wind blowing steadily stronger and the storm coming closer, I worked as delicately as a surgeon. A fumbler was I. Not now. In five minutes, the job was done. The driftwood tied securely to the detonating horns. A super booby trap for anyone seeking firewood on that beach. A strong pull on one of the pieces tied to the mine. And afterwards, what evidence would there be? It would be tragic, of course. But really no one's fault if Louise stumbled into a mine while walking on the beach. I'd mourn for a while. And then marry dear, sweet, adoring Ruth. I was finished. I put seaweed back to cover the mine, leaving the driftwood on top, where it would be easy to see and pick up. And then I hurried back to the cottage, and my heart was pounding in my chest with a noise like the thunder of the waves as I flung the door open and entered. Well, Matthew, where's the firewood? I, I, I'm sorry, Louise. It hurt my burned hand. I, I couldn't carry anything back. I might have known it. You can't even bring in firewood, you fumbler. Well, I did gather some. I left it on top of a pile of seaweed down the beach, but I couldn't bring it any further. Now I suppose I have to go get it. Well, I'll help you, but I can't pick the sticks up alone. Oh, no, Matthew. You stay here and get the fire started. 
Uh, maybe you can chop some splinters off that log, even if you can use only one hand. Of course. I'll have a fine fire going when you get back. I, I can handle the axe with one hand. You see? <clears throat> Matthew. Huh? You're acting rather oddly. Your face is flushed. I wonder if you could be getting a fever. I don't think so. Well, then on top of everything else, I'd have to nurse you. I'm perfectly all right, Louise. And I'll have this log chopped by the time you get back. Uh, what have you done? Oh, uh, the axe slipped. I've, what? I've cut my leg. Help me to the chair. Here, take my arm. Here. Now sit down. There. Now let's see. Oh, oh, my Louise. Look at all the blood. It's a deep cut, I can tell you. Oh, sit still, Matthew. I can't tell a thing with you squirming so. Oh, it's, now let me... it's bleeding so. Look, it's coming out in little spurts. Louise, do something. I'm very much afraid, Matthew, that you've cut an artery. Huh? An artery? Oh, no. I always knew something like this would happen someday. Louise, just... Don't just stand there. Do something. Put a, put a tourniquet on my leg. No, Matthew. No? What do you mean? I mean that fate has obviously intended you to die, and I don't propose to interfere. Louise, I don't understand you. What are you saying? Matthew, listen to me. When you said the other day that I should be married to someone like Court Von Walther, you were perfectly right. I love Court, and he loves me. He said so. Louise, you're joking. Now do something about my leg. I'm bleeding to death. Yes, Matthew, you are. But I was talking about Kurt von Walther. If I were free, he'd marry me. I know he would. But not if I were penniless. He's European, and they're practical about such for things. For the love of heaven, Louise, put a tourniquet on my leg. I know it's hard for you to grasp, Matthew. But I'm not going to lift a hand to help you. Oh, but you've got to. You're my wife. I won't be for long. Soon I'll be your widow. And I'll have a dowry of $25,000 to bring to court. Louise, you're mad. You're mad. He's not really interested in you. You don't know what you're doing. I do. I'm being completely practical. When I urge you to take out that insurance, Matthew, I think I was hoping something like this would happen. Maybe I was even planning to make it happen. I'm not sure. But now it, ha it has happened with no help from me. I have a right to love and happiness with a real man, and I'm taking it. Louise, Louise, please, please, please help me. Matthew, I'm going outside now. I'm going to watch the storm come up. I'll be gone at least half an hour. Then I'll bring back some firewood. If when I come back I find you beyond help, I'll be terribly shocked and distressed. But there won't be a thing I can do about it. Oh, no, Louise, wait, wait. I, I have something to tell you. I'm not interested in anything you have to say but now. But it's important. You mustn't go out. You, you, mu you mustn't pick up any firewood. Goodbye, Matthew. Louise, come back. Come back. That was just a half an hour ago. Louise is out there on the beach now, watching the waves pound on the sand and waiting. Waiting. And I'm sitting here getting weaker. Weaker. I tried to put a tourniquet on my leg, but it only slowed the bleeding. It didn't stop it. I never was good at first aid. I never was good at anything. Just a fumbler all my life. It's too late now to help me. In a few moments, Louise will start back. She'll pick up some firewood on the beach. Probably the firewood that I left so cunningly placed because it'll be convenient. She'll pull hard. The jar will set off the detonating mechanism of the mine. There. There's the explosion and broke the window of the cottage. My scheme worked. It worked. So I'm not such a complete fumble after all. But I'm getting weaker. I can't write anymore. I just want to say that this is my last will and testament. $25,000 from my insurance policies. I leave to the Handicraft Foundation for boys to be used in teaching boys how to do things with their hands. I especially direct that it be used in teaching first aid and the use of tools, especially axes. Every boy should know how to use an axe without cutting himself. <laughs> This 
this is the mysterious traveler again. So that cottage is empty now. There's really nothing wrong with it. Just a broken window and a few shingles torn loose by the explosion of that drifting mine that washed ashore down the beach. You could fix it easily. If you'd like to know where it is, I could... Oh, you'll have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. Just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. All the characters in today's story were entirely fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead was purely coincidental. In the cast today were Maurice Topman, Eric Dressler, Vicky Bola, Helen Titus, and Stefan Snavel. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... The Big Payoff, another strange and shivery tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler has come to you from our New York studios. This is Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Tonight we're going to drop in on Henry Norton, a man who saw death in every corner. I call the story... Death is my caller. My story begins late one afternoon in the luxurious office of Henry Norton, a stockbroker. Norton, a tall, dapper man in his 40s, is in the midst of signing some letters when he's called on the office communicator by his secretary. Excuse me, Mr. Norton. Uh, yes, Miss Perry. Does a Mr. Blair to see you? Uh, Mr. who? Charles Blair. He says you know him very well. Charlie Blair? Uh, tell him I'm not in. I'm out of town. Tell him anything. I don't want to see him. I don't ever want to see him. He says he knows you're here, insists on talking to you. Get him out of the office. Get some of the boys to help you. If he won't leave, just... Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. He forced his way in. I'm sorry. I couldn't stop him. Oh, that's, that's quite all right, Miss Perry. I'll see him. Hello, Henry. I thought you'd be delighted to see me. We haven't seen each other for seven long years. That wasn't nice not to have a chat with your ex-partner, was it? Well, I was awfully busy. I have a lot of work to do. You know how it is. No, I don't. Uh, I didn't know you were out already. I thought you had three more years to go. I did, but good behavior cut three years off my sentence. Well, that's wonderful, Charlie. I'm glad you're out. It must have been a terrible experience. You... You changed. It was a little hard to recognize you at first. Perhaps the prison pallor doesn't become me. And my hair has turned completely gray. I don't look so good, do I, Henry? Not like you with a Florida tan. <clears throat> well, how's Helen? My wife's dead. She's dead? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. What'd she die of? She died of heartbreak. Oh, poor Helen. She was always such a sensitive woman. Oh, what about your son, Alan? He disappeared after his mother died. I don't know where he is. He never wrote me while I was in jail. Never forgave me for bringing ruin and suffering upon his mother. You see, he was sensitive, too. You've had a pretty hard time of it, 
haven't you, Charlie? Your sympathy is touching. <clears throat> well, I, I, I hope you'll drop around again sometime when I'm not so busy. I'm not leaving yet, uh, Harry. Uh, I've got some important work to finish. If you come around in a week or so, perhaps I'll have a spot for you. Something in your Don't line. Don't be so nervous, Henry. I'm not going to kill you. Not yet. Kill me? Why should you want to kill me? I was wondering how long you'd put on this innocent act. All this concern about my welfare, about my wife and son. Why, oh, you slimy rat. If it weren't for you, I'd never have gone to prison. My wife would be alive today and my son wouldn't be embittered against me. I swear to you, it wasn't my fault. Believe me, Charlie, I had nothing to do... You should have known do... that sooner or later I'd be freed. Do you think I was ever going to forget how you framed me? I didn't frame you. It was out of my hands. I couldn't do when a thing. My wife died and my son disappeared. I had no reason to live. Just one thing that kept me alive. A fine and beautiful vengeance I had worked out for you. I thought of you constantly as I tramped the prison yard. I lay awake at night, smoothing out my plans to pay you back for all you've done to me. Seven years. You can think of an awful lot of things. It was all Grayson's fault, I tell you. He's the one to blame. I nourished and built my hate for seven long years. I cultivated it as I would a garden, so that it isn't a hot, violent anger anymore. Oh, no. It's a cool, efficient hate that works by blueprint. I look at you now as an engineer would at something he must destroy. And you're as good as dead. Henry. No, no, Charlie. No, I can explain everything. Just give me some I time. I could kill you now, but you'd only suffer a few minutes and then it would be all over. That would never equal the years of torture and suffering that I've gone through. But I won't disappoint you, Henry. I am going to kill you. But not until you've gotten a fair idea what seven years of suffering means. I tell you, Charlie, it wasn't my fault. Grayson made me do it. He made me water those stocks under your name. So it was Grayson. Poor Grayson went to prison where he got sick and died. He framed himself, didn't he? Come now, Henry, pull yourself together. You ought to be able to concoct a better alibi than that silly one. You were quite a brilliant fellow once. Why, with one swoop, you got rid of two partners. And you thrived during these seven years while I was away. I hear you're one of the biggest brokers in the city now. Climbed over the backs of half a dozen people. Oh, look, Charles, let's be reasonable. I'll give you an important position in my company. It'll be a good paying job. A job? Too. What for? What do I want money for? I have no family, no one to work for, care for. I have only one thing left in my life. And that, Henry, is to see you go to the next world in the most agonizing way possible. Goodbye, Henry. You can spend the rest of the afternoon most profitably by making out your will. <laughs> Henry Norton's cold and clammy hands were trembling as Charles Blair left his office. The impact of seeing this ghost from his past left Henry's mind in a whirl of confusion. His mind turned to flight, if that was impossible. His money, his very life was wrapped up in his business. He couldn't flee. His brain in a turmoil, unable to do any work, Henry got his hat and coat and left his office. He arrived home, badly unnerved, and retired to his study to give the problem of Charles Blair further thought. But he was interrupted. Uh, see who that is, Miss Dean. Uh, if it's Mr. Blair, don't let him in. I'm never into him, understand? Yes, Mr. Norton, I understand. How do you do, madam? Is this the Norton home? Yes. What can I do for you? Well, I'm Mr. Madden. I'd like to see the head of the household. Well, just a moment, please. Uh, who is it? He says his name is Madden. Madden? I don't know anybody by that name. Uh, has he got gray hair? No, Mr. Norton. His hair is black. Oh, all right. All right, I'll see him. Did you want to see me, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Are you Mr. Norton? Yes, I am. Uh, all right, boys, bring it in. I just, just put it down by the door for the moment, boys. That's it. 
Hey, what's going on here? Uh, why are you bringing a coffin into my apartment? Who are you? Well, now, if you please, I'd like to see the body. Body? What body? What's this all about? What's this coffin doing here? We've come for the body of Henry Norton. Oh, you must be crazy. I'm Henry Norton. You? Uh, I, I'm sorry. I must have gotten the names confused. Uh, what was your brother's name? I have no brother. And there's no body in this house. If this is some stupid joke. I don't think it's funny at all. I'm not in the habit of playing jokes, sir. I've been an established undertaker for many years. Here's my card. Well, the devil take your card. Who put you up to this? Some man came to my parlor yesterday and arranged for the funeral of Henry Norton. He paid for everything in advance. Some man? What was his name? He didn't leave any name. Charlie Blair. What did he look like? Remember that at all, I think. His hair had turned white. Blair. So it was Blair trying to frighten me. Get out. Get out of here, you stupid fools. Take that coffin back with you. I'm not used to being spoken to like that, Mr. Norton. Get out of here before I throw you out. Come on, boys. Here, wait a minute. Don't leave that coffin here. It's all paid for, Mr. Norton. It's yours now. Keep it. You might need it sometime. Before Henry could call Matt and the undertaker back, he was gone. Henry turned from the door and stared at the new coffin on the floor. It even had a plate on it with his name engraved. Unable to stand the sight of the coffin, Henry fled to his study and locked himself in. Unable to sleep, he spent the night trying to think of a way to escape Charles Blair's vengeance. The following morning found Henry haggard and distraught and no closer to a solution of his problem. As he ate a tasteless breakfast, the doorbell rang. Miss Dean, the housekeeper, went to the door. A minute later, she returned. Who was that, Miss Dean? It was the postman, Mr. Norton. His special delivery package came for you. Oh, oh, it must be the new field glasses I ordered. Here, let me have it. Huh. Nice of them to wrap it in a gift box. Kind of a small box, though. Huh. Yes, it isn't the binoculars after all. Someone sent you a gift. <laughs> Probably one of my clients. Wait a minute. You hear anything? Hear what? It's ticking. I'll put it to your ear. Listen. Yes, uh, I hear it now. It's throbbing. It's a time bomb. Oh, Somebody's trying to kill me. A time bomb? Oh. It'll go off any minute. Well, what are we going to do? Here, take it. Throw it away. Where? Uh, out of the window, any place. No, no, no. There's people outside. Don't stand there like an idiot. Throw it out. Well, I'll throw it in the bathtub. Well, hurry before we get blown to bits. Oh, dear, I hope it doesn't explode in my hand. Henry Norton stood frozen with fear as Miss Dean raced with the package to the bathroom. A moment later, he heard the water gushing in the tub. Aware of the danger he was in, he hastily retreated to the library, which was the farthest room in the house from the bathroom. There he crouched in the corner, feverishly mopping his brow. Ten minutes later, a police car raced up to the house, and the doorbell rang. Well, from the bomb and alien squad. Where's the package? It's in the bathtub. I turned the faucet on. That will do, good lady. Where's the bathroom? That door on your left. All right, you stay here. Jim, you come along with me. Okay, here's the bathroom. You better stand back a little, Jim. I'll take a look at it myself. Well, uh -huh. it isn't ticking anymore. Might be safe to open it now. Well, here goes. Why? Why, it's only an alarm clock. Someone must have wound it up before he sent it out. Now, who'd want to do a fool thing like that? That night, Henry Norton found it hard to sleep. He tossed and turned for hours, and it seemed he had hardly closed his eyes before he awoke with a start, certain there was someone in the room. Who's there? There's somebody in this room. I know it. I'll turn the light on. Never mind the light. It's... It, it, it's you, Charlie. What do you mean by breaking into my room in the middle of the night? Get dressed, Henry. Get dressed? What for? 
You and I are going somewhere. You're crazy. I'm staying right here. If you don't leave immediately, I'll call the police. If you call the police, they'll find only you here. Dead. Get dressed, Henry. All right. I'm getting dressed, but you won't get away with it. Make it fast. Don't make any unnecessary noises. Remember, it's with great control. I keep myself from pressing the trigger. Well, I, I'm coming. I've got to get my clothes on, don't I? You're not going to a dance. Just put your shoes on and get into your coat. Uh, where are we going at this hour? Don't be impatient. You'll find out soon enough. You, you, you're, you're not going to kill me. You had better stop stalling. I'll get my coat. It's in the closet. Go ahead and get it. You make one suspicious move and you're a dead crook. Are you ready? Yes. Walk in front of me. We're going out through the back door. Now, into the car. You're going to drive. You want me to drive? That's what I said, and don't plan anything. It only takes a fraction of a second to fire a gun. You'll follow my directions carefully. And drive slowly. How much further are we going? Not much further, Henry. Stop a little ahead of that tombstone sign. Oh, we're, we're near the cemetery. Look, Charlie. Charlie, I, I know I did you a great wrong. Maybe we can work out something. I, I, I've got lots of money. Stop here. We're getting out. Well, let's be reasonable, Charlie. Let's talk to the tombstone cutting establishment. Keep walking between the two rows of tombstones. Because this is our destination. Please, Charlie, don't. I, I'll do anything. I'll turn over half my money to you. Uh, why not all? All right, I'll give you everything I have. I don't want any of your money. And I'm not going to kill you yet. You see the tombstone in front of you? You see it? I'll turn the flashlight on it so that you can read it. There. Well, go ahead, read it. Henry Norton, born March... 15, 1899. Died October 21st, 1947. October 21st? Why, that's Tuesday, the day after tomorrow. That's right. The day after tomorrow. You have two whole beautiful days to live. But since you're the worrying type, you'll probably die a thousand deaths in those two days. Eight o'clock Tuesday night. Your infamous career will come to a sudden and violent end. You'll never get away with it. Nobody can get away with murder. You're right. That's why you're going to die in two days. I suggest that about five minutes to eight, you crawl into the coffin I sent you. It'll save time. Funerals are so disagreeable. The sooner you get it over with, the better. <laughs> you're inhuman, Charlie. Am I? Then you don't accept my generous offer? You prefer to be put out of your misery right now? No, 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 not now. Why, you're shivering, Henry. Better button up your coat. You're liable to catch cold. Imagine dying in the midst of a sneeze. Well, shall we go? Or would you rather look around at some of the other tombstones? Being so rich, you might prefer marble instead of granite. No, no, I want to go back Perhaps home. you'd like to look over the nice cemetery I picked for you. It's just the other side of this yard. I'm sure you'd like to see where you're going to be buried. No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like to see anything. Not even curious. Well, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't make any difference where you're buried after you're dead. Please, let, let me go home. I can't stand anymore. Please, let me go. Come now, Henry. You mustn't go to pieces. Why, you're trembling all over. Oh, you're due for a nervous breakdown. You must be very tired. You've had oh. such a hard day. Oh, you're driving me mad. Please, let me go. Mm, no pride at all. You ought to meet your fate with the 
defiance instead of oozing out like a blob of melted jelly. All right. Come on. We'll go back to the car. You can return home. And go back to bed now. If you think you can sleep. The morning of October 21st arrived, and Henry Norton's nerves were a little calmer. He had been promised a police guard, and detectives were searching the city for Charles Blair. He was reading the morning paper at home when the phone rang. Hello? Hello, Henry. Charlie, it's you. Very much me, Henry. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm fine. I, I forgive you for your, your joke on me the other night. Joke? I wasn't joking, Henry. In fact, I called now to ask if you would like an elaborate funeral with flowers or just simple services with no one but your intimate friends present. Oh, but how foolish of me. I forgot you have no friends. So my call was useless. But I'll see you tonight at 8 o'clock sharp. Goodbye, Henry. Operator. Operator, I must trace that call. Please tell me where it was coming from. Yes, I'll wait. Huh? What? The Judson Funeral Parlors? Well, that's in this block. Six o'clock. Oh, my head's splitting. Uh, are there any aspirins in the house, Miss Dean? Yes, they're in the medicine cabinet. Shall I get them for you? Uh, no, never mind. I'll get them myself. Uh, tonight I'm supposed to die at 8 o'clock. That's, that's fantastic. Blair can't carry out his plan. Not if I had police protection. I have nothing to be afraid of. Nothing. Uh, here are the aspirins. I'll take a couple of them. Oh, my head's splitting. No. No, maybe they're poison. That's right. They do look too large for aspirins. They are poison. Got to be on my guard. Death may come in a hundred different ways. Got to be on my toes. Oh, my headache. Uh, that's nothing. I, I won't take any aspirins. The dinner's ready, Mr. Dawson. Uh, no, I'm not hungry. Oh, but you must eat. You haven't eaten all day. How about a little broth? It'll warm you up. Uh, all right, yes. I, I do feel cold. Can't seem to get warmed well, I'll up. I'll get it for you. Huh. Why, she's so anxious for me to eat. She doesn't like me. She never showed any concern about me before. Here it is, Mr. Norton. Would you like some croutons uh, with it? Uh, no, no, nothing else. Uh, something's wrong. This broth... It, has a peculiar bitter taste. It's just some spice I'd put in. You're lying, Miss Dean. Lying? Why should I be lying? You're trying to poison me. Blair's put you up to this, but I'm too smart for the both of you. He'll never get me that way. You're crazy, Mr. Norton. I've put up with plenty from you, but I've had enough. I'm leaving. You're a hard, mean man. I wanted to tell you that for a long time, and if anybody wants to poison you, he must have good reasons. Get out. Get out, you, you, you bore you. I'm going. You can get yourself a new housekeeper. Good riddance, you... Tried to poison me. Good thing I didn't swallow it. Huh? Who's there? It's the police. Oh, just a second. Uh, police. Oh, it's about time you got here. You're uh, Henry Norton? Yes, of course I am. Come in, come in. I'm Officer Gibson, Mr. Norton. I was sent to act as your bodyguard. I was told someone's trying to kill you. Yes. Eight o'clock tonight. You don't say. Even told you the exact time. Yeah, uh, what precinct did you say you came from? I didn't say, but I'm from the 16th precinct. Hmm? Who's your captain? Captain Donovan, Tom Donovan. Say, what's all this about? Uh, I just want to make sure you're a real policeman. What do I look like, a fireman? Uh, I've just got to make sure. You got any credentials? Why, of course I have. Here's my identification card, and here's my badge. Hmm. I guess you're okay. I've got to be careful. Blair's promised to kill me at exactly 8 o'clock tonight. He's capable of any trick. Well, well, you don't have to worry, Mr. Norton. The chances are that he's just trying to frighten you. But if he's serious, he won't get very far. <laughs> you don't know him. He's an inhuman fiend. Well, I'll take care of him if he comes. 
say, you don't speak like a policeman. Your English is too good. You were sent here by Charlie Blair. You're a fake. I happen to be a college man who became a policeman. Nothing strange about that, is there? Why don't you call the precinct and make sure? I will. I'll call him right away. Hello, operator. Give me the 16th police precinct station. Hello. 16th precinct? Uh, this is Henry Norton. Uh, did you send an officer named Gibson to my house? Oh, you did? Uh, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, thank you. Sorry, you know, you, you can't be too careful. Well, that's okay. I understand how you feel. What time is it? It's two minutes to eight. Is that the exact time? My watch says three minutes to eight. I checked my watch by radio just an hour ago. He'll be here. I, I know it. I don't think so. No man in his right mind would walk into a trap. Uh, it's eight o'clock. Your hall clock is off about a minute. Well, say, you're shaking like a leaf. Oh, I'm frightened. He certainly put a scare into you. But what was that noise? I didn't hear anything. I'm sure I heard something move. Oh, it's just your imagination. Uh, well, what time is it? Just eight o'clock. As a matter of fact, it's a few seconds after eight. There he is. There he is. It's him. He's come. Stay right here. I'll answer it. Don't, don't leave me. No, you stay here. That's funny. No one's at the door. I'll take a look outside. Hello, Henry. Charlie. How'd you get here? You see, Henry? I keep my appointments. I got a boy to ring the bell at exactly 8 o'clock. I've been hiding in your house for hours. Oh, no. Don't, Charlie, please. You can have everything. I, I promise I'll, I'll give you back everything I took from you. In less than a minute, you're going to die. Uh, uh, help! Help! Gibson, save me! The door is locked. No one can save you. In a moment, your heart will be ripped apart by a piece of lead. Just one terrific moment of agonizing pain. Then you'll be dead. Open our door, Norton. Help. Uh, help, he's going to shoot. Open the door. You see, no one can help you now. This torture is only a minute for you, but it was seven years for me. It's a pity you want so much to live. Mr. Norton, Mr. Norton, huh? I'm going around to the side door. <laughs> Please, Charlie, I'll, I'll do anything. No use crawling, getting on your knees. I'm going to shoot you when I count three. No, no. One. No. Help, help. Two. Gibson, save me. Oh. What's going on here? Why did you lock me out? And just who are you? I was playing a joke on my friend. A joke? You just shot him. Hand over your gun. Yeah. But I didn't really shoot him. You can see for yourself. I just fired a blank. Huh? That's why Norton is lying on the floor? He's just fainted. We'll see. Keep your hands up. He wasn't shot. There's no wound. Not a drop of blood anywhere. That's right. I only meant to scare him. He's in a deep faint. We had better call the doctor. So, you only meant to scare him. Well, Norton's dead. You frightened him to death. the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? Poor Henry Norton. Imagine dying from the noise of a blank cartridge. His nerves were really on edge, weren't they? Ah, oh, well. At least he got a free coffin and tombstone, and he doesn't have to worry anymore about dying. Uh, what happened to Charles Blair? Well, he's still in prison, of course, because you don't get away with murder, even when you kill with a blank cartridge. And uh, speaking of murder, uh, I recall another case in which a, a lovely young girl was able... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. You have heard 
of the Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Santos Ortega, Agnes Young, Ted Jewett, and Neil O'Malley. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... Invitation to Death. Another strange and terrifying tale of the mysterious traveler. This program came from New York. Another program of tense and dramatic action follows in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. As you hear the story I call, The Man Who Died Twice. Tonight, we're going to delve into a murder most strange. One that confused many of the greatest legal minds of our day. My story begins in the mansion of Judge Marshall situated high on a hill overlooking a large New England city. It is early evening, and Judge Marshall, one of the state's foremost jurists, is sitting in his library reading a legal brief. As he intently reads, the French door leading to the porch slowly and silently swings open, revealing a huge white-haired man standing in the doorway. His tremendous bent frame shows the remains of a man who'd been a giant in his youth. Suddenly, the judge becomes aware that he isn't alone. He quickly turns and sees his visitor. Who... who are you? What are you doing here? Don't you remember me, Judge? No, I can't say that I do. Think back. Think back 16 years when you were judge at a murder trial. 16 years? My good man, I presided over a great many murder trials, as you call them, and I... I still don't know who you are. Just keep looking at me, Judge, and think back. Think back. You, uh, you do look familiar. I'll help you remember. My name is Adams. Luke Adams. Luke Adams? Yes, yes, now I remember. I sentenced you to prison for 25 years for killing a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for killing a man. You, you've aged, so that's why I didn't recognize you. Yes. It's hard to believe I'm only 45, isn't it? I presume you've been paroled? Yes. What do you want? I want to tell you my story, Judge. I want to tell you all the things I never got a chance to tell you at my trial. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Adams, the case is closed. Now, if you don't mind, Then I'd... we'll reopen it. I've come to tell you my story, and you're going to listen. Very well, Mr. Adams. Sit down. Thank you. I don't know if you recall, Judge, but my wife, Millie, was a beautiful woman. Yes, I remember. She had the kind of beauty a man can't forget. Yes. Yes, and I suppose that's what caused it all. Millie and I grew up together, and I guess I loved her from the moment we met. The only reason she married me was because of the money I'd inherited. And when I lost it in 29... Things were never the same again between us. She hated living in a small village, trying to stretch one dollar into two. 
Sometimes I think her smiling at other men was her way of getting revenge on me for the way we had to live. The angrier I got, the more she flirted, till she almost drove me out of my mind. Things went on like that, day after day, month after month. Here comes Luke. Hello, Luke. Getting home from work a bit early today, huh? Yeah. Your missus and I were just talking about how hot it is. Yeah. You must have found it fierce, breaking stone in the quarry in this heat. Uh Uh-huh. Well, uh, I've got to be going. See you again. What was he hanging around for? He just happened to be going, Pat. Stopped to say hello. Is there anything wrong in that? It's funny. Every time I see you talking to someone, it's always a man. How come I never see you talking to women? Because all the women in this village are a bunch of cats. They hate me because I'm beautiful and they're not. All right. But I'm warning you, I don't want to see Chuck Riker or any other men hanging around here. If I do, there's going to be trouble. The days went by. Millie hardly spoke to me. Nothing I said or did seemed to please her. And yet, just knowing she'd be there when I got home was enough for me. And one day I come home from work. She wasn't alone. Oh, hello, Luke. Home early, aren't you? What's he doing here? Chuck was going past, dropped in to say hello. Just like that, huh? I thought I told you not to let this happen again. If Chuck wants to call on me, why shouldn't he? Right, Chuck? Sure. After all, Luke, there's no use being old-fashioned. We've all known each other since we were kids. What harm is there in an old friend dropping in and... Why are you looking at me like that? There's lipstick on your cheek. You'd better let me wipe it off for you. Now, wait a minute, Luke. I can explain. There's no use fighting over... Get up. Uh, now, wait a minute, Luke. Can't we... Get up. Talking won't help. You'll have to fight your way out. That's it. Pick up that poker. Come on, come on. What are you waiting for? Okay, you asked for it. You're gonna get it. No. No, Luke, no. This'll learn you... No. Not to hang around other men's wives. Before I'm through with you, no woman will want to look at you. Luke, Luke, stop it. He's out on his feet. Stop it. How does he look to you now, Millie? I'll throw him out, then you and I will settle a few things. Come on, you. Out you go. There's a push to start you on your way. There. Now we come to you. You think I'm afraid of you. Go ahead, hit me. Ruin my looks so no man will ever want to look at me. Go ahead. Millie, don't talk like that. You know how much I love you. Why are you doing this to me? I know I haven't been able to give you all the things you want, but that's no reason to treat me this way. I won't stand for it, Millie. All right, then let's separate. You go your way, and I'll go mine. No. No, I... I couldn't live without you. You know that. I'll never let you go. You're mine, do you hear? Oh, stop it. Millie, don't turn away from me. You make me sick. All right. But I'll never give you up. Never. (laughs) Millie just stood there looking at me. Contempt in her eyes. I knew we were through, and yet I couldn't give her up. I clung to the small hope that something would happen that would change her. Make a feel toward me as I felt about her. Long, lonely weeks went by. I knew that Millie and I had been the scandal of the village ever since the day I'd beaten Chuck Riker. At the quarry, the men whispered to each other when they thought I wasn't looking. And I could only give vent to my rage by smashing rocks into a thousand small pieces. Then, one day in the autumn, an opportunity came. An opportunity to escape the villagers and their gossip. Millie! Millie, where are you? Here. What is it? Millie, you've always wanted to get away from the village. Now we have a chance. How? Well, I met Mr. Anderson this morning. You remember him. He's an old friend of my father's. What about it? Well, he owns a small farm which he's willing to sell for only $300 down. You mean you want to buy it? Yeah. Just think of it, Millie. A place of our own, 20 miles out in the country, away from the village and the gossip. Do you really think I'd move to a farm? Cut myself off from everything? Well, it's what you need, Millie. 
A home of your own, a place to work and build. You'd love it, Millie. I know you would. You mean you would. Don't think I don't know what's going on in that head of yours. You want to cut me off from everybody, take me someplace where you can keep an eye on me day and night. Well, I'm not having any part of it. But, Millie, you said yourself you're not happy here. That yes, you... but I don't want a farm. I want to live in a city. I want to have everything that other women have. But we can't go to the city. There's no work to be had. We're living in a depression. Are we? Well, if you can't give me what I want, there are plenty of other men who can. They'd better not try. I'm warning you, Millie, I'll kill any man who tries to take you away from me. Weeks went by. Weeks in which Millie scarcely spoke to me. We lived as strangers in an uneasy truce. I worked from dawn to twilight at the quarry, and as I worked, I, I could sense the men gossiping about Millie and myself. I would think of Millie and wonder what she was doing at that very moment. Steve. Yeah, baby? I can't stand it anymore. I can't go on living with Luke. The way he stares at me with those big cow-like eyes of his, watching every move I make. Well, you'll just have to go on putting up with it for the time being. It's all right for you to say that. You don't have to live with him. Sometimes I wonder if you really love me. Oh, don't talk like that, baby. You know I love you. Would I be putting my neck out like this if I didn't? Nobody knows we're meeting secretly. Maybe not, but sooner or later, someone will see us together, and then there'll really be trouble. Afraid? I've never run away from a fight yet. I don't mind telling you, I wouldn't like to mix with that gorilla husband of yours. I know, I know, Steve. You've got to be careful. Don't worry. I intend to be. Just let me raise some dough, baby. Figure out one or two angles, then you and I'll be off with a big city. What about Luke? He'd be sure to follow. You don't know what he's like, Steve. He'd never rest till he found us. And when he did... Yeah, you don't have to draw me any pictures. I know that type. If we run off, we'd never have a minute's peace. We'd always be wondering when he was going to catch up with us. Yeah. Oh, Steve, what are we going to do? Mm, I don't know, baby. I don't know. We'll just have to sit tight for the time being and be careful not to be seen together. All right, Steve. Oh, cheer up, baby. We'll make the big city yet and... Until then, we've got this. Oh, yes, Steve. Yeah. Lou? Is that you? Yeah, Millie. Do you want me? Yes. I've moved all your things up to the attic. I want you to sleep there from now on. Why? Because you keep me awake half the night with your tossing and turning. And you talk in your sleep. I talk in my sleep? What do I say? You keep yelling my names if I was murdering you or something. Oh, Millie. You'll be all right in the attic. Yes, Millie. Millie, can I talk to you for a minute? What is it? I saw Mr. Anderson again today. Millie, he says he's willing to let us live free for a year on his farm so we can see how we like it. And if we do, we can buy it. I told you before, I'm not going to live on any farm. But, Millie, why can't we just try it? It won't cost us anything. If we don't like it, we can give it up. No, I tell you, I won't let myself be trapped like that. You're perfectly willing to take a chance on farming, but you won't consider going to the city. But there are 15 million men out of work. What chance would I have of getting a job in the city? If you had an ounce of courage, you'd try. You don't hear men like Steve Hopkins whining about the Depression and trying to make excuses for staying in this miserable hole. Steve Hopkins, huh? I... So that's it. But... You've been seeing Steve Hopkins? No. No, I... I haven't been seen. You're wrong. You're lying. It's written all over your face. I... You're afraid, aren't you? You're afraid of what I'm going to do to Steve Hopkins. Now, Luke, listen to me. I, I tell you, there's, there's nothing between Steve and myself. When I'm finished with him, you'll never want to look at him again. Where are you going? To the village tavern. He's always there on Saturday nights. Luke, come back! Luke, come back! Hopkins, I want to talk to you. Well, go ahead, Luke. No one's stopping you. You've been making a play for my wife, and I don't like it. You're either drunk or looking for a fight. I haven't spoken to your wife in a year. You're lying. 
I know you've been seeing her these past weeks while I've been working. You better take it easy, Luke. You're getting to the point where you're suspicious of every man in the village. Don't try to smooth talk me. I know you've been seeing her, and if you try seeing her again, I'll kill you. Ah, <laughs> you don't frighten me, Luke. And if I wanted to see your wife, not you or anyone else could stop me. Oh, no? I'll show you. Ready, hey, boys. Grab it. That's it. Let go of me. Let go of hey, me. Show him. Hold on him, boys. Now, Luke, as sheriff of this village, I'd advise you to take it easy. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. I don't like that kind of talk. Now, mind your manners. You'll spend the night in a lockup. No man's going to make a fool out of me and live. Now, get hold of yourself. If Steve was seeing your wife, it'd be common gossip in no time. You know that. He may have fooled you folks, Sheriff, but I know better. You can protect him here, but just wait until I catch him alone. Just wait. When I got home that night from the tavern, Millie was in her room, her door locked. I went up to the attic and tried to sleep, but I couldn't. I kept seeing Steve Hopkins' face and the way he had smiled at me in the tavern. He might have fooled the others, but, but I knew. And he knew that I did. Hours later, I managed to fall asleep. I dreamt that I was alone with Steve and we were fighting. He kept hitting me, but I couldn't feel his punches. All I could feel was my fist smashing again and again into his laughing face. I woke to hear church bells ringing. It was Sunday morning. All that day, except for meals, Millie avoided me. After supper, she went to her room, and I went down to my workshop in the cellar. The next morning when I arrived at the quarry, the men were standing around in small groups, talking to each other. They stopped when they saw me. Then from one of the groups, I saw Sheriff Roden coming towards me. Luke, I want to talk to you. What about? A number of things. Is your sledgehammer? Why, sure. That's my initials on the handle. Why is it all wrapped up in paper? I'll ask the questions, Luke. Where were you last night around 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock? In my workshop in the basement. Why? Anybody with you? Oh, no, I was alone. Luke, you're under arrest. Under arrest? What for? For the murder of Steve Hopkins. For the murder of Steve Hopkins? Yes. His body was found in his cabin an hour ago. He'd been brutally beaten to death last night around 11. With this sledgehammer, it was found at the scene of the crime. You mean you think I did it? It sure looks that way. Let's go, Luke. No. No, I won't. I didn't kill Steve Hopkins. You'll get your chance to prove you didn't. Now, let's go. No. I didn't do it. I tell you, I'm innocent. Grab him, man. Let go of me. That's it. Hold him while I get these caps on him. I didn't do it. I tell you, I didn't do it. Silence in the courtroom. Proceed, Mr. King. Sheriff, will you tell the jury in your own words the time and circumstances under which you were notified of the death of Stephen Hopkins? On October 12th of last year, I received a phone call at 7 o'clock a.m. from Sam Morris. Said that he'd just stopped by at Steve Hopkins' cabin to pick him up for work and had found him murdered. I told Sam not to touch anything. And I got to the cabin 15 minutes later. Will you tell the jury what you found? Well, sir, that cabin looked like a slaughterhouse. I uh, don't want to upset anyone with the details, so all I'll say is that Steve Hopkins had been beaten so badly the body was uh, beyond recognition. You say the body was beaten beyond recognition. That's right. Then how were you able to identify it as being Steve Hopkins? Well, first by the ring and wristwatch that was on the body. But most important of all, by the tattooing. By the tattooing? Yes, sir. Steve was quite a tattoo artist, and on his left arm he tattooed a heart with his initials and some girls on it. I reckon just about everyone in this courtroom saw that tattoo on his arm at one time or another. And although the body was beyond recognition... The tattoo was clearly identifiable. Yes, sir. No question about that. Sheriff, when had you last seen the deceased? Uh, Saturday night, October 10th, at the village tavern. Did anything unusual take place at the tavern that night? Yes. Luke Adams came into the tavern around 9 o'clock. He accused Steve Hopkins of hanging around Mrs. Adams. Threatened to kill him. 
Sheriff, can you remember Luke Adams' exact words when he made that threat? Well, his last words before he left the tavern were, Just wait till I catch him alone. Just wait. I see. Now, Sheriff, when you arrived at the scene of the crime, did you find the death weapon? Yes, sir. Steve Hopkins had been beaten to death with a sledgehammer. I found it in the cabin, covered with blood. Was there any identification on the sledgehammer? Yes, sir. On the handle were carved the initials. L.A. Now, Mrs. Adams, you say there was no justification whatsoever for your husband's suspicions. No, none at all. In other words, he was mistaken when he accused Steve Hopkins of forcing his attentions on you. Yes, he was. I see. Now, your husband has testified that on the night of the murder, he was working in the cellar of your home. Where were you that night, Mrs. Adams? Upstairs in my room. Did you see your husband at all that night? No, I didn't. Would it have been possible for him to have left the cellar that night without your knowing about it? Yes, it certainly would. Silence in the courtroom. <coughs> the prisoner will rise. Luke Adams, you have been found guilty of murder in the first degree with a recommendation for mercy. The court hereby sentences you to 25 years imprisonment in the state penitentiary. Twenty-five years imprisonment. Yes, Judge, that was your sentence. The towering iron gates of the penitentiary closed behind me. And I no longer had a name. Only a number. A year after I was in prison, I was informed that Millie had divorced me. And disappeared. With that, my last tie with the outside world was gone. Years passed. World-shaking events took place and scarce reached the prison workshop where I spent long days repairing shoes. Then one day I was notified by the warden that I'd been paroled. I was free. The gates of the penitentiary opened, and once again I joined the living. I came to the city, a stranger, and found employment in a shoe repair store. Day after day I stood by the store window repairing shoes, watching the hurrying crowds. Then late one afternoon, I saw a woman pass. A woman who was a stranger, and yet wasn't. With a sudden shock, I realized that Millie had just passed. Throwing down my tools, I rushed out of the shop and down the street after her. I found her in the crowd and followed. She had hardly changed at all in the 16 years that had gone by. There were streaks of gray in her hair, but... She was as beautiful as ever. I followed her block after block, and soon we were in a residential section. She turned up the path to a large cottage, unlocked the front door, and went in. A moment later, I was ringing the doorbell. Yes, what is it? Don't, don't you recognize me? No, I'm afraid not. It's me, Millie, it's me. How dare you force your way in here like... <gasps> Yeah, Millie. Luke, after all these years. But you... You're in prison. I was paroled six months ago. Well, I... I I'm glad to hear that, Luke. I, uh, uh, you, you must leave now. I, I'm busy huh? right now. I can't Millie, talk. who is that? I... Millie, who are you talking to? Who's he? Steve. Steve Hopkins. Oh, you're, uh, you're mistaken. The name is Reed, Robert Reed. Steve, it's Luke. Luke? You're not dead. You're not dead. The body in the cabinet wasn't yours. No, no. I went to prison for your murder, but you're alive. I said I killed you, but you're alive. Yes. You let them put me in prison. You framed me. Luke, you must listen to me. You framed me. No, Luke, don't. I didn't... You framed me. Luke, let go of your... Don't, Luke. Don't. 
<coughs> Whose body was that they found in your cabin? Uh, uh, a young hobo I picked up by the railroad tracks. But the tattooing on the arm. After, after I killed him with your sledgehammer, I, I tattooed his left arm to look exactly like mine. I, I put my wristwatch and ring on the body and then beat him beyond recognition. And then you ran away. Leaving me to stand trial for murder. Luke, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? You remember Judge Marshall, don't you, Millie? Yes, I, I remember him. Well, I read in the papers a few weeks ago that the judge lives here, in a fine mansion overlooking the city. What are you getting at? Steve and I are going to visit Judge Marshall. No, Luke, no. You, you know what that would Luke, mean. Luke, we have some money. If you'll just forget what's happened, we'll give you money, plenty of it. Yes, well, we'll give you $10,000. $20,000. i am not interested in money. Come on, Steve. Luke, you, you can't do this to me. You can't. Luke, you once loved me for my sake. Come don't. along, Steve. No, I, I won't go. If, if they find out about that hobo, they'll, they'll hang me. I wouldn't have a chance. They let... You'll come, Steve, one way or another, understand? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, Judge. He didn't want to come here, but in the end, he came. In the end, he came. Incredible. Simply incredible. The, the man is a monster to have done what he did. Where is this man, Steve Hopkins, now? He's out on the porch, Judge. Bring him in, Mr. Adams. I want to see that man. All right, Judge. Why are you carrying him? He can't walk. Can't walk? What's wrong with him? He's dead. Here, Judge. Dead? Yes, Judge. But... But I, I understood he was alive. He was. Up until a half hour ago. You mean you... Yeah, Judge. I put my hands around his throat and squeezed... Squeezed until he was dead. Huh. I killed him. And there's nothing you can do to me, Judge. Nothing. Remember, you sent me to prison for killing Steve Hopkins? For 16 years, I rotted in prison. I've paid my debt to society for Steve Hopkins' death. I've paid it. <laughs> there's nothing you can do to me now. Nothing. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? What happened to Luke Adams? Well, his case became one of the most celebrated controversies of the day. Some legal minds claimed he couldn't be sent to prison again. He'd already been punished. Other legal experts insisted he should be tried again. But in the midst of this raging controversy, poor Luke Adams died, and his case was never decided. What do you think? Should Luke Adams have been tried for murder again? Or having already served 16 years for Steve Hopkins' murder, should he have gone free? I should like to know what your verdict is. Send your letters to the mysterious traveler, care of Mutual Broadcasting System, New York 18, New York. <laughs> You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. All characters in today's story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Art Carney, Elspeth Eric, Frank Behrens, and Jackson Beck. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled 
The Ivory Elephant. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the mysterious traveler. This program has come to you from our New York studios. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to this station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. As you hear the story I call, They Struck It Rich. Our story tonight begins behind the high gray walls of a state penitentiary. It is early Monday morning, and Dr. Richard Worth has just taken up his duties as a newly appointed staff psychiatrist at the prison. As he sits in his office, studying the medical records that have been turned over to him, there's a knock on his door. Come in. Sorry to bother you, Doctor, but they uh, just brought a prisoner from the warden's office for you to examine. Case of hysteria. Hysteria? That's what they said. Very well, Cook. Show him in. Okay, in here, fellow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hot one, really a hot one. <laughs> Me, Frankie Williams, on top at last. I'm a big shot. <laughs> Here's his medical record, Doc. Well, thanks, Cook. That'll be all. Yes, sir. <laughs> all right, sit down, Williams. <laughs> Williams, sit down. That's better. Here, drink this. Drink this. Uh, now, let me see. Frank Williams, age 34. Uh-huh. How do you feel now, Williams? Uh, I'm okay now, Doc. I guess the news was too much for me. Everything's going to be all right now. You know what I mean. You take care of me, Doc, and I'll take care of you. I see. Williams, uh, tell me about yourself. What do you want to know? For anything you feel like talking about. Tell me about uh, your childhood. Uh, how you happened to be in prison. Well, when I was 14, I was sent to reform school for knifing a guy. When I was 18, I got a four- to six-year stretch for a stick-up. Mm -hmm. well, why are you in prison now? You mean you don't know? I'm afraid not. The dark. Six years ago, my picture was in every paper in the country. I was famous. Well, six years ago, I was in a Japanese prison of war camp. So I'm not familiar with your exploits. Well, why don't you tell me about it? Sure, Doc. It all began back in 41, about a month before Pearl Harbor. I'd just gotten out of the big house on parole, and I managed to land a job as a sand hog on a tunnel that was building under the East River between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Well, one day I'm knocking off for work when I hear my name being called by... Hey, Frank. Frank Williams. What's the matter? Don't you recognize an old pal? Marty! Marty Davis, how are you, pal? Swell. Hey. <laughs> When'd you get out, kid? Two weeks ago. Parole, huh? Yeah. You working on this tunnel, too? Yeah, six months now. Huh? Frank, you're just the boy I'm looking for. Uh, what's up? Ever since I got out, I've been working on a little idea of mine. It'll take two guys, and the haul will be at least a hundred grand. Oh, uh, nothing doing, Marty. What do you think I took this job for? I'm a three-time loser. One more rap, and they'll send me up for life. Look, kid, ain't I in the same boat? I'm a three-time loser, too. And you ought to have more sense. From now on, I'm going straight. I'm not going to risk getting a life sentence. But, Frank, this idea of mine, it ain't any cheap stick-up. It's something big. And there's enough dough in it so that we can retire for the rest of our lives. Nothing doing. Ain't you even interested? No. 
They sure got you scared of that life sentence, ain't they? Yeah. So long, Marty. See you around. I left Marty standing there, Doc, and walked away. There's one thing you gotta say for Marty. He don't discourage easy. Day after day, he'd be waiting for me when I knocked off work. We'd have a few drinks together, and then Marty would go to work on me, trying to suck me into this big job he kept hinting about. Got so I took to avoiding him. And one night, while I was in a bar on the east side, Marty comes in and sees me sitting alone at a table. He pulls up a chair and sits down. Hello, kid. Did you hear the news? What news? Now that this country's in the war, they're going to stop working on the tunnel. You and me are going to be out of work in a couple of days. It's okay with me. I was getting sick of that job anyway. What are you going to do now? I don't know. Why don't you play it smart? Throw in with me. I tell you, kid, this job I got lined up can't miss. Yeah, that's what you keep saying. Frank, I feel so sure that if you knew what the job was, you'd go in with me. So I'm going to tell you about it. I ain't asking you to. I'll take a chance. While we was in stir, you remember me telling you about where I grew up? Yeah, on the East River up around 106th Street. Yeah, at Hellgate. I also told you about the way I was a sewerage pipe inspector for the city when I was a kid. Yeah, I remember. Frank, not many people know what the island of Manhattan is like underground. It's more than just a couple of subways. Why, underneath the streets are big gas mains, water pipes, electric lines, phone cables and tunnels. And sewerage pipes big enough to drive a car through. What are you getting at? Kid, there's hardly a square foot underground this island that ain't honeycombed with pipes and sewers. And when it comes to sewerage systems up in my old neighborhood, I'm what you might call an expert. Okay, so what? Come on over to my room. I want to show you something. Yeah, what? You'll see. Come on. Let's go. Give me a hand unrolling this map, will you? It's pretty big. Okay. Yeah. You recognize it? Well, this is the East River, ain't it? And this is a section of Manhattan from 86th Street up to 125th Street. That's right. What are all these red, yellow, green, and blue lines on it? The red lines are electric cables. The yellow lines are gas mains. Uh The green are water pipes, and the blue are phone cables. And the black lines are sewerage pipes. This is an official city map that I lifted. Uh You were sure right when you said this island is honeycomb. Yeah. You see this place I got my finger on? Yeah. 106th Street and East River. That's right. But what this map doesn't show is that this is where the Hellgate Bank and Trust Company is. Hellgate Bank? Yeah. Oh. Now I'm beginning to get your idea. Look at this black line that runs into the East River. That's a big ten-foot sewerage pipe. And it runs past the bank, only 60 feet away. Uh Uh-huh. You and me, we ought to be able to dig a tunnel from the sewer to under the vault of the bank in ten nights. Oh, there's one thing you're forgetting. What's that? This island is all sandstone. How are we going to tunnel through stone? That calls for drills. Kid, the island of Manhattan may be all sandstone, but at this point, where the bank is, it's all dirt. Dirt? Yeah. You see, the riverbed has been shifting these past hundreds of years. And during all that time, mud's been accumulating along this stretch at 106th Street. Today, all that mud is part of the island, with buildings on it. And one of the buildings on it is the Hellgate Bank. Yeah, I sure got to hand it to you, Marty. You got all the answers. I spent enough time casing this job to make me an expert. Wouldn't be too tough to tunnel through 60 foot of dirt? Of course it wouldn't. And think of what the jackpot would be, kid. I'll guarantee you there'll be at least a hundred grand in the vault. What do you say? A hundred G's. And a two-way split. Okay, Marty. You can count me in. A few days later, Marty and me moved into a basement cold water flat a block away from the bank. Every night for a week, we kept bringing to the flat things we would need for the job. A two-man rubber raft, shovels, big axes, flashlights, tape measures, small boards for shoring up the tunnel. No college engineer ever cased the job better. A couple of weeks later, Marty and me figured we was ready. We waited until a dark night, then we took the rubber raft, shovel and a pickaxe and left the flat. We went to the rear of the old tenement house where there was a manhole that led down into the sewerage pipe. We eased the manhole cover off and Marty started down the ladder. I handed him the stuff and then I followed. 
after pulling the cover back on the manhole. Fifteen foot down, Marty was standing on a small ledge. The water swirled past a little below the ledge. Frank, hold the raft while I fill it with air. Okay, Marty. Now, where'd I put that tube? Ah, here it is. It shouldn't take more than a minute to fill it up. Hey, is there any danger of gas down here, Marty? Not in winter. Boy, that water's sure running fast. Yeah. We'll have to be careful or we're liable to be swept out to the river. Okay, Frank, she's all filled up. Now drop the raft into the water and hold on to it. Right. Ah, just wait until I tie the end of this rope to the ladder. There. Now get in, kid. Yeah. That's it. Now hold the raft steady while I get in. Easy does it, buddy. Now I'll play this rope out nice and slow, and we'll float down to the right spot. Here's the first knot on the rope, and that's 50 feet. A hundred. A hundred and fifty. Two hundred. This is it, kid. Right here. Okay, Marty. Now try to hold the raft as steady as you can while I break into the wall with this pickaxe. <coughs> this is going to be a tough job. Yeah. I feel as though my arms are being pulled off trying to hold this raft steady in this current. I only hope that this rope I'm hanging on to don't give. We shoot out to the river. If it did. Now you coming. I'm getting there. <clears throat> that night we broke through the concrete wall and reached dirt. The second night, we tunneled through five feet, slanting it upwards so that if the water in the sewer rose, our tunnel wouldn't be flooded. The third night, we dug another six feet, shoring up every other foot so there wouldn't be any cave-in. Night after night, we worked. And soon, the tunnel was slanting down sharply so as to end up under the floor of the vault. While one of us dug, the other would get rid of the dirt. On a Wednesday night, exactly two weeks from the time we'd started, we figured we were under the vault of the bank. Marty and me rested up a couple of days. Then on Saturday afternoon, we went over our plans for the last time. Well, this is it, Frank. Tonight's the payoff. At about nine o'clock, we'll leave. Yeah, it shouldn't take us more than an hour to burn through the floor of the vault. You know what those old bank vaults are like. The sides and top are a couple of feet thick, but the floors are always thin. Sure. We won't have much trouble. We should have the vault cleaned out by midnight. We'll spend the rest of the night getting rid of the equipment. The river, huh? Yeah. And we'll go over this flat with a fine-tooth comb. Make sure we ain't leaving anything behind. And we'll wipe down the whole place so the cops won't find any prints. By right tomorrow morning, we should be ready to travel. That's right. When the bank opens Monday morning, we'll be in the hideout upstate. Hmm. A few months there, the heat will be off. And then you and me, kid, are gonna have ourselves a time. <laughs> <laughs> we sure are, buddy. Okay. We'd better try to grab a couple of hours shut eye. We got a tough, tough night ahead of us. I hit the sack and tried to get some shut eye, but I was too keyed up to fall asleep. The hours dragged by, and soon it got dark. At nine o'clock, we left the flat. A few minutes later, we were going down the ladder into the sewer. We filled the raft with air, loaded our equipment on it, then floated down the sewer to the tunnel we built. Each of us grabbed a suitcase and started snaking our way through the tunnel. First, there was a gradual climb of 15 feet. Then the tunnel sloped sharply for 50 feet, with us ending up under the vault. Marty got out the tools and scraped away the last foot of dirt, exposing the floor of the vault. Then I got to work with the acetylene torch. It was tough working in a three-by-four hole. A half hour passed, and I was still burning my way through. How's it coming, Frank? Won't be long now, Marty. The air is sure foul in here. Yeah, it's hard to breathe. I think that does it. Hand me the pickaxe, Marty. Here you are, kid. Just a couple of taps and this piece of floor should give. Here it comes. Help me ease it down. It's a pleasure. Come here. Okay, kid. Up you go. You got your flash? Yeah, I got it. Hey, Marty. I'm in the vault. 
It came up dead center. You sure had it figured out to the inch. <laughs> Not bad for a guy who never finished the fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, <Yeah>. kid. <laughs> Let's take a look at the cash drawers. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Marty. Look at it. The whole drawer is full of bundles of bills. There must be a hundred G's here. That's only part of it. Now remember, no new bills and nothing smaller than 20. Okay, Marty. I'll get the suitcases. Well, kid, that does it. A hundred and twenty G's. We couldn't cram another bill into these suitcases if we tried. Gee, Marty. Look at all this dough we're leaving behind. Yeah, I know how you feel. But this is as much as we can carry. Come on, Frank. Grab one of the suitcases and half the equipment. Okay, Marty. We're going to have a tough time hauling all this stuff back through the tunnel. You all set? Yeah. I lead the way. Make sure nothing's left behind. Don't worry, I'll double check. Okay, Frank. Come on. I'm coming. The best way is to push the suitcase ahead of you. Yeah. With the equipment piled on top of it. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. You okay, Frank? Yeah, I'm right behind you. That's funny. I feel as though I'm slowly sinking. Yeah. Marty, the floor's caving in. We're falling. We're falling! Uh, Marty. Marty, where are you? I'm over here. You okay? Yeah, I think so. What about you? I just had the wind knocked out of me. Sure is dark. What happened? The floor of our tunnel caved in. Yeah. I wonder where we are. You got your flashlight? Uh, No, I I dropped it when I fell. Yeah, so did I. Feel around, Frank. Should be near you. Okay, Marty. This would happen to us just when we hit the jackpot. Yeah. What lousy luck. You find it yet? No, the ground here is just mud. Soft mud and puddles of water. Frank, I found my flesh. Is it work? Wait a minute. Yeah. Now, let's have a look at this place. Uh, it's a small cave. Yeah, you're right. Wait till I shine the beam on the ceiling. Marty, look. There's the hole in the ceiling where we fell through. Yeah, that was a 30-foot fall. If we hadn't landed on mud, we'd really been banged up. Without a ladder, we'll never be able to reach that opening in the ceiling. Yeah, I know. Now, let's see what the rest of this place looks like. Hmm. Ain't very big, is it? There's nothing but mud walls. Marty, we're trapped. Take it easy, kid. It ain't that bad. We still got our tools, the torch, and most important of all, the dough. A lot of good that'll do us if we don't get out of here. We'll get out. Give me that pickaxe. What are you going to do? I want to see what this wall is like. This is the river end, all right. Nothing but mud. Now, this is what we're going to do, Frank. We'll dig in about five feet or so, and then we'll start tunneling our way up. Sixty feet? That'll take us a week. Well, I'm hoping we'll run into a shaft or something. It's our only chance, kid. Yeah, I guess you're right. Now, hold the flash for me. That's it. Now, shine it against the wall while I start digging. I guess you dug about three feet, Marty. Yeah, just about. Want me to take over? I ain't tired yet. Frank, I struck wood. Heavy wood. What do you think it is? I don't know. Maybe it's the wall of an old cellar. A cellar? This deep? Could be. Hold the flash closer while I scrape away the mud from the wood. Look, it's a solid wall of heavy timber. It must be at least a hundred years old. See how rotten that wood is? Sounds hollow. I'll bet it's a cellar. You think it might lead up to some old building? Could be. Get the torch, Frank. Let's burn our way through. Okay, Marty. Feels about eight or nine inches thick. Well, here's the torch, but it ain't gonna last long, Marty. It's almost all used up. Yeah, I figured as much. Well, go ahead, kid. See what you can do. Yeah, 
I just about got it, Marty. Good. Oh, there goes the torch. Uh, so. I will have to break in the rest of the way. Yeah, hold the flash, kid, while I use a pickaxe. That's it. A couple more and it should give. We got an opening. Give me the flash, Frank. Here you are. What do you see, Marty? Looks like a room of some sort. The floor's about three feet down, covered with mud. I'm going to climb in. Come on in, Frank. I'm coming. I'll hold the flash this way. Hey, the air in here is sure musty. I'll shoot the beam around so we can see what this place looks like. <sighs> What's the matter with you? Marty, didn't you see it? Over in the corner. Something white. It looked like a skeleton. A skeleton? Yeah. You're right. Let's take a look at it. Marty, I want to get out of here. I don't like this. Get hold of yourself, will you? Uh, well, look at this. A sword. A sword? Yeah, and an old one, too. And a skeleton. It has the remains of a uniform on it. Frank, this ain't no cellar. We're on a ship. A ship? Yeah. This is a cabin we're in. But... What would a ship be doing here? Back in the old times, the East River at this point was dangerous to sailing ships. That's how it became known as Hellgate. So many ships used to sink at this part of the river. And this is one of the ships that sank in Hellgate? Yeah. It probably sank over a hundred years ago. And the tide swept it along the bottom of the river to this bank. As the years passed, the wreck became covered with mud. The riverbed changed Leaving it behind. You mean this wreck is buried under the East River shore? Yeah, that's what I figure. There ought to be a door somewhere in this cabin leading to a passageway. You see it? No. Then the walls are so covered with mud it's hard to tell. Yeah. Wait a minute. There may be a door here. Hand me the pickaxe. Here you are. It's a door, all right. And here's the handle. Is it a passageway, Marty? No. No, it's a small room. Look, there's a half a dozen chests in here. Chests? Yeah. They have locks on them, too. Wait till I break the lock on this one. <clears throat> that does it. <clears throat> the lid seems stuck. Help me lift it. Okay. Now lift. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hey, look. It's full of copper coins. Frank, these ain't copper coins. Huh? Look, scratch one. These coins are gold. Gold? Frank, this is a treasure ship. A treasure ship, do you hear? Well, there's ten times as much dough here as there was in the bank. Uh, We're rich, kid. We're rich. How much? How much do you think there is in here? I don't know. But there must be millions. Think of it. And it's all ours. How are we going to get it out of here? How are we going to get out of here, Marty? Yeah, that's right. This wreck is probably buried 60 feet under the East River Bank. Yeah. We'll have to go back to the cave and find another spot where we can start digging our way out. But, but what about all this gold? Don't worry, kid. We'll be back for it. But first, we've got to get out ourselves. Come on. Let's go back to the cave. <sighs> the air is sure better in the cave. Yeah. Now, let's try one of these other walls. You start digging, Frank. Okay, Marty, you just... The beam is flickering. Yeah, the batteries are shot. There it goes. Marty, we can't dig our way out in the dark. Now, don't you think I know it? It looks like the game is over, kid. Huh? You may as well sit down and take it easy. But, but we just can't stay here in the dark. You got any better ideas? No. Guess not. What's going to happen to us, Marty? Come Monday morning, the cops will be swarming all over the bank. They'll find the tunnel we dug under the vault, then they'll find us. Probably some fat sergeant will fall through the tunnel and land in our laps. And the 120 G's and, and all the gold we found? Well, the bank will get back the 120 G's, and as for the gold we found... Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> That's a hot one. 
We hit the jackpot twice in one night to the tune of millions, and we end up behind the eight ball. <laughs> this is really a hot one. All that has to happen now is for that fat sergeant to fall through the tunnel and land in our lap. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what happened. A fat cop fell through the floor of the tunnel and landed right on our laps. <laughs> Ain't that hard? Uh, Williams, Williams, get hold of yourself. Uh, get hold of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay, Doc. I'm All okay. Right. <laughs> what happened after the police found you in the cave? Well, uh, Marty and me led the cops to the wreck. You, you should have seen their faces, Doc, when they saw the gold. Mm, uh, and the, the wreck you discovered, uh, what ship was it? You, you mean you didn't read about it in the papers, Doc? Back in January of 42? Oh, it was in all the headlines. Well, I told you that at the time I was in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Oh. Well, Doc, that wreck that Marty and me found buried in the mud was the British treasure ship Hazar, which sank in the East River at Hellgate on September 13, 1780. British treasure ship, huh? How much gold was it carrying? A million pounds in gold, Doc. That's over four million bucks. Four million? Yeah. The gold was sent over here to pay off the British soldiers who was fighting the Americans during the Revolution. I see. Marty and me heard all about it while we was waiting to go on trial for robbing the Hellgate Bank. Ah. Well, I see by your record here you were found guilty and received a life sentence. Yeah, me and Marty both. The Hellgate Bank robbery made us four-time losers. Yeah. It's been six years, Doc, since we found the wreck. Six years. Tell me, uh, who got the four million dollars in gold that you found? Ain't you heard, Doc? Heard what? Well, I just come from the warden's office. The warden, he tells me that after five years of legal scrapping by my mouthpiece, Marty and me are going to get two million bucks of that gold. Think of it, Doc. A million bucks apiece. A million dollars? Yeah. Ain't that a hot one, Doc? The court gives me a million bucks. You know what that means? I'm a millionaire. The richest guy in this prison. Only, Doc, how am I going to spend it? This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? What happened to Frank Williams? Oh, the rich fellow is still serving his life sentence. All of his fellow prisoners have nicknamed him the millionaire. But the problem of spending the money is driving Frank crazy. However, he hasn't given up yet. Right now, he's figuring out how he can uh, take it with him. Now, I recall another young man once who decided that money was the root of all evil, so he... Ah, oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying... All characters in tonight's story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Joe DeSantis, and Frank Thomas. Original music by Paul Taubman. Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... Seven Years to Wait. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the Mysterious Traveler. This program has come to you from our New York studios. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear the story I call <coughs> Murder in Jazz Time. Tonight, we're going to delve into the strange and confusing events in the life of Alexander Drake. But what person can tell you of these events better than Alex Drake himself? As our story begins, Drake is seated at a small table, staring at several blank sheets of writing paper. Slowly, he picks up a pen, hesitates, and starts to write. I scarcely know at what point to begin telling of the things that have happened to me these past months. I suppose I should begin with Vicky. Vicky, who I have loved ever since we were children. If my love was never returned by her, I was content to wait, ever hopeful that someday she would reciprocate my feelings. We saw a great deal of each other after she graduated college, and I watched with interest as she embarked upon a singing career. Success came to Vicky quickly and smoothly, as all things did. She sang with several name bands and then became a star attraction at the swankier nightclubs. Several years passed, and then one night, as I had always dreamed of it happening, Vicky agreed to marry me. That was the happiest moment of my life. A week later, we were married and driving to New Orleans on our honeymoon. Happy, darling? Oh, yes, Alex, yes. No regrets about giving up your career? None at all. Oh, it's good of you to say that, Vicky. I'll try to make it up to you. Oh, no, really, Alex. Giving up my career isn't any sacrifice. For a long time now, I've known that I wasn't very good. Not very good? Why, you were getting $1,000 a week at the Casablanca. And look at the way your recordings are selling. Oh, let's face it, Alex. I have a nice voice. I'm fairly attractive. And thanks to fine publicity, I've come a long way. But I'm not really a very good singer. Oh, nonsense. I think you're a wonderful singer. <laughs> That's because you're in love with me, darling. But I know better. Take, for example, that recording of, uh, of Easy Living that I made. That was one of the best things you ever did. Yes, Alex, it was. But have you ever heard the recording that Billie Holiday made of that number? No, I don't think I have. Well, if you had heard it, you'd know the difference between good singing... And really great singing. You mean she was so much better? Yes, Alex. And if I can't be a top blues singer, then I won't sing at all. Oh, Vicky, you're young yet. It takes time. No, Alex. You either have it or you don't. I see. Is that why you decided to give up your career? Marry me? <laughs> yes, darling. I'm glad you told me. Oh, look, Vicky, that sign. Only 37 miles to New Orleans. Oh, wonderful. At last, I'm going to see New Orleans. You don't know how long I've waited for this. Why all this enthusiasm for New Orleans? Why, Alex, New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz. Think of all the great musicians and singers who've come from there and the wonderful jazz they created. People like uh, Willie Johnson, Bertha Hill, and Jack Simmons. And just think... Jeff Becker is still in New Orleans, and we can hear him play. Uh, he's the fellow that owns the famous waterfront cafe, isn't he? Oh, Alex. Jeff Becker isn't famous because he owns a cafe. Why, he's one of the great names of jazz. Many critics think he's the finest jazz pianist who ever lived. <laughs> Forgive my ignorance, darling. I'm afraid I'm just a long hair at heart. <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, if this fellow Jeff Becker is as great as you say... How come I haven't heard more about him? Because he's always refused to leave New Orleans. He's had some fabulous offers to play in New York, but he's turned them all down. That's why he isn't widely known. But real lovers of jazz come from all over the country to hear Jeff Becker play at his cafe. Well, then I guess there isn't any question as to where we're going tonight. Jeff Becker's it is. An hour later, we were in New Orleans and registered at a hotel. 
Early that evening, Vicky and I had supper at Antoine's, and then we left for Jeff Becker's cafe. As we drove, Vicky was unable to hide the excitement she felt. Jeff Becker's cafe turned out to be a long, rambling, shabby building with a balcony that ran the length of it and hung over the river. The inside of the cafe was as unpretentious as the outside. There were 40 ancient tables or so, a small bandstand, and an equally small dance floor. A mahogany bar ran the length of one wall with a long mirror behind it reflecting the shabbiness of the cafe. As we were seated, a few musicians began to drift in and take their places on the bandstand. Vicky whispered excitedly to me the names of the musicians whom she seemed to know without ever having seen before. And suddenly, Vicky clutched at my arm. Alex, look. There's Jeff Becker. Where? There he is, walking towards the piano. That little sandy-haired man? Yes. That's Jeff Becker. I stared at him and felt somewhat disappointed. For no good reason whatsoever, my imagination had led me to see Jeff Becker as an impressive-looking individual. Whereas in reality, he was a slight man, being no more than five feet five, with a plain undistinguished-looking face. He looked a good deal younger than the 50 he was reputed to be. There were two very attractive-looking women with him, both of whom followed his every move as he sat down at his piano. The talk and the laughter in the cafe died out, and Jeff Becker and his men began to play. Jeff Becker played, the disappointment I'd felt about him passed left me. As he sat there at the piano playing smoothly, effortlessly, he was no longer a small, slight man with a plain face. There was a warmth and greatness about him, and even I, who was no lover of jazz, could sense the genius of Jeff Becker. Yes, Vicky, he is. He really is. Alex, look. He's coming this way. Yes, he seems to be coming to our table. Good evening, Miss Saunders. Welcome to New Orleans. Why, thank you, Mr. Becker. Thank you very much. Just call me Jeff. Only tourists call me Mr. Becker. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Oh, uh, this is my husband, Alex Drake. Glad to meet you. How do you do? Won't you join us? Sorry, no. I only have a minute. The boys and me got some playing to do. I've heard Brown B. Boogie played before, but never as wonderfully as you do it. Thanks very much, Vicky. How did you know who I was? I've seen pictures of you. Have you ever heard my wife sing, Jeff? Yes, I have. Well, I got to be getting back to work. It's been nice meeting you folks. See you around. Yes, of course. Huh. An abrupt sort of fellow, isn't he? He was being tactful, darling, not abrupt. He was afraid you might ask him what he thought of my singing. Well, what's wrong with my asking him that? Oh, nothing. Only it would have made Jeff Becker unhappy to have told you the truth about my singing. Well, anyway, I still think you're great. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Oh, look, they're going to play now. We sat listening to the magic of Jeff Becker's music for hours. When I suggested to Vicky that we leave, she refused, insisting that we remain until closing time, which was four in the morning. The next evening found us once again at Jeff's cafe, and again we remained until closing. Try as I might, I couldn't get Vicky interested in the sights of New Orleans and the fascinating swamp country nearby. Night after night, despite my protests, we would end up at Jeff's Cafe. Life to Vicky came to revolve around these nightly visits, and all else seemed unreal to her. Soon, even I lost track of time. Weeks passed, and then one night at closing time, Jeff Becker came over to our table. For the first time since the night we'd met, 
Howdy, folks. Glad to see you still with us. Hello, Jeff. Well, how do you folks like New Orleans? Having a good time? Frankly, we've seen very little of New Orleans outside of this cafe. Well, uh, just between us, there ain't very much more to see. <laughs> I agree. Oh, dear, it's closing time already. No sooner do we get here than it's time to go home. Well, if you'd like to hear more music, why not stay on? The boys and me always have a small session after closing now. Well, thanks very much, Jeff, but I'm afraid that we really oh, must Oh, we'd be... love to stay on, Jeff. It's wonderful of you to ask us. Glad to have you. See you around. Vicky, enough is enough. We've been here since 9 o'clock. Alex, you don't understand. It's an honor to have Jeff ask you to stay on. Few people get that invitation. Well, I'm duly appreciative, believe me, but seven hours is enough of this place for one night. Now, come along, Vicky. Let's go back to the hotel. No, I want to stay for the session. Vicky, I think I've been more than reasonable. Coming here night after night for weeks, now it's about time I got my way. I insist we leave. I won't go, I tell you. I'm staying here. If you want to go back to the hotel, don't let me keep you. As Vicky screamed at me, for a brief flashing moment, I almost imagined I'd seen hate in her eyes. The shock of that moment was like a revelation. Suddenly, I realized that Vicky had changed that I was losing her. Her face as she listened to the music was like the faces of the musicians and Jeff Beckers himself. Their emotion laid bare. By turns ecstatic, impassioned, unresisting. I was an outsider looking in on a way of life of which I could never be part. The lateness of the hour, the smoke-filled room and my confused thoughts were too much for me. And I fell asleep with my head on the table. I have no idea how long I slept. But when I awoke, it was daylight. I became aware of a woman singing. I looked up. I saw it was Vicky. Vicky standing by the piano, singing to Jeff Becker. Since it is a dancing floor, just for Well, Jeff? I don't know, Vicky. What's wrong? Hard to say. Oh. Vicky, jazz was born in these parts. And it came from the people. The people who worked on the levees, the river side wheelers, and in the fields. It was part of the bone and flesh of old timers like Willie Johnson and Joe Fletcher. They play jazz the way it was in their hearts. A singer like Chippy Hill just stepped up, clapped her hands, and gave out with the blues. That's what made it great. They played and sang as they felt. I see. Second-rate musicians picked up something that was fine and clean and took it to the big cities in the north. They weren't playing for the sake of music. They were playing for greenbacks. And is that what's wrong with my singing? Afraid so. I reckon you had too many teachers, Vicky, and they all taught you to sing by the book. It may be popular, but it ain't good. Do you think it's too late to go back? Hard to say, Vicky. Do you want to start all over? Oh, yes, Jeff, yes. Would you let me stay on here and... And sing with your band? Well, if you feel... No, Vicky. Alex! You're not singing with the band. We're leaving New Orleans at once. Alex, be reasonable. You it's know... It's no it... use, Vicky. We're leaving New Orleans today, and that's final. I'll get your suitcases from the closet, Vicky, so that you can start packing. I tell you, Alex, I'm not leaving New Orleans. Not only am I staying, but I'm going to sing with Jeff Becker's band. Vicky, are you blind? Can't you see what's happening? You're losing all sense of perception, of values. Life to you has come to mean only Jeff Becker's cafe. I don't care. That's where I belong, where I really feel alive. If you loved jazz, felt about it the way I do, you'd understand. I do understand, but there are other things besides Jeff Becker and his music. Not for me, there aren't. Now, here's a suitcase. Start packing. It's no use, Alex. I'm not leaving. You'll have to choose between Jeff Becker and myself, Vicky. Well, I'm sorry it's come to this, Alex. 
but I'm still going to sing with Jeff Becker's band. It was at that moment I knew that I had lost Dickie. As she turned away from me, an overwhelming hatred for Jeff Becker surged up within me. Had he been in the room at that moment, I would have killed him without any hesitation. I left the hotel, walked the streets of New Orleans. I knew that Vicky would never be mine as long as Jeff Becker were alive. And I also knew that I couldn't go on without Vicky. There was only one answer. I returned to the hotel, told Vicky I would remain in New Orleans with her. Night after night, we continued going to that waterfront cafe. And each night after the place had closed, Vicky would sing with the band. As I listened to Vicky sing, even I, who knew very little of music, could sense that her singing was superb. The musicians in the band looked at her approvingly and accepted her as one of themselves. Under Jeff Becker's almost hypnotic guidance, she sang with warmth and feeling. As much as I hated Jeff Becker, I couldn't help but admire his genius for bringing out talent. The music ended, and Jeff rose from the piano and patted Vicky on the shoulder encouragingly. He left the bandstand and started walking through the cafe towards his office in the back. This was the moment I had long waited for. I quickly eased out of my chair, which was in a darkened part of the cafe, and slipped out into the balcony. I then ran quietly along the balcony until I reached the French door that opened into Jeff Becker's office. I got there just as Jeff sat down at his desk. He was alone. I opened the door and stepped into his office. Oh, hello, Alex. What can I do for you? I've come for my wife. Your wife? But... Vicky isn't in here. Vicky is wherever you are. And I can't have that, Jeff. She's got to be mine. She is yours. You know that. No, no. She belongs to you now. She said as much. As long as you're alive, Vicky will never be mine. I know that. You're wrong, Alex. Believe me. It's music. No. She's got to be mine. She's got to be. Alex, don't. No. I felt... Jeff's body go limp in my hands. And I knew he was dead. I quickly picked up his slight body in my arms and carried it out to the balcony. There was no one in sight. I leaned over the balcony rail and dropped Jeff's body. It fell into the river with a small splash and was gone. I quietly walked to the other end of the balcony and slipped into my seat in the darkened cafe. The musicians and Vicky were still on the bandstand talking, and I knew they hadn't missed me during the few minutes I'd been gone. <sighs> the ordeal was over. A week passed, and Jeff Becker's disappearance was the talk of New Orleans. The police questioned everyone, but were unable to solve the mystery. Vicky was inconsolable and locked herself in her room at the hotel, refusing to see anyone. Who is it? It's Alex, darling. Please let me in. Darling, you can't stay in your room like this day after day. You know it isn't good for you. Vicky, let's leave New Orleans. Go to New York. No, I'm going to wait until Jeff comes back. Vicky, Jeff isn't coming back. What? What do you mean? A body was found floating in the gulf this morning. The police think it's Jeff's body. Oh, no! After a week in the water, naturally, it was hard to identify. Jeff! Dead? Yes, darling. It's in all the papers. Oh! Alex! <laughs> you mustn't cry, darling. Here, let me wipe your tears. Don't you think it would be better if we left New Orleans? All right, Alex. Anything you say. A few days later, we were back in New York. 
There was snow on the ground, and the air was invigorating. What had happened in New Orleans seemed like a dream, a bad dream. At first, Vicky was melancholy, but as days passed, she grew better, and I felt confident that in time she'd be her old self. We saw all the shows in town and dined at the finest restaurants. And then one night, I took her to Carnegie Hall to hear the Philharmonic Orchestra. Here, darling, here's the program. Thank you. Oh, I see they're going to play the Rachmaninoff First Piano Concerto with Andre Duval, a soloist. You've always liked that concerto, haven't you? Yes, Alex. Look, Duval's just come up on stage. Young, isn't he? Yes, he is. Happy? Alex, they're going to play now. As I sat there in that great concert hall listening to the orchestra, I became aware of discordant playing. I looked at Vicky, at other concert goers, but none seemed aware of it. The discordancy grew. And then suddenly I realized it wasn't the music of Rachmaninoff I was hearing. It was the music of Jeff Beckett being played faster and faster, louder and louder. I walked the impulse to scream out. As I put my hands to my ears, I became aware of my arm being shaken. It was Vicky. Alex, what's the matter with you? Vicky, the music. Listen to Alex, it. Alex, be quiet. Everyone is looking at us. I can't stand it anymore. Let's get out of here. All right, Alex, but please be quiet. Everybody's looking at us. Hurry, Vicky, hurry. Oh, it's gone. Thank goodness I can't hear it anymore. What's gone? The music. Alex, you aren't making any sense. We came to the concert to hear music. What's wrong with you? Wrong? Nothing. Uh, nothing at all. I, I just suddenly felt ill in there and had to get out. Perhaps we'd better see a doctor. You look so pale. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all right now. Are you sure? Yes, yes. Let's, let's go home now, Vicky, huh? All the way home, I kept thinking of the amazing hallucination I'd had. Obviously, it was the result of the mental strain I had undergone in New Orleans. But with sufficient rest and relaxation, I would soon forget the horrible events that had occurred there. Arriving home, I went to bed, but found it difficult to fall asleep. Hours later, I drifted off into an uneasy sleep, and then I started dreaming. I dreamt that I was in Jeff Becker's cafe, and the only people there were Jeff and myself. He was seated at the piano playing, smiling at me. I walked over to the bandstand and he spoke to me. Hello, Alex. How do you like this number? Pretty good for a dead man, huh? You can't play if you're dead. Yes, I can, Alex. You hear my music, don't you? Yes, I do. You're always going to hear it, Alex. Always. But my music will never die. Even if you did kill me, it'll go on and on. No! Stop! No! I don't want to hear it! Stop! Stop! Alex, wake up. Alex, wake up. Wake up. Alex. Alex, what is it? What is it? You were having a nightmare. You screamed and woke me up. Yes. I, I remember now. What were you dreaming about? New Orleans. New Orleans? Yes. Go back to sleep now, Vicky. I'm all right. I'm all right, I said to her. But I wasn't... That was the beginning of a series of nightmares and hallucinations in which I heard Jeff Becker playing that accursed music of his. When an attack came, I would flee from room to room, pressing my fingers against my ears, but there was no escape. I could hear the rhythmic pounding of Jeff Becker's music in my head, growing louder and louder, relentlessly hammering away. I knew that it would only be a question of time before he drove me mad. I fought for my sanity with the... Good morning, Mr. Drake. How are you feeling today? Oh, I see you've done quite a bit of writing. Good. I'm glad you followed my suggestion. It's all written down, Doctor. Everything that happened to me. It's fine, Mr. Drake. I'm sure it'll be of great help to both of us. Uh, do you uh, feel in the mood for a visitor? A, a visitor? Yes, uh, your wife. Yes, I'd like to see Vicky. She's just outside. I'll have her come in. 
Will you come in now, Mrs. Drake? Hello, Alice. How are you, darling? Vicky. Oh, it's good to see you again and have you near me. Oh, Alex. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell says that you're much better. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm much better. Doctor, will you tell him? Yes, Mr. Drake. Tell me what. Well, won't you sit down, Mr. Drake? Yeah, that's it. Now, what I'm going to tell you it will come as a shock. But I'm hopeful it'll rid you of the hallucinations you suffer from. Yes, Doctor? Mr. Drake... You did not murder Jeff Becker. But I did, I did. I choked him until he was dead. And then I threw him into the river. No, Mr. Drake. Jeff Becker was not dead when you threw him into the river. He was only unconscious, and the water revived him. His body made a splash. A small splash. Jeff Becker is alive. He was picked up by a fishing trawler going to sea. Do you understand, Mr. Drake? Jeff Becker is alive. Will you come in, please? I... I didn't want to do it. But he made me. Hello, Alex. How are you? No! You're dead! You're dead, do you hear? But your music, it goes on and on. I can't get away from your music. It follows me everywhere. Doctor, can't you do something? I'm afraid we've failed again. The feeling of guilt is overwhelming. However, we shan't give up. It's getting louder and louder and I can't escape from it. Stop it! Stop it! This is the mysterious traveler again. Too bad about poor Alex, wasn't it? It just goes to prove you may be able to escape the law, but there's always your conscience to reckon with. But what happened to Alex? Oh, he finally responded to medical treatment, and today he and Vicky are a very happy couple. However, there are still two things Alex can't stand. Jazz and the sight of rivers. He's uh, strictly a long hair these days. Now, I recall another young man once who decided that two murders are better than one. And so... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. <laughs> You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. All characters in tonight's story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Frank Behrens, Joan Alexander, and John Gibson. All recordings heard in this program were played by Miss Hazel Scott and may be found in her latest album, Great Scott. Organ music was played by Paul Taubman. Sound by George Cooney, broadcast engineer Al King. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Robert J. Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled, The Little Man Who Wasn't There. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the Mysterious Traveler. This program has come to you from our New York studios. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.